Laura. Day two. Day two. Hallelujah. We're back. And we sound um, so enthused. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome back to CUR 2020. I hope everybody had a good first day. I know that uh, I, I thought we had a good time. Yeah, yeah. And right. it, the day went a lot faster it, it went than very, I anticipated. Very quickly. So why don't we actually, while we're here, Gretchen, we can pull all the stuff up and uh, let me just make sure that, okay, that was looking good. I just want to make sure that everything's working here as we're getting started. It all looks like it's on target. We don't want to um, crash and burn at the outset. Yeah, that would be kind of tragic. So, um, so for today, why don't we just sort of pull up what's going on and what's happening uh, throughout the day today. So I'm going to yank the schedule up here. Let me pull it up for everybody to see. Um, and we're on day two already, right? So let me pull it on up. And by the way, for everyone who's here watching the live stream, which is all one of you probably. No. <laughs> so actually, you know, we had a good crowd yesterday. Um, even though no one really ever chimes in other than you know people telling us if, if they're having problems. Um, we had several hundred people watching us yesterday as the show went on, which was thank great. You, so thank, thank you for showing up um, because, you know, obviously people are ducking in and out of classes all day and some days you just want to break and you want to sit. Today, if you look at the schedule, um, checking it out right now, you'll see we have a pretty full slate this morning uh, if you take a look at the schedule. So it's not like yesterday where we had those little divots where you could even take a time out. Um, lots of really fun stuff this morning. So. Kicking things off this morning, uh, we have Mark Friedberg's uh, follow-up to his OCT lecture from 2015, I want to say. Was it from the first CUR? He gave an epic lecture all about OCT, and it was so popular, in fact. I want to say that once the, the course was done, we released it to ODWire generally a couple years later, and it's become one of our most popular videos. So Mark graciously agreed to come back and do a follow-up lecture on OCT. Um, so that's going to be really fun to watch. Uh, just to see sort of the evolution of what's happened in, in the subsequent few years. Uh, right now also we have Steve Silberberg who is doing his talk on epigenetics. So if you took genetics a long time ago, you might not even know what epigenetics is. So, <laughs> so Steve is going to catch you up on the latest science of epigenetics. Um, and it's a really interesting thing. He did a lot of research on it. Uh, and I think you will like it a lot. Um, Sue Resnick is also going to talk about how to launch a specialty contact lens practice. And Gretchen and I just got back from GSLS in Las Vegas, and mm -hmm. I was shocked by how vibrant the meeting was. You know, specialty lenses are thriving in a way that I, I would have predicted years ago this would not be. Yeah. I thought well, the you industry would have been was doomed. Wrong, my good I sir. would have been, I, this is why you never want to, you know, take stock picks from me or anything else, <laughs> because I would have been totally wrong. 30 years ago, I would have said, oh yeah, this, this whole specialty lens thing is nonsense. It's going to die, right? Everyone's just going to be wearing soft lenses off the shelf, but it's not true. Um, it's never been more vibrant. So Sue's going to talk about how to get started with specialty lenses. Um, and she's the one who knows. And she's the one who knows, yes. Yeah, so her practice is pretty incredible. We're going to actually talk to her after her lecture is done as well. Coolio. Um, and uh, Charles Shedlowski is giving a talk on acquired brain injury and concussion. So this is, I think, our second one on concussion at CEYR this year. It's a big topic. Yeah, Traumatic become, brain injury, what an optometrist can do yep. in terms of vision. It's And it's also part of sports vision. Yep. So that's a very important topic. It is. I mean, concussions are things, you know, it's not just for football players, right? It can happen to anyone uh, in all walks of life, and it's something you need to be aware of. Um, so those are the first ones kicking it off, and just a reminder that the OCT lecture with Dr. Friedberg is two hours long. Um, so if you're going, make the commitment. You got to sit through the get whole the thing. Get the bathroom. Yep. Get your coffee. <laughs> um, and speaking of commitment, so people have been asking me about credits and how to get them, and so on and so forth. So a quick reminder. That let, was a very nice segue. Let me pull this up. Quick reminder for everybody, so you can see it here. Okay. So. In order to successfully complete credits at CUR 2020, it is not that difficult. The critical factor is you must watch the entire lecture. Please, whatever you do, do not leave the lectures early. It is not rock and science. It people. is a COPE requirement, not even our requirement, a COPE requirement that the way the software has to work is that it watches, watches, it actually just makes sure that your <laughs> browser window is open Big for time. the entire uh, duration of the lecture. If you close it early, it's going to know. Um, so it keeps track of it, and this is critical, right? Because COPE wants to know that you're watching the material, but it's even more critical because there are some states that require you to do your CE live live, right? Where you're actually here and have the ability to interact with the speaker. So our software tracks it, so it knows if, it watched, if you watched this live or if you watched it on demand. And actually we have two different COPE numbers for those lectures, right? Even though it's the same content, COPE issues us two separate numbers. One for if you're watching it live, 
and one for if you watch it on demand. And that means you need to submit it twice and pay for it twice. Yeah, we did. Yep. So we, we go through that hassle of doing it twice with COPE because we want to make sure there are a lot of states like New York where it makes a huge difference, right? If you watch it live, it counts as live credit. Uh, that's why we do it twice. But anyway, the software watches what you're doing and it knows when you took it. So if you watch the lecture live and let's say you don't feel like taking the quiz right now, that's totally cool. You can come back whenever you want and take it through August and you'll still get credit for the live course because it records the fact that you were here live. Um, so to get credit, watch the entire lecture, eventually take that quiz whenever you feel like it. We know just from looking at the data, many people will not take the quizzes immediately because you don't have time, right? You saw how jam-packed the schedule is. Right. So you can come back and take it whatever you want. I recommend taking it relatively soon because you, you know, you forget stuff. Right. And you want to pass, so, um, but you don't have to do it immediately. The other critical thing, step three there, um, at the end of each course, you'll see there's a link to a survey for each course. If you could quickly just take a minute or two to fill it out, it would be really useful for us. If you have things that you liked or you hated or things that you want to see, that's the, the spot to let us know. And literally, it takes like two minutes to fill out or less. Uh, but without that data, we have no idea what's good and what's bad and what you like and so forth. So, anywho, that is that. And... I guess before we really get underway here, uh, another thing, the text, the, there's a chat box right beneath where this window is. And if you're watching this on Odiwire, you can feel free to type into that box if you have any questions about stuff for me or Gretchen, um, or if you're having any trouble with the talks or anything else, just type in a comment there uh, and we can get back to you really quickly. Otherwise, Gretchen and I are kind of trapped here, right? We can't, we are. We can't really communicate too well with other folks um, just because we're on camera for the next several hours. Yeah, come so. say hello. It'd be great to know who's here, yeah. what you're liking, what you're not liking. Yep. And that is that. Well, we do have some, some highlights from uh, Steve Silverberg. So he just shared this on the, the chat. So he says, all lectures were well received. Mm -hmm. special, sh special shout outs to great lectures that are needed or unique, uh, such as Ben Casella's narcotic lecture mm -hmm. that's required in many states. Uh, we've got pediatricians and ER docs. They were unique perspectives for optometry. And lecture on the overuse of antibiotics in the eyes, natural flora. That was something you will not find uh, many other places. True. And then he says, of course, what do we do with Dr. Clark Chang and all the Will's, uh, Will's Eye ophthalmologists? I mean, yeah. that was just incredible. So Clark is now the the king of CEYR 2020 because he did four classes in a row. Yeah, those guys were hardcore yesterday. And in fact, let me pull this up so people can see it. So this is a schedule from yesterday. Now, all of these courses that you're seeing here are already available on demand. So if you missed any of them yesterday, come on back and watch them right now. They're there. Um, so if, if you can do on-demand classes, again, if you're one of those people from New York or Texas or I forgot <laughs> where else, <laughs> where the state board says you must watch stuff live live, Go for the live ones today and then come back and watch everything else on demand. Uh, for many states, it makes no difference whatsoever. And by the way, special shout out to everybody from Canada um, because, you know, we have such a huge Canadian presence here because they are allowed to take most of their credits or all of them, I guess, depending on the province online. So that's why... Um, what a concept. Yeah, right? <laughs> so uh, shout out to everybody uh, in Canada for coming out uh, to see wire today. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool. You know... I know I made a big deal about Clark having four classes in a row, mm -hmm. but not for nothing. We got somebody else today who's got three in a row and also deserves a shout out. Who? John Gellis. Oh, right. Let me actually pop that up so people can see it. So he, and he's going solo, right? He's just, he is. Yeah. He doesn't have a sidekick. So we've yep. got Keratoconus. Uh, actually, they're all Keratoconus. Contemporary Keratoconus, Future Keratoconus, and Custom Soft Lenses. Wow. So it is all keratoconus all the time. So he's got three hours right in a row solo. So kudos to him. So if Clark is the king of CEYR 2020, then John, I think, is the prince of <laughs> CEYR 2020. Awesome. Oh, Steve wanted to point out, um, mm -hmm. first, shameless self-promotion, which I don't blame him. Don't miss his landmark lecture today at uh, Now? Like, yeah, coming up, right? Yeah, yeah in about 20 minutes. 20 minutes. He also wants to point out that you cannot watch on demand and a live lecture at the same time. So if you're trying to double up in terms of time, <laughs> so one on demand and one live because you are just that hardcore, 
can't do it. No, do not do that. Do, do not do that. So yeah, the software will not allow it. So again, a lot of the software requirements were driven by COPE, not us, right? right. So we, we have to follow the letter of the law. Um, that's actually something that I think people may or may not appreciate. We, we try to follow their rules as best we can. And when you see things that may not make sense to you or like, why did you do it this way? A lot of times it's, it's driven by those requirements. Again, like the thing about keeping your browser window open for right, the whole time. Right. Um, this is something that, that that's a requirement of COPES and we just try to, to stick by it. So um, we sort of feel like they made those requirements for a reason. They're not, you know, they didn't come up in, out just of thin air. Just to piss you off. Just, yeah, just to piss everybody off. So that's why we try to stick to them as best we can, so. You don't want to make COPE angry because then they, <laughs> then the group will not accredit your courses and people right. will be unhappy and they are not unreasonable. Right. And again, the COPE, COPE serves a very useful function because without them, I can only imagine what it would be like trying to get CE accredited across the entire country and all the provinces of Canada and, right. and, you know, and everywhere and in Australia. Having this, this, you know, this common denominator helps us incredibly. Yes. Being able to submit these courses to one place and get them vetted is an incredible, incredibly useful thing. Um, totally agree. I only wish that the state boards, you know, could be a bit more uniform in the way they handle CE, but that's a completely different. Well, that would be a nice segue to talk about um, AI and machine learning because <laughs> they are humans mm -hmm. who are reviewing these courses, and it depends on who it is, their experience, right. and if you get person A reviewing your courses this time and person B the next time, it's, yeah, it isn't consistent and it's yeah. not able to be, but maybe yeah. that's something they could work on and who knows, maybe it will be AI machine learning in the future. Right. Well, on, on the whole, it works out well. The reviewers, you know, we are in a, in a unique situation here because we sit, submit each course twice, right? So mm -hmm. the live and the on-demand. Now, you guys know because you're taking them that they're all the same course, right? It's the, we literally submit identical things twice to cope, but I think sometimes the reviewers will be different for the same lecture, right? Oh, right. So we'll send in like Steve's lecture on epigenetics twice. We'll submit it twice. One will go to one reviewer and, it, and the second copy of it will go to a different reviewer. And it's well, because they don't want to see. overload reviewers, and it's, and it's interesting to see what their takes are, you know, if you have the same content going to two different people. But by and large, the process works really well. We only have each, each time we do this, we only have a handful of lectures where they bounce them back at us and say, hey, this has got to change. And they make notes and they're like, you know, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, change this. But you're overloading them. You just dump a whole bunch of them. We do. We're, we're really bad. So sorry, Cope. No, no, no. I don't mean that, <laughs> that you're overloading them. I just mean that you are sending in such a vast quantity mm -hmm. of, of material yep. because of how much that you offer at one time. Yep. That's all. Yeah. I'm not trying to throw shade. And because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I looked up, you know, just this, the number of courses that we have here is you know, 60, it's a lot in terms of credit hours. So when you look at other conferences around the country, you have your expos that do about 100 or SECO or, the, you know, they do about 100. Other than those really, you know, few big ones, then there's us. And so I feel really kind of bad for COPE when we start in the fall, when we really start hammering them with all the stuff. I don't know how they get it done so quickly, but. But that's why you pay them. That's why we pay them. But yeah, I'm always amazed that they're able to get it done so efficiently. Um, and as you'll notice, actually, if I pull the schedule back up, we do still have a couple of, lectures that it says pending, COPE ID pending. So you can see it down here. And what that means is the course has been submitted, but we haven't heard back yet with a number. And so you can take the course, you know, up until this point, it's always worked out where a number was issued. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, gonna knock, I'm gonna knock on some wood too. Um, but if you see pending there, that's what that means, is that number has not been issued yet. And that can happen for a variety of reasons. It can happen because the lecturer got the materials in late, which happens. Um, the code may have had a problem with some certain piece of content that required a change. And we've resubmitted the change, but they haven't had time to review it yet. So our assumption is this will be okay, but you know. <laughs> well, I think it's important to note that, that if somebody really needs uh, live CE credits. So for example, if we look at there's one in the two o'clock slot and if we see COPE ID pending and if you definitely need that live credit in order to cover your butt, you might want to opt for a different class. Agree completely. Yeah, because you want to go for the short thing if you need the live, live, live credit, right? 
Um, How many times are you going to, you were saying live, live, now you've added a third live. So, because there, there is a difference, right, for some states, and we don't want people to get stuck, and I really should be able to figure out which the states are. I mean, I know just the big ones like Texas and New York. I'm sh- almost certain there are some smaller states that I don't know where right. it's the same kind of thing. <clears throat> Um, again, this goes back to each state board having their own set of arcane laws that developed throughout the 20th century. And right. <laughs> um, but just take a note of that because you yeah, don't want a, anybody to be screwed. If you need a live credit and it turns out not to be, we don't want anybody's license in jeopardy. Exactly. And, you know, there's an instructive thing here. If you're looking at Craig Thomas is the one that says pending, the one right beneath it that he did also got co-credit. That just came through with an ID number a couple days ago. Mm. And so... You know, why the other one hasn't yet, I have no idea. The review, it could still be out with the reviewers. Um, it's just the way it is. So, fortunately for us, again, we don't usually have too many problems. Most of our courses make it through okay. There's another course, actually, and it's not listed on the schedule. This Because this schedule I have in front of me right now on your screen is an old printed one. There's a course about AI that's going to be at 7 p.m. tonight. Again, this is in the co-pending category. Um, it's all about uh, using machine learning to treat uh, binocular vision uh, disorders. Um, so a pretty cool lecture, again, um, not approved as of yet, it says pending. It's running unopposed against any other lecture at 7 o'clock tonight, so again, you don't have to worry about, you know, should I take this course or another one? There's nothing running against it, so uh, it's a cool class. I don't know when the, the ID number is going to come in, but I'm just making everyone aware of it. Right, right. Better to be safe than sorry. Yep, that's why we ran it unopposed, actually, because we want to make sure, you know, if we had space, unopposed space, we'll put the pending one there. So that's a good whenever plan. Whenever we can. So, yeah. And you can see this is going to be quite an active day today. We have some of our, our favorite <coughs> folks here giving <coughs> talks. Uh, we're going to be speaking, actually. We're doing a large number of interviews today, just in case anyone wanted to know. In addition to talking to Steve Silverberg later, because, you know, we right. have to, right, Steve? And, oh, by the way, people have been asking me, too, where's Paul? Um, oh, right. We didn't even address that. So, so Paul uh, is not here, um, and it's, it's not because he didn't want to be here. It's because I wouldn't allow him in my house. <laughs> well, um, for two reasons. Right. There was a, a first reason, and then there was a second reason. Yep. So f- reason, Paul. reason number one was that every other family member here, my, my, my son and my wife, came down with vomiting disease and 102 degree fever. So I didn't think Paul really needed to be around that. And by the way, Gretchen, congratulations on surviving being around all this. I, no, not good. Oh, yeah, I haven't not good. survived yet. So I'm not going to say um, I'm in the clear till Wednesday. Yeah. And it'll be all your fault. Yep. So in fact, I invited other folks to be here with us today, like, you know, Charlie McBride and everyone else. And then I, I actually just sent out emails to everyone, keep away. It's <laughs> far away. Yeah, that's, it would have been bad. Bad, bad. Yep. So we're just dousing ourselves in bleach. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. Those ridiculous wipes, they're all over the place here. I've been, you know, just wiping down every hard surface I can find. But anyway, um, so that's why Paul's not here. He's actually in the chat window. I think he's probably going to be around. Um, not yet. But, but not, not yet. He's, yeah, he's too, too lazy, right? He's sleeping in. I wouldn't say um, lazy. <laughs> but so that was the first reason. And then yep. the second reason for today is that he came down with a cold. Right. And then we would have had dueling... Yeah, so we don't want to be near him, so, yeah. So first, your wife and your son were sick. Yep. Now your dad's sick. If I get home unscathed, it will be... It'll be a miracle. A miracle. Yep. So that's why it's just me and Adam. And I miss having Paul here. He adds a very different dimension, and it's a bummer. Well, fortunately, though, we do have Paul on film, because as you'll see today, and, and hopefully if you were watching this yesterday, you got to see our trip to the Contact Lens Museum. Uh, and we're going to run that again today so everyone can see it because it was a really cool thing. So on Thursday, when Gretchen came out here, we went out to the Contact Lens Museum in Forest Grove and we got to experience it was really cool. contact lens history. <laughs> Our thanks to Pat Caroline for being there to show us around. Mm-hmm. And also kudos to Pat and his partner in crime, Craig Norman, that, uh, that they put all this together. And it, it really is incredible. If you have an opportunity to see it, I highly, highly recommend it. Yeah, it's really cool. Definitely, if you're in Forest Grove, if you're out of Pacific for whatever reason, go to the museum, get them to open it up, and so you can walk around and see it. It is really cool. You know, the number of artifacts there is actually really stunning. And I was surprised, actually, that they had so many of the original soft contact lenses that survived. You know, I could understand how the the glass scleral lenses could make it for all those years, but Mm -hmm. seeing the vials of the old soft ones is really kind of cool. Actually, I'm not surprised that they survived, because I think as we move to uh, frequent replacement and blister packs out of the vials that 
doctors didn't really get rid of them. They got shoved in the bottom of a closet or right. in a back room and then they're forgotten. And really, they don't take up a, a lot of room individually, of course. So, and those glass vials were solid, they were heavy. Yep. So it would be hard to break them. I mean, unless you're smashing them. Well, on what's, what's crazy too is they preserve, they have bottles of saline, like they had Unisol, like those individual Unisol bottles. They had those from like the 70s or 80s or whenever it was. I'm like, wow, who on earth kept this? And how actually, did they? Actually, Unisol was even later than that. Was it? Yes. Yeah. Yes, so it anyway, was. they had all this this nonsense it's there. Really you could, it's really cool. It's really cool. Um, yeah, definitely and check so it out. And so you'll see it later on that yep. Adam stitched together some of the video that uh, we took and it was just on Thursday so he was able to put that together fairly quickly and you'll get to see that and yep. I'm really it was excited for people to see that. Yeah it was really cool and if you have anything by the way so if you're listening to this and you say hey I have a closet full of garbage. It's not garbage. <laughs> you know what I mean. I have, I, have, I have people who've been yelling at me to get rid of this stuff you know feel free. Now to, there's a place there's for a it. place for it and in, and in fact Paul just unloaded, what, 35 pounds worth of stuff from his garage. I'm actually quite impressed. So we were there on Thursday, and Pat was saying that he really wants doctors to go through their storage, their basements, their attics, and see what's there, preferably now before they're no longer around. Yep. Because once you're dead, your family doesn't know what's important. And all of these treasures are being thrown out because families don't understand the history. Yep. So we were there Thursday. And Pat is telling us this, and Paul said, how about my diplomas from, say, Columbia University that no longer has an optometry program? Yep. Because apparently your mother has relegated them to the garage. Poor Paul. <laughs> and Pat was quite excited, and I am so impressed. Paul wasted no time. Yesterday, packaged up out the door. Yep. I mean, that was incredible that he had them. So, Pat... There's something coming your way very soon. <laughs> Good luck. I'm just stunned that he got them together so quickly. Oh, I'm not. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, you know, I, I think that when, when we were there, and, and you'll see in the video too, they did have some diplomas there on the wall from, right. and they were very ornate looking. So I, I think it is a good fit. So if you do have things like that, you know, they, you, they may not seem special to you, but you know, I think people would get a kick out of seeing them. Absolutely. And some of these, oh, I mean the glass scleral lenses, and then we had that machine that oh, would machine. make them. It was the <laughs> only working one left in the world when they used fire and asbestos, yep. which is very scary. <laughs> yes. So yeah. that stuff is really, really cool. So dig around and get in touch with Pat Caroline at Pacific, and he would welcome anything that you have, because we'd rather save it and preserve it instead of having it lost yep. in time. Absolutely. Well, cool. So what, are, what time is it now? We so got seven up? minutes. All right. So seven minutes until, until Steve until, starts, right? Until the first classes start. Oops. There we go. Until these guys. All right. Right. So we have OCT part two, Steve Silverberg's epigenetics, a lifetime attack on the human eye's DNA. Mission control, prepare to launch your specialty contact lens practice and acquired brain injury and concussion, what the primary eye care OD needs to know. Those yep. are all very long titles except for OCT2. Yeah, <laughs> Friedberg gets to the point. Um, so meanwhile then, why don't we, while we're here, I can uh, let people, remind people about our sponsors. So um, we couldn't do CEY, or at least we couldn't do it as cheaply without our sponsors, right? Our goal with CEYR is always to make education as available as possible to try to give you the lowest price possible. Um, and so we couldn't do it without the sponsors because this, you know, putting together the conference is actually pricey. I know we don't have to rent any you know, physical spaces, um, so people think, oh, it can't possibly cost that much to put together, but really it does. Um, we try to put most of the money in the conference back, give it back to the speakers, right, because without their content, the conference really wouldn't be anything. Um, and also the, the technology, um, is also rather expensive because we have to support everything that we do here uh, year-round. So again, another COPE requirement is you guys have to have access to these certificates for not only this year, but for years past as well. And so if you haven't met our support team who actually works here, uh, it's not just me and Steve running around. It's, you know, uh, we have a, a whole other firm that works with us to help keep everything running smoothly. Um, you might have, if you ever contacted support, you might have met Kat who helps us with this too. Um, so we have a whole team that's behind the scenes that, that sort of keep things together here. And 
it's sort of expensive to, to maintain the operation even though we don't have a physical space. Um, so thank you so much to our sponsors for, for being behind the conference this year. And let me just quickly run through the specials that they're offering. Uh, we're, I'm also going to be setting out an e-blast after the conference is over, again reminding people to visit the exhibit hall, which will remain open through August, um, to try to take advantage of these specials. So uh, it's critical, you know, that you let the sponsors know that you appreciate them, uh, because without them, this, this conference just couldn't take place every year. It would be way too difficult. Um, so Marco, you know, is our first sponsor, and they've sponsored the live stream since the beginning. So thank you so much to Marco. Um, you know, without them, we probably wouldn't have had the bravery to go ahead and even put this thing together five years ago. Uh, we told them what we were interested in doing, and they said, go ahead and do it. We're behind you 100%. <laughs> That's fabulous. And I'm like, okay, well, we'll give it a try then. So thank you to Marco. Um, so Hog, you know them for their instruments, and uh, they are new to the conference this year. So thank you to them for coming on. They actually have a show special. Let's see if I didn't mess this up too badly. So a $1,000 rebate with the purchase of an Octopus 900 basic set and a $1,500 rebate with purchase of an Octopus 900 Pro set. You put the specials up on the slide? Yeah. Check you out. Yeah, well, you know, I was tired of like rifling through the paper, so I figured this is a more professional approach, right? Very um, well done. So Looks thank nice. You. So um, with HOG, again, this is, this is a special that is uh, unique to CUIR 2020. You're not going to get it anywhere else. People have asked me too, why do you have some specials that are only available here and not at other conferences? And the answer is because the costs for HOG to actually do this conference are much lower um, than going to say a physical conference. So especially for equipment vendors, as you know, carrying equipment to places is incredibly expensive. Um, the equipment vendors have told me it can cost upwards of $50,000 just to ship their equipment around from conference to conference. Uh, so obviously they don't have those expenses here and they can pass those savings on. So that is Hogg's deal. To get it, just go into the uh, exhibit hall, you know, right from your main lobby. If you click the link that says exhibit hall, you can get in there and see what's going on. And go into their booth, look around, uh, and you can contact the folks at Hogg right there. And then there's a little form that you just click on, and there you go. So the Neurovisual Medicine Institute. And so this is another new sponsor for this year. And let me see if I can pull up their website here just so you can get a sense of what they're all about. Possibly. There we go. All right. Um, so again, neurovisual medicine, so uh, this is something that optometry, you know, is uniquely situated to do. So we're, this is all about binocular vision and treating problems with binocular vision. Um, and so this is a place where you can actually go and take a course and learn about how to integrate this into your practice to become a neurovisual specialist. Um, and again, you know, in optometry, as, as we spoke about yesterday, there, people always say, oh, these, these other professions are encroaching on our, our field, right? Um, but this is something that is really unique to optometry, sort of like fitting scleral lenses, right? There's only one profession that's really going to do it. And the same thing here, dealing with binocular vision problems. And so they, uh, the Neurovisual Medicine Institute gives you sort of a soup to nuts, as Clark Chang might say, um, <laughs> overview of how to actually do this in your practice, right? They'll teach you. Um, how to diagnose and treat these uh, disorders and actually integrate the whole process into your practice. So we're going to be speaking with them on the phone uh, later today as well to learn more about it. So thank you to them for sponsoring the conference. Check out their booth. They have a lot of materials in there that you can go look at. So tear care. Um, so again, my, my Bohmian gland dysfunction is their game. And let me pull up the little device for you so you can see. Um, so there's the tear care device right there. It uses heat, opens up the meibomian glands. Now, the thing that's fascinating to me about tear care, if you take a look at it, um, look at how small it is, right? <laughs> it's very small and, and very portable. It's small, it's portable, and it's inexpensive. And so we're going to have the folks from tear care talk to us. Jim Sluck will be by later today to talk to us a little bit about tear care and how it works. And I think the thing that's striking about it, for anyone who's been doing this for a while, is not just the size, uh, but also how inexpensive it is. So you remember when the first treatments for my bohemian gland dysfunction came out, um, it was not cheap, right? Um, I'm thinking Paul's old practice, they had one of the first devices way back when, and I, I'm thinking it was over $100,000. Um, it was something, you know, insanely expensive, and the consumables were expensive. And it's a big investment. It's a big investment, right? And you're under a huge amount of pressure, and oh my gosh, can we actually make this work? So, but over time, the technology's gotten better, it's gotten smaller, and it's gotten cheaper. Um, and so, tear care is sort of the latest generation. 
and we're going to talk to them all about their products. So thank you to them for sponsoring the conference. Definitely go into their booth and you can see some examples of how the product works. Uh, and I think, you know, the goal for Criteria Care is to really get this product out there, right? They priced it in such a way uh, that is really accessible to most clinicians. So kudos to them. Uh, VTI Natural View. Oh, I was going to say before you start, mm -hmm. it is 11 a.m. Eastern and classes are starting. So heads up. Don't listen to us, go to your class. Yeah, there you go, go to the classes. But if you are still here and listening to us, <laughs> let's just talk for a second about VTI Natural View. We had uh, Doug yesterday talk to us um, about Natural View and their multifocal uh, daily disposable lens uh, and how it's different from other multifocals, right? So it doesn't have different ad powers, which is kind of interesting. That is very interesting. Yep, so it's, it's the design's a little bit different from what you're gonna see out there. And we also spoke about the, the topic that, you know, it's verboten for some people to talk about, but not for me. Um, how you, you people are using the lens off-label uh, for myopia management. Absolutely. And so, uh, again, not, not an FDA-approved indication as of yet, but everyone's, you know, not everyone, but, you know, people do use it off-label. It's something that you can do, right? Right. Uh, and, it, and so check that out. Um, they actually have a, a special running. Save up to $3 a box with the purchase of a 25 or 50-unit bank of the Natural View Multifocal One-Day Contact Lenses. So that is a CE wire special. So check them out. Zeiss, so good old Zeiss, uh, sponsor of this conference, and they have a bunch of equipment specials for you. Um, see, I was a good boy today, and I actually wrote wow. them out because I just, yeah. <laughs> it was getting to be a bit much trying to find it on paper. So special pricing for the Claris retinal cameras, Cirrus OCTs and OCTAs, and HFA3 perimeters. And they're also throwing in an extra year of warranty on most products. Excellent. And, and that's a really useful thing. So. They also have uh, retina-specific bundles, which is a combination of Claris and Cirrus, and glaucoma bundles, which is a combination of an HFA3 and a Cirrus. Um, and specials on the forum data management uh, solutions, um, up to 20% off. And forum, if you've never seen it before, it takes data from all your different instruments and combines it into a way that you can actually make sense of what's going on clinically. That's really um, cool. And it doesn't just work with Zeiss equipment. People always ask. It's for, I mean, the list of equipment that it works with is incredibly lengthy. So that is, from an engineering perspective, a huge undertaking, and it's, uh, absolutely, it's kind and of an amazing what a bonus thing. that yeah. you can use information from yep. different places. They they don't discriminate. That's really cool. Yep. So check that out. Uh, so A B Max. So this is the cute little device for anterior blepharitis. Mm -hmm. um, so I, what did I call it? A Dremel tool. A Dremel. Yes, <laughs> that has a, a quite a different connotation. It, it it does, but you know, so you know. You, uh, patients really seem to like this thing. Actually, I've had it done uh, to myself. Um, we spoke with John, uh, who is actually the inventor of the first generation of this device, and this is now the second generation. And the critical thing I think about the AB Max, um, you know, year over year, is that the consumables are, are much cheaper than the first generation device. And that's a really important point because yep. I think some practitioners have concerns about the cost of consumables. I mean, because that's above and beyond the cost of the device. Right. And will it be something that's financially viable for the practice? So that's a valid concern. Yep, and, and from what I could see, the consumables are less than half of what they used to be. Um, and John's running special here as well. If you go into the booth, you can see it, where basically if you're buying the consumables, he'll give away the device itself because um, he wants to try to lower the capital cost of getting this thing into an office. Right. Um, he wants everyone to be able to try it and, and not feel pressure once they have it to use it on every single person that comes through, right? Exactly. He's trying to remove cost as a barrier to um, give it a shot. So, so definitely check them out. He also has a trade-in deal. Let me see if I can actually pull that up, too. It's some, oh, there it is. Um, so trade, this is interesting. trade in and trade up. So if you have one of the first generation devices, and not, you know, not the AB Max, but you know what I'm talking about, Brand X, <laughs> as he says, mm -hmm. right, the first generation one, um, he's offering you trade-in. Uh, you, can, you can trade these things in, and um, he said he's got a closet full of them now, <laughs> um, which is, I, I, I understand why, right? Because if you trade in and get the latest generation, the consumables on the new one are so much cheaper. You can make back your money almost immediately, right, um, if you do a lot of these procedures. So, so, yeah, so check that out, too. It's, again, the details of all these offers are in his booth, so pretty cool stuff. We also have a little movie, actually, that I, I, I saw him at at Seco, and maybe if we have time later, I'll show, put up the movie of the device in action. That'll be cool. So that is that. 
So Neuralens, uh, again, this is a, a company, thank you for sponsoring us, they were sponsored last year as well. So they have an entire system, both a diagnostic tool, it's, a, it's an instrument, and uh, a method of making lenses with special prism built into them um, to help with binocularity issues. And Gretchen, you even have a pair of these lenses made up. I do, I do, and I wear them over my multifocal contact lenses while I'm working, staring at a monitor all day, and I do notice a difference from when I'm wearing them versus when I'm not. And not only does NeuroLens uh, make the spectacle lenses, but they also have the equipment in order to test patients to see what's cooking and to offer suggestions on what the patient should be doing. So NeuroLens is collecting the data and also manufacturing the spectacle lenses to help your patients. Right, and I think the, the importance of the instrument too is that it does it in a very sort of precise way, right, in an automated way so it doesn't take a long time to actually capture the data that you need right. to get this prescription done properly. So check out how their device works in their booth and they can you know, give you a show. Um, so pretty, pretty neat stuff. And there's actually a lecture later today mm -hmm. at uh, mm -hmm. 7? 7. Mm -hmm. 7 p.m. tonight um, about uh, machine learning and using this um, to diagnose these problems with binocularity. So it's interesting. They talk a little bit about the machine learning behind the device. So. That will be very, very interesting. Yeah. And Oculus, another great sponsor of the conference since pretty much the beginning. And Gretchen finally yesterday looked at their <laughs> logo and said, oh, now I get what that is. I feel like such an idiot. Yeah, you just pop that up there. And yeah. I, I see only the eye. How I didn't see it before, I cannot say. Yes. It's a so lovely logo. It is. And so Oculus, a family-run German company um, with U.S. headquarters right near us here, actually, here in Seattle. Um, so you've used their instruments before, and we had a great talk with them yesterday with William from, from Oculus. Talking, and we talked baseball, too. And we talked baseball because, you know, we went to a baseball game together. Uh, at, where was it? At AOA. Um, so Oculus, you know, th we're talking about the Pentacam because, again, specialty lenses were, were very much on our mind. Um, and, you know, these days the Pentacam, which is like a Swiss army knife, basically, it's got so many functions built into it. I love but that what, analogy. But what a lot of folks are using it for now is to help fit scleral lenses. And in fact, right. my local OD, Charlie McBride, has one. And he, he took me through the process of actually creating a scleral lens with it. And it's, it's fascinating. You know, Gretchen and I, we went out to the, the Connect Lens Museum. We saw how they used to make scleral lenses, right, with fire and asbestos. Which is a horror show. <laughs> and now you can use something like the Pentacam to get all the measurements that you need. It takes the data and stuffs it into a computer. You can adjust it a little bit with your mouse to make the scleral as just the way you want it. Hit a button, set those parameters off to Wave, the contact lens company, and three days later, you will have a fully customized scleral lens. That's incredible. Sitting on your doorstep. Um, so the, the equipment and the evolution of this is really kind of remarkable, you know, considering where it started. <laughs> right, absolutely. Um, so Oculus has, you know, devices like the Panacam. Um, and in fact, they have an extension to the Panacam, and I, I had no idea about any of this, right? They have a new one now that, that can actually measure axial length. So they're taking the device, which was already a Swiss Army knife, and adding more functionality. Um, to try to make it even more useful throughout your practice, especially if you're doing myopia management. If you're not measuring axial length, you're not really doing myopia management. <laughs> right? And that is a challenge for practitioners outside of an academic institution yep. to capture axial length measurements. And the fact that Oculus offers that functionality is absolutely incredible. Yep. And as we also learned uh, about the Pentacam in particular, I didn't realize the device was modular just right. by looking at it. Just swap out um, so the if you, head. So if you do a trade-in, it's not like you're trading in the whole unit and replacing the computer and everything else. They can actually, you know, unbolt and swap out the head and put it, the new one without the whole rigmarole of destroying your office and putting yeah, new computers in. Yeah, I mean, in. How, how cool is that? Just yep. put on a, a new piece and boom, you have all this additional functionality. Yep. And so also what they're doing is they have a deal going on here at CEWire. So you purchase a Keratograph 5M uh, and receive 45% off your first 10 wave lenses ordered each month for a 48-month period. So for, for those folks who are doing a lot of sclerals, this can be an amazing deal uh, because, as you know, those wave lenses are not cheap. And so this can be worth up to 28,000 bucks if you start doing a lot of sclerals. And that's over 48 months is four years. Four years. That's a long time yep. to, have, uh, to have discounts like that. Yep. And so if you, if you haven't seen this whole process of the modern way of doing sclerals, you know, I almost wish I filmed Charlie at his office, you know, going through the whole process. Maybe, maybe that's for next year. We can, say, we can convince Charlie we can have... go up there. 
He's right here. And, and do it because it really is a sea change from what it used to be years ago. So anyway, thank you Oculus for, for sponsoring the conference. Um, Science-based health and their Hydro Eye product. So we talked to Zach Denning yesterday about the science behind supplements these days in eye care um, and sort of where, where things are going. And uh, we, we learned an awful lot about GLA and other supplements. So go into their booth because Zach has an endless amount of information for you. <laughs> he has. That man is so smart, and what he knows is just incredible. Right. I love talking with Zach. Yep. And what's great about science-based health is, as their name might imply, they really are um, science-based. So there's not a lot of hand-waving with them. Um, they want to get down to the science behind supplementation and what works and what doesn't. Um, and so they like to stick to the studies, and that drives really their products and how they're made. Um, Hydra in particular, look at that, I put the special up. They have a BOGO offer. If you buy one case here, you'll get a second case of Hydro Eye free. So definitely go into their booth and check it out. Um, covalent careers. So uh, if you are looking for an optometry job, or let's say you're an optometrist even looking for an optician, right? Covalent careers is a good place to go. They got your back. They do. Uh, and as we learned yesterday after speaking with them, it's not just a place to post job listings. Uh, it, they also have good advice on how to like, I don't know, write you know, a listing, uh, how to deal with the interview process, and so on and so forth, all kinds of advice. And I can probably actually pull it up here. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, okay, so on ODWire itself, you know, we've partnered with them as well. If you can see the jobs link here on ODWire. If you click on that, it'll give you a list of all of Covalent's open positions right now. So the way Covalent works is when you create a job listing on their site, they have a network of sites that they'll publish your job listing to. So you see we're on ODWire right now. But these listings also appear on other websites as well. Essentially, ODWire reaches out and grabs their listing and plops it up here on our site. And they do this for many, many sites. So when you list with them, you're getting the power of a lot of eye care sites and a lot of people seeing your stuff. So you can see how many listings they have. Wow, Luxottica's going to town here. Look at that. <laughs> There's 800. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, and so again, they have jobs for optometrists and opticians and so forth. So definitely check them out. 10% um, off monthly job listings for ODWire members and CUR folks, so you might want to go check, check that out if you're in the market. Okay, so that is covalent, so yeah, 10% off. Um, so I Care Live, so this, I Care Live is a telehealth company, and so I know I, I just said a scary thing, right? Um, but what they're really <laughs> trying to do is provide tools that you can use in your office to stay closer to your patients, right? So when people hear telehealth, sometimes they get a little bit scared and they think, oh no, this is just something to you know, steal my patients away from, you know, someone's gonna look at my patient and they're gonna be in Asia and giving them advice. And <laughs> no, no, no. This is for you to have in your office where you can then reach out and work with your patient on their smartphone if they can't get to you, you know, into your office. If they're away on vacation or for whatever reason, they physically can't be in front of you, right? These are tools that you can use to stay close to the patient. And this is something that more and more people are expecting, right? Um, it's, not, it's not something that's exotic, right? People expect this level of care. I mean, at least here in, in the Portland area where I am, I wouldn't go to a doctor, right, if I couldn't reach them through some sort of a portal after hours, right? That's where because I could, you're you know, a tech geek. But but even my father, who I, I think you, tech geek, nah, no. possibly not, <laughs> but you know he, he goes to the same system as I do, and even he makes use of it, right? We used the analogy yesterday of Uber, right, where it was nowhere, 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 then all of a sudden, one day, everywhere, because the technology made it possible, right? Right, right. Everyone had a smartphone with GPS built into it and could do microtransactions. There's Uber. I think it's the same thing here, where there's going to be an expectation that you're going to be able to reach your clinician the way you want to reach them, through your smartphone. Um, and now everybody has cameras that are good enough, pretty much, in their phones to mm -hmm. be able to at least show you, uh, to some degree, what's going on with them. Well, the best part of that is that you, as a practitioner, keep the patient. Right. And you are managing your patient with whatever problem cropped up while they're in Italy or camping yep. or whatever, and they're not going to see somebody at an ER who may or may not know what's going on. Yep. 
you continue to manage your own patient. I mean, imagine as the patient's checking out, you can tell them, by the way, download this app to your phone. You'll always have access to me when you're away, right? What, what better thing could there be to keep a patient close to you? So anyway, I that... can hear the complaints now, though. OK, start complaining. I want to hear them. <laughs> I think <laughs> doctors would be like, oh, I'm already in the office how many times a week? I'm going to have these people getting in touch with me at 11 o'clock on a Friday night or it'll be in the middle of my kids' piano recital. I'm always on. That is one of the bad things about smart devices that we're always connected. We can't escape, and now I won't be able to get away from the office. So I would agree with that. However, I know a lot of doctors who already give out their cell phone numbers to their patients, and people, by and large, are pretty respectful of your time. Um, I not mean, everybody and not everybody chooses to give out their cell true. number. That's true. But I, I found in general people are respectful of your time. Look, at CEWire, on your certificates, when you're taking these education, oh, you'll no, see a number. Oh, say it again. I'll say it again. You'll see a number on your certificates, a phone number for support. That number that's on there is actually my cell phone number. <laughs> so, you know, we've had over 10,000 people go through countless numbers of hours of CE. I can count maybe 15 times in five years that docs have actually contacted me directly to talk. Um, That's not too bad. It's not too bad at all, and I don't mind doing it, right? Because if someone is motivated enough to actually jump on the phone and talk to me, if they're having a problem, totally cool. And I think patients are the same way. That most are going to respect your time. I mean, I'm sure you'll, you'll get an occasional crackpot that'll drive you insane, but, you know, that's life. Um, I guess doctors would need to weigh the risks and benefits of being able to continuously treat their patients with the annoyance of some Yahoo who's going to harass you at three in the morning. Yep, but at least with I Care Live, you know, these tools are structured, as you can see on the screen right now. This isn't freeform stuff. You have an app, and it handles a lot of these interactions for you. Um, you know, we should have, we talked to Paul Super yesterday, and we should have asked him if there's a screening tool, because it, it, how different is it from simply giving a patient your cell phone number? Uh, if a patient just clicks call doctor now or, you know, however the interface works, right. is that what happens? Or is there some sort of screener questions um, to try and decide, is this a true emergency? Or right. you lost your contact lens? Dude, I am not going to the office at 3 in the morning because you lost your contact lens. Yeah, so here's the thing that everyone should do. Go into their booth, I Care Lives booth, where all the materials are, and take a look. Just take a look at what they have. Um, because Maybe they, I should they, do that to answer my own You should do questions. that to answer your own question and take a look. Um, but these sort of structured tools, I I'm... You know, I've, I've been wrong about a lot of stuff in my life, right? As we all know, right? I, I thought special lenses would be dead by now. Um, That's true. <laughs> so, but this I don't think I'm wrong about. Tools like this, whether it's I Care Live or, or anything else, these structured tools to interact with people, they're only going to get more advanced, right? You are correct. And, and so whether you go with I Care Live or something else in the future, this is going to be the way things are. I mean, how many times have you had a patient call you and say, I have a red eye? Uh, you know, I, I'm in Nebraska, what do I do? Now, with tools... First I'd ask, why are you in Nebraska? Well, there you go, but <laughs> that's a totally different topic. But anyway, the, with this, you know, people can actually take pictures of their eye. True. And send them to you in a HIPAA-compliant, secure way where you can start evaluating what to do. Right. Oh, my and, God. You know, you need to get to so-and-so's office. I'm going right. to make the call. Or, or you, you're fine. Or you're fine, right? right? And so... For patients, obviously, this is a huge service, and for the doctors as well, it keeps the patients closer to you. So anyway, I, you know, obviously change is, is happening constantly. I don't think this is anything to be afraid of. I think this is a really important thing that people should look at closely. So that's just my feeling, <laughs> right or wrong. Uh, so I Care Pro. So uh, if you have to market your practice, and everybody does, and you do it online, and everybody, everybody does. Everybody should. Everybody should. Um, I Care Pro is a great way to go if you don't want to actually try to do it yourself. So they work with hundreds of practices. They know how to market I Care practices online, how to handle your social media, how to keep everything up to date. And an interesting show special that they're running right now, if you take one of their packages, uh, they'll come to your office and take professional photos for you. That's really, really neat. Yep, and it's becoming increasingly important too because, um, you know, these days when people look for you like on a Google map, if you've ever done it before, you'll notice they'll see your location, they'll mouse over it, and pictures will come up. So this is mm -hmm. the first impression that people are going to get of you. Um, so taking pro, pro photos are a good thing. And look what I have up on the screen here. They sent me some of the links uh, to work wow. that they've done. 
So Those if, are great photos, and that is a snazzy-looking office. Isn't it pretty cool? So, yeah, so they were going to come in, and I'm not sure if they actually created this website as well. I have to ask them, because um, this is obviously part of what they do. But they, they create really professional-looking stuff. So if you don't have the wherewithal to handle this on your own, and frankly, many doctors probably shouldn't be handling this on their own. You know, Gretchen, I see what you do every day with Optometry Times and sending out endless an endless stream of social media it takes a lot of time it is it is very time consuming and fortunately there are tools that can help with that that allow you to schedule but most ODs that that's not your skill set and nor should it be and just like way back in the day when practices would create a website which was a huge undertaking back then and then leave it alone you you can't create a website or a social media account and then walk away from it. I call it feeding the beast, that you need to continually provide a stream of fresh content. And it can't always be promotional. It needs to be informational as well. So you're not simply saying, hey, we've got an opening at 2.30 today. You have to also talk to your patients about sun protection and dry eye and pediatric vision exams. There's a lot of information out there that you need to share with patients and it is a time suck. It isn't difficult. You need to stay up to date on best practices and how things change in social. So it's not hard, but it is very time consuming and you need to commit to that. And it's very, very difficult for practitioners to do because your primary goal is patient care as it should be. So there are companies out there who are willing and able to help doctors make sure that their practices are visible. They'll help give you SEO techniques to make sure that patients are finding your practice when they do a Google search. And apparently now, if you talk to iCare Pro this weekend, you'll get great looking pictures to go on your social media and your website to help draw patients in. So if that's not something you're interested in doing, maintaining your, your digital presence, and I understand why you're not, and perhaps you should not be doing it, there are people who can help you. Absolutely. So that is Eye Care Pro. So Lac Rivera, for those of you who do punctal plugs, you might want to go check them out uh, and check out what they're doing. They have a huge list of show specials here, um, and it's a whole it's a whole thing. If you go into their booth, they have a smorgasbord of discounts, particularly for CE Wire. Uh, we also have a lecture coming up today, all about punctal plugs. And let me actually see when that was is, was, is, I believe it's in the afternoon. I think it's today. Yep, it's actually at 6, 6 p.m. Eastern time there tonight. The ins and outs of punctal occlusion. So obviously, punctal plugs have been around for a while, uh, but the technology is constantly changing too, right? These products right. don't, they're not set in stone, right? Um, and so Dr. Brooker's gonna go, you know, take us through what's going on in the world of punctal plugs. Um, you, you know, it's another good tool that people use for ocular surface disease, so. Check it out and check out Lac Rivera. And later in the show, I'll, I'll maybe bring up the smorgasbord of discounts. I mean, this thing is like... They have a huge it's, list. <laughs> so definitely, if, if you're interested in their products, please go into their booth and, and check them out. Uh, and again, we're also going to be... I'm going to be sending an e-blast to everyone, too, um, letting everyone know about these discounts because I know that so many folks are busy during these two days that sometimes it's hard to get into the exhibit hall, but mm -hmm. you really should. And the exhibit hall will be open after the lectures are done. Um, you know, obviously everything's going to be on demand through August, but you want to jump on a lot of these discounts quickly. Uh, some of them will go away relatively rapidly. Some companies like to keep the discounts open for the whole on-demand period, but many will, you know, strictly time limit what they're doing. Best to jump on them today. Yep. And Optometry Times. Optometry Times, yes. So our goal at Optometry Times is to bring you practical chair-side advice that is easily consumed, easily digested. And our goal is that you'll read a piece of content between patients and then apply that information to the next patient in your chair. So our goal is to help you help your patients. And a big shout out to our chief optometric editor, Ben Casella, and our entire editorial advisory board. I couldn't do it without you. We are also looking for new blood. If you're interested in writing for us, we would love to talk to you. And if you aren't currently reading Optometry Times, you can go to our booth or even our website and sign up to receive print copies via mail, or you can sign up to receive our digital offerings, such as our email newsletter or our digital edition that we will send you. So we would love to hear from you, and thanks for reading. 
And also, since I'm here, I want to give a shout out to my daughter, Alex, who is listening and watching us. So I said she can't see us yet because we're going through the sponsors, but uh, we'll be up on video soon. So Pookie Pie, thanks for watching. Love you. Very nice. Yeah. And, and hello, Alex. I'm, I'm glad that you decided <laughs> to turn up. <laughs> Hope, hopefully we won't put you to sleep. Well, Troy said, my husband said yesterday, how can you sit there and talk about eye stuff all day long? I said, <laughs> sometimes it can be a challenge. Yep. Especially when we're up early. Well, ho hopefully not today. So hopefully we can keep it interesting for you. So Vision Equipment. So this is Leo Hadley's company. So again, Leo has been at this game for a long time. Uh, they sell refurbished equipment. And as Leo has said numerous times, you know, you ask him where you get this equipment from. It's like from all those offices that bought brand new equipment and overextended themselves, right? Um, because with high quality refurbished equipment, you know, at a fraction of the cost of new equipment, you can outfit your office. So if you're just starting out, or if you want to acquire an instrument that you're not sure of, well, how much use am I going to get? It can, the, the difference um, with going refurb, if you know the source of it, um, the savings can be significant and the risk is, is lower. So check it out. And if you've ever seen Leo's stuff at a trade show, you'll know that even though it's refurb, it looks like new. Uh, when you see it. So it's sort of like looking at a time capsule actually for some of his really old stuff because you know intellectually that, oh, that's CRT is, you know, old technology, but the thing looks brand new. That's really cool. And it's a great way for doctors to add new pieces of equipment and new technology to them, to their practices at a lesser investment. And you can get started doing something additional to help your patients without needing to sink a bunch of money in it right from the get go. Yep. And that is it for our sponsor list. So let's see what's going on here now. And now Alex can see you, so. I also, she just called me out for using her nickname <laughs> in front of everyone, so I'm sorry. How so, embarrassing. Yes. Hey, wait a minute. You, you, you call your, you have a nickname for your kid. That's true. Should we actually get him in here? We should at some point. We yeah, should get Reed in here. He's, he's getting to the age though where he's actually too embarrassed to be seen with me at all, so. Well, as long you know. as he's not puking. Yeah, and that's I think true. we're over that. We're gonna yeah, knock wood. Hopefully, knock yeah. wood. So hi to Alex and pet the kitty cats for me. I'm, we have I miss our kitty cats at home. So that's what happens when you're working hard. Yep. Or hardly working. Hardly working, right? So okay. So what's up next? So we have, we have a call. We do. We have a call with Crystal. Hopefully, we can find her. Yep. We're gonna be talking to Crystal Bremer in just a few minutes. Yep. So we Big have a dry eye minutes. expert. And before we do that, again, I want to remind people if you just joined us, and some people have just joined us, let me put this up. Okay. Oh, we're um, going to remind people. I'm going to remind people rules. of this because, uh, whoops. Come on there, PowerPoint. Doing me wrong PowerPoint here. PowerPoint fail. There you go. There we go. Okay. So if you are in a class, remember watch the entire lecture do not leave early um, don't do it whatever you do the entire lecture and in fact when you're watching there's going to be a warning on the right side of your screen whoop, whoop, i made sure whoop. of it this year <laughs> don't leave even if you know all the content cold right even if you could recite the stuff in your sleep keep that window open and stay there and watch um, it's a cope requirement that you have to stay for the full period of the class the software tracks when you're in that class uh, which is actually critically important for many states too, like New York, where live credits means live. Like you have to go to the live session, not the on-demand session. Um, so definitely watch, because people have asked me in the past, how come my credits didn't go through? What happened? And it's like, well, the software detected that you weren't there for the whole time. Um, so that's an issue. So please just watch the entire lecture. Leave that window open. Don't try to watch two lectures at once also, <laughs> which... I didn't realize that people would try to do that. And I'm glad that Steve pointed that out earlier, that if you're trying to you know, double time it, go through two at the same time. Who actually, yeah, not who work. did that? I, we, should we wrap that person out? I mean, that, that I've never heard of such a thing. How would you even con conceive of doing it? You'd have two audio streams going at the same time too. You'd be well, like- you can also just put the mute down on your Yeah, that's true. So laptop. anyway, don't try to game the system. It won't allow it, I guess is the point. <laughs> yes, yes. They're on demand for a reason. Just yep. watch one next week. And again, these aren't our rules. COPE has very clearly defined rules in the software that we use. We have to meet their requirements. So we just, we're living up to the letter of the law to the best of our ability. So that's why you don't want to leave the lecture early or run it twice. Pass the quiz at the end, 70% is passing. You don't have to take the quizzes immediately. You can put it off as long as you want uh, through August 1st. However, I'd recommend, you know, taking it while you still remember the material. 
Um, but people have asked me, do I have to take the quiz immediately? No, absolutely not, because the classes are all back-to-back. -back. I mean, there's just no time. Um, so most people don't actually take them immediately. And by the way, if you flunk, you can take it as many times as you need to until you pass, so. Flunk. I mean, that sounds like somebody is a flaming failure. <laughs> Maybe if you just misread a question. There you go. Or click the wrong button. Yeah, well, you know what it is. There's only 10 questions for each hour of class, and that's not a lot of questions, right? That's so true. I hate those kind of tests. So if you miss one, you're screwed. Right. I mean, if, if you miss, you know, four, you're done for, and you have to do, do the quiz again. You don't have to watch the whole video again, at least, right? So you, you just have to take the quiz again. But anyway, 70%. The other thing is the survey. At the end, you'll also see a link to a survey for each course. Please, if you could, fill it out. Um, it only takes two minutes or less. Especially if you love something or absolutely despise something, we need to know. Uh, because we actually um, look at these things, right? You're not just, they're not going, you know, into a garbage can. I actually read them. And what you write there determines what we're going to do next year. And that's really important because you and Paul and Steve really do want to hear what people have to say. It's important that people give input and you do listen. And I think that if somebody has a desire for a certain topic, or wants to suggest a speaker, the chances of that advice being taken is so much greater here than at a bigger meeting because you do, you're not deciding by committee. Yep. It's just the three of you deciding what's gonna happen at the next meeting of the next conference and you out there listening right now can have a big effect on what's gonna be happening next year. So fill out those surveys, let Adam know what you liked, what you didn't like and suggestions for next year because he does take a look at them. Yep, absolutely. So there we go. And we have Crystal. Okay, so let now. me let me go find Crystal here. Let me get her number. And, and her class will be coming up then in 30 minutes. Okay, so we want to make sure that we uh, get her off to her class in time. Yeah, so she'll be speaking at noon Eastern on Dry Eye in the Real World. That's uh, in room four. And Crystal has a lot of experience with Dry Eye, and she also has her own Dry Eye Institute, where yeah. she helps practitioners get started in treating dry eye in their practices, and she offers um, very small classes with hands-on uh, experience with equipment, and I think it's great. So she'll tell us about that and about dry eye in the real world. Hello. Hey, Crystal, it's Adam and Gretchen. How are you doing? Hi, Crystal. Hello. How are you guys? I'm great. Well, I don't know that I'd say we're great. We're mostly good. It's still early for us, we're... and day two is always harder than day one. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, Crystal, we, you remember, remember, Crystal, that one year where I had the flu? Well, this is, oh, yeah. this year has been way worse. Um, I haven't been sick, but everyone around me, has been, they've been dropping like flies. So I'm just waiting, oh. waiting for it to happen. So, yeah. You just and now you're up. having to pull the weight. Yep. <laughs> you're almost you're almost home free now. You're over halfway. You know that. Yeah, I know. So this. we're in we're in the home stretch. So we're we're feeling good. We're knocking so. wood that neither of us is going to keel over dead from from the uh, plagues. See, I, I think your next career is going to be radio announcer or something. Maybe not radio, a sports announcer, because you are just building your longevity here. <laughs> Your endurance. There you go. I, I, you know what? I know that I'm not cut out for this though, because you know what's going to happen? <laughs> like the, the second the camera goes off, I'm going to be asleep for a week. So I can't do this. It's so hard. Yeah, oh we are God. pretty lame on Sunday afternoons here. As soon as we're finished, we we just flopped on the couch and we, yep. we look rather pathetic. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, and I, I have another story to tell everyone, because you know, for posterity. So last, so, you know, so Crystal, not to get gross, but like people in this house have been puking everywhere, and like. So my son, oh my, my son and my wife, and they've been sick. And my son, who's like 10, and obviously because he's 10 has no sense, right? He's like, I'm feeling better. We should all go out for sushi tomorrow night. And this was last night, uh, and I'm like, and I could tell you were horrified. I was completely horrified. I, and we're like, okay. Sushi, really? I'm Dude. I'm like, okay, all right. Let's just, we'll, we'll see how it goes. So we actually did it. We went out, and he was turning all various shades of green, but he wanted sushi. So. Uh, and he managed to have it. He did. He kept it down. I was and, really impressed. And it went well. Okay. And, and it went well. So, so far, of course, we haven't seen him yet today. <laughs> so who knows? 
Oh my God. <laughs> it could have pushed him over. You better go check on him. You yeah. better check. Yes, absolutely. So it's, it's been a, it's been a challenge, but it's, it started out strong and we'll finish strong. We hope. That's, that sounds absolutely. like a, that sounds like a slogan. Hashtag finish strong. Yeah. So meanwhile, yeah. Crystal, what's going on in your world? Oh, it's, it's good. I mean, it's 2020. We're going to have a great year. I think there's just good things to come. And, um, I'll tell you, I was actually putting this lecture together and I spent a lot of time just researching. And the reason that I did was because I had seen so much in my office about how life was just tearing people down and, and affecting them. And I thought, I, I got to put this together and be able to help them and do more than just those couple minutes with them in the exam room. I want, I want it to have a lasting effect. And, and my point is, in doing this, it was a really big look in the mirror of, wow, <laughs> I've got some work to do on myself because I, you know, I work all the time and just don't have a ton of self-care. And you're talking about um, sleeping for a week after this. <laughs> you know, that's one of the things that I go over in my lecture is how much, how much it, it, it takes a toll on your body. Just mm. even having six hours of sleep a night, it's not enough. And what was so interesting was the people – self uh, assess and they thought they were doing great that they had acclimated and they were running well in six hours but then when the objective assessment came through they were not they were not performing well but adam you'll be happy to know that a lot of the dry eye effects from lack of sleep were uh recoverable after you know they went and slept for a week <laughs> oh. there's hope for us there's, yet thank god yeah <sighs> yeah so i was doing this getting ready for this and it was talking about food and diet and I just kind of sarcastically took a picture of my refrigerator. There's nothing in there but condiments. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe we shouldn't show our breakfast of Yeah, that's not champions. breakfast of champions. <laughs> so, yeah, just a little bit at a time. It's not about perfection. We're going to get there, Gretchen. That's true. Well, I've got a protein bar waiting for me yeah. shortly, so I needed a little sugar kick. But, uh good friend here does not even, I told him you need to have a, at least a glass of milk to go along with your Rice Krispie bar. So yeah, I'm fine. Uh, the Rice Krispie treat is all I need. So at least pretend it's a bowl of cereal. <laughs> and I had, uh, I had my Solid. flat white that has protein in it. You're drinking just black coffee with fake sugar. So you are just a hot mess. I know. Complete hot I, mess. Mm -hmm. Shameful. You'll need to. Uh, all right. Well, you guys to... tune in at 12 o'clock. That's right. Week, so you can. <laughs> You need you to beat him up with Seco, Crystal. Right. Yeah. So meanwhile, Crystal, I, will. I have I, will. <laughs> I have pictures here, pictures of things. So let me actually put it up here. You sent me pictures of your office, right? Because I want to know what's going on in your world and, and going on with the Institute yeah. and stuff. Okay. So this was a, a big deal for me. Wow. I made a decision to take the optical out. Hmm. And really? it, it was it, it was a long time in the coming in coming, but I had been doing primarily dry eye anyway, and I just I made that decision, and, and I am so, so happy with it. I couldn't be happier. I was trying to be everything to everybody, and there's a point where you just got to focus on who you are and what you do well and what you enjoy doing and go in all the way. So that uh, really caused the practice to take a little bit different turn because one of the reasons I did it was I saw all these patterns of these women, especially coming in so stressed, and I really wanted to do more. So I put in this relaxation room and there's two chases and I, I just oh encourage God. them. I know there's a lot of stuff going on in your life and I can't fix that. I can't help with that, but here's what I can do. And I encourage them to come early. We've got uh, IECO's Tranquil Vibes mask. So it vibrates and it stays hot for 20 minutes. And we have them sitting there. We put their glasses in an ultrasound cleaner and um, just, give them a latte or a glass of wine or whatever they want. And we just wanted to create this, this tranquil place where they feel comfortable um, and they, they don't feel intimidated and we can really address the lifestyle things that are uh, influencing their outcomes. So ever since then, when I walk in the exam room, my goal is just to be present. Um, it is so hard in the exam room. We've got a hundred things going on in our mind and it may be about that patient. We're trying to figure out what was the last treatment they had and what are they doing with this and this and how many minutes do I have left? And I've just really tried to refocus and it's been great. Um, as far as what it's done for Dry Eye Institute, it allowed me to increase my number of seats. 
So now we have, instead of five people, we've got room for up to 10 people at a time. And I have been working for weeks on this, but I've been, uh, I've just finished today and I'm sending it off to the printers. It's about a hundred page patient education uh, manual. Wow. And it's really just encouraging them and training them how to create better habits and things like this that they can apply to all aspects of their life. And what's cool about that is now that added another 100 pages to the Dry Eye Institute manual. So now we're, we're 300 and some, almost 400 pages. And it's just really created this awesome tool that they can take with them as a resource and don't have to start from zero, don't have to recreate the wheel, just use the resources and it works on inspiring your people and growing them. So I'm, I'm thrilled about that. And I know I'm rambling. I'm talking fast because, <laughs> but I wanted to you to know. Um, but I'm thrilled about that and being able to accommodate them. But also we're changing our format and we're going down to just quarterly meetings in Wilmington. Uh, but we're taking it on the road to St. Louis and to Chicago. Hmm. Cool. So that's that what's happening really- with me. That's really cool, and I want to come to your your relaxation room right now. <laughs> I didn't know that you had gotten rid of no. optical. That's incredible. How have your patients reacted yes. to that? They love it. I mean, I, I think they feel special. I think they walk in the door, and they know how much I care by how much I've poured into the practice. And, you know, I've got a fireplace there now, and this beautiful mantle with all this uh, wood, this hundred year old wood. And then we burned the edges of it. And they just, I think it makes them feel special and makes them know that I care. And that's the start of everything. If you want them to do what you're asking them to do, they've got to know that your heart's in it. It sounds absolutely incredible. And I'm glad that your patients have such a positive reaction. That is so, so cool. And so going back to dry eye Institute, so you increased your seat availability to 10 that's interesting Mm -hmm. i like that because i and are you able to to can to still offer that small focused discussion because i know that that was one of the cornerstones is that you had only a few people and you were able to dive deep so i'm betting that adding another five seats still keeps it small but it adds a bit more you can learn from each other then with different interaction when you have just a few more people there to bounce ideas off of. How is that working out? Well, my first one is in two weeks, so I'll tell you. But uh, the reason that I, I came up with that number is in the past, we'd had five on Friday, five on Saturday. So it, on Friday night, we had all 10. And it was really perfect. There was an energy there, but yeah, everybody could hear each other and, and really share. And so what adding the seats on the day of the retreat does for me is it allows people to bring more staff members. Hmm. Um, Even and so better. It, it may not be that we, yeah. So it may not be that we've got 10 offices there. I'm sure that but we won't. It's more of, okay, we've still got five offices, but everybody brought their key person or we've got, you know, six offices and one brought three. And that's what I'm dealing with now. I've got somebody registered who actually an MD and two of their staff members come in and I'm a, working on their customization but that is uh, just a phenomenal scenario because then they're going to go home and I was hopefully able to inspire those staff members and it come directly from me and and then be able to feed off of each other and brainstorm together and be at ground zero together instead of putting all this weight on the doctor to go back and now make everybody else great Um, because you need that one person you can pour into and say all right this is you. I have chosen you and you have earned it. And now go and make me proud and make everyone else just as good as you. And that's when it, it just comes together so well. I like the idea of involving staff more. And you're right. That way, when the staffer is there with the doctor, the staffer hears the same information and gets fired up. And so the doctor and the staffer can play off each other and lean on each other for support once they're back in the day-to-day when it's really hard to affect change once you're in the whirlwind of your everyday practice. So I think that's fabulous to have the staffers there as well and and to be able to affect even more change once they try to get it going when they're back. Well, and Gretchen, the other thing that it's allowed me to do is to really encourage the vendors to, you know, either 
reward those offices that are great customers or um, really help get that one who has so much potential to the next level. So I've reached out to them and said, hey, guys, I've got more seats. Send your people. So if you've got a company that's a vendor partner with us and and you've got a good relationship, ask them, make them accountable. Say, hey, send me to Dry Eye Institute because I know I can do more and I want this to just really be the one of the, the hearts and, and pulls of the practice. Yep. You know what I find really funny? And actually, I have it up on the screen right now. Uh, whenever I, I you know, see, see you when you have a booth at meetings, the folders that you give people, um, you leave nothing to chance at these meetings. And what people come away with, you know, is not just sort of, a vague, what should I do? It really is like, this is how it should work. Mm -hmm. um, so you really remove a lot of the element of chance at the Institute and, and the folders I find hilarious because this thing must weigh like 30 pounds. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's heavy. <laughs> I have to no prepare slouch. them as far as how to pack. <laughs> Um, between, but it's, between that and they get this backpack with almost six thousand dollars worth of stuff, so that's the one uh, comment that I get is I didn't know I needed a, you know another suitcase. <laughs> right. <I> get <laughs> and that is a good problem to have. Yep. That's right. Yeah, I have I have some attendees and they'll say, you know, for the first six months I took it to work and from work every single day, <laughs> <laughs> and they just I still get notes from people who came two years ago. I mean, I had been doing this for 24 months in a row. So um, I still get notes from them saying, man, what a difference it's made. I had a guy uh, in South Carolina send me a text and he came, he came three months ago, but he said, Crystal, in the first month, we made $20,000 that we did not have before. Now he had some things in place. It was more about how do we engage with the patient? How do we explain it? How do we make this work logistically? So $20,000 in a month, and that's, that's the key, is you look at this and you say, all right, that's an investment. Is it, is it going to be worth it? But I've had people go back and go back to work that Saturday morning and say, oh, I paid for it today, without a doubt. Wow. So it's a matter of growing and just investing in yourself and your practice and being able to be more fulfilled in, in what you're doing. Um, and, and just go home excited about the difference that you've made. And, and that's why I'm passionate about it is because I know that, that you know, life gets, um, gets challenging and hard, but it can get mundane. And mm -hmm. this is just a way to, to not just help patients in a ripple effect, but to help doctors who they're, they're given their life to, to service for others. And, um, but that doesn't mean it's easy by any means. So, Crystal, if we jump back to your talk that you're going to be giving in about, oh, 10, 15 minutes, you're talking about dry eye in the real world. If you could give three pieces of advice to optometrists out there who are struggling with treating and managing dry eye patients or who want to get more involved, what would those three pieces of advice be? So if we're talking about it at a beginner level, the first thing I would say, without a doubt, is start screening everyone and really choose your screening method where it relays the right message to the patient. If it's, I mean, a survey is great, it's certainly better than nothing, but it gives them the impression that whatever you find or whatever you diagnose or ask them to do is based on their symptoms. And so one thing I really like to do is screen every single patient that walks through the door, but make it objective where it's about the findings, because we all know that the signs and the symptoms don't always correlate. And just because right. somebody's not hurting doesn't mean that they're not progressing. Right. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing I would say is uh, really don't try to take on everything yourself. And, and like I said earlier, be everything to everybody. Figure out what it is you're passionate about and then go in all the way. And if it's dry eye, um, there's, there's so much that you can learn and absorb and make this easier for yourself. So don't feel like you have to know all the answers and don't feel like you know, you've got to go 100 miles an hour from day one. Make sure that's what you love and then, and then use the resources that are already in existence because 
we're at this wonderful point with dry eye where it is exploding and there's so much attention to it. And you don't have to do this on your own. There's a ton of resources just like dry eye Institute where you can get what you want without right. as much pain <laughs> right. and, and strife. Yeah. And then really having that key person that you can make accountable and, and help you as far as getting the other staff members on board and patient education, um, and I, I even even right now, I mean, I've been staying up till two and three o'clock every night working on this patient education, but I'm doing it to make my life easier and to make the patient get more out of it and be more compliant because I don't want to look around for brochures. I don't want to dig around. I want to hand them something and say, all the answers are here. You don't have to remember everything I said. I just want you to be in the moment and and understand it and then take this home. Right. Um, I'm working on my creating templates for this EMR and it's for the same reason. So I can click a checkbox, make it easy on me, please. But on the other side of that checkbox is this word merge that's created that tells them all the instructions. Right. And same thing with the 5M and the, and the crystal tear report, just being able to walk them through that collage, show them their story, but then make it as easy as possible on the staff and, and our side. And things like, I'll, I'll tell you, Patient education is just key because it it helps them know your intent and helps them feel empowered and a part of the treatment decision and a part of the process. So it builds compliance, which is the key to all of this. But Adam, if you go back to that picture of <clears throat> the big sign in the in the lobby, I you'll see that I, I made this four by eight sign and I'm not happy with it. I'm going to remake it on sheet metal, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but that'll look the, cool on the, I want it look cool well this one was supposed to be clear and it showed up white I was like wait a minute <laughs> but on the left you'll see it, it's this two column list of everything that contributes to dry eye and it's talking about stress and lack of sleep and poor diet and anxiety and depression and all of this but it's also talking about the pathological causes and then in the middle, it's talking about, all right, we're going to we're gonna take this bull by the horns. We're going to do this differently. We're going to find out what's the underlying cause, and we're going to pair it with the treatment. And then on the right, it's just little snip, snippets um, and pictures of what these possible treatments are. And I want to set the stage on patient education when they walk in. And because it makes it easier on me, easier on the staff, easier on the patient. So that's another bit of advice. For the person who is already into dry eye, but wants to to go in deeper. Right. Well, cool. And I want to actually put up for everyone one more time the retreat dates, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I pulled up your website right yeah. here now so everyone can see it. So let's pull this up so everyone can see. So it looks like you got a couple dates in, in February and then in April, May, and in November. Yes. So February and May are in Wilmington. We're going to do them quarterly in Wilmington. April is St. Louis. November is Chicago. And then there may or may not be another Chicago date. Um, but it's, it's going to be fantastic. And we're exhibiting at SECO. We're booth number 601. And we're going to have a, just a lot of cool things going on there that will be very valuable. So definitely stop by. And we have a registration code for people who are interested. It's DEI. So you could register for the exhibit hall free at SECO with that code. Oh, cool. You just have to come by and see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And then another thing maybe to, to show is just click on that testimonials tab. I mean, the, it's, it's so fun to see what a difference this has made in, in doctors' lives and, and then secondarily in the patients they see. So. Cool. Yeah, there we go. Excellent. Crystal, thank you so much. I always enjoy talking with you and I always learn something new. And you have your class coming up in about five minutes talking about dry eye in the real world. That's in, in, in room four. So this is awesome. Thank you. We'll be talking soon. Thank you, guys. I'll see you at Pico. All right. Alrighty. See you there. Bye. Bye. All right. I love talking with Crystal. She's so passionate She's about what she does. Fun. and. Yep. It just shines through with everything that she does. Absolutely, yeah. It's all, always fun to talk to her. So she didn't bring up the best part of her booth, though. She's always got a little bit of something. A little drinky drink. Yeah, yes, yes, so. yes. Go, go see Crystal. And her booth is always. I love the way it's designed. Mm -hmm. It's, it's comfortable. 
It's stylish. You can sit down. It, it, it isn't well, it's a very, normal booth. It's very homey. It's kind of right. like it's kind of like that, that, right? Yeah, and she's got cool lights, and it's yeah. I feel like I'm sitting in somebody's very well designed living room, and yeah. you can sit and have a chat and a glass of wine and talk with Crystal. So yeah. I plan to do that. Yeah, it's always a great. You know, you're walking around the exhibit hall, you're dragging, and you're like, oh, thank God, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's her booth. Let's mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. sit here. <laughs> yeah. So check out Crystal's booth. And her talk will be starting in just a couple of minutes. Yep, so cool. So let me actually take a look here at what is going on talk-wise. So Crystal's talk, obviously. And what else is happening? Well, we've got the second half of OCT2. We also have new technology and sports vision training. And also off the menu, a nutritional approach to dry eye. Yes, with Melissa Barnett. And we will actually be speaking to Melissa very soon, right? Right, we'll so. be talking with her uh, in about an hour. Yep. So that should be amusing. Um, she's always got a lot to say. We actually saw saw her recently. Um, so she's not actually talking about specialty lenses for once. Or we're yeah. going to be talking to her about nutrition, which is cool. And we are going to be talking with Sue Resnick in just a few minutes. Yep. So Sue had her talk about uh, launching your specialty lens practice. Um, and... Uh, yeah, it should be interesting talking to her. We're going to actually talk to her about another project that we're undertaking um, very soon. So our top secret project, which secret no more. <laughs> <laughs> way, to, way to pimp that out, yeah. Adam. It's no longer secret <laughs> if you're mentioning it. Oh, boy. So we're coming up to noon Eastern time, and it's 9 a.m. here. And it kind of feels like noon here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> We've been at this a while. So Gretchen, you've been actually watching the chat. Has anybody said anything terrible or is, is no. everything falling apart or are we? I've heard very little. However, um, when we were talking earlier about visiting the Contact Lens Museum with mm -hmm. Pat Caroline, Michael Davis said he has a diploma from 1926. It isn't his, uh, but it's from the Philadelphia Optical College that he will send Pat Caroline. So just based on what we were saying and encouraging people to dig deep into their storage areas. Right now, um, the Contact Lens Museum will have another piece of history because of somebody listening who found something. So thank you, Michael, for being willing to send that. And anybody else, please take a look in the back of your closets, your basement, your garage, your attic, your storage areas. If there's anything that you've been hanging on to just because you cannot bear to throw it away, but you really don't have any use for it, Yep. contact Pat Caroline, and it, it may have a spot in the Contact Lens Museum to keep this history ongoing and letting other people see it. And even if you have products that were complete failures, those are probably even more interesting. Oh, absolutely. To send, to send on in, you know, because there are so many things that people have tried and it just, you know, sort of blew up in their face. But it, it would be great to actually have that, the artifacts. Right. If you have old vial lenses, even yep. old blister pack lenses, <laughs> if you have contact lens care products, anything, instrumentation, yeah. You know what I didn't see a lot of there? Like the original hybrid lenses, which I think that would be an interesting thing to have there. Um, I didn't see. Were there any? I don't even remember. I don't think so. I don't think there were. Yeah. So those would be interesting if any have survived. Um, yeah. So old trial lenses. I mean, I know that Adam is going to show the movie again a little bit later and you'll get to see some of the things. So it isn't only contact lens things. Um, but anything that is related, I mean, there are uh, collections of loose lenses, so there are some books. So anything that you have, um, just reach out to Pat or Craig Norman and let them decide whether they think it's something that would be valuable for other people to see. So don't just throw it in the trash. Even if you think it's, it's junk, pop them a message, take a few pictures, and you never know. It might be something that is worth saving for... Uh, for people to see in the future about the history of optometry. Yep, and by the way, the museum is a, actually a labor of love. They are a nonprofit organization. They're always looking for donations. Oh, and, right, not even and, just stuff, but cash. They yep. will take cash money yep. and welcome it. They need a bigger facility yep. because what they currently have is fabulous, but Pat even said when they started to set it up, they realized from the get-go that they were already yeah. going to outgrow it very, very quickly, so they will gladly accept. Yeah, I mean the donations. space—the space that you'll see in the video is jam-packed already, and that's not even you know the entire exhibit, right? They right. still have much more junk that's you know kept not junk treasures. 
a collection. Collection that's you carefully know, kept curated away. Um, over years. So yeah, so it's it's a challenge for them. They need more space for sure. Um, Absolutely. Um, <laughs> that was good. <laughs> ah. <laughs> oh boy. Excuse me, here, folks. <laughs> I love this. Well, we're going to be talking. We're going to be talking to Sue Resnick in a second. Uh, let me just. Uh... <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, he did send us a message here, so. Why don't you send him a message back and just say, "Hey." <laughs> Hold on a second. Do you want to add that here? <laughs> Excuse me, folks. We're having a little technical difficulties. We need to make sure that we have one of our speakers logged in. Okay, excellent. We got you covered. Okay, so. So we are going to be talking to Sue, and we need to get her on her cell. Okay, yep, let me find her. Okay, so Sue, where are you? So how come when your phone rings, we hear it through, does it run through your computer? It runs everywhere. Oh, okay. So yeah. Because I'm not just hearing watch, it here, the whole but thing, I'm hearing it's, it's like an, It's like an air raid siren going off in my head. Whoop, whoop, yeah. whoop. Okay, so Sue. Well, this is funny. I guess people somewhere know how old I am now because I just got an email from Silver Singles Online Dating <laughs> telling me that love gets better with age. <laughs> Delete. Junk. <laughs> Unsubscribe. I don't, I don't even subscribe to these things. This stuff is, just shows up. It is so funny. All right, so let me get Sue going here. All right. I like that little song. It's very cute. Hi, good morning, guys. Hey, how's it good going, morning, Sue? Sue? How's everybody? We need more coffee, I think. We do. We need to <laughs> do Uber good. Eats coffee delivery. <laughs> I have it. I actually, I actually have an idea. Yeah. Um. I think I think you guys should just stay there and host the Oscars tonight. <laughs> that would I, be pathetic because I haven't seen most of the sh movies that are out. I've seen uh, 1917, and that is about well, I, it. I got news for you. Most of the people who actually submit their votes haven't seen the movies either. So, oh, I think it's just a popularity well, contest. I, I've seen most of them, so I could give you all the uh, background information. But anyway, there we go. We'll see. We'll have our our headphones in, and you could be coaching us. <laughs> Excellent. I think exactly. we'd be sad. We, we get low ratings and yeah. boot it off. Yeah. But thank you for the vote of confidence. <laughs> well, it's hostless. It's, it's hostless from what I hear, so I figured, you know, what the heck. That's right. We could collect a fat paycheck. And we could do it. I'd take it. It's up, <laughs> better than this. It's up for grabs. Um, so meanwhile, Sue, you just completed a lecture, yeah. I believe. Yeah. How did it go? I did. I, I stayed awake. I'm not sure uh, if anybody else was. But no, no, no. I think there were a couple of people there. I got a couple of questions. So it was nice. Yeah. Questions are always good. Excellent. Excellent. You know what, Sue? I, I have been talking about my failure to predict markets. Um, because I crash and burn, dude. My because my feeling was like 30 years ago, if you told me that specialty lenses would still be a thing now, I, I would be very surprised, right? Like we were just all out at GSLS. And I was just amazed by how vibrant the meeting was. Um, and I would yeah. never, I would never have predicted that, say, 30 years ago. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, nobody really knew. Uh, but you know, when you think about it, all right. So I've been doing this since 1980 ish, ish. And um, <laughs> <laughs> and every couple of years, uh, you know, I mean, the growth in this industry has really, when you think about it, you know, been phenomenal, just in terms of materials and and everything and then you know and then when lisa came around everybody was predicting the demise of contact lenses. oh my god the sky is falling you know how it was you know it was going to be 
it just, you know, it's all going to go downhill from there. Um, but really, this it's getting more exciting now than ever. I, I actually find I, my, it's harder to keep up than when I first, you know, came out of school. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's hard to it's hard to teach myself new things now. <laughs> but, um, well, the technology it's, has it's changed what, so dramatically. It's, 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 yeah. yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah, the diagnostic technology is really what's um, it's actually keeping up with the. Uh, product technology so the integration now of the two i think is what is um you know is most exciting yeah it's funny and i just i just yeah, yeah. i mean because you know when gretchen gretchen and i saw how they made scleral lenses in the past right we went out to the contact lens museum on thursday and we saw that they use flames and asbestos oh and, my god <laughs> and you know hammers and stuff i mean this was crazy it was insane um, but then you you look at stuff now like the pentacam and sending things off to computers and then you press a button and then wave sends you a contact lens three days later i mean it's just amazing how it's right. changed just wait till we have the uh with 3D printers and patients will be like sticking their eyeballs and like a little <laughs> scanner thing and they'll be producing their own lenses in right. a couple of years at home and it'll be, it'll be nice. Yeah. That'll be crazy. Yeah, that, that, that's, <laughs> it's just amazing. So, you know, from, from your lecture this morning though, how, you know, you're talking about how people can get into doing specialty lenses. I think that for some people, there might be a little bit of a fear factor, right? Like mm-hmm. how do I even get started doing this? Yeah, well, that's why I try to keep the talk really. Uh, I don't. I don't like to use the word cookbook, but that's what I try to do: is give them the three steps to, you know, how just get yourself mentally prepared, mm-hmm. and then just take it take it one step at a time. And you know, you don't have to start off treating Steven Johnson syndrome patients. As a matter of fact, uh, nobody wants to treat. You know, that's <laughs> tough. You're not going to start there, but. Just think about within the context of your primary care practice, everyday practice, you know, become proficient in presbyopia, soft lens multifocals. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think about specialty lenses, it's not about how complex the the cornea might be per se, but it's about are you fulfilling a specialty niche? Are you taking a population of patients that you really become excited about, proficient about? Um, embrace the technologies that are coming and you may choose to just treat presbyopes you may choose to just manage children with spherical daily soft lenses and do myopia management so that's the beauty of this you can be as selective as you want you can practice at any level as you as you want you know start off slow build um, but don't you know if you take little bites it's really not as daunting a task as you know jumping right into fitting custom molded scleral lenses. Um, right, so, right. You know, that's the way I, w- I would approach it. Just think about what you want to do, but more or less do like a little bit of a survey of your practice demographic. Who's mm-hmm. coming to see you? You know, before you start to attract patients outside of your database, make sure you're really getting the low ha- uh, hanging fruit. You know, are all of you, are you discussing contact lenses as an option with all of your primary care patients? Mm-hmm. And I think all of us are guilty of the answer being no. I mean, on a daily basis, I'm seeing just as many primary care patients as I am contact lens patients. And at the end of the day, I go to myself, oh, shoot, why didn't I mention to Mr. Smith, who's a golfer on the weekend, that he could be wearing soft lenses and wearing regular sunglasses versus trying to play golf and read the greens you know, his cockamamie progressive, you know, mm-hmm. so, you know, I, I too am guilty of sometimes being too busy to make money. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you know, you, really, you, you, you understand what that means is that you can get caught up in, you know, look, we're, we're responsible for diagnosing disease and treating infections. And, you know, you get caught up in that, but at the same time, you want to always keep in the back of your mind, what value added services can I provide? And that's what it's all about. Yep. Yeah. And in fact, it's funny, you know, we saw the survey from ABB that it's something like ridiculous, like only 18% of clinicians fit like 80% of the multifocal lenses. And when you see that, and this is just talking about, you know, off the shelf soft lenses. And when you see something like that, you really have to wonder the opportunities that, that people are missing, right? It's huge. There's a big market out there that people aren't even addressing. We leave so much on the table, um, and that's, that's not in contact lenses. Um, 
we, in my practice over the last couple of years, and I think in most practices, particularly contact lens and anterior segment practices, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. I'm like, when did dry eye become a thing? <laughs> you know, at the same, just like last night I was eating a salad and I went, when did avocados become a thing? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's like the same thing. All of a sudden you look down and you go, wow, you know, this is like something I didn't do a couple of years ago. I didn't eat avocados and I didn't, uh, you know, treat dry eye. <laughs> but now um, dry eye has become, in my mind, like a primary care procedure, much like you would check IOP. You know, I'm taking, doing my bony and gland imaging on just about every patient and giving out a questionnaire, and I've introduced some, what I consider very easily um, incorporated, um, my, my, you know, my bony and gland treatments that I consider basically primary care procedures now, and that almost like everybody should be having. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, you know, it's contact lenses, but it's all these other things that we can be doing or should be doing um, that, be, you know, become much more mainstream and are not just, you know, niche procedures and niche products anymore. So um, the problem is, is that there's so much out there. You really have to decide, well, you know, it's not what you want to do. I think we all want to do it all, but the problem is implementation. Mm -hmm. First, you've got to clear your head and figure out, okay, you know, how big is the device? Where am I going to put it? Uh, and then it's like, okay, I have to get my staff on board. And then it's, okay, how do I work it into my flow of patients? And that's where the hurdle is for most practitioners, myself included. Every time something new comes along, you know, I say to myself, oh, my God, I got to teach, you know, I got to teach this to my team and right. I got to get my associates on board. And first I got to get myself on board. So, you know, it's it's work in that sense. But, you know, once you do it, the, the you know, the, as, as Adam was saying, the opportunity is there. And if you don't do it, you know, you just, you're just giving up stuff that a could be so beneficial to the patient, right. but B can so impact your bottom line. Yep. Can we go back to um, a minute to, you said to take a look at your patient base to decide where to get started. And I, I'm pretty sure I know what you mean, but I'd rather ask you. So for example, if you have a, younger patient base, then perhaps you don't want to dive deep into multifocals. Or if you have a lot of kids in your practice, then you might want to look at myopia control. Is, is that what you mean by taking a look at your patient base? Or are you suggesting actually asking patients what they're interested in? Well, um, I think it's both. Um, so for instance, um, and, and you guys know that um, in, in a few weeks, um, I and Dr. Viola Konevsky, who is another practitioner with me in Manhattan, she happens to be on the west side and I on the east side, each of us has a specialty contact lens practice. Hers is primarily pediatrics, mm -hmm. um, and she is phenomenal at that and, 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 and is great. And, and, and that's basically how, you know, she had a love of pediatrics, of children, um, obviously, um, it became obvious, and so she has a lot of the pediatric ophthalmologists referring her and to her. And while my practice has, uh, you know, has been around for you know years and years more than hers, um, and ours is known for um, contact lens specialty in general, we do not have as much of a pediatric focus as she does. So it has to do with, I think, where your interests lie, what you're naturally going to attract, um, but you can choose to attract or you can just pick up on your natural you know, patient base. Mm -hmm. Our patient base, based upon our location, um, we have just, I would almost think a bell curve in terms of our demographic. Um, the majority of my patients are between 35 and 65. Mm -hmm. um, I do see, you know, I do see some peds. I do see a lot of older patients, but the vast majority of my patients are, you know, patients who are probably early to mid presbyopes. And part of that is your practice grows with you. So, you know, when I first started out, they were all young, <laughs> um, but now they're my age and older. So, yeah, I mean, you can choose to, I mean, you can be a six year old practitioner and choose to just see kids, you know, and that's fine. Um, but again, if you have a demographic where you have a bell curve, you know, I think you want to, 
uh, try to serve the patients in that bell curve in addition, perhaps, to having a sub-subspecialty. So you, you can do both. I like it. I like it. So you're also suggesting that practitioners follow their natural inclination as well as what's really sitting right in front of them. And that's good because some of these specialties require a bit of time and effort in terms of diving deep, getting up to speed on the latest studies, looking into uh, what products are available, do you need additional technology, and if, so for example, if somebody is not feeling the passion for low vision, then you don't want to start a low vision clinic. Or if somebody doesn't really like dealing with kids, then a specialty pediatric contact lens practice is not gonna be your bag. Right. So I like that, looking for your own interests exactly. as well as what's within your practice already. Right. Yep. But Gretchen, you just like segued into the best, best topic. I'm so passionate about um, our younger um, colleagues coming into the profession and those of us who have practices and are looking for young associates and exit strategies. What a great opportunity. Let's say, for instance, that I hate kids, which I don't. But, <laughs> I, can find an, but I can find an associate who loves kids. What a great way to bring in a, an associate to build another, you know, branch to the practice. So right. if you have somebody, if you don't have sports vision in your practice and you can find a residency trained or, you know, somebody who's had great rotations in that area and is passionate about it and wants to come into your neighborhood, um, you know, I'm just encouraging people to bring in young associates and let them grow what they're interested in. And hopefully it'll be a little different from what you're interested in. So, um, you know, it's a way to build the practice and branch it out. So just because you may not like something. So, for instance, um, we have one of our associates who is, you know, much better versed in low vision than I and, and our other partners. And if I have a patient who's sent in for medically necessary lenses, but also by virtue of their particular corneal condition is a low vision patient, you know, I'll do the contact lens fitting and he'll then take on from there with the magnifiers and the telescope. So, you know, we don't have to refer out for that per se. Um, I remember when I first joined the practice, and for those of you who don't know, it was Adam's dad, uh, Paul Farkas, who founded my practice. And um, Paul decided to bring in a young um, associate at that time who was very interested in sports vision. Um, so each of us, um, you know, was quote unquote charged in quotes with bringing in something different um, uh, as, we ca as we came into the practice. Um, I was, uh, having been a SUNY grad, uh, did have pretty good background in binocular vision. And while I became a contact lens specialist and still am, I still do very comprehensive binocular vision evaluations. Even though I don't treat or perform vision therapy, I can make very, very educated referrals to our local colleagues who can then take the patient from there. So, you know, that's just a little bit of advice to the grads coming out. When you come to interview with us old folks, you know, tell us, ask not what you can, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. <laughs> that's a really good point, because I think many doctors in looking for associates are looking for someone who is just like them. And that can work in many ways, because you're very similar, right. but that also doesn't grow the practice in any way. And you want somebody who's got strengths that aren't yours to bring a different dimension to the practice. And I think that's really, really good advice. Yep. Yep. Good. Yep. And so I, I see we have to talk about, you know, the thing that we have coming up. You, okay. you briefly mentioned it. So now I get, we get to go in promotional mode here. Pimp it so. out, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so for everyone who, who doesn't know, I guess because it's been a great secret, um, we, so Sue, so you mentioned we're working together with Viola on a, a, a new webinar talking about um, trying to separate your practice from managed care, right, running independently from it. So do you want to give everyone a little sneak preview? And, uh, you know, the, the registration for this is going to be coming out uh, this week, um, and then this is going to be sometime in March. But do you want to tell everyone what they can expect if they sign up for, for this show? Sure. So it all started like this. Because I'm an insomniac, I pop up uh, at least three times a night. And 
one night I popped up and I said to myself, gee, I had just gotten off one of the, uh, you know, uh, professional group pages and there were threads upon threads of discontent with managed care and, you know, Warby Parker and VSP and it was going on and on. And I just like, I just thought it was three in the morning and I thought to myself, damn, let's get the conversation started. I, I just, it bothers me that my, there's such an undercurrent of discontent in the profession and there needn't be. So I thought let's, I, you know, my practice um, having being um, private pay cash practice, I thought I can't be the only one. I mean, yeah, we're special, but you know, we're not the only ones. There's got to be other practices out there that go take managed care. And certainly there's a lot of practices that don't want to take managed care or at least want to have some separation. So I sit down and I type out a six page outline, which I gave to uh, Adam. And I thought, okay, I'm going to come up with a COPE approved course and we're going to teach everybody how to do this. And then I realized, yeah, it doesn't have to be COPE. Let's keep it friendly. Let's keep it conversational. And we entitled it Dare to be Different, Achieve Independence from Managed Care. And then I thought to myself, okay, I don't want to do this by myself. Who can I bring on board? Well, I thought none other than Dr. Viola Kineski, who is across town. And what's great is that she started off with managed care and dumped it. And my practice, having never taken it and then taken one plan for a year or two and then dumped that, I thought we had a good synergy in terms of very, you know, different, we had enough similarities and enough differences to make it interesting. Mm -hmm. So the goal is we're going to chat for, um, she and I are going to each present um, different segments, like half hour segments um, on how to go about doing this. And again, there is no right or wrong. It's just the way we did it. And there's no recipe or formula, but it's just to give people ideas and to start the conversation. And we're not going to be suggesting that people go out and dump every plan. Um, they can, but that might not be the wisest thing to do. Mm -hmm. But we certainly want to present it to, um, to doctors who may be starting out cold and give them the idea that they can start out and perhaps not go on plans or perhaps take some. But we want to pretty much give some ideas about how you would go about doing it. What are the things to look out for? Um, what are some of the tools to use to make it successful? And to be sure that we do this so that people are asking questions during the course of the webinar and, you know, answer as many questions as we can. Certainly there's going to be some controversy. We're looking for that. Um, <laughs> yep. and we're looking for input from other practitioners that have done it. As a matter of fact, since this came up on Facebook, um, there's been a n more doctors than I knew existed that do not take plans or have dumped plans. So I'm actually hoping some of the experienced practices like ours come in and help us discuss it. I think we can all lift up the morale, and I think we can all, um, you know, just sort of get a better um, attitude going towards how we deal with managed care. And additionally, <clears throat> excuse me, talking about disruptors, because that becomes a factor as well. Uh, it's not just about managed care, but it's about other influencers in the field and how do you stay on top of it. Yep. Wow, what and, a sell. And that so sounds this, incredible, and this, Sue. And Sue, we're going to make this into a safe space as well. So I don't want anyone to think that this is just going to be like an internet free-for-all. You have to register for this thing. It's going to be closed off. People are going to be able to talk amongst themselves, and it's going to be a space for friends where we can all talk this stuff out. So I think it's going to be really cool. And I think it was smart to right. avoid COPE approval for this because oh, yeah. <laughs> it would be really hard to make yeah. a talk like this fair and balanced yep. just by virtue right. of, of what you're discussing. There's just no way. And I think it wouldn't be as effective if it was a COPE approved course for CE. Yep. Yeah. And, and so that, um, you know, and, and I'm going to mention, Gretchen, that um, one of the reasons I did it is because I am going to be, you know, look, everybody's got their favorite vendors, their favorite products, and I'm not going to be shy about just speaking about the ones that I use. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say that there aren't a gazillion vendors in each of these areas, but, you know, the thing is, you know, when I do speaking, and I'm sure it's true for a lot of my colleagues, you know, you're cornered in the hall, and the question is, okay, who do you use for this and who do you use for that? So, you know, the vendors that I use and Viola uses, they're well vetted. They've served us well. Um, they're going to be just examples of right. 
um, vendors that we use, but ones that work really well and really do side with um, with private practice. Um, we, my partner Jordan Castro has a phrase he calls it "profit protected product." <laughs> the three Ps. It's an alliteration, but we're you know part of it is looking at that, looking at profit protected procedures. Because let's say a practitioner comes onto this webinar who is just interested in hearing the spiel, mm -hmm. but really doesn't, that, but really they, they can't come off managed care. And that, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. There are areas in this country where you must be on it. You're serving large populations of maybe less, um, you know, well-heeled populations. You're dealing with commercial industries that employ large groups of individuals and they're all on plans and that's great but you can add value added services so you can add private pay procedures and not just sell you know the pair of glasses the patient is entitled to right but you can manage and treat other things which may be out of out of pocket for them you can price it affordably you can do volume but at the same time you want to know what those procedures and profit centers are so the goal is to just give some suggestions in all areas, um, contact lenses, dry eye, um, spectacle lens technologies. And I don't profess to being an expert in that. I'm just going to share what we do with our, in our practice. And every year, we try to come up with one or two what we call profit centers, not just about the money, but just to keep yourself from getting bored to death. <laughs> um, Agreed. You know, Which is better, one or two? Yeah, you're there all day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, you know, that's the goal is to, is to make it fun, make it friendly, but at the same time, so people come away and come away with at least one or two pearls. Yep. And I I'm, like it. And I'm hoping that it's going to be very practical and that people who attend this really are serious about it, you know, and they really want to try to, to do something. Because, you know, we do a lot of webinars at ODWire and we get big crowds to show up. And I'm sure some people just casually show up and they're like, yeah, whatever. I'm, I got the night off. I'm just going to sit here and listen. Right. But I really hope that people who attend this one take a lot of the messages that we're going to give them to heart. Uh, because these ideas do work. You obviously have implemented them, you and Viola. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's really important to share in this sort of more um, intimate space. I think it's going to be great. Yeah. Are there sponsors? Yes, here? we will have sponsors. And when the page goes up, and again, Sue, I, I apologize that everything's not up yet. It's not that I'm being lazy. It's that, uh, yeah, so you've heard, you've heard all of our stuff about the plagues that we've had here in the home. But, well, this has kept you a little and busy. This, this, see why it's kept me a little busy. But what we're going to do when the page goes up, you'll see the sponsors as well. Uh, so we will have a few sponsors. Um, and, you know, as Sue mentioned, she works with certain companies and uses certain products. Mm -hmm. And so obviously in her talk, we're going to be talking about those as well. So, you know, again, this is not COPE approved. <laughs> it doesn't come within a mile of COPE, but it's here to give you really practical advice and show you in the real world what people are actually doing. Well, I look forward to it. And I'm so glad that you gave us a sneak peek, Sue. This is going to be great. Yeah, it should be fun. And if it's not, you know what? I'll just uh, go off into the sunset. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for talking with us this morning. This has been fabulous. And we will see you soon at SECO. Great. All right. So you're doing a great job, guys. And I love this uh, CE wire. And um, have a drink on me. All right. You betcha. Right thanks. after we're finished this afternoon. <laughs> you better believe it. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, Sue. <laughs> All right, take care. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, yes. So this is going to be a really fun event. And we, I've been holding off actually talking about it until CE Wire was done. Um, but for those folks who are listening to this, this is going to happen. It's going to be uh, in mid-March, and you'll get the dates. Obviously, I'll be sending an e-blast to everyone, showing people when it is. So Very cool. We got a sneak peek. Yep. So we are halfway through our noon hour on the East Coast, that is, mm -hmm. uh, 9.30 here. So we are halfway through pain man. oops, sorry. Um, we are halfway through OCT2, uh, new technology and sports vision training, nutritional approach to dry eye and dry eye in the real world. And then coming up in about 30 minutes, we've got pain management with great power comes great responsibility. Carotid stenosis, what the OD needs to know and contemporary keratoconus management, and then the start of a two-hour class on ocular nutrition and wellness, fact or fiction. That sounds pretty interesting. Yep. 
Great. So yeah, a bunch of stuff coming up. And as you can see, looking on the schedule right now, it is chock a block with classes. There are no sort of empty slots here. So, you know, last day here, we're really, really loading it up. So hopefully everyone's having a good time. And hopefully, you know, I haven't looked too much at the chat windows and seeing what's going on. Nothing really um, cooking. Um, so yeah, there was a, a question about volume in one of the classes and it may have been recorded a little lower just because the speaker is a bit soft spoken, but we, Kat was able to work her magic on the back end oh, and good. bump it up a little bit. So um, all is good and we'll take it and I'm going to knock wood for no tech problems. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we've had remarkably few tech problems this time around, which has been great. I guess you do this long enough. We'll take um, it. We'll, we'll take, take it. it. So yeah. Well, cool. So what time is it now? It's about 12.30 Eastern, 9.30 Pacific, and we have a call coming yes, up with we do. Uh, iCare Pro. With iCare Pro. It's we at iCare Pro. So this will be great. Um, so as you know, we've been talking about iCare Pro, uh, you know, talking about what they've been up to and, uh, yeah, and talking about how they can help your practice. And we right, put up the pretty right. pictures of the, uh, the office. Let me actually, I can get one of those up as well. Absolutely. To show yeah. people what it is that they do. So let me... See if I can find that again. That's Crystal's office, which is also pretty, but let's get rid of that here. So let's see. Yeah, so that was this is a very modern looking office that you had up before. Yeah, so let's see if I can get it back up again. Of course, my, my desktop now is just an absolute mess of tabs and. Uh, well, you have a lot to keep track of here. I do. So there we go. There, there it is. is. So that's a really. Does it say where that is? Uh, McKinney, Texas. That's snazzy looking. I really like that. Yep. So this is just an example of what iCare Pro has done. Um, so we're going to give them a call, and I'll do that right now, and uh, we can give them a shout out and see. Excellent. So, so, all right. Let me get this going here. And. I will get to this number. See, now if I was a little more motivated and a better self-starter, I would have had these pre-programmed in, or if I had a producer. See, my son is almost old enough. I should conscript him into duty and make him produce these things. Okay. Please state your name after the tone, and Google Voice will try to connect you. <laughs> Adam Farkas. Hello, this is V. Hey, V. It's Adam Farkas. How you doing? Great, how are you? I'm doing well. So uh, we are uh, on our second day here at CEWire, so we're all hanging in. <laughs> Fantastic. How's that going? Oh, it's going really well. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. The classes have been great. And uh, yeah, we've been, we've been talking a lot about you guys over the past, past two days. Oh yeah, good things, I hope. Oh yes, absolutely. In fact, I have up on the screen right now for everyone to see a picture of one of the offices that, that you took photos of. Um, because this has been the big topic of conversation over the past day, uh, the fact that you guys will actually come out on site and take photos. Yeah, that's a special for, um, for this virtual conference. Yep. Um, that that's included with any sign-on. Yeah, so pretty neat stuff. You know, I was, I was talking to people about sort of first impressions on the Internet and how they're everything. And, <laughs> you know, if you look somebody up on Google Maps now and you mouse over and you see something, you know, you want what people are seeing to actually be good. Um, so this is definitely a valuable service that you guys are providing. Absolutely. So we're, we're all about, you know, a strong online presence uh, in a way that results in new patient appointments. And so to do that, um, you know, just having a, a website is certainly not enough anymore. You need to have some basic SEO going on. Make sure that, you know, you've got the content. Make sure that you're showing up the kinds of patient searches that you need to and that you want to be showing up for. Um, but then once you're there, you still need to improve um, you need to be above, you know, the rest with your Google reviews. You have to leave that impression. And once they've been to your site, having a, a really branded, developed sense of who you are, um, both in social media as well as your website, is really going to help keep you in people's minds. Um, so that's why, you know, this is a, a fun promotion for us because it only helps us do our job with our clients better 
um, that they have, you know, lots and lots of, of imagery to give us. You know, we don't we don't love stock imagery. We we use it when we have to. Right. You know, it's it's funny over time. You know, you think about when things started in the '90s, mostly online. You know, building a website was something that people could kind of do on their own, kind of sorta. It still wasn't. You know, a lot of times the result wasn't great. But the way things have evolved, not only with having a web presence, but also having to keep up with social media, it's gotten to the place where, for most doctors, it really is not worthwhile to try to do this stuff on their own. Yeah, um, and that's that's definitely what we find, and we're we're very happy to share as much expertise to any practice uh, or interested person who wants it, you know, for free. These aren't industry secrets. Um, we do happen to be extremely skilled with, you know, optometry keywords, and that takes experience, and that's quite, that can be quite technical. But none of this is beyond the ability uh, of an OD to master. The question is time. We want our practices to have more time to help more patients and to focus on that, and we'll take care of that end for you, working in collaboration with any practice, uh, with one of our marketing packages in order to really scale up and grow in a in a reliable, sustainable way. Um, and uh, it's that reason that we don't really use contracts. We feel like we should be be able to deliver that value, you know, in a transparent, you know, reported way uh, on an ongoing basis or else, you know, that's what's going to keep you with us. Right. Um, but when we really stand by that, that's quite crucial to us. Yeah. And, you know, one interesting thing, too, is that you have um, you have so many practices that you work with, right? Hundreds and hundreds of practices. So you know kind of what works and what doesn't in the market. So whereas a doctor might engage in some trial and error to try to figure it out, you guys are already there. And I think that's probably a big part of the value that you bring, right? There's just less uncertainty. You know what works and what consumers want to see. A hundred percent. And uh, I would go even a step further because we, we've been working in this game, optometry only marketing for uh, over 15 years now. Um, we have over 1,800 clients. And, um, you know, one of the, one of the basic um, uh, things that we've developed with, you know, having a marketing consultant speaking to our marketing clients on a monthly basis is that your every practice is able to draw on the experience um, of all these marketing managers with other practices, what practices have done really well that's worked, what's not worked. Uh, you know, it's uh, a decade and a half of experience is not too shabby, um, and it's still, but we're still 100% on the cutting edge as industry leaders in terms of what is the state of the technology in the online world to get those appointments in. Yep. It's funny, actually, when I was in business school, we would always ask, you know, we'd work with Fortune 500 companies and they'd bring in consultants from outside from McKinsey. And we'd always ask, like, you know, we're pretty smart here internally. Why are you bringing in consultants? And the answer is we're not bringing them in just for who they are, but it's who they also work with. Right. Because they see the entire market. So they know what's going on outside. And so when you get somebody in from outside who's working with all the other companies in the industry, they can immediately lead you to a correct solution. And I think that's what's going on here as well. Right, because as, as an individual doctor, you don't know what you don't know. Um, but with you guys, with literally thousands of clients, you understand the breadth of the eye care market and how to market to patients. So, um, absolutely, I can I can see where it's critical for a lot of doctors. And particularly, you know, I'm looking at your products right now. We have it up on the screen. You have a, a wide variety of different uh, products that people can implement. As I'm looking at OD Site and OD Essentials and so forth. Yeah. Um, well, we really. Um we really try to make sure that we have something powerful to offer any kind of practice, um, recognizing that some practices, you know, are brand new. They don't have a lot of funds. You know, we do have that OD Essentials, formerly OD Life, that is really about putting butts and seats in a hyper local area, making sure you're showing up well and have good Google reviews for searches like iDoctor, iExam, iClinic. Um, but with our work in the industry, with uh, all sorts of both vendors and medical specialty groups, which we've been quite involved in from the outset of the development of those um, changes in the industry. You know, we're also equally able to provide, you know, programs that are really, really focused on things like vision therapy and scleral lenses, um, neurooptometric rehabilitation, dry eye, um, and not in a way where it's a little bit of content that, oh, we can help you with dry eye, but, you know, real breadth so that you can reach those new patients based on our experience you know, in the ins and outs of these uh, optometric specialties. So, you know, you're not having to explain what you're doing in a, in a vision therapy consult. Uh, you know, your marketer knows exactly what CT is all about and is already helping you get new patients. 
Right. Um, so, so basically, and likewise with the with the brands and and uh, vendors and all that as well on the optical side of things. Right. So basically, then if I if I run a practice, I can just come to you and say, by the way, you know, in our practice, we do vision therapy, we do scleral lenses. It's basically run down what it is that you do, and you guys can craft a program pretty quickly because you understand exactly what it is that they're talking about. Absolutely, and we won't always recommend people take you know a more um, let's say rigorous. Um, advanced program to start if they need to, you know, they want to build a little bit of experience with us, learn who we are, learn, you know, build a bit of trust. You know, we're happy to see people start out at an entry level um, unless we really feel that it will not deliver what they're looking for. And then we'll talk about, you know, we'll talk about that. But a lot of practices need guidance even where to just start. You know, this is the practice I have. This is the practice I want to have. How do I get there? Right. Great. So what did you recommend if people want to get started with you? How, how should they begin? Now, obviously, you can go to your booth and take advantage of the special and get the, the pictures and stuff. But what, how, does, how does it get started when they contact you? Do you sort of guide people through your different product matrix and, and try to fit the right one for them? That's exactly what happens. You'll get a, you know, you will confirm a sales time uh, call with you and uh, really go over the ins and outs of, of you know, what is, what's the situation in your practice? Is it more general care? Um, are you wanting a very distinctive optical brand? Are you sort of high-end optical? Are you needing a lot of customization? Um, are you fairly, you know, running the, on the mill? Are you really trying to expand a little bit of the vision therapy on the side? Are you wanting more referrals for, for neurooptometry? Whatever um, is in the mix, you know, that's how we'll figure it out. And, you know, our marketing manager team who, does, who do the consultation with our practices, um, that's divided amongst people who specialize in different core areas of the industry. So, you know, we're always making sure that, you know, as you're onboarding with us, that you're, you're paired with someone in a collaborative way who's going to be working with you on that exact level you're looking for. And if you're not sure, we, we have that conversation too. Right. And I guess one question I had was about the metrics. So once uh, folks are on board with you, how do you actually provide them data to let them know how things are going? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, all our marketing clients um, get a monthly report um, that shows traffic trends um, that will show um, your search rankings for given search terms that we're targeting in your area, how well you're doing on those lists, how many new patients came by filling out a new patient appointment form on the website, how many calls that you got in using various call tracking numbers. Um, for us, data is everything. Um, we are solidly digital marketers, so data is, is basically the L and end all. And for us, the final metric of results, we're not happy with simply visits or impressions. It's got to be new patient appointments, butts in seats, whether that's for a refractive exam or whether that's for, you know, um, a neurooptometry assessment or whether that's for fitting a low vision device. Um, that's the main metric of what's working and what's not. Right. And I'm looking here also at your, your other interesting products like Get Set Pro. Um, so you guys have, have really branched out. I, I remember when you, knew you first got started. I've been doing this for a long time, too. And it's kind of amazing the breadth of, of services that you're offering now. Yeah, so um, we're definitely no longer, you know, when we first started, we were basically an optometry website company. And over the years, you know, as optometry has changed, so have we. And we're now much more, and we certainly have website-only clients, um, very many of them. Um, but our message, we can't but help them tell them that, you know, having just a website is not that advantageous anymore unless you're doing something with it. Um, so with lots of packages, they're really about your online presence versus just having a website. Um, and we're also developing technologies to aid um, in that pursuit for individual practices, something that would be interested, interesting as well to vendors, something that is, um, but primarily, you know, for our end practice, we started developing technologies to help the market better and make changes to the website faster. So um, review generation, you know, soliciting patients for a Google review when they're in-house, um, that app, you know, Get Set Pro that has, you know, Get Set Review as a subset of that and there you just send a live link to patients while they're in your place, you know, with a, with a link to uh, a live text, sorry, with a link to, uh, to follow and leave a review on Google and our practices who use that diligently right. um, build up dozens and dozens of five-star reviews from the patients they're seeing, you know, to, uh, to really stand out. And that's actually something we didn't even touch on at all. The idea these days that the reviews, both in Google and on Yelp, are absolutely critical. And being able to manage that process, people, you know, they're so upset about it all the time and looking at it. But, you know, getting help on actually getting more reviews and getting good reviews, I think, is incredibly useful and something, again, that a lot of people just do by trial and error. 100%. And it's something, you know, we didn't feel there was something out there enough. And we were, you know, um, 
constantly telling our practices, look, we've got to work on Google reviews. Um, you know, patient communication tools like Demand for Solution Reach, you know, offer typically a way to do that, but only after people have filled out an internal revenue. And we found that frustrating as a company because those you know, internal reviews don't really help anyone who is not familiar with your practice to know that you're the person to choose. Right. But Google reviews show up top and center on, you know, if you make that three pack in the map at the top of the page, um, people immediately know how many Google reviews you've got and what your rating is. Um, and that is compelling. Um, there's a real difference in traffic patterns based on your reviews, undeniably. So it's not just about people's perception of you. Um, it, you know, it changes the number of people wanting to choose you as a doctor. I mean, it, it really is money on the table and not being engaged with your Google reviews is, is a is a serious lack in the digital marketing uh, outlook, but it, it can be time consuming. And, and the coaching and the, the how to just get staff involved in that process is so overwhelming for practices that that's become a major part of, of what your marketing manager with us is doing with you, yep. you know, is training your staff and making sure those reviews are coming in. I mean, it's so critical. In fact, I know a lot of people right now, if like on Yelp or Google reviews, if you have less than four stars, people will dismiss you just out of hand. They won't even look. Absolutely. Um, and so, yep. you know, it's, it's like a first step. You really absolutely must make sure that you're, that those reviews are as good as they possibly can be. Absolutely. And it's, it's an ongoing thing. You can't be complacent, even if you have a lot of good reviews. People look to freshness. Um, people will look at the most recent ones. You know, you've, you've got to have movement on there. Um, and Google sees movement on your Google My Business. Um, you know, when you're getting those things in and you're responding to them, it sees it as a further sign of reliability. So there's an SEO component to your reviews as well. Hmm. Yeah. So I think the takeaway from all this is that this is rather complicated. And, you know, doctors probably don't have the time that they need to put into it. You obviously can learn all of this stuff, but my gosh, the time investment is huge. So I think that's why working with companies like yours is probably useful for, for most docs. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, to have someone in-house do this, you know, that's a full-time salary, um, and we're quite a bit more uh, cost-effective than that. Yep, absolutely. Great. Okay, so to get started with you guys, I guess obviously they can go visit your booth today um, and check out everything that you have, but also on your website, we're up there right now, I can see there's a little get started button right here. And so is that just the best way to go? That is the best way to go. If you mentioned on the, you know, on the call that you uh, were at the CE Wire, you know, convention and uh, um, you want that photo shoot, we'll set that up for you as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. And uh, I hope, you know, if you spend any time in your booth, you get good questions. And, uh, you know, otherwise, I'm sure if, if I have any questions, I'll pass them on to you. Fantastic. Looking forward to it. All right. Thanks. All the best. You have a great one. You too. Bye. Bye. All right. Well, that was fun. And what time is it now? It is quarter till. So, before we move on to our next interview with Melissa Barnett, I just want to remind people one more time about rules of the road here at C Wire. So lectures are going well. We haven't had any technical problems, you know, knock on many pieces of wood. Um, and so um, the biggest questions that we get at the conference is how do I get my credits? You know, I want to make sure I'm getting them. Uh, I don't want to miss out. So remember, to get your credits, watch the entire lecture. Do not leave early. And on the right side of the screen, actually, as you're watching, you'll see there's a little note there reminding you, please don't leave early. It's a COPE requirement that you watch the whole thing. Otherwise, they can't issue credits to you. Even if you complete the quiz, if you don't watch, you won't get the credit. Um, and again, we do this because not only is it a COPE requirement, but some states even make, you know, they, they want to make sure that you're watching it live versus on demand. So the system records all of that when you watched. So please watch the whole lecture. Remember too, you have to pass the quiz. You don't have to pass it immediately. Um, some people take months to take the quizzes and it doesn't matter um, because you know, there's so many classes back to back. You don't have time to take classes. That's cool. Don't worry about it. Just take it sometime between now and August 1st to get the credit. Uh, I'd recommend taking it sooner rather than later just because you know, the data leaks out of your head and you're going to forget a lot of answers. Um, the most important third thing too is to fill out the survey so it takes about two minutes each lecture has a survey associated with it and you'll see at the end of the lecture and at the end of the quiz you'll get uh, a link to click on that lecture it's critically important that you do that because we take your data and we actually use it to generate um, the roster for next year so we we do take your feedback seriously we're not just saying that like you know most companies say we take your feedback seriously we actually do 
Uh, if you've been watching the, the CWire for the last five years, you'll know that we have a speakers roster of at least 100 people, probably more at this point. And we frequently rotate the speakers that we have. And a lot of that rotation is, you know, not only to keep the conference fresh, but it's also based on the feedback that we're getting from people about who they liked and what they want to see more of. So we really listen to what you're telling us. Uh, so it's incredibly important that you fill out the survey. And again, it's anonymous. I don't look at who submitted, uh, you know, uh, so you can tell me if you really disliked someone or something or, or anything about the conference, put it in there because we need to know. Uh, we don't want to have a situation where we're giving you content that you don't want, right? That doesn't really serve anybody. Um, so please let us know. And so before our next interview, which is coming up in about 10 minutes, I just want to run through our list of sponsors again and thank them for being here with us uh, today. Um, we couldn't actually put on CE Wire without our sponsors. You know, it, it's uh, especially at this price point, right? We try to keep the conference as inexpensive as we can for clinicians, and putting on 60 credits is a lot. Uh, and we couldn't get off the ground each year without our sponsors uh, because the fixed costs of putting on the conference are very high. So thank you to them for coming on board. And so thanks to Marco, uh, sponsors of this live stream. Um, so they, they keep the insanity running here. So thank you for them. Uh, Marco was our first sponsor for the conference. They were the, the one company that gave us the confidence to go ahead and do this. Uh, five years ago, we came up to them with this idea and they said, go for it. We'd be happy to put our weight behind it. So thank you, Marco. Uh, Hogs, a new sponsor this year, so you're all familiar with their instruments and uh, check out their booth because they also have some deals going this year. $1,000 rebate with the purchase of an Octopus 900 Basic, $1,500 rebate with the purchase of an Octopus 900 Pro. So check out Hogs booth for all of their deals um, and those will be ongoing. And again, I'm going to send out an e-blast to everyone when this is all over reminding people of the deals because even after the live show is done, the booths will remain open and many of these deals will still be valid and you can still obtain them. Because uh, I know that during the conference um, itself, a lot of people don't have time to go in uh, and actually, you know, shop, right? Because you're too busy taking classes. So you can check it out afterwards. Neurovisual Medi Medicine Institute, we're going to be talking to the folks there today uh, in a little while. Uh, all about binocular vision issues and how you can treat them. And they have a comprehensive approach for your practice to treating these issues. Uh, and it can be a real practice builder for you as well. It's one of those topics where this is sort of the domain of optometry and there are no other sort of specialties that are better suited to treating it. And this is sort of a one-stop shop to show you how to integrate this into your practice. And they're gonna tell you all about their program later in the day today, or you can check out their booth right now in the exhibit hall and learn more about what it is that they do. Tear care, so they make a device for my bone and gland dysfunction. And let me see if I can bring up some pictures here uh, to show you what it's all about. Now, of course, in the old days uh, when MGD treatments were new, they were big and expensive, and now they, are, they have come definitely down in price and size. If you take a look at how big tear care is, it's tiny. Um, so you can see the device right there. You know, their whole idea as a latest generation device is that it's inexpensive um, and they want to get as wide a distribution as possible um, for treating MGD with heat. So you can check it out here. We're going to be speaking with Jim Sluck from, from Site Sciences, the makers of Tear Care, later in the day today uh, so we can learn an awful lot more about the product. But it's remarkable. You know, we had Sue Resnick on the phone and I remember she bought one of the first devices for MGD way back when. This was, you know, over a decade, well over a decade ago. And I think it was over $100,000. I mean, it was not cheap. Um, and just to see how prices have come down as the technologies advance is kind of remarkable. Um, so VTI and the Natural View Contact Lens. So this is a specialty lens company, and we're happy to have them on board as a sponsor today. Uh, with their natural view lenses, and they make a very interesting uh, uh, daily disposable uh, multifocal lens. Um, it's an interesting multifocal in that it doesn't have a, a, you know discrete ads like most multifocals do. So check out their booth to learn more about that technology and how it works. Uh, and they have a, a deal going on right now: save up to three dollars a box with the purchase of twenty-five or fifty-unit bank of the natural view multifocal one-day contact lenses. Uh, Zeiss, and so Zeiss, obviously you're familiar with their instruments. They are running some great specials today. 
So special instrument pricing for the Claris retinal cameras, Cirrus OCTs and OCTAs, and HFA3 perimeters. And they're throwing in an extra year of warranty on most products. Uh, they also have bundle packages if you want to go that route with retina-specific bundles, which have Claris and Cirrus, uh, and glaucoma bundles, which has, have a combination of HFA3 and Cirrus. Um, and again, they also are running specials on Forum, the data management uh, solution with 20% off depending on package. Uh, and Forum, as you know, takes data from a wide variety of instruments and puts it in one place so you can make sense of it. Uh, and it works with devices not just made by Zeiss, but basically for the whole industry. It's an incredible piece of software. So AB Max, so this is a treatment for anterior blepharitis. I jokingly refer to it as like a Dremel tool. Um, but you know, you, you do it in office. It's a procedure where you can get all that junk off the person's lashes and lids. Uh, to get them a good start to treating their anterior blepharitis. Now, this is the latest generation device. So uh, we spoke with John uh, from the company who actually created the original device. He has the patents on it. Uh, but this is a second generation device. And the, there are some big differences in the two devices. There's extra operational modes for the new device. But more importantly, the consumables are much cheaper. I think they're about 50% less or more. And if you go into the booth, you can actually check it out and see how much cheaper they are. Um, and John's also running a really interesting special where he'll actually cover the cost of the device itself if you buy a certain number of consumables. The idea being he's trying to reduce the capital cost of the device to get it in as many offices as possible. He also has a trade-in offer going. Let's see if I can bring that up. Uh, if you have one of the first generation devices where he'll give you a huge credit on it. Um, and obviously, you know, if you look at the economics of this, because the tips of the newer device are so much cheaper, than the old ones, you can make back your money rapidly and, of course, have access to the latest technology. So it's a really good deal. Apparently, he's got a closet full of the old ones now <laughs> uh, because so many people are taking advantage of, of this deal. So check it out. Uh, so Neuralens, so they make a, uh, an entire system to treat uh, binocularity issues with PRISM. And so they have a diagnostic device that takes measurements for you and the resulting output gets sent off to make a prescription of a very specific, uh, particular sp uh, spectacle lens that they make that's proprietary to them that has PRISM built into it. And if you take a look in their booth, they talk all about their technology and how it works um, to help folks who are suffering from migraines and other issues that may be related to, to issues of binocularity. So you should check them out as well. And Gretchen, my sidekick, who actually stepped out of the room, I think she went to go eat something. Um, she actually uses her neural lenses. She has a pair, they're Plano, but they uh, have that bit of special prism and it helps her with her eye strain when she's working. So interesting stuff. Maybe we'll talk about it later. Uh, should she ever return from her snack break? Or she may have actually just taken off completely because she, she couldn't take it anymore, but hopefully she'll come back. So Oculus, makers of instruments, um, and you know we've been talking a lot about them uh, at this conference in the context of specialty lenses. We've been talking a lot about the Pentacam. Um, and how people are using it these days, you know, I call it a Swiss army knife because it really is. It can do a lot of things, but people are using it uh, to create specialty lenses, scleral lenses. They take the output from the Oculus and can create a customized scleral lens, um, you know, with a few clicks of a mouse, send that design off to Wave to make contact lenses. And within three days, you have a fully customized scleral lens with an incredible fit. And I actually went through the process here locally with Charlie McBride. He showed me the whole system and, and actually created sclerals for me. Uh, and it's amazing how far the technology has advanced uh, to create sclera lenses. Um, so you want to check that out. What I also learned about the Pentacam and speaking with the folks at Oculus yesterday is that there's a new version of it uh, called the AXL that can also measure axial length. So again, they added just another, another little piece to the Swiss Army knife. Um, so if you're starting to do myopia management, this is an incredible tool to have, right? Because if you're not measuring axial length, you're probably not really... I mean, are you really doing myopia management if you can't measure, measure axial length? I'm not sure. So uh, having this tool at your disposal will make your treatment that much more effective. And so that's an upgrade to the Pentacam. And as we also learned, the Pentacam's modular, which I didn't realize. So if you wanted to upgrade, you obviously pay the upgrade fee, but it can replace the head of the thing without actually replacing the computer and table and all the other stuff. So it's actually a very easy upgrade. Um, so they're actually running a special here too, which is kind of cool. The Cratograph 5M, uh, if you buy it, you'll receive 45% off your first 10 wave lenses ordered each month for a 48 month period. Uh, and so that's up to a $28,000 value if you do a lot of scleral lenses. So if you're starting to work with wave, this is an incredible deal. Uh, so definitely check that out. 
science-based health, so makers of Hydro Eye, the, the supplement uh, for dry eye. And we spoke with Zach Denning yesterday, talking all about the company and how, as their name might imply, they take a, a scientific approach to the development of their supplement. So, um, you know, whenever you see their product, you know, they always like to go uh, and develop it based on the latest scientific recommendations and studies. Um, so check them out. They're actually running a special today, too. They're having a BOGO deal. So uh, buy one, get one. Uh, if you buy a case of Hydro Eye, you'll get a case free. And that's just here at the event. Covalent Careers, we had a great conversation with them as well. If you're looking to get a job in eye care or looking to, to move jobs or looking to find, hire an employee, an optometrist or optician, they're a great place to actually make your listing. Um, and if I can put it up here, let's see if I can find it again. My desktop has become a mess here, but here it is. Here's their site. Um, you can actually see that they, when you put a listing on their site, they will syndicate it and put it in a wide variety of places. Now, even on ODWire, if you go back here, you'll see right up here where it says jobs. You click on that, and you'll see that we actually have a listing of all their jobs as well. So they syndicate your listing and put it in multiple eye care sites to get a maximum distribution. Um, so again, if you're looking to place uh, a job somewhere, this is a good place to do it. Uh, they also have great advice about how to actually write um, help wanted ads so that it doesn't look like amateur hour. Um, so give, give them a shot as well. And they're 10% off uh, a listing if you want to do it for folks who are at CUR um, or ODWire. So check out their booth. I Care Live. So this is a company that does telehealth, and telehealth is not a scary or dirty word. They provide tools for your office that let you keep in closer contact with your patients when they're remote. So you have the patient who's on vacation. They've got a red eye. What's going to happen here, right? So with tools like the ones that iCare Live provides, um, you can stay in much closer contact with your patient in a HIPAA-compliant way. Now, I know that you know, some people are nervous about telehealth. Oh, my gosh, what's it going to mean to your practice? But ultimately, in my opinion, these are the tools that everyone will be expected to have sooner or later. And you may as well you know, take a look and see what's going on right now and get ahead of the curve. Uh, because patients are going to expect the ability to connect with you uh, digitally like this in the future. And what a great, you know, sort of um, security blanket you can give to patients when they're leaving. You can say, by the way, download this app. You'll be connected to me directly if you ever need eye care services and wh for whatever reason you're out and about. Um, you can always contact me and we can share information this way. Uh, and so you can, you know, even try to diagnose remotely if you have to. So really cool tools. Check them out. And... I Care Pro, we just got off the phone with them talking all about the different services they provide, not just for building websites, but also handling your social presence, dealing with the thorny problem of reviews, um, Google reviews, and Yelp, which has led to, to the demise of many, and an untold number of restaurants, <laughs> but also now I Care practices, right? I was mentioning, um, you know, I was mentioning when we were, when we were speaking that, um, my wife uh, will never even go to a restaurant if it's got less than four stars on oh, Yelp. really? Won't even give them a look. It's like not even a consideration. I'm an animal, of course. I'll eat anywhere. <laughs> but, but she was like, I will not even give them a second look. If I see that it's below four stars, forget it. That's my rule. And well, so, at least she's got standards. Yes, that's true. <laughs> but it's funny, right? Because a lot of people are doing that. They will mentally filter something. If they see three and a half stars, it's like, no. Just okay is not okay. <laughs> and you so, sound like at and Exactly. <laughs> and, so, and so they'll mentally filter it out. So you need to be on top of how your reviews work, right? And so I Care Pro can do that for you too. It can help you um, not only get better reviews, but also um, show you about the velocity of your reviews, right? You have to have a certain number. Velocity. Velocity, because you have to have a certain number over a certain period of time mm. to improve your SEO as well. Yep. I had no idea, right? And I didn't know I'm talking like velocity. an expert, but I had no idea. But you have to have a certain pace of them, right, in order to keep fresh, and that apparently helps with your SEO. I, I don't know. So they know this. Right. And so that's the important thing. If you're worrying about this, you're probably wasting your time because how are you supposed to keep up, right? They have entire dedicated staff, and they do this for a living with thousands of practices. It's so. time-consuming, and that's yeah. the biggest challenge with this is just staying up to date and then carving out the time to stay on top of it, feeding the beast, as I call it. Feeding the beast, yep. <coughs> and La Rivera, so again, uh, if you're into punctal plugs, definitely check them out. Obviously, technology has evolved over time. Um, we're just going to be talking about punctal plugs coming up this afternoon. 
Uh, so you might want to check that out as well to see what the latest and greatest uh, is. They have huge discounts. I don't have them in front of me right now. It's like this gigantic sheet. Their giant sheet. list, yeah. Yes. Um, <coughs> and check it out in their booth because they have significant discounts for folks here at CE Wire. Optometry Times. Optometry Times, yes. Uh, that's where we are giving our readers practical chair-side advice. And our content is designed to be easily digested and easily consumed. And our hope is that you will read our content in between patients and then immediately apply that advice to the next patient in your chair. So we want people to read it. Our pieces are designed to be easily read and then check it out because next month we'll send you another and everything lives on our website. So we're always looking for new authors. If you are interested in getting started writing, get in touch with me. We'd love to hear from you. If you don't receive our publication, you can go into our booth and sign up for our print publication every month or you can sign up for digital products, such as our digital edition and our email newsletter. We would be happy to have you. Did you, so, just, did you just tell people to throw your magazine in the trash? I absolutely did. <laughs> uh, if you go to any eye care office, you will see stacks of journals because people want to read this stuff and they should read this stuff. It's good information, but it's time consuming. And if you want to sit there, as I've said before, with your glass of scotch, and read your optometric journals, then by all means, have at it. But with Optometry Times, you don't need to do that. It's designed to be um, consumed easily. And so read it and then get rid of it. Line your bird cage, line your cat litter pan, because next month we'll send you another one and everything is archived on our website. So you don't need to hang on to these publications. All right. Thank you for reading. And finally, Vision Equipment. This is Leo Hadley's company with refurbished equipment. Check out their booth for the latest specials. I have no idea what they are because I'm, I'm sometimes I don't think Leo does either because he has <laughs> a, he's got an inventory of things coming in, right? So these are refurbished. But he lovingly refurbishes everything. If you've ever seen his equipment at trade shows, you'll know mm -hmm. it looks pristine, <clears throat> like brand new. If um, you want yeah. it, chances are he has it. Yep. And so uh, it's high quality. He backs what he sells. Uh, and it's a great way to get a piece of equipment without breaking the bank, which is very obviously important for many practices today. So go and check him out. And so I guess that's it for our sponsors. And we have a call coming up right now, don't we? We do. We are going to be talking with Dr. Melissa Barnett, who is a scleral lens guru. But earlier today, I think she just finished, yes, yeah, she just finished her class on Off the Menu, a nutritional approach to dry eye. But before we jump in there, we just had uh, our one o'clock classes start. And that is pain management with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, carotid stenosis, what the OD needs to know, contemporary keratoconus management, and then the start of a two-hour class on ocular nutrition and wellness factor fiction. All so right. that's what has just started in our one o'clock hour. <clears throat> All right, well, that sounds good. And let me give you back that, and we will see if I can find Melissa. Maybe, possibly. You have to hit the call button. That would help, wouldn't it? <laughs> I told you it's a catchy song. Maybe not. Nope. Maybe she's busy answering questions. Could be. I'll text her quickly. I bet you that's it. I bet you she was answering questions. Yeah. So that can actually happen, right? There's spillover from classes because people, you know, have the ability to, to interact with the speaker. So why not? <coughs> All right. Well, then. Well, we will see if uh, We Melissa. will see. Yeah, I haven't. Um, That's okay. And, and if not, you know, we'll catch up with her later. Yeah, um, absolutely. We do have some other calls coming we do. later today. Some great folks to talk with. Yep. And uh, we're going to take a little break in a little bit, too, though. We're going to show you our trip to the Contact Lens Museum again because it was really fun and if everyone needs to see it. If you did get a chance to see it, I highly recommend you take a look because this is a really, really cool thing. And Adam 
and his dad Paul and I had a really fun time with Pat Caroline showing us around and we saw some absolutely phenomenal stuff like the only working machine in the world that can still create glass scleral contact lenses. Yep. So is Melissa... Oh yes, Melissa's around. All right, so hopefully I didn't fat finger her number, which, you know, knowing <laughs> me, it's, it's possible. Let's see if this is right. Paul says this little musical tune woke him up. <laughs> your phone number with the one that I'm texting her on. Maybe we have a different number. Okay, maybe this is the number we should be. Yeah, we're dialing a different number. Okay. Oh, you have, you mistyped it. Oh, of course. <clears throat> of course I did. <laughs> so it should be a, uh, the, the two should be a three. Oh, there we go. So it helps if you dial the correct number. So that is look, totally our bad. Look at that. I, I pulled a Paul Farkas. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Sorry, Melissa. That's our bad. And this, this poor soul who's getting calls from us is wondering who the hell is calling me. Let's see. Yay! <laughs> Hi, Melissa. We managed to get you. It's Gretchen and Adam. Hello. Thank so sorry. Time. So sorry that we, uh, I'm glad that I thought to check the number and because we would have thought, what the hell? She just said she's around and now she's not answering the yeah, phone when I, it was entirely our fault. I, I can't type, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you just finished your class not thing. long ago. How did it go? Yeah. It was good. I enjoyed the questions from the audience. That was really fun. Well, Steve Silverberg just said in the uh, live stream chat that your lecture was great and he is changing his diet. <laughs> oh, wonderful. I think well, you hey, need to, if I uh, can help patients and doctors, I think that's probably good for everyone, right? Adam, I think you need to watch your lecture. Are you saying that my Rice Krispie Treat breakfast was not good? I am absolutely saying that. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I think you need to You have to lots go. of hours of lectures to go. You, you need energy, right? I know, I know. Well, he'll have a big crash from the, the carb and sugar, and I say he needs some protein to carry him through, but he disagrees. And you know better, too. I know better, yeah. It's just, you know, when I get under stress, I'm sure I'm like a lot of people, right? When you get under stress, you just want to shove every carb in your face that you can find, right? <laughs> I mean, it's just like, it's like human nature. Um, but it's a terrible idea, but it's what I did. <laughs> yes, it is what you did. You were mainlining sugar, caffeine, yep. and carb this morning. Yep. Breakfast champions. So Adam, you'll have to get back to me after you watch the lecture and let yep. me know if you implemented any changes. Yep. All right, now you're on the hook. Not only do I know that you have to watch and change, Melissa knows, and everybody, everybody all 2.5 people who are now currently watching. So great, when I walk around at a trade show now, everyone's going to look. They're going to be like, oh, Adam, you know, what are you that doing? Candy bar. Yeah. What are you eating? <laughs> Is that another Rice Krispie treat? <laughs> oh, my God. So, Melissa, what kind of questions were you getting from uh, your lecture attendees? So, one question I thought was, was good was about, you know, what if someone's a vegetarian and they can't have, like, an omega supplement? Mm -hmm. And we do have a lot of vegetarians and vegans in our practice, so I, I thought that was a good question to ask. So microalgae is an option um, for those patients. Also, they could do, like, flaxseed oil or ground flaxseed or walnuts or walnut oil or hemp seed oil or hemp beverages. Because I do get a fair amount of questions um, from my patients about that. So I thought that that was helpful. Um, something else that's pretty common when I give this lecture is asking about how I incorporate this in my patients who have not only dry eye but rear contact lenses. Mm -hmm. And I just want to share a recent story mm -hmm. of one of my patients because I have a lot of established patients that I've seen for a very long time and they you know, they understand, especially those with severe dry eye or Sjogren's, you know, they get it that if they follow the recommendations, they're going to do better, they're going to feel better. But I had a, a patient recently and she was new to me. I, I just met her. She'd been seen in the practice, but new to me. And it took 
it took a few visits, actually. She wasn't complying with anything, really. Mm -hmm. You know, she came in and she wasn't following any instructions. And I saw her two times where she really didn't do much of anything that I asked her to do. And she said, you know, I'm really just not doing better. My symptoms are the same. (laughs) And she wasn't doing anything I recommended. And so the third time, I, you know, I just sat down with her and I like to go back to what the patient is telling me for their symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, it looks like your eyes are are burning. Your eyes are really irritating you at the end of the day after you're on the computer. That's what you mentioned to me. And this is why I am recommending these specific things. And and it's it's a lot. I will, I will admit it's a lot of different management options, but this is why I'm recommending it. And we just kind of had this really great conversation. And the next time I saw her, she, she was complying with most, most everything. She was feeling a million times better. And for her, the, when I got down to it, her concern was that she was going to be on everything forever. You know, and I said, no. I said, this is what I want you to do for four weeks. I'm going to see you back. I understand you want to get off as much as possible. That's great. That's fine. Um, let's, you know, let's start with everything and then slowly reduce and see where you are. So that I thought, and of course, you know, with her consequences, she's feeling much more comfortable at the end Mm -hmm. of the day and she's much happier and I could just see her smile walking in. But sometimes, you know, that was kind of a good recent lesson for me is that, you know, I do get all these new patients too, and they're so incredibly symptomatic and everyone's a little bit different you know, and how to talk to them about their dry eye and their ocular surface disease, how, how to really connect with each patient is, is different. So well, it's just a, a lesson that, that came home that was recent. Well, you said that every patient is different. So does that mean that you can offer uh, ODs who are looking to jump into this one or two pieces of advice to get started? Or is it just too difficult because every patient will have different needs and therefore you would recommend different things. Yeah, I think, you know, maybe one thing to get started <clears throat> is having an omega that you recommend. Okay. So that could be just one specific omega that works well for you um, in your practice and having brochures or recommendations or selling it within your practice, whatever sort of works for you. Mm-hmm. That's a, a really easy thing. So I find that many of my patients do quite well, you know, with one specific product and then some need something different. Some people can't take pills at all or need a liquid form, for example. Um, but that's something that everyone can do. You know, everyone can incorporate that. And I'm a really big fan of giving my patients lots of, lots of information so that when they go home, they have written information. This is exactly what I should be doing. You know, right, Dr. Right. Barnett told me, you know, I need to do X, Y, and Z because if you say it, you know, verbally and then they forget and don't, oh, absolutely. don't remember, or remember anything. Yeah. Right. So you can, you, know, you can recommend a specific eyelid cleaner, a specific compress, a specific omega, a specific artificial tear, a specific prescription eye drops. These are all things you know, that can be recommended that anyone can do, anyone can do in their practice. And I would, you know, start simple, it's fine. Um, better to diagnose and manage dry eye than just to ignore it. Right. Um, and then once you have, you know, kind of your baseline things that you like and that work well for most of your patients, you can expand and, you know, get into other things such as moisture goggles, for example, at nighttime or daytime moisture release eyewear. Um, there are so many great products out there now that didn't even exist like 10 years ago. Right. So I think, I think that everyone can incorporate it into their practices. Are you finding that practitioners are open to having this discussion? Because not too long ago, people would poo-poo using um, something like a moisture goggle or adding more omegas or, you know, insert whatever here and coming at it from a slightly different perspective. Now, I think our culture and society has changed a bit, but that doesn't mean that practitioners are, are open. Would you say that doctors are open to incorporating this or not so much? 
It depends. So I think there's a whole group of doctors that are open, embracing it, enjoying it, you know, really just there's so many great products that we can offer our patients and they're just taking it to their practices and sharing it with their patients. And they come back and tell me, which I think is fantastic. Mm -hmm. I do think there is still a group of doctors that is just in denial. I can't even believe it (laughs) that they're not um, diagnosing and managing dry eye, but it's still out there. Right. Um, And so there, there's sort of these two groups and, you know, since I do a lot of contact lens work in dry eye, I think you have to manage the ocular surface when you're fitting contact lenses, whether it's for normal corneas or regular corneas, it's so incredibly important. And I think that some people who are very highly skilled in contact lenses are still kind of denying the ocular surface too, which I don't, I don't understand, but I think we're getting better. I think, I think things are improving over the last few years. It's really good to hear, yeah, because I think we're seeing more science coming out around some of these new schools of thought, and for some people, that's what they need. And there's also, we're, we're seeing more and more products that are available, because in the past, there weren't as many. But now we've Right, become... and, another, and another thing to add in there, you know, is makeup. Um, right. mm-hmm. I talk to my patients a lot about skin creams and eye creams and makeup and you know, those who both have dry eye and wear contact lenses because there, it was, it, two weeks ago I had a patient come in and she was a student in her 20s for an urgent visit because of a reaction to her mascara. Mm-hmm. You know, so these are, these are conversations that I think are important to have. And when I'm, you know, lecturing on this with a bunch of men, everyone looks towards to me and, you know, what do you do? What do you say? But I have these conversations with my patients because it's only going to help their ocular surface. Right. It's going to only help their dry eyes if I give them a specific recommendation. It's going to make it easier for me um, as well to treat them. And then it only will help with their contact lens comfort, especially towards the end of the day. You know, even if it's a soft, daily disposable lens, they're going to be more comfortable if they have products that don't have harsh chemicals. Right. And there are many great resources, you know, for... Um, and then science behind it, too, as far as certain products to use. So, again, having, you know, one or two of your favorite recommendations and sharing that with patients or, you know, some practices or even selling certain products mm-hmm. within their practice as well. So what would you say is the biggest stumbling block for patients? Is it a complete change in what they're doing? Is it remembering to do it? Is it uh, a complete lifestyle way of thinking? Is it financial? Because patients have different reasons for not complying with recommendations. And this is a little different than take this drop three times a day or something like that. What would you say is the biggest stumbling block for patients adhering to your recommendations? Great question, Gretchen. And I think it really depends on the patient. Um, You know, I have patients that don't have any money at all. Like they have no money. Um, And so sometimes, you know, it's really financial, like they honestly cannot afford even an artificial tear. So for those patients, I recommend, you know, dietary changes is a really easy one. Drinking water, linking your eyes, doing a warm compress, you know, just really sort of basically reducing caffeine. Um, And then, of course, looking at medications if they're on oral antihistamines, for example, that are drying out their eyes you know, rec- and they have to take it, recommending increasing hydration. So, you know, for some, it's financial. For a lot of people, it's just getting it into the routine, right. <laughs> what yeah. they're doing. You know, they're happy to do it, but they can't figure out a way. So oftentimes I'm talking to my patients about how to get it into their routine. Brushing teeth is a really easy one. You know, if they brush their teeth in the morning and the evening, using a drop at that time, it's kind of a simple one. If they have a certain task, and I'll ask them specifically, you know, do you have a break at work? And if so, can you put in a drop like during that time? Can you put a little note? Can you set an alarm? Can you, you know? And so I, I talk them through it, and that seems to help quite a bit of how to incorporate this into their day to day. If I'm recommending a warm compress, and for example, they don't like doing it at night because they fall asleep, mm-hmm. do it in the morning. Mm-hmm. It's fine. <laughs> you know, I'd rather have them do it at 
sometime during the day versus not at all. And then, um, you know, it, yes, for some people, it, it is a big change in, in talking through that and, you know, kind of setting realistic expectations. Uh, some things that are, you know, chronic conditions and how can we do a sort of balance, like help with the treatment and management to an appropriate level where you're feeling a whole lot better, but not making this so, you know, just difficult that you're thinking about your eyes all day long and you're worrying. And I'd like my patients to really not be thinking about their eyes and just be comfortable all day long if possible And just sort of incorporating as much as is needed, but also knowing that they have to be able to fit it into their life in order to be compliant. But it's a really good point. That is a really good point that patients need to be able to fit it into their lives, whether it's their budget, whether it's their lifestyle, or just the time. If it isn't something that is easily added to a daily routine, it's just not going to work. And you have to think about other things that are going on, you know. <clears throat> it could be um, diabetic, for example, or they could be on dialysis. Or, you know, they, there are many other issues for their health only, not just, you know, the life, of course, working with kids and every day to day. But there's so many other things that we need to consider as well. Right. Absolutely. That's all really great information, and I bet you your course was just chock full of it. So I'm really glad that we got a chance to talk to you and ask a couple of questions about it. Thank you. Always a pleasure to talk to both of you. And and I'm amazed. Congratulations to both of you on your recent award. Oh, Oh, right. Thank you. Yes, thank you. That is very kind of you to say. We haven't even mentioned that, have we? We we are not pimping ourselves No, we haven't. We've done a terrible job of (laughs) self-promotion. Well... Well-deserved. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And thank you for doing CE Wire again this year, Melissa. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you. And we'll talk to you soon. Sounds great. Thanks. Bye. Bye. I forgot about that. Oh, that was so nice of her to say. Yes. (laughs) Well, yours is right here. I could go get it. No, that's okay. People don't need to see it. So, yeah, no, we were just talking about a little thing that we did at GSLS um, where we got a little award. Um, Gretchen, for her for her outstanding contributions to journalism for X number of years. A lifetime I, I achievement. Won't, I won't say how many years, right? So That means I get to retire because I got right. a lifetime achievement award. <laughs> My God, I feel old. <laughs> and as did you. So, yeah, that was we're good to old. us. We're both old. Yeah, we both got... For the, from the Contact Lens Manufacturers Association, from the CLMA. Yep. And I am ever so grateful and honored to be recognized that way. So, thank you. Yeah, it was pretty cool. So... All right, so what time is it now? It is... It is about 10.30 our time, and it is about 1.30 Eastern. So everybody in class is halfway through the 1 o'clock classes, which is pain management, uh, carotid stenosis, and contemporary keratoconus management, as well as a quarter of the way through the two-hour class on ocular nutrition and wellness. Okay. And then in half an hour, we are coming up to our 2 p.m. Eastern time slots, so that'll be critical concepts for critical corneas, stuck on you, vitreomacular interface disorders, and future keratoconus management, a glimpse of what's to come, and then the final hour of ocular nutrition and wellness. So we've got a lot of cornea stuff there. We've got critical corneas, keratoconus, ocular nutrition and wellness, which has a lot to do with ocular surface disease, and then a little bit of retina, so vitreomacular interface. Cool. And I will say this, by the way, about that critical concept lecture that you can see up there at the 2 p.m. hour, 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, that one was actually pitched to us relatively late. You know, we mentioned before that we do take feedback seriously here, um, and we mean it. So that one came out of the blue. Uh, someone came up to me and, and uh, would, you know, said, hey, this would be an interesting topic. Uh, and then Dr. Santelli came to me and said, hey, we have this. You want to do it? And I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Um, so all of this came about based on feedback and people willing to approach us. We are, this is a, a very democratic process here, right? We, we, don't, um, we don't discriminate. So if you have ideas for good talks, we always want to hear about them because we want to keep it interesting. And another way to have your input heard is by completing the evaluations after every CE class. And in fact, that is a COPE requirement. But Adam, Paul, and Steve take those very seriously, and they want to know what you like and what you don't like 
if a class just didn't deliver as promised or a speaker was outstanding and exceeded expectations, those are things that they want to know. So what yep. you want to hear, what kind of CE you want to see coming up, please put that information down because Adam and Paul and Steve do look at each and every one of them and your voice is heard and your vote counts. Yep, and again, it's anonymous. I, we won't, you know, see who wrote what. We won't so hunt you we down. We won't hunt you down. Or so they won't like hunt that, you down. We need honest feedback. We need to know the truth, whether we want it or not. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we have a, a break coming up. We do, and because we have a break, what we're going to do, it's a significant break, so we have time to show people our trip to the museum. So uh, if you haven't seen it before, uh, Paul Gretchen and myself visited the Contact Lens Museum on Thursday. It was fabulous. In Forest Grove, right across the street from Pacific University. And what, what came out of that was a, a great tour from Pat Caroline showing us everything that's there. And we filmed it all so you can all see it. Absolutely. And as we said earlier, if there are things that you are, have hoarded in your basement or garage, some old products, some old equipment, uh, drop Pat Caroline or Craig Norman a line. They are very interested to hear from you because it can help you offload your old items out of your storage area. And it'll also save them for posteri posterity just to show the history of optometry and contact lenses. So don't throw it out. Do it now before you die and your loved yeah. ones throw it in the trash. Right. Uh, let Craig and Patrick decide if um, if they are good things that they can add to their collection. So please drop them a line. And also, they're looking to get a bigger space because yep. even before they finished putting the entire collection together, they realized that they had outgrown the space that they are currently in. And it's been open for only a few months. So they're looking to get a new location which will allow them to show more of the collection. And they can do that only through support because this is a labor of love for them. Yep. It is a nonprofit, and so they need support from all of us, both financial as well as donations of your historical items. So please get in touch with Pat and Craig. Yep, and highlight in the movie as you're watching it, Gretchen flips a switch on the ol oldest and only machine left in the world that can create a glass scleral lens. Which is kind of scary because there was a fire involved and a cup of <laughs> asbestos, which was... <laughs> Which is not good. It's, it's a pretty cool device. So why don't we flip this on and uh, we'll see you guys when the movie's done. All right. See you soon. Pat, so, would you um, tell us how you came about this idea? What prompted you and Craig to start a collection? Well, you know, uh, like most collections, you start collecting things one at a time and then one day you wake up and you find uh, you've got a museum sitting in your home in closets, garages, and we found ourselves in that situation and then uh, decided that uh, we were just going to open up a contact lens museum. How long did it take you to curate the collection in here? A long time, and we, that's an ongoing endeavor. Um, you know, trying to do something of this magnitude while you're working full time and everything else, uh, got full curriculum and back there, it's, um, it's, it's been very busy, but as you can see, um, it's just such a joy. It just brings so many smiles to so many faces when you bring older practitioners <laughs> through here yeah, the, because the relic in. Yeah, <laughs> it, it really it's so true. Why you because, me? I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, we'll put you in the chair. There you go. That won't be creepy at all. <laughs> no, it won't be creepy at all. But no, you're so right. It's just uh, so many memories then come back to all of us that were touched by contact lenses. You know, it's uh, when you think about how contact lenses have changed so many people's lives of and course. changed their lives. All those keratoconus patients, and irregular cornea patients. It's it's humbling, you know, to you know be a part of you know having this history. So we we felt that uh, you know. Those are younger patients. Where do you get your lenses? You're nine years nine old. Nine years old. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Really younger contact lens wearers. Yeah. You know, they're in so many millions of people's lives have been changed so much with these. Now, if practitioners have 
anything lying around their basements or garages or the oh. back room of their practices, mm -hmm. would you be interested from, in hearing from them? Yes, we'd be very interested. That's where we pick up a lot of these relics. Mm -hmm. um, every practitioner, literally everyone uh, out there, has one or two items that have been given to them by an elderly patient or uh, they took over a practice that you know, had been established back in the 30s or mm -hmm. 40s. And somewhere in their archives uh, are these treasures, you know, that they've not known what to do with them. They hold on to them because they don't take up a lot of space. But they don't know, where, they know they can't throw it out. Right, of course uh, not. But they, they're looking for a place to send it. This is the place. <laughs> <laughs> this is the place to send it. So. There, it can be archived, uh, taken care of properly. Um, we've, Craig and I have spent, you know, hours and hours learning about curating um, an optical museum like this. It's, uh, there's a lot that goes into it. We had to then uh, apply for a, um, a nonprofit uh, organization, a 501c3 with the government, we uh, got that, so we're official. So not only are you accepting items to be displayed here, you're accepting financial contributions to support yeah, the museum. Yeah, very much so. This has been totally funded uh, through gifts and so on, and by Craig and myself. And oh, that's it. That's a good charity for next year. Absolutely. That is. It really is. It's a lovely charity for uh, individuals in the eye care profession that want to see, you know, the history of uh, contact lenses preserved. So uh, you can see here we uh, uh, encourage donations, and uh, so we, uh, yeah, we love it. You know, when people can, uh, when they win the lottery, you know, send us uh, some of that, and uh, so we have fun. But it's, um, we get the, believe it or not, our biggest support from uh, patients. So they feel this incredible emotional, you know, tie to these lenses. Sure. Now this is uh, actually just part of the collection. Uh, uh, a lot of it still is in storage right now. Uh, we need a, a bigger facility. When we opened this up in July, we opened it up with the knowledge that uh, we've already outgrown it. Uh, it's a good that, problem to uh, have. Good problem to have. And so we're just going to keep raising you know, funds as best we can and uh, hope to move into a bigger uh, facility as time goes on. And then this is, like I said, part of the collection. The other collection I'm going to show you is the uh, collection of antique glasses, uh, oh. spectacle lenses, um, probably one of the finest in uh, North America right now, um, and that's across the street at the school. Um, so um, it's this has been just a passion for Craig and I, you know, this collecting. And, um, fortunately, we have wives that understand uh, the insanity because <laughs> uh, that's what it is. It's truly it's insane to be doing this. Uh, um, uh, but you know, Craig and I have been blessed so much, like you have like we all have, by the eye care industry. That, Very much so. Yeah, that it's just been a humbling experience to be a part of it. So this is our payback, or this is our legacy that we'll leave, you know, so. And it's a beautiful one. It's a start. It's, yeah, a, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful start. And so we're real happy, very, very happy with it all. Excellent. So. Many, many years ago, as you can imagine, the, um, it's really myself and Craig Norman who kind of put this all together. The story begins over here. I'll sort of walk you through. 
this is kind of the evolution of contact lenses. The, uh, all of these lenses here are made of glass. And so these were the earliest uh, contact lenses company and Zeiss. So they were the three making glass uh, scleral lenses at the time. When did Obrick come in? Obrick came in in the uh, 1940s. How do you know that name? <laughs> I used to live with him. <laughs> oh my. My, I was just uh, reading a, a book uh, this morning, uh, his uh, textbook from 1945 uh -huh. on um, contact lenses. It's really one of the earliest. Yeah. And uh, that is, what a coincidence. Oh, yeah. So all are, of... Are these companies related? It's, it's no, Muller, Sohn, no, and Muller, Welt? No, they were different... Um, Families. Okay. Yeah, they had no uh, no relation, and uh, so these, uh, like I said, it's the largest collection of glass uh, contact lenses in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's um, they're hard to find, very rare, uh, wonderful to feel because they're incredibly heavy. Can can I touch one? Yeah. As a matter of fact, you can touch the one that is yours. Uh, we wanted, Craig and I wanted you to have this. This is a glass uh, really? scleral lens. Wow. And uh, it's all the contributions you've made to the industry. You deserve that. Oh, you are so <laughs> kind. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's kind of neat to have. You can see kind of how rough the optics were. Very rough. And, uh, but, you know, they got better with time. That's a real early one. Like what year? So, uh, this would have been probably early 1900s. Wow. So between 1900 and 1910. But you could feel how smooth uh, yeah. the glass The workmanship was, was wonderful. But, um, yeah, it's... Uh, that's definitely one we wanted you to have. Oh, very nice. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. This would be a real challenge to apply and to remove. Yeah, it really, it really is because of the size. Um, these were about 22 to 24 millimeters in wow. diameter. So they were pretty big. And then I see that they're fenestrated as Some well. Some of them were, and that's kind of unique, the number of them that were fenestrated. Um, you can imagine drilling a hole in glass can be a little bit challenging. And, a lot of breakage. Uh, yeah. But uh, I'm always surprised when I'm going through the lenses, the number of them that have uh, actually been fenestrated. And that would have been a challenge as well, not only drilling the hole, but making sure that the edges are smooth enough. Because oh, yes. That would have been quite painful had you applied a fenestrated yeah. lens that wasn't smooth. But then you look at these Zeiss lenses, the optics are absolutely perfect, and they're incredibly thin. And I always wonder how many of those broke in the eye. You know, it wouldn't take much trauma. That would have been to a shatter really good those, problem. yeah. But that was unique of the Zeiss lenses at the time. Um, they uh, they were incredibly thin. Do you know who made this one? The one that you gave me? Uh, that one, yes, I do. That one uh, was uh, from the uh, Mueller Welt Company. Wow. Yeah, that one. Look from at these. There. And then so those are the molds right those there? Those are the molds. So that and is brass, me, and then... Let me take you through how... Let's say like it's uh, 1920, and I'm going to fit you with a contact lens. It would all begin over here. Um, May I sit in the chair? Yes, please. Uh, you sit in the chair again. That's where I sit. <laughs> I get comfortable in here. <laughs> and um, now the molding process began by just simply mixing this compound. It's called moldite. moldite yeah. And we would mix it in one of these uh, containers. And then uh, it would be placed into a syringe. 
and this mold then would be placed onto the eye and the moldite compound injected through here and then it would take a perfect mold of the anterior segment so the molding compound would harden in about 90 seconds so you had to be real efficient with your time you had to load this inject it and uh, be pretty efficient so you have to do that on a board exam right yeah, absolutely <laughs> 1950s, uh, and uh, then uh, what happened next was when you had that beautiful mold you would mix this next compound called cast stone and that cast stone then uh, was just like a, um, a concrete but incredibly fine powdery concrete and then you would let it harden and uh, then you would have this beautiful impression of the eye now back in the day in the before world war ii a second mold would have to be made of brass and the reason for that is that when the lens was actually turned into a contact lens it um, was made of glass and the glass would just simply the heat of the glass would destroy the, the moldite so it had to be turned into a brass mold then it was taken over here and this is probably the highlight of the museum and the fact that we have the only remaining glass contact lens making apparatus in the world. This really? is it. This is the only one left. Does it work if it you works. wanted to create a lens? Oh you yeah. Could? Yeah, we've had it fired up and you can see we've destroyed part of the uh, table from the firing <laughs> it up and uh, uh, it makes a lot of pops and noises and now there was a, this vice was on the stand we don't know what its function was but uh, it must have had some function the problem with this instrument is that nowhere can we find anything written on how to manufacture the contact lens or how they were manufactured wow. so we're having to piece it together little by little now the um, if oh, I push this is something gonna happen yeah push oh, it push it yeah push both of them uh, this one. Oh and my God. it still works that's the amazing thing we fired up these motors and um, uh, they were still working. Uh, this is incredible. So, uh, they, uh, now, the way it worked was you attach the mold, the brass mold of the shape of the eye here. Top two, I think. Perfect. Now, the bottom, yeah, no, you got it. You got them both, okay. good. And what would happen is you uh, had natural gas and oxygen that were mixed together. Those were, um, it wasn't propane. Propane hadn't been invented yet. So they actually used natural gas wow. back in that day. And so the gases were then mixed up here to the appropriate concentration. And these valves controlled the amount of oxygen versus the uh, amount of natural gas. It looks like it's a very non-precise process. Exactly, exactly, very non-precise. Then they had these two by two wafers of glass uh, that were set right here. And then this was just simply brought around once the glass had been molten and this just brought down and an impression made of the uh, contact lens. And that's the mold right there. And that's the mold. So you would of swap the, uh, that out depending upon the yeah. patient you're creating this for. And then in this little container, when I got the instrument, uh, it was just filled up to about here with asbestos. Oh, excellent. So, uh, that uh, made it all complete. Uh, so then you would bring it back here, drop this mold 
and because it was flaming hot from uh, being in contact with the glass and it would fall into the asbestos where it would be cooled and now with these little tools here the residual glass would be broken away and then you saw over here how the edges were rounded and then the power placed on the front of the lens with, uh, with this. Now the only thing we can think of here is that this was actually operated by hand the, to oscillate the uh, application of the power on the front side of the lens. That's all we can actually kind of surmise. We don't know how else it was driven. And, uh, but everything came with the unit. It was intact. And it's actually from, of all places, Perth, Australia. Don Ezekiel. Yeah, Don Ezekiel. And, and if anybody would have something like this, it would be it'd him. It would be him. And uh, you'll see as you go through the museum, many of the pieces are from Don's collection and that was probably the largest in the world and he gave it all to us so we're really super fortunate to have that. And he got his basement back. I'm sorry? He got his basement back. Yes, he had <laughs> his garage. He had, uh, had it in his laboratory but when he sold the laboratory, it went moved into his garage. So he was kind of uh, grateful, but again, sad to see it all go away. And, uh, but to have the only one remaining. Uh, now this is for this. <laughs> <laughs> A mechanical tool that nothing yeah. to do with creating the contact no, lens. No, no, strictly for changing out the gas. If you wanted to, is there gas in there? Could no. you make one? No, we uh, we keep the uh, the live ones in my garage at home, uh, but these are uh, actually empty. And so you have uh, filled ones if you wanted oh, to. Yes. I mean, I don't know that oh, I'd put asbestos sure. there, but you could create oh, yeah, a glass yeah. lens. We're the only ones in the world that can make glass contact lenses if you need one. Have oh, you tried it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've tried it, and it's incredible. Just there's a lot of experimentation getting the temperature right, getting the just the exact amount of uh, natural gas and the exact amount of oxygen but you could see that it uh, would be very easy to, uh, to accomplish. Now, when PMMA came along, things changed rather dramatically because now it was possible to just simply use the mold itself rather than turning it into a brass mold. And what was used at that time then were these PMMA wafers. That's actual PMMA? Yeah. I thought now, it was cardboard. No, it's, it's it has this protective coating on it, and you just peel this away, and then there's this beautiful piece of acrylic plastic. Wow. For scleral lenses. That's really cool. Very cool. And now, you know, it didn't take any temperature at all to melt that. You know, you, that was not like melting glass. So I think we may even have one here that might be, yeah, there we go. Oh, so that's so, it. That's it. So Darren, Total I asked the question when you were in school, did you ever see anything like this? Yes, well, with, with the way it worked in school, <laughs> our, our contact lens course was one person with keratoconus that was handed down from class to class. <laughs> and we had a, it was at Columbia University, and we had Isidore Finkelstein was the professor, a very bright guy, but that was it. And he had this one guy, and every time they had to do something to wash the lens or something, there was no sink. Fink, the Fink used to walk in to the bathroom and wash it and try it on. And this guy never succeeded, but he kept coming back from class to class, oh. and that was Bless the contact him. lens course. 
in the 50s. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's so interesting you mentioned that name. I read his name for the first time last night, uh, Fickelstein yeah. from Columbia University. And the reason I came across it, I was uh, doing a story, as I'll show you down here, on Dennis England, who helped invent the first corneal contact lens. But uh, I came across an article written by Hank Knoll from Bosch and Law on uh, this gentleman from, uh, from Columbia University. And it was the first time I had seen his name. And so it was really yeah, so that, that was the kind of neat. That was the contact lens course. Oh, wow. period. <laughs> and the story, and then whatever you learn happened afterwards. Yeah. It happened afterwards. But the academy required. In order to become a diplomat, you had to be able to fit a scleral lens, lens and yeah. using moldite. Yeah. And what oh. happened, yeah, you know, as basically we smuggled in some anesthetic because there's no way you can put that shit in your eye. Yeah, no kidding. And say, stay still now. Because you so, can imagine if the patient's eye was moving right. during the molding process, you know, you have a pretty bad mold. Yeah, I mean, so. <laughs> what year did you earn your, uh, your diploma? In 1965, I think. And so that was being required at that yeah, time? Yeah, it was a very large class. Uh, the, the word was, you better get it now because it's going to get much tougher to do. But that particular part was separating the men from the boys because you had to learn not only to do it, but then to adjust it. And, yeah. were, and I was always very unhandy. I figured I'd cut my hand off with the burrs yeah. that, that they used. Um, oh, my. So, uh, Wonderful. <laughs> So we yeah. have glass lenses. Glass lenses and then... Yeah. Uh, oh, boy. Er, er, Boris and I was suffered. Oh, <laughs> my. So here we go to PMMA sclerals. PMMA sclerals. And, you know, it was uh, very uh, plastic. It was very slow to get involved into the... Uh, evolve into the contact lens industry. It was only after World War II that plastic really did replace glass. Yeah, as the World War II. Huh. The yeah. plastic star first started on airplanes. Mm -hmm. I see up there Ernst Abbey. Yeah, Ernst Abbey. Does that have anything to do with the Abbey value? Yep, it sure does. <laughs> that is it right there. He was the mathematician, uh, the brains behind the Carl Zeiss Corporation. and. Um, he was a brilliant mathematician. He developed this machine right here. This um, was it's like a, an early lensometer. It it looks like an early lensometer, but it's called a refractometer. And what it did is just measure the index of refraction of huh. the glass. Huh. And because when they were manufacturing glass at the time, they could never control the index of refraction of it. Uh, so each piece had a different index. And so what they had to do is read the index of refraction, and then they knew what radius to put on the front to create the power. There was a lot of math involved. There back was then. a ton of math involved back in those days. And, uh, but he was the one who really kind of uh, was at the forefront of that. Now I see back here there are corneal lenses as well as scleral lenses. Yeah, it's just like um, um, CDs and uh, VHSs. You know, there's that time uh, in space where the two cross over mm -hmm. and um, this was uh, really it in the 1950s. Uh, it was unsure which of the two modalities was going to really take over. Was it going to stay scleral or was it going to go corneal? And so you see a number of these fun sets that have actually both in them. Now here's the uh, Theo Obrick sets uh, out of New York. Uh, the one in the back was the original Theo Obrick uh, scleral lens set, and then the one in the front uh, is one of the um, later uh, sets. 
I like these glasses down here. The world of contact lenses. That is that really is cool. Bizarre. So um, WJ made them. Well, Newton Wesley uh, was the man responsible for kind of bringing contact lenses into the mainstream. Uh, so in the early 1960s, he marketed everything uh, to get contact lenses out to the masses. God bless him. Yep, and um, he appeared on the Steve Allen show, <laughs> and he was just this incredible kind of showman, but yet incredibly ethical. And, um, I yeah, never he was keratoconic. Yeah, that's correct. Do you have any stories? Well, yeah, he and he had a partner, George Jessen, mm -hmm. yeah. and George was a, a glad hander type of salesperson, and Newton was the front front guy with the research type of thing. Right. And uh, they they did everything, and they not only market glasses, but I remember they used to hand out ties. Oh, I've got one. It says contact lenses on it. Yes, I'm so, it's so funny you should make that you're the only one I've ever known right there uh, from the uh, Newton oh, Wesley is, yeah. Company. And, uh, but he, he was just this incredible marketer. Yes. And it was just so cool what he was able to do. That's good. Somebody needs to get the word out. Well, you know, and a uh, little known fact, it was Newton Wesley who founded Pacific University College of Optometry. Is that right? I didn't and, know that. Yes. He, uh, it's a rather kind of long and sometimes sad story because um, he founded it uh, but then had to give it up mm -hmm. and sell it uh, because of uh, World War II and the internment camp. So his two sons and his wife ended up in a, an internment camp uh, throughout uh, the course of World War II. And uh, it was here in Portland where the internment camp was. And um, uh, Roy Wesley, his son, is still alive. And um, he is on our board of directors of the museum because he's this incredible historian of uh, that era uh, of the internment camps and all the kind of injustices done uh, back then. So kind of a fun story to just uh, hear him talk about. Oh, and, I bet. Um, about his life growing up as a child in, in the camp. Right. So... And then um, over here, um, we have a couple other items. Uh, one is the Micon. This was the first commercially available contact lens solution that went into the back of a scleral contact lens. What is Micon? And, um, you know, it, it's, I'm not sure, I think it's a sodium bicarbonate. Uh, uh, system. What does it say there? I looked oh, it up. Oh, 2% sodium. Go. You were yeah, right. I was. Sodium bicarbonate solution. So where did the name Micon come uh, from? Now, that I don't know. It was manufactured by House of Vision in Chicago. House of Vision. <laughs> House of Vision, yes. It uh, sounds like a sketchy place. It <laughs> does. It, it, uh, like a haunted place. <laughs> Now, uh, next to it here is another one of those Wesley Jessen things. This was a research lens, um, and uh, patients were losing their lenses um, pretty easily when they switched to corneal. So what they did is they impregnated the contact lens with little uh, graphite particles. Uh, and then you would just pick it up with a magnet or find it. Are you it. kidding me? Yeah, so it was a magnetic. A magnetic contact, contact lens. Contact lens, and that's what it's actually stuck to is the magnet right there. Oh my gosh. Did that affect vision by having no, that into the no, plastic? No, it, it's sort of like putting fenestrations in the lens. They never really affected acuity very much, and uh, 
just a, a clever idea. So, but they never marketed it or anything, but it's just kind of cool to have a one of their... magnetic lens. Wow. Some magnetic. patients may like to have that option available to them. Oh, gosh, I thought it was so clever, you know. But it just shows you, you know, you've got a problem, uh, you know, this is how we're going to fix it. Who was the optician that brought the, I forgot his name, that brought, made the corneal lens popular? Was, oh, Kevin Tui? Tui, yeah. Yeah. Tui lens. Kevin Tui. That was the first one. We've got some of his early uh, things over here as we evolve from. It took lids of steel to adapt to those. That's for <laughs> sure. Uh, the, then we went from the sclerals into the. Uh, oh, we have a, a Tui contact lens fitting record back there. Yes. Yes, now that's kind of interesting. That's Robert, uh, Robert Ryan. Uh, Ryan. Now, Is that I a HIPAA violation, Pat? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a definite <laughs> HIPAA violation. Now, he was a famous actor. Oh, sure. Uh, back in the 50s. And, um, and uh, another that, famous person that's was Ronald Reagan. Ronald mm -hmm. Reagan. Mm -hmm. Yep. Maybe more contact lenses. More contact lenses. So, we had some pretty interesting things. Oh, so here's the little scandal, I guess, with Dennis England. His, he yes. tried to, he applied for the first U.S. patent. In 1945, I've got the original patent. Uh, Craig, um, I've got a Xerox copy, but Craig has uh, contacted the patent office, and we're going to see if we can get the original patent, uh, that patent application. And Kevin Tui um, preceded him. Yeah. Uh, oh no no no. Uh, sorry. Followed. Okay. Uh, he followed him by uh, two years, one month. Um, was uh, two years later, Kevin Tui took out his patent or applied for his patent. That was uh, in the fifties, I think. Fifties. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nineteen fifty. And then Bill Feinblum also. Got involved with scleral lenses. Yeah, and there's Bill's uh, diagnostic set. Yeah, You'll he, notice those green lenses there, and uh, apparently someone told me that uh, those were actually developed for treatment of an nystagmus. Huh. Now, Did uh, it work? That I have no yeah. idea. <laughs> no, uh, no. Yeah, I, wouldn't, I didn't know why it would work. Again, I wish uh, Bill was still alive. And, uh, you know, there's a, a, there's a Yiddish questions. expression, it worked like a toitan bankus, like a, a leech on a dead person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so did you know Feinblum? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. We well, used to, he used to yeah, work together. He was the man. Yeah, he was, yeah. uh, Bill, uh, what happened towards the end, he, uh, he, he couldn't handle the contact lens, so he referred to us. Hmm. But he was a tremendous promoter, and his main specialty was low vision. Yeah. Hmm. Right. And he was able to get his, his, his face on, on Life magazine, hmm. yeah. and he ended up having a tremendous practice on Park Avenue. And again, the low vision didn't work. But <laughs> it was... It was, but people kept coming I've got in. got that Life magazine with that, <laughs> his story, the Feinblum story. It's yeah. actually one of the really earliest um, he, he publications. Yeah. He was, well, actually, <laughs> his direct link was between Bill promoting and me. <laughs> Afterwards, oh, so, my. so I shouldn't, I shouldn't knock him. This machine, the Yeah, it's the only one I've ever seen. It, um, it again, another WJ product uh, from the 1960s, and you turn those dials, and it would bring, you would build your contact lens. Each one of those dials uh, put on a different radius of curvature. Wow. So you design both the anterior and posterior surface of the lens with that little, they call it computer, but it's just roller um, device. And um, it, a very, very cool thing, but. Did you ever um, use one? No, never used one. Uh, it's the only one I've ever seen. Yeah, those, those, uh, those tinted lenses are also very interesting. Yeah, those yeah, are from change England. Your, yeah. Change your eye color. Yeah, <laughs> remember, Caprice PMMA we, we lenses. Had this, oh, God. Somebody needed his eye color changed. Yeah. I forgot his name already. Well, I recognize something George, down George there. George Siegel. Oh, the actor, yes. Yeah, so he came Siegel. in, you know, he was, 
he was young and he had to play an Arab. He had blue eyes. So he had to play an Arab in some sort of film he was in. So Columbia Pictures sent him in. He was in New York in those days. So we had to give him one of those lenses. So I gave him the lenses and I gave him a bottle of anesthetic. So we were shooting because he, yes. he suffered with them. They were thick and they were terrible. Oh, wow. So he had to have dark eyes for the shoot. Did so. you see the movie? Afterward? Uh, no. No. <laughs> Maybe it didn't even come out. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it could be. <laughs> Who knows, many, yeah, many Maybe don't didn't. make it. I see a bottle of Playa gel down there. I haven't yeah. heard oh my gosh. Uh, in a long yes. time. Yes, uh, Playa gel and, and the ones behind it, the yellow ones, are called LC65. Um, they were uh, big items back in the 60s for PMMA. And what happened in the 50s and low 60s, early 60s? These lenses were very thick, and somebody came up with the idea of what if we fenestrate them? And they put four little holes in, and they called it the vent air contact lens. Yeah. So vent air, and then became, became a marketer for the, for the thing. They did a tremendous amount of advertising, and they ended up with offices all over the country. Wow. They were, vent air was one of them. There was one other company from Chicago. But also yeah, um, there was a spiro vent. Spiro vent had and, one. Uh, you just happened to have some of it right here. <laughs> yes, yes. Some of the, here's an original Tui uh, brochure. And uh, let's see, I don't know if I have my vent there out there. See, no, I guess I don't. After that, the lenses were so thick that the people were terribly uncomfortable, and that's when I went into practice. Mm. And Ted, my partner, worked for Ventair down the street. Oh, boy. And he sent people over to yeah. me. And then we came up with the bright idea. says, hey, if they're so uncomfortable we're thick, why don't we make a thinner lens? Oh, boy. So we formed a company called Micro Thin Contact Lenses, and we got one Orthodox Jew to work in Brooklyn in a lab, uh -huh. and he was the micro thin maven. He oh, was the one that, that did it, and we had a thinner lens. And because we had a thinner lens, we were able to succeed where, my, where Ventair failed. So we built up a very large Fantastic. PMMA practice in those years. How did Ventair feel about Ted? They didn't <laughs> know that he worked for us, <laughs> and then after that, after that. <laughs> He left there because the practice got big enough that right. we were able to. Now, to over it. on in this cabinet is the uh, early evolution of soft lenses. Mm -hmm. uh, soft lenses were developed by that gentleman there, Otto Wichterly in Prague, Czechoslovakia. He started working on uh, the material in the early 1960s. He actually started producing contact lenses in 1966, and those were the first soft lenses. They were called SPOFA, S-P-O-F-A, SPOFA lenses. Right there, right in front of you, is the first soft contact lens brochure ever <laughs> produced. That was in 1965. Um, and... Um, these uh, lenses here uh, really do represent the first team out for first soft contact lenses. I've got one hydrated there. The rest are stored dry. Wow. Um, the um, very kind of neat to have those as part of the collection. These were the original SPOFA cases from 1966. And um, about the same time, a uh, company in upstate New York and Toronto uh, started this uh, Bionite company, you know, which was a Griffin lens. Well, I've never um, heard of that. Yeah, that um, was the um, uh, high water content lens. It had about a 55% water, but you see it um, goes back to that same time frame as the Otto Wichterly uh, lenses. Oh, and there it says they were purchased by AO. Yep. And, and then, then became Softcon. Yep, and then became Softcon, exactly. And, and then pb and L marketed them very differently. They had uh, salespeople, and the first sales manager insisted that all their salespeople come in with dark suits. Uh -huh. So they were very, very formal, Very unique. Very, <laughs> very businesslike. Yeah. With, uh, 
with a vaginal lens. Uh, and now we're into the salt tablets and heat units. Salt tablets and then heat units. Uh, oh, yeah, this the, is the, uh, the scepter unit. range of the scepter units. The first one you see right here was the original Bosch and Loam one, uh, 1971. The FDA had no idea on how to disinfect these soft contact lenses, so this is what Bosch and Loam came up with. If um, you look kind of closely, that heater unit there was uh, actually a baby bottle warmer. <laughs> uh, they purchased them from uh, Gerber Baby Food Company and then modified the top lid to hold a contact lens case. So you filled that up. You remember the distilled water oh, that you put in there and, uh, and uh, push your button. And actually, it was a marvelous way to sterilize lenses because yeah, it was. after that, people, the cold sterilization came in, but unfortunately, they put thimerosal mm -hmm. into the solution. And that and was this one right here. This mm -hmm. was the first. And the red eyes started. The red eyes started uh, <laughs> big time. So you'll love these names here, Paul. The uh, normal, flexol, and oh, preflex. Yeah, okay. That will resonate yeah, with you. Names. Those are just so cool. Alcon Swirl the, Clean. Uh, yes. That sounds like toilet cleaner. <laughs> well, it does sound like Sorry, it. Alcon. The acceptor, the acceptor unit was something that the patients had individually. However, the office had very large units. Right. So you can no, right down here. So there they are. Yeah. I remember and, those and that, glass vials. And my that fingers particular on them. one ended up with a short circuit over a weekend, and our office burned down. Oh no! <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> the yeah. got to turn it off before they they, left. Uh, they lost so many an office fire. with that unit. Wow. And, that, was, uh, that was when you met me at the door and said, Dad, you can sleep late tomorrow. And I came back from the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, You know, this was, um, a, you'll notice that a lot of different cleaning systems were developed because at the time, we had to make soft lenses last a year. Right. Uh, they were replaced on a yearly basis, so a lot of heroic uh, things were developed to try to oh, extend the length of time. The, uh, matter of fact, we had one, one scheme. We met the developer woman who developed the contraceptive sponge. You remember Seinfeld Sponge Worthy? Right. It was a contraceptive sponge. I remember that. And it was FDA approved, and it had the ability that if you would rub a contact lens on it, you could clean it. And we say, this is what we're going to do. So how did somebody come up with that concept that this is a contraceptive sponge, I'm going to put my contact lens on there? I mean, where did that come from? Say what? <laughs> I mean, who would think of that? So, <laughs> and the chemicals, because it was a spermicide, yeah, right? So but, I mean, but, wonder what the chemicals yeah, would do so, to so the we, lens. We started dealing with this crazy woman uh, who, who had some company in, in Europe and Germany and it cost us at least six figures by the time we figured out it's not going to work. And then she conned us. <laughs> and so that, another scheme. Okay, so I'm glad to hear that you that talk was... talk about waste, my West Indian land, that was even worse. <laughs> but So that actually, nobody ever really did that. So she no, no, took we, you we for just, a ride. Okay, I'm yeah, glad to absolutely, hear that. Absolutely. I mean, not that you were taken for a no, ride, no, I'm not I, glad, no, but I that nobody was cleaning their lenses many on rides. a contraceptive That was only, that was only, yeah. <laughs> that was only one of the many rides. <laughs> I see CSI lenses back there, and yes. now I, what else did I see? Um, yeah. Lens Those Plus. Are... Now we're getting into things that I remember. Yeah. Those terrible vials that you cut your hand on. Yeah, yep. and do you have a, there it is. The crimper. The, the crimper. crimper. I remember <laughs> those things, and those oh, very yes. light, uh, the caps. Caps. Uh, that they were, were light, and then you put it on, and then yeah. when you try to pull it off. Yep, there goes your finger. Yep. And... Uh, so it, it's just so much fun. Then lenses, I never made it. Uh, the hmm. 3M lens, uh, called the Advent lens, uh, lasted in the marketplace just a few months, and it was a pure fluorocarbon contact lens. Uh, very oxygen permeable. They teamed up with Allergan to promote that lens, but it never made it. Uh, the Epicon uh, was another one that 
never quite made it in the marketplace. And then the Nike Max site down I remember here. That. You have um, Sil Soft in there? Sil Soft is right here. Yeah. Yep. Another one that worked beautifully. 100% oxygen permeable, but yeah. way too thick. So yeah. you, it was terribly and uncomfortable. so hard to remove, yes. too. It was a rubbery yeah. thing. It was Dow, Dow Corning owned it. Yep, and Dow gave, Corning, way to go. Man, this has got to be weird for you. <laughs> yeah. All these things coming back. And <laughs> yep. just, uh, you, you wonder where all that garbage is being stored. You know, I, I always ask myself, where well, is it Well, are you kidding? Stored? I mean, I, I've got these Gilbert and Sullivan operettas up here. That, <laughs> oh, you know, my. You know, oh. So, that's yeah, but I can't remember what happened to him yesterday. Yeah, me either. <laughs> me either. That's uh, the truth. Well, you've got a DMV in there. Yeah, we do, and and it looks like you have a designer case. Yeah, we do. It was a short period where Revlon bought out one of these companies. I, I uh, Hydrocurve. Uh, bought out Hydrocurve. Or Barnes Hyde. They got themselves a really serious PR firm in New York. And they sent me around the country to talk about uh, their their particular product. They were interested in, uh, in in tinted lenses in those days and changing eye color. And uh, but they they got me on morning shows all over the place by using a great PR firm. And that's when you did Phil Donahue. Yeah, you know, Phil Donahue came through that as well. Oh, these you'll remember. Now these were called medical alert bracelets, and uh, and they were developed for PMMA lens wearers who had been involved in auto accidents and maybe in a coma, because what was happening is people were wearing PMMA contact lenses. They'd be in a two-week coma. They'd finally look at their eyes and find a huge ulcer sitting there. So uh, these medical alert bracelets uh, made everyone aware of the fact that they were wearing contact lenses. And then uh, these old Shiatz tonometers, you'll remember those. Uh, oh, yes. Both you and I were yes. trained on those back sure. in the day. And, wow. Um, really beautiful instruments. and. Um, Obviously replaced by applanation tonometry, and uh, wow. so you know what you need. Oh, you do have it over there. I uh, see. Uh, you need. A, I was looking at this uh, trial lens that you need oh, a yeah. lens cabinet. Oh yes. I have a friend uh, at one of the practices where I worked, and she had one of those old. It was a big piece of furniture oh, with the lens. It was oh, beautiful. My. I wanted. Oh it. no, I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Those are, you know, they sell for a lot of money now, as yeah. you can imagine, because they are just beautiful. And uh, read this uh, Barbie doll. I thing. saw so, that. Ooh. Does it? Why do you? Why does it say "Looking for Ken"? Ah, uh, yeah, I, I just put that in there. <laughs> it's a little sexist, <laughs> yeah, Patrick. Yeah, a little, little bit, but. Uh, uh, on, oh wait, on loan from the Craig Norman Barbie doll collection. <laughs> yeah. That's totally awesome. Uh, yeah. We need to find out what other Barbie dolls Craig yeah. has in his collection. Yeah, yeah we, we really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got Eclipse glasses in yeah, there. Yeah, you know, it's part of our history. Um, 19, or 2017. <coughs> that, was, um, that was really interesting that we had done a story about how to protect your eyes during an eclipse. Very and there cool. were a lot, there was so much interest drawn during that very short window of time of people talking about that yeah. and, and vision and blindness and looking at oh. the sun. So it was a great, a great news hook yeah, and great PR sure for all of eye care. It was, it was a, um, a wonderful opportunity for eye care to uh, tell the story. And then we have a collection of eye cups there, mm -hmm. and this was kind of the original treatment for blepharitis. And I don't know why it went out of vogue, because it's still perhaps one of the better treatments for cleaning the lids and lashes, and very popular in the 30s and 40s. As you can see, a lot of different styles came out. And 
Well, maybe it will come back into vogue because yeah. neti pots are coming back into yeah, vogue. Yeah, yeah. Similar yeah. concept. Yep, yep, exactly. I mean, that looks like patent medicine, though. What is that, McElroy's lotion? What is that? Some of these were mixtures that you would put into the eye cup and uh, not sure what some of these uh, actually had within them, but you'll see in the forefront the uh, bicarbonate of soda uh, tablets. That's what was usually used. Baking soda? Um, yeah, yeah. Huh. And... Uh, this is really cool. And I now, see some uh, instrumentation up here, too. it starts over Placido here. Placido discs. Uh, these are all from the early 1900s. These are all keratometers, ophthalmometers. They look like satellite dishes of today. Oh, yes. they there was do. still some in my, in my school. Yeah. yeah. Was, Just like that. In, yeah, that's uh, the where we took yeah. position. You had, to, you had to get the axis on. Yep. And they, they rotate, and I swear that they could still be used today. You know, uh, the electronics would just have to be redone, but uh, other than that, um, they're uh, fully uh, functional. Yeah, this is the old slit lamps, too. Yeah, the old slit lamps, and um, you know, you really realize that very little has changed in, in the optics of eye care. Um, optics are just such a fundamental thing. So this is circa unknown for this clock, and I'm guessing 60s. Wow. Yeah, you know, some of this stuff I'm still trying to track down, you know. Um, I need to get out to Bosch and Lowe. Uh, so much of the history of optics in of this course. country originated there, and um, I've um, been in contact with their curator there, and a lovely person, lovely woman. American and, Optical still do? Uh, you know, that's the other one. American Optical in Massachusetts, are they still around? That I am not sure of. And uh, if they're still around, AO was a big, big company. And um, then uh, back here, we have um, um, some interesting things. One, this is our uh, uh, little humble um, uh, library. What we're trying to do is uh, also get all of the books ever written on contact lenses and um, any articles, um, brochures, anything related to contact lenses uh, we're trying to archive and, and save as well. Does the AOA library have? You know, I'm surprised the AOA does not have a very um, complete collection. Uh, they're, um, uh, I've always been kind of a little taken back by the fact that they haven't taken their kind of the history of optometry a bit more serious. In, and and um, Indiana also, they have the, the, history, the historical society. Oh, yeah. Which Yes, and uh, so we need to get involved with all of those folks. Now this, uh, here's a company you'll remember, um, uh, Milton Roy uh, company. Here's a, it's an American Optical, and uh, this was the original um, inventory system for fitting contact lenses. <laughs> And uh, they came in two diameters, 8.2 and 8.7 diameter lenses, all PMMA. And uh, yep. then, uh, but still a fairly complete set. So yeah, not many of those. Really? She wore PMMA for a lot of years. Hmm. And then, uh, of course, this is a bathroom, but of course we had to deck it out with all of this antique uh, <laughs> stuff and, and uh, so this is, is really quite fun and um, 
So really anything historical related to eye care, we, uh, we jump on, uh, Craig and I. This is uh, something you might remember too, the old uh, Leslie Jessen uh, photo periscope, oh, yeah. P-E-K is what it was called. And uh, again, that was uh, another WJ product. These are the projectors I used for many, many years. I know. <laughs> I know. Sure. See, the thing is, is that back in those days, that equipment never wore out. No. It, it's like these old, uh, old, these old greens refractors. Yes. Um, you know, they still are a hundred percent functional today. Uh, the the workmanship that went into all of these instruments was just unbelievable. And then the other thing that was always amazing to me is how heavy all of this stuff, because it was all made with cast iron, uh, especially this chair. Yep. Uh, this is pure <laughs> cast <laughs> iron and um, from the 1950s and yep. an old B&L keratometer. Who do you think that? Do you think he'd still work it? Uh, I bet you he well, could. No, I mean, it would come just, back to you. Yeah. This is a slip lamp. It's not. Yeah. It's, it's not a just. The. Um, and there's the Burton lamp. Yeah, the, the Burton lamp. The black light. Yep. People used to use this one I thought was very unique. It was on a uh, mobile stand, and uh, you would oh, wheel it around. Where's it in it? Put up the. So this is the Foropter? Look at how tiny it is. Yeah, that was one of the real early Foropters. Now here's one of the original Foropters, the Zang Foropters, and what you did here is you use your loose lenses mm. and you would put them in here and then your uh, auxiliary lenses, the uh, prism, would fold move into position, Maddox rods, all of these things. So this was the earliest of them. And then uh, they evolved into that one there. Wow. This so hard. this had a joystick already. Yeah. Mm. So this is a newer, yeah. newer model. That's a, that's a newer 1950 um, Zeiss. <laughs> newer. So yeah, newer. <laughs> As a matter of fact, most of the time I didn't use one. Mm -hmm. I yes. remember when I was in the uh, in the sixties, I joined the. Uh, I, they put me on the committee, the contact lens committee. There were very few people limited to practice, so even though I was very young, they put me on there. And basically, there was a problem because opticians in those days were the were the leaders in contact lens. Fit, fitting, you know, and delivery, but the optometrist said, no, 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 they, they didn't like that idea. I said, well, you know, what? one thing you could do is make it the state of the art that everyone has to have a slit lamp examination when they have, when they wear contact lenses. And then the AOA in their wisdom says, we can't do that because some of our, many of our members don't have a slit lamp and you'll estrange them. Yeah. So not only didn't they have sinks in their exam rooms to wash their hands, they didn't have a slit lamp to examine eyes. <laughs> but people survived. Yeah, they needed somehow. <laughs> Goes pretty. Hey, hi. Hi, how are you? Hi. See you tomorrow. You betcha. This sounds good. I love it. The... So is this yours or is this the school's? No, this is mine. Mine and Craig's. Wow. Completely. And, uh, now the story here begins actually in all of all places, China. Uh, China was the first uh, country to produce uh, spectacle lenses. And these are some of those early spectacles. Uh, many of them are made of tortoise shell and um, some made of brass. They found their way to Europe, and they think through the uh, 
Adventures of Marco Polo, that he actually then kind of brought back the concept. So they were introduced in the late um, uh, 1200s. So Marco uh, Polo brought the concept of eyeglasses, spectacles, in addition to mm -hmm. spaghetti. To spaghetti, there you go. <laughs> And both have had a big impact. <laughs> and then um, here are some of the earliest glasses made uh, in this country in the early 1700s. These were made by blacksmiths at the time. And so they're made of iron, but they were shaped and uh, then uh, uh, this, these are all from the mid 1700s. So what these, is a wig, what are wig eyeglasses? Wig eyeglasses had these little extenders on them. Uh, you'll notice the little bars, the oh, second bar. to stick in the wig to, to stay on. To stick in the wig. Uh, Interesting. So they were just referred to as wig glasses. And uh, then uh, in the late 1700s uh, were these models that uh, were available. So we're moving away from the entire round shape. We've got uh, some rectangular shape. Yep, oval. we sure do. Interesting. So yeah. even then we're getting into different lens shapes. Yep. But still the jewelers didn't get involved. And you can tell as soon as the jewelers got involved because the frames got incredibly elaborate. They're rimless. Yeah, Is that they rimless? were rimless, but wow. they were they were glass. They're all glass. Plastic hadn't come about until the 1920s. Mm. So very very slow on the uptake. Oh, and there's Franklin's bifocals. Yeah, that's an original 1700 uh, Franklin bifocal. Where did you find that? Uh, again, been collecting my entire life, and um, that's incredible. Yeah, yep. Yeah. The only thing that I miss about these glasses, and same thing with the context, you just wish they could talk. Oh, and of just tell us your history and tell us where you've been uh, would be just so absolutely fascinating. And then what happened oh, then? Pinchnez and then the Oxford frames, uh, very similar. Uh, the Oxford frame used a little spring to hold the, uh, the glasses on the eyes. And then it was in the 1920s that plastic first got introduced. Tortoise. And Horn tortoise rim. and beautiful, beautiful. You know, you look at some of these from the 20s and you go, I would wear those. Uh -huh. I mean, those are very cool. I mean, they're just incredibly cool glasses. Wow. And then we have the 30s, and uh, then these were glasses that were called inventory glasses made by American Optical. The doctor would um, buy them in these uh, boxes like this, and then he would put, he or she would put them together. The frames are right there, and you can see the different bridge sizes. Mm -hmm. And then the bows that went around the ear were what are called gold-filled um, material. Um, what they were... More expensive. Um, yeah, and you could see these uh, are all gold-filled as well. And, um, and you don't so, have these cases locked? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to edit that part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when, did male, when did male female glasses start? Hmm. You know, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. You know, the um, it uh, that's a good question because they were the same um, for many many years. These are just old ads, and uh, then um, a fake spectacle lenses. Mm -hmm. You remember mm -hmm. those? Mm -hmm. uh, you remember know, you're... the old a fake spectacle lenses? Oh, yes. uh, how <laughs> thick and heavy. People and, just couldn't, uh, yeah. they couldn't get around. Uh, 
So here are some of the old optics books. We have the Irv Borsch refraction book that you and I were raised on. And uh, that one's actually signed by Irv. Oh, wow. So kind of special. Pat, would so, you um, tell us how you came about this idea? What prompted you and Craig to start a collection? Well, you know, uh, like most collections, you start collecting things one at a time, and then one day you wake up and you find uh, you've got a museum sitting in your home in closets, garages, and we found ourselves in that situation and then uh, decided that uh, we were just going to open up a contact lens museum. How long did it take you to curate the collection in here? A long time and we, that's an ongoing endeavor. Um, you know trying to do something of this magnitude while you're working full-time and everything else uh, got full curriculum and back there it's um, it's, it's been very busy, but as you can see, um, it's just such a joy. It just brings so many smiles to so many faces when you bring older practitioners <laughs> through here because... Yeah, another relic in. Yeah, yeah well, it, it really, it's so true. Why do you want Bobby? I mean, I yeah, that's right. Oh, we'll put you in the chair. There you go. That won't be creepy at all. No, it won't be creepy at all. But no, you're so right. It's just uh, so many memories that come back to all of us that were touched by contact lenses. You know, it's uh, when you think about how contact lenses have changed so many people's lives of and course. changed their lives. All those keratoconus patients, and irregular cornea patients. It's it's humbling, you know, to you know be a part of you know having this history. So we we felt that uh, you know. Those are younger patients. Where do you get your lenses? You're nine years nine old. Nine years old. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Probably one of the younger contact lenses. Where yeah, you know, there in so many millions of people's lives have been changed so much with these. Now, if practitioners have anything lying around their basements or garages or the oh. back room of their practices, mm -hmm. would you be interested from in hearing from them? Yes, we'd be very interested. That's where we pick up a lot of these relics. Mm -hmm. um, every practitioner, literally everyone uh, out there, has one or two items that have been given to them by an elderly patient or uh, they took over a practice that, you know, had been established back in the 30s or mm -hmm. 40s. And somewhere in their archives uh, are these treasures, you know, that they've not known what to do with them. They hold on to them because they don't take up a lot of space. But they don't know, where, they know they can't throw it out. Right, of course uh, not. But they, they're looking for a place to send it. This is the place. <laughs> this is the place to send it. So. There, it can be archived, uh, taken care of properly. Um, we've, Craig and I have spent, you know, hours and hours learning about curating um, an optical museum like this. It's, uh, there's a lot that goes into it. We had to then uh, apply for a, um, a nonprofit uh, organization, a 501c3 with the government. We uh, got that, so we're official. So not only are you accepting items to be displayed here, you're accepting financial contributions to support yeah, the museum. Yeah, very much so. This has been totally funded uh, through gifts and so on, and by Craig and myself. And oh, that's it. That's a good charity for next year. Absolutely. That is. It really is. It's a lovely charity for uh, individuals in the eye care profession that want to see, you know, the history of uh, contact lenses preserved. So uh, you can see here we uh, uh, encourage donations and uh, so we, uh, yeah, we love it. You know, when people can, uh, when they win the lottery, 
you know, <laughs> send us uh, some of that, and uh, so we have fun. But it's um, we get the believe it or not our biggest support from uh, patients, so they feel this incredible emotional, you know, tie to these lenses. Sure. Now this is uh, actually just part of the collection. Uh, uh, a lot of it still is in storage right now. Uh, we need a, a bigger facility. When we opened this up in July, we opened it up with the knowledge that uh, we've already outgrown it. Uh, it's a good that, problem to uh, have. Good problem to have. And so we're just going to keep raising you know, funds as best we can and uh, hope to move into a bigger uh, facility as time goes on. And then this is, like I said, part of the collection. The other collection I'm going to show you is the uh, collection of antique glasses, uh, spectacle lenses, um, probably one of the finest in uh, North America right now, um, and that's across the street at the school. Um, so um, it's this has been just a passion for Craig and I, you know, this collecting. And, um, fortunately, we have wives that understand uh, the insanity because <laughs> uh, that's what it is. It's truly it's insane to be doing this. Uh, um, uh, but you know, Craig and I have been blessed so much, like you have like we all have, by the eye care industry. That, Very much so. Yeah, that it's just been a humbling experience to be a part of it. So this is our payback, or this is our legacy that we'll leave, you know, so. And it's a beautiful one. It's a start. It's, yeah, a, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful start. And so we're real happy, very, very happy with it all. Excellent. So. Many, many years ago, as you can imagine, the, um, it's really myself and Craig Norman who kind of put this all together. The story begins over here. I'll sort of walk you through. This is kind of the evolution of contact lenses. The, uh, all of these lenses here are made of glass. And so these were the earliest uh, contact lens company and Zeiss. So they were the three making glass uh, scleral lenses at the time. When did Obrick come in? Obrick came in in the uh, 1940s. How do you know that name? <laughs> I used to live with him. Uh, <laughs> oh my. My, I was just uh, <laughs> reading a, a book uh, this morning, uh, his uh, textbook from 1945 uh -huh. on um, contact lenses. It's really one of the earliest. Yeah. And uh, that is, what a coincidence. Mm -hmm. So all are, of- Are these companies related? It's, it's no, Muller Sohn no, and Muller Welt? No, they were different. Um, Families. Okay. Yeah, they had no uh, no relation, and uh, so these, uh, like I said, it's the largest collection of glass uh, contact lenses in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's um, they're hard to find, very rare, uh, wonderful to feel because they're incredibly heavy. Can can I touch one? Yeah. As a matter of fact, you can touch the one that is yours. Uh, we wanted, Craig and I wanted you to have this. This is a glass uh, really? scleral lens. Wow. And uh, it's all the contributions you've made to the industry. You deserve that. Oh, you are so <laughs> kind. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's kind of neat to have. You can see kind of how rough the optics were. Very rough. And, uh, but, you know, they got better with time. That's a real early one. Like what year? So, uh, this would have been probably early 1900s. So wow. between 1900 and 1910. But you could feel how smooth uh, yeah. the glass The workmanship was, was wonderful. 
but um, yeah, it's uh, that's definitely one we wanted you to have. That's very nice. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. This would be a real challenge to apply and to remove. Yeah, it really, it really is because of the size. Um, these were about 22 to 24 millimeters in wow. diameter, so they were pretty big. And then I see that they're fenestrated as Some well. Some of them were, and that's kind of unique. The number of them that were fenestrated. Um, you can imagine drilling a hole in glass can be a little bit challenging. And, a lot of breakage. Uh, yeah, but uh, I'm always surprised when I'm going through the lenses, the number of them that have uh, actually been fenestrated. And that would have been a challenge as well, not only drilling the hole, but making sure that the edges are smooth enough. Because oh, yes. That would have been quite painful had you applied a yeah. fenestrated lens that wasn't smooth. But then you look at these Zeiss lenses, the optics are absolutely perfect and they're incredibly thin. And I always wonder how many of those broke in the eye, you know, it wouldn't take much trauma that would have been to a shatter really those, problem. yeah. But that was unique of the Zeiss lenses at the time, um, they, uh, they were incredibly thin. Do you know who made this one, the one that you gave me? Uh, that one, yes, I do. That one uh, was uh, from the uh, Mueller Weld Company. Wow. Yeah, that one. Look from at these. There. And so then those are the molds right those there? Those are the molds. So that and is brass. Me, let and me then take you through how, let's say like it's uh, 1920 and I'm going to fit you with a contact lens. It would all begin over here. Um, May I sit in the chair? Yes, please. Okay. You sit in the chair again. That's where I sit. <laughs> I get comfortable in here. <laughs> and, um, now the molding process began by just simply mixing this compound. It's called moldite. moldite yeah. And we would mix it in one of these uh, containers and then uh, it would be placed into a syringe and this mold then would be placed onto the eye and the moldite compound injected through here and then it would take a perfect mold of the anterior segment so the molding compound would harden in about 90 seconds so you had to be real efficient with your time you had to load this inject it and uh, be pretty efficient so you have to do that on a board exam right yeah, absolutely <laughs> Jeez. and uh, then uh, what happened next was when you had that beautiful mold you would mix this next compound called cast stone and that cast stone then uh, was just like a, um, a concrete but incredibly fine powdery concrete and then you would let it harden and uh, then you would have this beautiful impression of the eye. Now back in the day in the before World War II a second mold would have to be made of brass and the reason for that is that when the lens was actually turned into a contact lens it um, was made of glass and the glass would just simply the heat of the glass would destroy the, the moldite so it had to be turned into a brass mold then it was taken over here, and this is probably the highlight of the museum in the fact that we have the only remaining glass contact lens making apparatus in the world. This really? is it. This is the only one left. Does it work if it you works. wanted to create a lens? Oh, you yeah. Could? Yeah, we've had it fired up, and you can see we've destroyed part of the uh, table from the firing <laughs> it up. and. Uh, uh, it makes a lot of pops and noises and now there was a, this vice was on the stand we don't know what its function was 
but uh, it must have had some function. The problem with this instrument is that nowhere can we find anything written on how to manufacture the contact lens or how they were manufactured. So we're having to piece it together little by little. Now, the... Um, if I push this, is something going to happen? Yeah, push oh, it. Push it? Yeah, push both of them. This one. Oh and my god! It still works. That's the amazing thing. We fired up these motors and um, uh, they were still working. Uh, this is incredible. So, uh, they, uh, now, the way it worked was you attach the mold, the brass mold of the shape of the eye here. Top two, I think. Perfect. Now, the bottom, yeah, no, you got it. You got them both. Okay. Good. And what would happen is you uh, had natural gas and oxygen that were mixed together. Those were, um, it wasn't propane. Propane hadn't been invented yet, so they actually used natural gas wow. back in that day. And so the gases were then mixed up here to the appropriate concentration and these valves controlled the amount of oxygen versus the uh, amount of natural gas. It looks like it's a very non-precise process. Exactly, exactly, very non-precise. Then they had these two by two wafers of glass uh, that were set right here and then this was just simply brought around once the glass had been molten and this just brought down and an impression made of the uh, contact lens. And that's the mold right there. And that's the mold. So you would of swap the that eye. out depending upon the yeah. patient you're creating this for. And then in this little container, when I got the instrument, uh, it was just filled up to about here with asbestos. Oh, excellent. So that uh, made it all complete. Uh, so then you would bring it back here, drop this mold, and because it was flaming hot from uh, being in contact with the glass, and it would fall into the asbestos where it would be cooled. And now with these little tools here, the residual glass would be broken away and then you saw over here how the edges were rounded and then the power placed on the front of the lens with, uh, with this. Now, the only thing we can think of here is that this was actually operated by hand the, to oscillate the uh, application of the power on the front side of the lens. That's all we can actually kind of surmise. We don't know how else it was driven. And, uh, but everything came with the unit. It was intact. And it's actually from, of all places, Perth, Australia. Don Ezekiel. Yeah, Don Ezekiel. And, and if anybody would have something like this, it would be it'd him. It would be him. And uh, you'll see as you go through the museum, Many of the pieces are from Don's collection, and that was probably the largest in the world. And he gave it all to us, so we're really super fortunate to have that. And he got his basement back. I'm sorry? He got his basement back. Yes, <laughs> he had his garage. He had, uh, had it in his laboratory. But when he sold the laboratory, it went moved into his garage. So he was kind of uh, grateful, but again, sad to see it all go away. And uh, but to have the only one remaining. Uh, now this is for this. <laughs> <laughs> A mechanical tool then, nothing yeah. to do with creating the contact no, lens. No, no, just strictly for changing out the gas. If you wanted to, 
Is there gas in there? Could no. you make one? No, we uh, we keep the uh, the live ones in my garage at home, uh, but these are uh, actually empty. And, so you have uh, filled ones if you wanted oh, to. Yes. I mean, I don't know that oh, I put asbestos there, sure. but you could create oh, yeah, a glass yeah. lens. We're the only ones in the world that can make glass contact lenses if you need one. Have you tried it? Oh yeah, yeah, we've tried it, and it's incredible. Just there's a lot of experimentation getting the temperature right, getting the just the exact amount of uh, natural gas and the exact amount of oxygen. But you could see that it uh, would be very easy to uh, to accomplish. Now, when PMMA came along, things changed rather dramatically because now it was possible to just simply use the mold itself rather than turning it into a brass mold. And what was used at that time then were these PMMA wafers. That's actual PMMA? Yeah. I thought now, it was cardboard. No, it's, it's it has this protective coating on it, and you just peel this away, okay. and then there's this beautiful yeah, piece sure. of acrylic plastic wow. for scleral okay. lenses. Yeah. Like That's really cool. Lot. Very cool. Turn off the and now, the you know. Actually, it, I love that movie. I would love to go hang out at the museum overnight and have things come to life. So I love that. Yeah. That would be really cool. I He'd wonder if Pat's stuff comes to life. Yeah, that's a good question. We should go there one night, try to sneak in and see. Didn't he say at one point it would be great if all those items could talk? You won't he know did. unless you spend the night at the museum. There you go. Then they'll come to life. So meanwhile, welcome back. We're here again. I hope you enjoyed the uh, museum thing that we just did. Right. I hope you uh, enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed going. It and was tremendous. We yeah. will pimp it out once again. If, dig into your closets, your storage units, find your stuff. Yep. Get things out now before you croak and move on into the next phase because your family won't know it's valuable. Contact Craig Norman and Pat Caroline to send these items to them. Let yep, them decide yeah. if it's valuable. Don't just throw it out. And also send them a check while you're at it. They there do you accept go. money. They do need uh, a bigger location to exhibit more of the collection. Mm -hmm. And they are nonprofit and they can't do it alone. So yep. don't just send them your stuff, send them a check. Yep, and uh, in the meantime, we have an interview coming up. We do. So, and it's gonna be with Jim Sluck. And let me actually pop this open while I'm dialing a number so you can see what it is that I'm talking about here. So, here we go. And while you're dialing that, it is 3 o'clock Eastern Time, so we are getting ready for eyelid lesions, evaluation and treatment. What are you going to do about subclinical eye disease? Custom soft lenses for keratoconus and beyond, and myopia. The new hot disease that is affecting billions, how do you treat it? So isn't isn't that a great title? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I call it a hot disease, yeah. but... Uh, but those are the classes that are starting now. So those that's our 3 o'clock Eastern block. And then after that, we've got three more full blocks. And then in our last 7 o'clock slot, one more. So, yeah, we're coming up to... Lots going we're, on. We're looking at the close. So we're, we're getting there. We are getting there. So let me pull up Jim's number here. And here we go. We can say hi to Jim. Jim. Hey, Jim. It's Adam and Gretchen. How hey. you doing? Hey, Adam and Gretchen. How are you? We are doing just dandy. How are you on this lovely Sunday afternoon? It is. It's a, it is a, is a cloudy but warm Sunday afternoon in Fort Worth, Texas. And I guess I'd be remiss if uh, knowing that you guys are two huge foodies to uh, wish you a happy National Pizza Day, I, I, I've heard. How did we not know life. that? So I had happy no idea. National I don't know how you did not make that list, and uh, and and it is also um, National Ham Net Day. So, uh, <laughs> congratulations Hamnet. on on both. Yes, happy Ham Net. <laughs> Absolutely, we might need so to change our, me. our dinner plans to to yep. now reflect pizza. And it is not. It is forty Amen. degrees here in Portland. It is not sunny. It is not warm. <laughs> no. Well, good friends, uh, good friends will uh, will make up for all that stuff. So, absolutely, I'm uh, glad you guys are able to be together and have me on. 
So We're glad to have you. Glad to have you here. And in fact, we've been talking about you and and um, and tear care and everything for the past day or so. So we've been getting into it. You know, there's a whole bunch of dry eye here. Yeah. It's safe to say, like, a, what yes. do you say? I mean, it, a lot it, of incredible number of dry eye lectures and products and stuff. And we've been talking you guys up, and I'm going to actually pop it up on the screen right now. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about what's going on with you, because the thing that I started harping on right from the beginning, as I started looking at all these products. It's sort of the evolution of tech, right? Like when MGD stuff came out first, I remember my dad's practice way back when, I guess it was decades ago now, they had these huge devices that mm -hmm. were like $100,000 and, and relatively complicated and the consumables were expensive. And what's shocking to me, looking at what's you know hitting the market now is just how much smaller everything is. It's kind of amazing how the tech has evolved. Yeah. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, if you think, and unfortunately, we're all going to date ourselves. And first of all, th thanks for again having me. And, and I'm super humbled considering some really good friends that I've I've just been chatting with or have seen um, coming through today, like uh, like Kathy Mastrada and and Susan Resnick. So I'm humbled to uh, even be around the same sorts of folks. And Steve, I know uh, Silverberg is um, is chatting back and forth with a number of folks. So. Yeah, great lineup again, Adam and Gretch. Um, congratulations. But, but you hit the nail on the head. I'm, I'm glad you recognized it. I mean, if we think about, and we'll date ourselves, if we think about the the, the uh, bag phones we lugged around 15 <laughs> or 20 years ago, and 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 you think about the you know the reality of the uh, you know the the printers and computers you had um, had far less. Uh, memory storage and capability than than the oldest of iPhones or oldest of Android phones. So, you know, we, you know, the, the industry has certainly recognized uh, the innovation possible over time. And, uh, and again, thanks for, thanks to people like Dr. Corb and Dr. Blackie for sort of shining the light on, on MGD and, and the ultimate need to, um, to seek treatment for MGD. Um, here we are today with a device uh, in, in our case, that's, Frankly, the brains are uh, the size of a hockey puck in our smart hub, and and uh, <laughs> the real, the really, the the real brains are even in a smaller, you know, device in in the smart lids, and and so, um, you know, again, thanks for recognizing that. But tech has certainly um, evolved to this point. And I think that it's fascinating with the size of this that you can put this in your pocket and move it from exam room to exam room, and that makes it so much easier that you can take the technology to the patient in exam room one, two, or three versus having it sit in an alcove or a room and taking the patient to the technology. Yeah, I mean, we, we recognize that early. I mean, it was, it was one of the, it was sort of a secondary thought, um, frankly, uh, Gretch. Um, you know, our founders and a lot of the development happened in, in Menlo Park, California, so Palo Alto. And, you know, whether you're in, you know, med device or whether you're in gaming or whatever, whatever the case may be, you're in a, you know, an intellectual, uh, you know, hotspot uh, and a very competitive hotspot as well. So, you know, you're constantly being pushed in that environment for, you know, better and smaller and more efficient and more powerful and so on and so forth. And that, and that really drove um, the sizing of the device, uh, you know, more than anything else. Now, you know, once that's out in in the market and the necessity for the size of the device as well. I mean, with with uh, the technology and innovation that the team was able to put into uh, this site sciences. But then once you get out into the market and you hit the nail on the head, it becomes a uh, portability becomes a super interesting uh, notion, whether you're moving it from room to room and it moves with the technician or the doctor from patient to patient, room to room. Or what we realized early on, and, and you had, um, you know, one of the foremost users of the tier care system on, I'm not sure if, if Susan Resnick talked about it at all, but, you know, the thing for Susan was she had a, a large device, uh, expensive device sitting in one office um, that, you know, her patients, if they were in Queens or, you know, in um, the Upper East Side or Upper West Side, needed to come to the middle of Manhattan for treatment. And so for her, it was really the notion of being able to take the device from location to location and office to office, um, you know, but either way, the portability became a really important idea early on, especially for those, um, those practices that were already, uh, you know, fairly adept at treating my bone gland dysfunction and, and had a, had a potent dry practice. Um, but for those that, uh, that aren't, again, the, the size and footprint is, is impressive to them that they're not taking up, um, 
you know, valuable space in their office um, uh, for no for no real good reason other than the uh, innovation technology hasn't caught up with uh, what their needs may be. So, Jim, as you know, there are quite a few devices out there for practitioners to assist them in identifying and treating dry eye. What makes tear care different from what's out there, and why should doctors take a look at this technology as opposed to something else? Sure. Sure. I, and I think some of it um, really, Gretch, starts with the notion of the company. So we, we, the, the story is a really kind of cool story. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful story of two really smart brothers. Um, one, David Bedow, who's a corneal specialist in Chicago, and his brother, uh, Paul, who's our CEO, um, and had been an NIH scientist and then an investor, a healthcare investor for a long time. And they'd sort of get together at these meetings and, and look at um, why more isn't being done in, 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 the case, in this case in eye care. Um, and they looked at uh, MIGS as, their, as an example, and they said, you know, why, why is it so traumatic to put in um, and, and do this sight-saving procedure potentially or, or drop-sparing procedure in some cases and, um, and then innovated around it. And then they sort of looked at dry, at dry eye and they said, why is it so expensive and time-consuming and footprint so large and, and why can't more people, if we know that the epidemiology is such that, that a lot of people should be treated, you know, why aren't they being treated? And, and it became sort of the DNA of site sciences, which is, you know, let's treat and, and, and look at a comprehensive targeting of, of a proven sort of mechanism and, and uh, difficulty in the market. And then let's think about ease of use. So let's make it a lot easier for people to use surgeons to use MIG devices um, and, and efficient for them to use MIGS devices and, and experience for the patient will improve if we can make it more efficient. And then they looked at sort of the, the MGD space and said, you know, huge epidemiology, a lot of people need help. Um, ultimately, we need to address the, the mechanism of the disease. Um, and we know that 86% of dry can has some element of, of, uh, of MGD. So what can we do to get to the, to the core? And then let's think about the economics. Um, that are good for the stakeholders. That's the, the ECP and the facility and the patient and and uh, and ultimately for us, obviously, as a as a growth based company. But you know th their story drives you know the whys. And so then you know to answer your question, uh, you know it's a beautiful story of, of brothers really actually putting a lot of their own money into this before we even sought any any uh, financing in the market. But um, you know then they they took a look at. You know, predicate science, again, and I, you know, all kudos to Dr. Korb and to Dr. Blackie for the work that they did over 10 or 15 years, if, and, and, and in Dr. Korb's case, much, much longer, um, and looked at, at, at how that procedure and how those procedures can be recognized, but also uh, made more efficient. And, and, and there you have the beginnings of, of tear care. Um, as a cornea specialist, so we'll start with the smart lids. I mean, as a cornea specialist, David believed, um, you know, one of the things that he wanted to do is spare the cornea at all costs. So, you know, we, we work um, on the outer lids and we heat to a temperature that allows the, the mybum to be efficiently um, heated mm -hmm. to the temperature, again, that Dr. Corbin Blocky recommended. Um, and then we, we express uh, over a 15 minute period, we, we heat the, the glands through the smart lids, which speak to the smart hub 240 times a second. Then ultimately, after that period of time, um, the the eye care provider comes in and expresses the glands, the warm, warmed uh, mybum, and um, and and with that, we we think we have a couple advantages. Number one, it's an open eye procedure, so the the body is working uh, for us the entire time, so you're able to blink. In fact, we encourage active blinking during the procedure, and and whether that blink comes as you're watching, you know. Um, Patient ed brochure, patient ed information on video, or you're um, sort of reading during the 15-minute procedure. Um, blinking is certainly encouraged, even though it's a, a spa-like experience. And I think that's a word Susan would use. Um, <laughs> but that that's one huge thing that makes it very different is is that you're in an open eye, you, you're having an open eye experience, and again recognizing the fact that we're we're really sparing because David believed as a cornea guy believed to really it's really important to stay off the cornea so we're heating externally and we're um, again communicating intelligently with a, a smart hub that that says that the um, that the procedure is started that the temperatures are appropriate and and tells us when the procedure is done 
Um, I think the other big difference uh, besides it being a very personalized open eye experience is the fact that it allows ultimately allows the eye care provider to personalize the treatment when it comes to expression. Um, and that, that's a big differentiator um, of the tier care system versus others. Um, you can literally uh, use the forceps to express some areas. As an example, Adam may have uh, a lot of uh, expression needed uh, nasal and lower nasal. And, uh, and it allows the practitioner to really get in there and maybe two or three passes to uh, evacuate the glands. But, but that's a decision that the, that the doctor is making and, and a personalization that is inherent to Adam's needs. Uh, Gretchen, yours may very well be a uh, temporal upper. Um, mm-hmm. And, and uh, the practitioner doing your procedure may very well uh, feel like it will take three or four passes to really fully evacuate those glands. And so, um, again, it's the open eye procedure that makes it very personalized. It's also the, the ability to visualize and sort of work um, to a, a very personalized, customized end in terms of what is being expressed and, and to the degree it's being expressed versus some of the other systems that are, that are you know, pure, purely automated. So they're not recognized, they, recognizing the fact that Adam needs more work on lower lower nasal and Gretchen needs more work on upper temporal. And, and we think those are really the two huge uh, difference, differences clinically. Uh, and then we've got a few commercial differences uh, as well. So. Right. Uh, so question, how frequently do you, people typically come back to repeat a treatment or is it, is it variable? Really, really great question, Adam. And because we're fairly new to the market, so we, we commercialized starting in April and we really had a very soft, um, sort of a soft, intentionally soft launch um, and really um, had a lot of units into the market by uh, the third or fourth quarter. So we're just starting to see folks uh, coming back. But I think generally speaking, in the studies that were done by uh, early studies by David Bedawi, we called people back at seven months um, and at seven months, we were still their 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 uh, their performance or their uh, glands were still uh, well performing well above their baseline um, their baseline measures in OSDI and uh, and also in um, tear breakup time. So I don't have a great answer for you there in that um, in, in normal circumstances and what I would call normal natural circumstances. These patients were not on Zydra or Restasis or uh, soft steroid. They were, they were uh, the only thing they were able to use in the study was um, rescue OTC lubricants. So in, in a real life view, we're, we're really not sure what we're going to see, but we know in a, in a clinical environment, we were seeing, um, seeing these patients back at six to seven months. Um, so I think it's safe to say you certainly will want to see your patients back at least at that point, but then it's the clinic, it's really the clinician's decision. And frankly, what we're hearing back from people like Susan and, and others is that, you know, these patients, um, you know, it's symptom that will drive the interest for treatment. So if at that point the patient feels um, that they they're ready for another treatment, then another treatment's done. Um, But we're really interested in looking at what the durability um, may be in a real life situation um, through phase four study and, and through, um, through some other study of the device in a more real life situation. But I think what we've seen thus far is, is six to seven months. Um, and it could be, um, could have more durability than that if we really waited until it got back to baseline. Right. So, you know, one of the things that fascinates me though about your product specifically is the business model around it. Um, you know, you mentioned Dr. Resnick yeah. and obviously I know her practice pretty well. And I remember mm-hmm. the first devices mm-hmm. that she had way back when, and these were, you know, big, and very, very steep investments. And of course, when you buy an instrument that's a, you know, six figures or close to it, you worry about how am I gonna actually pay for this thing, right? And you start thinking about mm-hmm. the, the amount of patient flow that you need. But it looks like, you know, trying to figure out the economics of your product, it looks like um, you've gotten the, the price point down so where that perhaps is less of a worry for most, most practices of a reasonable size. Yeah, I mean, and, and and you hit the nail on the head again, Adam. I think the you know part of the DNA at Site Sciences through again Paul and David Bedawi is, um, you know, we we've got to make and re- we've got to make this uh, economically viable for the clinician, for the patient ultimately. If if we want to make a dent in this 
terribly unpenetrated market of MDD you know, treatment with device. So, you know, Paul recognized that. <clears throat> Paul Badawi recognized that in in sort of the development of the device and also just our, our business model. Um, so we we've removed a lot of the barriers to becoming involved if you've got the ambition to be involved. And I, I think that we use the word sort of ambition and adoption a lot um, internally and, and, and externally, frankly, and, and Susan would say the same. Um, so we've removed a lot of the financial barriers to become involved. Um, so with that said, um, and that's the beauty, the, the thing that I've always loved about optometry is that there's so many sort of places and scope to practice. And, and so if you have an interest in, in dry eye, and if you have an interest in MGD treatment, um, there, we've removed the barrier to, to jump in and really do right by your patients with, with, through device, through a heating and expression device. Um, and so with that, anyone can frankly put it on a credit card at any, at, a, at any point. Um, but there still needs to be an ambition. So for our, you know, our business model, um, you know, we'll remove all those barriers, but we really will focus on those folks that um, either have other devices and, and need, uh, you know, secondary location or have other devices and, you know, 10% or 20% of the time uh, due to patient anatomy, they can't, you know, use the other devices, which I, I call sort of panel heating devices, whether it's um, J&J's device or Alcon's device, um, and, and needs some uh, more personalized focus placed on certain glands. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, the, the, but the model remains the same in that, um, you know, you have to have an ambition to adopt MGD treatment in your practice, um, and, and you, and we will help uh, sort of drive that ambition if you want to treat a number of patients, and every practice certainly has them, we'll, uh, we'll work with you hand in hand to make that happen. But the model is really, uh, you know, remove all financial barriers from your treating your patients, and then partner with you to, uh, to offer as many treatments as you have patients that need the treatment. Um, but it does come back to you've got to have the ambition to make that part of your practice because there are so many other opportunities, be it low vision, be it myopia control, be it uh, pediatric part of the practice, um, be it scleral lenses. I mean, there, that's the beauty of, uh, of, of optometry is that there are so many opportunities to focus in your practice. But um, if dry eye and MGD treatment is one of them, we'll, we'll be there with you hand in hand. So Jim, I had a question for you since you mentioned the economics. Um, you, if you have, tuned into the live stream earlier, you've seen or heard Adam run down all of the sponsors and thank you for being one and mention yeah. show discounts that certain manufacturers are offering for their products and you are not offering any for this, uh, this device at this meeting. Can you talk about why that is? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, well, first of all, again, it, it it, it, it lives in our DNA. We, we have already, you know, we've got a device that frankly is $1,500 for the smart hub, um, which is a fraction of the cost of any other device in the market. Um, so we've recognized price already to make it easy for, for folks to get in. Uh, the disposables are, are uh, $250 for a smart set of smart lids. So that's a patient treatment. Um, and so we're in a place already from a financial perspective that makes it very, very easy for you to jump in. And if you're making a choice, um, it, it's the most economical choice already. So the, the need really doesn't exist for, um, for show specials. And we did some um, early in 2019. And ultimately what we recognized is, um, you know, we really are seeking to work with those folks that have the ambition to really use the device and to, and to jump in and, and, and give the patients the treatment that they're seeking. Um, and with that, I mean, we'll we certainly work with folks as they get up and running and if they feel like their volumes are such that they can do a number of treatments. Um, but at this point, we're at a price point that is so, um, so uh, in line with our uh, sort of our corporate DNA to remove barriers. And we're so in line and we're, we're offering such an advantage to other pricing, uh, pricing of other devices in, in the market that, you know, again, there just, there isn't room for more discounts <laughs> against, I mean, against this at this point. And, and again, I think it removes the need for, I mean, we really want to work with the people that have the ambition that frankly may have a, a lot of different things in their practice, maybe using Blefex already or, and certainly maybe using, uh, you know, selling a nutraceutical or, 
other dry supplements and so forth, omega-3s in their office. And now they're at that point where it's sort of like, it's time for me to take the next step. I'm, I'm wanting to take the next step. I'm seeking a partner, um, you know, a low risk, frankly, partner that will partner with me and help me sort of develop my dry practice and take it to the next level. And I think that's the sort of the folks that will step up and say, it's hard to recognize that this isn't the most economical choice uh, in, in, in the sort of the big three devices that are out there now. And, uh, and we'll continue to work with you hand in hand and making it a success in the, in the practice. But long answer to a short question, you know, the economics are already sort of built into the pricing. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I figured. And 1500 bucks. you were right about a credit card. I mean, there are iPhones that cost more. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right. And yeah, I, good point. I appreciate your willingness to be transparent with that answer because yeah. sometimes uh, people do wonder if there are certain companies that are offering tons of show discounts. Well, shoot, why don't we have one for tear care? And you had a good reason for that, so yeah. I wanted to put that out there and give you an opportunity to speak to it. Well, Gretchen, as I said, we, we and, and we weren't, uh, um, you know, we won't throw stones because we've been there. Um, what we found over the year from a commercial perspective is that it really didn't drive someone's ambition. Um, it, you know, and, and we talk about, you know, we talk about, and we use a lot of analogy, we talk about, you know, we really don't want this to be the, um, you know, the uh, treadmill sitting in the corner of your office with clothes on. <laughs> on. We really we we want you to be able to and and that's the danger of having a, you know the price point that we have but we really want to partner with those that are ambitious about adoption of the device um, we know that there are a lot of patients that every single uh, viewer listener uh, that's in practice out there can can absolutely apply uh, in your practice because we know that the epidemiology just says it's true so um, we've been there but again it, it comes down to our model and I think the model that um, that says treat the patients that need it is the model that says um, that, that dictates, um, you know, the partnership in this and, um, and, and show discount. Um, and we don't want you to make a, a quick decision based on show discount. We want this to be right for you. It's not right for everyone. Uh, MGD device treatment is not right for everyone, although everyone can certainly, you know, apply it to your practice. Um, and the same can be said for scleral and the same can be said for low vision. The same can be said for myopia control. Uh, but if you're not, quote unquote, into it, um, you know, we don't want it to be the uh, the treadmill in the corner of your office right. with uh, white coats sitting on it. But you see, here's where I disagree with you a little bit. I think every clinician should be into it, right? Because when those glands are dead, those glands okay. are dead. And, you know, doing yeah. something is better than doing nothing. And if this is your, your introductory step, you know, why not make that move? I won't argue with you, Adam. Um, I think we've what we've learned in a short period of time, and I think what what um, you know, Dr. Korb and, and the team at Tier Sciences and and J and J has learned is that, uh, however, that there still needs to be uh, an interest to do it. Yep. Um, you know, the, the, we've been talking about uh, Jim Murphy at Alcon started talking about the need to to apply sort of a dental model to dry eye uh, six or seven years ago. Dr. Korb has been talking about it even longer. Um, and we still have folks out there that uh, don't have, uh, a, you know, an interest in, in, in it as, as much as we'd like. Um, so I, I agree with you, Adam. But I, as a, as a, as a commercial organization, we've got to sort of um, speak to where the or, or address the market uh, interests and market needs. And um, and again, uh, we're we'll talk to everyone um, and and would love to sell a tear care device to everyone. But at the end of the day, we really want. Uh, those patients to be treated that need to be treated. And I think that would affect, positively affect your spectacle sales, certainly positively affect your, your contact lens sales. I think uh, J&J showed that, Tier Sciences showed that in terms of their, um, their contact lens duration study. Um, so there are, there are a lot of advantages um, to treating the meibomian glands uh, and, and with device. Um, and we're here for those that have the ambition to do so. Yep. Jim, is there any uh, training required for the doctor or a staffer who are working with the patients? Really, that's a great question. Um, and I would say um, there is some use technique, um, for, for lack of a better word, uh, Gretchen, in that, you know, our staff would come in and help. Um, you know, we generally will do a demo in the office of those uh, ambitious practices that really want to get started. We do a demo in the office, sort of show the staff how to get the smart lids on, um, talk a little bit about the technology with the doctors and staff and, and administrators. Um, 
but the but the reality is, um, once the smart lids are um, are on, um, it's really a set it and forget it procedure for 15 minutes. Now um, there there are some techniques, and we we have the um, expression techniques available online um, to expressing the glands. But again, frankly. Uh, for those folks that are using amniotic membranes, for those folks that are putting in plugs, for those pr folks that are removing foreign bodies on a routine basis, this is, um, you know, it's an expression technique and everyone's got their own and everyone has their own sort of device, whether it's the Mastrata paddle or um, the clearance assistant we provide or some other forceps you, you prefer. But generally speaking, it should not be a foreign, you know, expression should not be a foreign uh process or procedure for, for any uh, practicing optometrist in the market right now. Totally agree. Totally agree. I'm really yeah. glad so that... It's not, it's not difficult. It's not time consuming. I'm really glad that we had the opportunity to chat with you and find out more about this and just offer some more insight into those, for those doctors who might be interested in taking a look at tear care and finding out why it's different from other devices. So this was, this was great, Jim. Thanks so much. Hey, Gretch, thanks to you and to Adam, and keep doing the great work that you guys do. And, um, and again, uh, thanks again for having me on to talk a little bit about site sciences and a little bit about uh, tier care. And I think we've got a place for your audience to uh, stop in and, and see us or seek more information. And uh, we'd be happy to, to work with, with folks on, that have that ambition to go to the next level and, and start to treat MGD with, uh, with device. So thanks again for having me, guys. Oh, Excellent. thanks for coming, thanks, Jim. and thanks for supporting CE Wire. You got it. Have a great day. You too. You too. Bye. All right. I like talking with Jim. Yep. He's always going to give you the straight answer, and I appreciate that he was really willing to talk about why um, Site Sciences doesn't offer show discounts for their new well, technology. And it, it drives me crazy though, you know, he's talking about ambition, like really every clinician has a, po has a population of patients that they're seeing, whether they feel like treating them or not, that will have MGD. Mm -hmm. And you gotta do something about it, right? Those glands will die if you don't treat. Right. And so, you know, here we have a technology, we've reached a place where it went from being incredibly expensive and difficult now to be in incredibly cheap and easy. So this may be the point where you just want to jump on. I liken it almost to the camera that we're using right now to actually shoot this, right? I mean, it's a low-end version of a very high-end movie camera. But it just it gets you into that point where you can actually get something that's functional. And it's the same right. kind of thing, right? You're, you're on that ladder now. And I think that if you've never done this before, you probably should step on board and give it a shot. You're, you owe it to your patients, right? Right, right, right. And we have another call coming up. Oh, yes, we do. Oh, and more about dry eye. That's right. Go figure, right? <laughs> Big topic. <laughs> um, well, one of the dry eye queens who makes things fun, we're going to be talking with Dr. Laura Perryman. Yes, we are. And, and before we hit that dial button, can I talk really quickly about where we are in terms of class? You may, and I will actually try to find her number, too, if I didn't oh, wait, totally here. blow it. Oh, there Sorry. we go. <laughs> okay, so right now it is 3.30 on the East Coast, and we are looking at halfway point. At four classes here, we've got eyelid lesions, subclinical eye disease, custom soft lenses for keratoconus, and myopia treatment. And coming up at four, and that's one o'clock Pacific, that's in about 30 minutes, we're gonna be talking about changing lives with lenses, a new approach to vertical, I can never pronounce this word. <laughs> Wait, what, where, what is it? Heterophoria? Heterophoria, yep. Thank you. I can spell things, I just can't pronounce them. Uh, and Laura's class, uh, Dr. Perriman's class, is coming up in 30 minutes. The Dow to Healthy Beautiful Eyes, exploring the dermatologic, aesthetic, and ophthalmologic aspects of ocular surface disease. Wow, Whoa, that's a mouthful. It really is. We also have another myopia class, slowing myopia progression one child at a time, and a third myopia class, which is myopia, oh wait, is that a, that was a two hour class. I it's didn't a two hour that. class, yes. It was kind of awkward looking on the schedule, but it's two hours long. Then my apologies, then that three o'clock class, which we're now uh, halfway through that time slot, we're a quarter of the way through this slot on treating myopia. So we've got a couple of myopia classes. We so. sure do. Excellent. All right, so let me see if I got this number right, if I didn't fat finger this one. Uh, never easy, right? Okay, <laughs> so. Oh, Dr. Perriman, where are you? Hello. 
Hello. Hey, Hello. Laura. How's it going? <laughs> Hi, guys. How's it going? We need some of your energy. Oh, we do. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, I got lots. I know you do. Oh. I know you I'm do. I'm about to share. You need to bottle it and send it over <laughs> this way. How are you today? Um, good. It's actually day here, which is about as common as hen's teeth. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to... And I'm really glad I don't have to get on camera because I ain't looking so cute. Oh, dear. Well, we, we are running ourselves ragged here. I mean, we've been on camera now for two days, and we've been dealing with stomach viruses around the place and, and all kinds of... Oh, no! So, yes, so yeah. we look like death here for you, so oh. we're cool. Yeah. We're cool with that. Oh, I had that last weekend. That was no joke. Oh, oh my gosh, you poor people. Yeah. Oh, my... Yeah, this is this has been a bad one, but uh, yeah. it was worse than pregnancy nausea. I'm, that was it was bad. Oh dear. Well, at least you get something good out of pregnancy nausea. That's true. <laughs> oh my gosh! So meanwhile, so, um, we we submitted your course to Cope. You know, your the course that you did, and they said, "Is that really the title of the course? Because it's so long, we've run out of characters on the oh, no, the field." Oh, so there. Uh oh. There you are. It, they asked you, is that? Oh, is that really the title of the course? Because it's so long, we ran, almost ran out of space on the field for the title of the course. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are breaking new ground here. Yes. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so uh, why don't you tell us all about it? Because are we I'm, live, by the way? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, yeah. We're, when we're, we call, we are on old. the air. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, good to know. Hi, everybody. I'll try not to swear. <laughs> if anyone's in danger of swearing here, yeah, that it would be, would be me. That would be her. <laughs> I, I love it when you let loose, Gretchen. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, so, yeah, so I was curious, awesome. what is this What is this course? You know, I, I, the, the title was so intriguing, and I'm like, yeah. wow, that's, that's kind of cool. So How did you come up with this concept? The Tao. Well, um... So my crazy brain, right? I, I survived medical school by creating uh, stories out of lists of things I had to memorize, right? Oh, really? So, um, oh yeah, I'm the queen of acronyms. So it's <laughs> and like little tiny stories. So, um, so if you're memorizing the nerves and the vessels that go into the orbit, it's uh, luscious French tart, French tarts uh, await anxiously in anticipation. So that's how you know from severity and fear. Oh, wow. the okay. yeah. <laughs> right. So like the whole, <laughs> the whole concept of uh, your memorizing list, that's how I came up with the Bisto, RAR, the six interrelated mechanisms of MGD. It's like you, you, those white papers are incredible, huge fan, but how do you translate the white paper science language into something that's memorable and that's approachable? Right. So right. That's where stories come in. That's where acronyms come in. So the Tao is, uh, you know, I, I think of, you know, a wise man on a, or woman, wise woman on the mountain um, and showing you the way or talking about the way. And the Tao is a Chinese idea of the way to truth, the way to peace, the way to harmony. Well, and that's very appropriate. That's exactly what I'm talking it? about. I'm, I'm talking about blending dermatology, aesthetics, and ophthalmology and bringing all of those together into one umbrella I like for it. beautiful, healthy eyes. Because they all affect each other, just like the Bisto and the six interrelated mechanisms of my bone gland dysfunction. It's all this interrelated mismatch of things that pull on each other, that push each other, that can help or harm each other. And so if we can put all of these things that our patients do into this beautiful harmony, oh, now we're getting somewhere. Right. So I that's like the that. whole thought behind pulling all these disciplines together into a cohesive whole in a story. I like it. I'm crazy. <laughs> well, I'm, I may not disagree, but that doesn't mean you're wrong. <laughs> so I don't think you're wrong. So, you know, something interesting just happened. We were just on we were just on the phone. I don't know if you heard the interview just before you. We were talking to Jim Sluck at Site Sciences mm -hmm. and talking all about tear care. Cool. And, and he said something that, that I found really interesting, you know, he that they want to work with clinicians that have the real interest. No, right? no, no. Or and sorry, not ambition. 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 Excuse that me. Is ambition. Their term. And I found that very interesting that they chose that word to mm. use, not interest, not yeah. desire. Ambition. ambition that means mm. something different uh -huh. it does indeed that's like putting action to your desires and wishes that's a different animal altogether that's the next step Absolutely. you can start out with a dream 
Absolutely. But a dream without a plan is, just, is inaction, ambition. Yep. Oh, I like that. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of wondering. And that's I, what we're always trying to create as a community, right? Right. And I mean, obviously. How do you translate into. You, yeah, because mm -hmm. you have that ambition, right? You have that drive. You can see it in all of your lectures. The question is, how do you get other people on board to really be interested and excited in it? Because as I was thinking about it, I'm like, everyone at some level should be interested in this, right? Because you're seeing people every day who have this problem, mm -hmm. whether you want to treat it or not, it's there. And by ignoring it, you know, you're, you're actively doing harm to someone, right? Because once the glands are dead, they're dead. So I guess my question mm -hmm. for Jim and for you would be just how do you get people sort of motivated to do something now that we have the technology that can actually help? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's an awesome question. Um, I have been educating for a very long time, and I find that there's multiple barriers that clinicians have. One is uh, the perception of time, the perception of cost, the perception of um, effectiveness. And for the longest time, those were all big barriers in dry eye management. We had plugs and artificial tears when I went through training. Then we got cyclosporin restasis, awesome. Now we can address the inflammatory component in a steroid sparing way. And since then, we have this amazing good fortune of dovetailing in all of these awesome, effective, approachable, integratable modalities, technologies, devices, mm -hmm. such as tear care into our clinical practices. And so now that that lofty barrier of like, oh, you can only get cyclosporin and peanut oil made by a special guy in a dark room in a custom <laughs> pharmacy, <laughs> that whole idea. <laughs> Maybe there's a hump on one shoulder, you know, <laughs> right. to go from that to all of this stuff is accessible. But then the flip side of that is it can become overwhelming for clinicians. And so that's where, um, that's where things like CE Wire, which is such an amazing community platform. Thank you for doing all the work that you do. I mean, huge hats off to you for the organizational Thank you. mountain <laughs> that you climb every year in creating this amazing community for people and resource. So thank you for that. And it's awesome to participate. And it, so I love it so much. Um, th so the barrier or the way to, to make it digestible, approachable, fun, for overwhelmed clinicians is the challenge because in our day-to-day -day reality, we are under the thumb of insurance companies, prior authorizations, which is utter BS, by the way, um, administrators, the pressures to see more patients and do more with less time and fewer resources and less staff, like that's the counter pressure. So whatever we can do as a community, colleagues, industry, forums like this to quiet the noise and lead the path in, uh, to decrease resistance to all of those forces and factors on our colleagues is where the challenge is, is where the discovery is, is where the fun is. I like it. And we get there by telling stories and telling jokes and making it fun and sexy and cute and funny and <laughs> memorable. And this, this is, it, if you can engage that curiosity and fun factor, it helps a lot. Absolutely. So, and that's always, of course, why we have you back here year after year, right? Because uh, you actually keep things entertaining. You know, so many lectures, we, <laughs> you know, they, you look at the schedule and you're like, oh my gosh, how am I going to survive this? But, you know, you, you keep it fun and light, which is really great. So thank right. you for coming back year after year and doing this. <laughs> oh, so it's, we... it's my sixth year honor and privilege. There's a lot of science packed into that spoonful of sugar. <laughs> <laughs> so Paul has a question for you. And he said, speaking of dead meibomian glands, when should you factor age into the treatment? When does age affect the glands even more than everything else that's going on? Does, does that factor in and what do you do and how do you, how do you consider that? Uh, well, it's a great question. So on one hand, we know that MGD increases with age, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean we ever give up. Like, if, if I'm 90 and my eyes are killing me, I want you to offer what you got to make me more comfortable and to enhance my quality of life. Like, I'm not going to make that value judgment on who's too old for treatment. My job is to present you with the options and to do everything I can to improve your comfort, your visual performance, and your quality of life. So I don't think age is a factor at all. I don't give up. Well, of course you won't. If anyone is not going <laughs> to give up, it will be you. But I... <laughs> 
I think that was a great question. Absolutely. So can you, yeah. tell, can you tell us just a little bit about the intersection then about um, the aesthetic and the dermatologic? Because obviously a lot of uh, ODs already have the eye care aspect of it covered, but the derm part of it, I think, is a little different because we've heard a bit about the aesthetic for a while, not as long as we've heard, obviously, all the clinical parts, but aesthetic we're getting into, but the derm part is really fairly new for most eye care practitioners. Yes, right. Um, and I would suggest that uh, that we do need to pay attention to that aspect because the skin is the closest neighbor to the eyes. And I think some of our clinical diagnostic comorbidity assessments of patients, particularly the ones that aren't successful, quote unquote, with our current strategies, you have to zoom out from that foot lamp view of the eye, zoom out, start looking at the neighborhood. What are the loads looking like? Do I see telangiectasias? Do I see rosacea? Do I see atopic dermatitis? Do I see um, seborrheic dermatitis? Do I see somebody who's misusing neurotoxins for age management? Do I see um, uh, bad skin care ingredients being used? Like all of these things dovetail into what's happening on the ocular surface. So that's, it's an invitation to zoom out, think a little bit bigger. And then the next step after that is the, the human itself, the entire person. And that, that'll be next, next lecture. So I'm, I'm sure <laughs> well, and, and if I, if I, if I make <laughs> I just it, gave it away. I say, should I, should I stop right there? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the thing is though, for, for a lot of people, spe specifically of my demographic, you're speaking at a level that's so far above because, you know, for, for people like me, right, men of a certain age, right, we, <laughs> We know like literally nothing about this, zero, uh, particularly around the cosmetic angles to, to a lot of the stuff. And it's because it's, you've chosen not to uh -huh. learn. Well, we've had a lifetime of being, you know, sort of shielded from all this, right? We never really thought about it. It's not part of our daily experience. You don't wear guy liner, Adam? Can't you tell? <laughs> um, I mean, so, it's, it's, I would love to do a makeover for Adam. Oh, oh my God. God. I will pay cash money. <laughs> a, nice, a nice wing with his liquid guy liner. That'd be awesome. <laughs> you would totally rock Laura, that. Laura, we are totally going to do that. Oh, we God. totally are going to do that. We're going to glam Adam up. And you will have his wife's full approval. Uh, but at least I know whatever you do to me, it'll be I okay for it. my eyes, right? I, I won't get any dry eyes. So, um, oh, but, you, can, you can count on that. <laughs> But that's seriously, a, that's like, a truth. but this is the thing. So we're having like your lecture. I, Jen Lyerly gave a lecture too. These are things that you know. There's uh, large, you know, parts of the population that have no idea about this stuff. So I'm very glad that we're just kind of getting this into the conversation, uh, and it's become sort of an acceptable yeah. thing because it's obviously always been there, but it's been ignored. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Right. Have you spent any time on Instagram recently? I try not to. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> if you're curious. I put in the search term man makeup. Oh, God. And the. Uh, That'll probably no, get no, you but results it's not, you may like, not want. Yeah. <laughs> Safe search on. <laughs> but but it, it, goes, it goes from subtle. Right. was in the Harvard Visits Review just this last fall. Men are wearing makeup to job interviews. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there, there's definitely that cosmetic thing that's coming about. And these are, you know, this is becoming mainstream. Okay. So that's, that's one thing. The other thing is men think they're immune to this discussion about the Dow, but they're increasingly concerned about age, skin care, especially those under 35. So this, this wave is coming up. It's going to be exposed to all the same things. And then Adam, to your point, like your demographic and how you think about skin care, it's like, oh, I'm just going to grab whatever's cheap at Bartels or CVS or I hate CVS, by the way, um, <laughs> Costco, whatever this is. Oh, dermatologist tested. Great. I'm like, oh, um, what's in that? Have you looked? Yeah, tested and, for and so what? <laughs> men get into this bad habit of using what's cheap and quote unquote dermatologist tested, but that does not mean it is dry eye friendly. Right. And so I see people all the time. In fact, this is a question in our intake form. What do you use to wash your face with? And the vast majority of the time, it's Cetaphil or CeraVe, yep. which is dermatologist tested. It's like top brands, right? Cheap, drugstore, whatever. Full of parabens, not one, not two, not three five different parabens, which are known offenders to the meibomian gland stem cells. And so, you know, men in their simplicity with their 
I'm, I'm, forgive me, I don't mean to overgeneralize. Oh, you're not overgeneralizing at all. I, I, just taking care of it and having skin. I, I use Cetaphil, so you're uh, not overgeneralizing at all. You had my, <laughs> you had my number from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. I, I, it's not even good. At, I wouldn't even do it to my dog. Um, I love my dog, but it's it's just not ocular surface friendly. It right. has no business any, being anywhere near the eye. Mm -hmm. And so men who are trying to save time, and maybe they work out twice a day, they've got the Costco-sized seed fill in their shower, yep. and they pump, pump, rub it, and then all over their face, their eyelids, everything, and then rinse it off with the shower. They've effectively stripped away all of the delicate mybum that their glands have slaved to create. Yikes. They're inducing a desiccating stress on their own eyes. So this is where the Tao applies to men, too. Not like only the it. ingredients, but your practices, your exposures, um, and then your sunscreen, right? Mm -hmm. So same problem. Sunscreens are full of ocular surface and friendly ingredients. I mean, we know how bad it stings when it gets into your eyes. Right. I have um, a hot tip for that. There's uh, just a quick segue. Uh, Trader Joe's Mineral Sunstick. Hmm. Clean well, first, and gentle enough for a baby. Oh, Trader amazing. Joe's is Trader awesome Joe's in mineral so sunstick. many ways. Yeah. But their sunstick, not their spray. Um, that's really clean. And then the other uh, thing I really like is um, this Canadian sunscreen company, Kinesis. K-I-N-E-S-Y-S. -S. Um, now, it's a chemical sunscreen, not a mineral one, but it, has a, it stays really well, layers under makeup, layers under moisturizer, and it doesn't uh, sting as much as your other sunscreens do. Hmm. So sunscreens have parabens, formaldehyde donating preservatives, all these other ingredients that also impact dry disease. So I think we have an opportunity here to be much more mindful about what we're putting around our eyes, around our face, not only in everyday practices, but medical diagnoses, systemic diagnoses, in addition to everything that we're doing for the dry eye patient. So it's just it's zooming out and then zooming back in and just taking a bigger picture of the whole thing. And I realized that uh, this that is, makes sense. it does, and it's going more mainstream. <laughs> you actually, if you look up on the screen that I just popped up here, just a quick search of Dr. Google, of oh. course, brings up things like Glamour Magazine, right? Mm. Where people are starting to really talk about this and take it seriously in the form of articles. Um, oh, there we go. The best makeup right. for dry eyes. Let's see. If we scroll down. Where are you at? Are you on... Uh, uh, so just, yeah, so I'm just on the, the live stream. You're a couple of, if you're watching it on your screen, you're a few seconds behind us, right? There's like a seven second delay, but I'm just... Uh, uh -huh. Oh, there I am. Okay, enter now. Uh -huh. Yeah, so anyway, you, you might not want to turn it on because it might kill your bandwidth or whatever at home while you're talking to us. But anyway, I'm just, oh, uh -huh. I'm sort of going through Glamour Magazine right now, just looking at articles about what, you know, this whole idea of dry eye. Right. Um, I want to see in this article talking yep. about the best makeup for dry eyes. I want to see if they're quoting anybody and if they are, <laughs> are they quoting an optometrist, no. an ophthalmologist, a beauty person? Uh-huh. Uh, it looks uh -huh. like they're uh -huh. not quoting um, anybody. Yeah. Send me that link. Yeah. Uh, that, I, unfortunately, I'm not seeing it. So here's the other thing on the beauty trend. So, you know, we've been uh, lecturing, writing articles for years, uh, Leslie O'Dell and myself and Amy Sullivan um, on this topic. And uh, trying to get the beauty industry to pay attention for years, and it's finally starting to come about, I think largely in part to the beauty counter movement. They're powerful, and right. they're, they're trying to, to clean up our ingredients. They do a good job. It's not perfect, but at least it's a start. It's a step in the right direction. It's creating awareness. When I see beauty mag articles, there's still it's still not an authentic source of information. You really want to lean more on what we're putting out because number one um we know the science right uh, number two the cosmetics world can claim just about anything as long as it doesn't say it treats a disease right you yeah. can say organic all day long that does not mean ocular surface friendly full stop yep. you can Green. say vegan you can say gluten-free which is, <laughs> is it really gluten-free because i'm gonna no. eat it <laughs> Correct. It's just very, very strange. Um, those do not confer any type of gentleness or ocular surface safety. When you, so um, when you, even hypoallergenic, when you think the word hypoallergenic, what brand comes to mind? Elme. Hypoallergenic. Yes. And how about at the department store? And how about what? Sorry? At the department store. At the department store, hypoallergenic. I don't know, because I don't yeah. get things like that at the department store. Don't look at me. I'm a caveman. Right? 
<laughs> Not for much longer. <laughs> <laughs> when you start looking into the ingredients, when you learn to look for the ingredients, um, you'll see that hypoallergenic is not Oculus service friendly, that there's so much stuff in there that's not anywhere close to being safe for the dry eye patient. Even, even the quote unquote gentle eye makeup remover is a chemical insult to the ocular surface of a dry eye patient. Um, so we, we, we need to like rethink all of this stuff around what we're doing around our eyes, what we as a eye care community feel good about recommending because I haven't found anything that meets that bar yet. But recommending something, if I recommend something, that's a high bar. Right. And to date, all I've been able to find is like, oh, it seems a little less bad than the other stuff. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot. To, here's the other thing I need to tell you. The cosmetics industry is self-policing. Mm. Which and means that always works well. In the hen house. Mm. Correct. We out, we, there, there's many examples of how that doesn't go well. Exactly. Um, and this is another case of that. The When you get the stamp ophthalmologist tested, dermatologist tested, hypoallergenic, the actual studies that are done to get that claim that you can put in your package are, how do I say this politely? I don't quite know how. Oh, don't be polite. It's not even real science. (laughs) It's not even real science. Like the the assays that are done, the studies that are done, it's not even real science. Mm, It's it's an abomination. That's disappointing. the label that we're leaning on as a community, as consumers. And so there has to be some changes here. There has to be a way to create um, authenticity and a higher standard, a higher bar. So there's, there, you know, the market's changing. You're going to see clean beauty, even Maybelline's trying to get on this bandwagon. Don't believe it. Do not <laughs> believe any major cosmetic company that's telling you clean beauty, safe beauty, utter BS total BS. They're, they're too big. They're making too much money. They have, they are not motivated to create a clean product. Look for your indie brands, look for the, for the startups, look for, um, look for other, other small nimble companies who really can do it right. Hmm. I'd never actually even heard that phrase before. That's how out of it I am, but here it is. I'm looking at Harper's Bazaar right here, the ultimate guide to clean beauty. So I guess yeah. that's a thing. It's a thing, and it's, it's going to be increasing, but it's also another smoke and mirrors that's going to confuse patients. So another another way that as an I, as the eye care community, we can lead the way and no trust this. Like here's here's a better source of information. I like it. I like it. Yeah, and that's that's the Dow. And, and <laughs> Adam, you're not immune. Sorry, dude. <laughs> we'll talk about this at Adam's makeover. Yeah. We're going to have to make plans for that. I'm, I got to stay away from Seiko. Should, or, we, should or, we do some uh, <laughs> some glue on uh, eyelashes? No, <laughs> they're not ocular surface friendly either. That would be horrible for his ocular surface, but I still think we need to do something. So we're going to make some plans. All right. Well, I'll, t- I'll tell you. you uh, know, I think it'll be really fun. When when we do those interviews at Seiko or whatever, when they'd always do the makeup beforehand and they'd put it on me, when we when we're all done at the end of the day, I have no idea what to do afterwards. Uh, I'm like, all right, well, I guess I just leave this uh, on till it falls off, like. <laughs> No. Makeup remover? What's well, in that? our own research, the <laughs> research we did with uh, with Leslie and Jen Hartson and Milton Holm mm-hmm. um, and Amy um, Sullivan and uh, um, uh, Jen, Jen, Jen Hartson, I got her in there too. We saw that uh, patients wearing makeup that didn't take it off had higher speed scores than uh, patients who did remove their makeup every day. There you so, go. Um, oh, make sure you remove your makeup, but do it do it mindfully, right? Oh. So. The Neutrogena makeup remover wipes, full of ocular surface offenders. Oh, so it's mm. not just remove your makeup, but remove it with the right stuff. Not that Lancome Bifacil, that stuff in the blue bottle that you have to shake. That stuff is awesome. It'll remove the paint from your car. I'm exaggerating, <laughs> but not by much. <laughs> and it has more BAK in it than you would ever dream of allowing near the ocular surface. And BAK beats up in the goblet cells, the epithelial cells, and the bone glands. Like all this stuff. So it's what mm. we do in clinic is we switch everybody to non-waterproof makeup. Um, there's several formulas out there that won't run and smear if you have to use artificial tears. Um, and then you loosen the makeup with a couple of pumps of um, organic, uh, uh, excuse me, my shell uh, argan oil in a pump. Um, but also I really like 
We Love Eyes and I also like Hecka Clean. Those are um, designed and developed by colleagues of ours. Um, uh, uh, Hecka designed and developed by mm. Mila <clears throat> Luisi Silva in Portland, Oregon. Hmm. And We Love Eyes oh, is developed uh, by Tanya Gill, and that's available um, in uh, many of the mainstream stores. Mm-hmm. So there's 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 good makeup loosening products out there that are ocular service friendly. So that's really great. So you, you start with that and then you follow it with a Trader Joe's micellar makeup remover wipe. If you don't have Trader Joe's near, your, near you, you can order from Amazon simple brand makeup remover wipes. Those are those two brands, the Trader, uh, Trader Joe's and the um, simple are much cleaner from an ocular surface bending ingredient point of view. Excellent. And you know what? I'm looking at We Love Eyes. And I'm going to be developing more stuff on my website. I'm going to be putting a whole bunch more stuff on here. Um, On Dry Eye Master, um, there'll be some stuff, uh, some updates on dryeyediva.com. Excellent. There's all kinds of uh, interesting places to to go. I'm looking at... For the... uh, mm -hmm. I'm looking at We Love Eyes right now, and there's a section for men. Hmm. There we go. Really? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yay, Dr. Gill. Good for you. Yes. That's awesome. Well, we I'm are so, coming so up excited. to yeah. right. You've got your class in oh, right. <laughs> just a few minutes, so we got so. Oh yeah, let me make sure you get on this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's. Uh, sorry about that. We didn't mean to uh, get in your way here. So yeah. So hopefully your class goes well. I'm oh, sure gosh, you're, you're, well. you're going to get a million questions. I'm sure uh, because this is this is a, so. a burgeoning topic. So this is fantastic. So thank you for doing this. Many thanks. Oh, you're so welcome. And I'll, I'll keep uh, bringing your stuff. Check out my website dryamaster.com. I'm on Instagram, Twitter. Um, and YouTube as Dry Eye Master, and then um, we'll keep generating content for y'all. So check back. Thank All you right. so we'll much, sure and we will talk class. soon. Yeah. All right, thanks. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Bye. Okay, bye. So we are coming up Ooh. to 4 o'clock Eastern. Are we really? And so Dr. Paraman's class, uh, The Dow to Healthy Beautiful Eyes, Exploring the Dermatologic, Aesthetic, and Ophthalmologic Aspects of Ocular Surface Disease. We also have Changing Lives with Lenses, a new approach to vertical heterophoria. We've got Slowing Myopia Progression One Child at a Time, and then the last hour of myopia, the new hot disease that is affecting billions. How do you treat it? <laughs> Boy, those are all mouthfuls for yes, our four really o'clock are. classes. Jeez. And then at five o'clock, we have some other exciting things coming up. We've got Hot Topics in Retina, Challenging Cases in Neuroophthalmology, private equity, things to fear and things to cheer, and the impact of oral medications on the ocular surface. So if you're interested in more ocular surface, we've got there that there for you. Indeed. Cool. Excellent. And so it's one o'clock. We actually have a guest coming on, um, Ben Turley from Zeiss. And let me see if I can get him on the phone because Zeiss, as you know, is one of the big sponsors of the conference. And they have a whole bunch of specials going on. And I want to hear what's going on in the world of Zeiss since it has been a while. I'm finding the eyelid scrub kit for men here for you, Adam. Thank you. It's just what I needed. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I always wondered about that because she, she, she literally had my number. Like, yes, I have this big tub of Cetaphil or whatever in the shower, the pump thing. And, like, who knew, right? She knew. She knew exactly the terrible products that I, you know, used. I thought it was hilarious. We're going to hook you up. Yeah. Okay, so let's see if I can get Ben here. Speaking. Hey Ben, it's Adam Farkas and Gretchen Bailey. How you doing? I'm very good. How are you? Doing well. Hello. So thank you for taking the uh, the time to be here with us today. Pleasure, pleasure. So you know, Zeiss, as I was mentioning to everyone, has been a, a huge sponsor uh, of the conference, and we're we're very grateful uh, to have you folks come on out and, and be part of this. Um, and we were talking sort of about about your devices and. One of the things that somebody brought up before, we were talking about forum, um, and 
they, someone asked me, can you really actually integrate with all other products, even non-Zeiss products? And I said, yep, that is true. And the question was, how, how in the world does that even work? Do you have teams of these engineers who you, you lock in the basement and keep them down there? <laughs> because that is a, I, as someone who's done IT, that is a monumental undertaking. Yes, um, and you know, let's um, set some expectations. Um, one can't take a, uh, let's, let's be honest, a, a competitor's device, um, raw data and allow it to, dynamically be used right. like one might do with, with our own data. But what one can do is pull in raw fundus images or PDFs of reports. Mm -hmm. And in that respect, you can manage your patient accordingly with that data. Um, but of course, no, you wouldn't have the, the raw manipulation that you would have with an individual device. Does that make sense? Right. So you can't do so do these dynamic manipulations, but you can actually just import the data in. So you could have it sort of in that stream of data with your other devices. So you can start looking at it in forum as well to get like one picture of what's going on. Yeah, you could be looking at, for example, a a B scan from an OCT, mm -hmm. a, a color fundus image from from a fundus camera. Um, you could be looking at a report from a you know, a third party device. Um, and then of course, the key is having all of that in one physical location. Sometimes when one tries to use the data in from, from various different machines, you have to drive it obviously with individual softwares. And that's what can make things cumbersome. And when one has to close out of one and pull up another, and, and it might even be the simplest thing where you have to retype in the patient's details to get that data up. Right. Mm -hmm. And all of that just elongates the workflow. Yep. So what's going on in, in So your... being able... Yep. Sorry. Yeah, so Sorry. I, was, I was just going to say, so th with, with the devices, though, one of the big things that I know that people have also asked me about, they wanted to talk a little bit about Claris, right? This is the other thing that people have been asking me about because I said I, I used the phrase eye popping, which was probably not the right phrase to use. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Look, looking at the images, but you know, they are stunning. And when I think when people see them, they just sort of stop dead in their tracks. Um, and I got a, a, a good demo of it uh, the last time I was out. I forget which meeting it was. Um, but I'm just kind of wondering, it was introduced, I believe it was last year. Um, it's a relatively new device, and I'm kind of wondering how that's been going. Yes, yes, and it's it's quite exciting actually. It's a uh, it's a fantastic product because it's uh, wide, moving forward. Wide field imaging quite clearly is is the way we you know we need to to go. Um, Forty five degrees view is no longer acceptable with regards to what we're missing in the periphery. So you know everybody's got an ophthalmoscope, but if you've got your uh, for example the the um, uh, Claris product, you've got a wide field view that's a true cul color fundus image. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not um, contrived from you know a couple of lasers. It's a physical, um, you know, true full full, full color image which you visualise, for example, with your ophthalmoscope. But in a literally matter of seconds, you've captured um, that view. Now, of course, to get the full wide field, admittedly, with the and Claris product, you take two images, but the um, flash is a you know non-invasive flash. I mean, it's, you know, it's something that one can do with a um, a, a non-dilated pupil um, if you obviously give time for for the recovery, if you like. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic tool, and from our point of view, we're we're very proud to kind of um, promote the the wide field capability and. As I said at the start, there the 45 degree view is um, almost uh, you know uh, left behind when you look at something that um, is giving you such a, a peripheral exposure, if you like, from the phrase to um, to the patient's condition. Yeah, and in fact, I have up on the screen right now. I'm showing some some of these shots. Like I said, eye popping, kind of amazing what it can produce. I, I kind of wonder, and I don't know if you know the answer, but I remember the very first generation of these devices from a million years ago. 
Um, and you have to like really smash your face in there uh, to get a decent <laughs> picture. I mean, it was really uncomfortable. It wasn't fun. Um, and even then, a lot of times you couldn't see very well the periphery. Um, and also, by the way, the machines were gigantic, right? They were like huge room-sized things. Yeah. How, has, how has this yeah. changed? I mean, how have you actually been able to make this so much more compact and make the, the uh, exam easier? Oh, good question. I mean, of course, um, the concept for ourselves is more of, you know, a fundus camera um, base where you place your chin upon the rest. You know, patient comfort is key. Um, you know, patient compliance is, is mandatory, really. You know, in many cases, one needs uh, a simple solution. And if you just pop your chin on the, the rest and forehead against the bar, just the way one would do with any, you know, standard um, slit lamp or even, um, you know, uh, shall we say, legacy fundus cameras, um, then uh, we're, we're uh, you know, able in that respect to manipulate the um, the device if if necessary, so you have a um, you know a, a, a pan and tilt capability of of the actual device, and then the full wide field view we capture in two images, and that allows us then to not need you know you you gave an example which is uh, you know fairly graphic there you're quite right you know from a, a, a discomfort um, trying to get one's almost head in the machine <laughs> right and um, that's not not necessary when you do it if you like the way in which we do um and and of course that allows us then to pull the two images together and produce a a total image you know and one could argue well hang on you've got two images there you've you know effectively stitched them together how do i know it's um you know correct or true and, and because we're using the same device and the same fixation etc for the patient then it's it's very easy to do uh, in, with today's software. Yep, and in fact, I have pictures up right now of the Claris itself. And the, what's really shocking about it too is its size, right? If you look at it, it's narrower than like the widths of a, of a patient's shoulders, right? It's it's very different from from older technology, um, and so you don't have to reposition the patient, right, when you're moving from eye to eye as well. Correct, and and you know, there's another reason for that as well. And again, it's, it comes back to my comment about patient compliance. When one's operating a device like that, one you know you you need that communication, just like a traditional slit lamp, where you know you can guide the patient and you want to be able to see them. And you're right, you know, with the larger devices of uh, you know of yesteryear, um, one would crane one's neck trying to look around the device to see if the patient even had their chin on a rest. Right. So um, having that slim build uh, certainly allows that that capability. Excellent. And I'm looking also here. Let me pull pull this up for people can so people can see it too. Um, you know, I guess you guys had uh, this, the new Cirrus unit came out. When was that? That was relatively recently, right? We were at a trade show and we, we got to see a demo of it. Um, and did that that actually made it to market? Yeah, we, correct. Yes. Yeah, so the first six thousand we launched at the end of of last year. Um, so uh, fairly. Uh, well, very recent, if you like. It's our, our latest um, Cirrus product. It's fantastic in respect to its legacy capability. So, you know, it, it's important for somebody who's new to um, an OCT device to have the, the latest, you know, fastest and, and capable device. But it's also very important to look after our legacy customers who may have originally purchased, for example, a a Cirrus 4000 or a Cirrus 5000. One of the key things that we maintain is the structure of the data, which allows the dynamic progression analysis moving forward. If, if one was to change, let's say as an example, if one was to change a manufacturer, you know, device, um, the data wouldn't necessarily be uh, compliant or um, uh, usable from a progression analysis, one would start a new baseline. But if you've got a customer who, you know, 10 years ago purchased one of our Cirrus products um, and they purchased a, a new 6000 today, that data migration is seamless uh, and would allow that progression analysis to continue, um, which of course is key to, you know, certain um, uh, prognosis or diagnosis uh, with regards to um, you know, patient care. Yep. And in fact, I have a, a, a movie actually that we put up on ODWire and I put it up on the screen 
uh, of taking, when I got access to the Sierra 6000 back in September, where I just got to take a scan, and I was shocked by how fast it was. Um, the whole thing couldn't have taken more than five seconds. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, um, you know, to, to kind of put the, the figures out there, yeah, it's 100,000 A scan per second device. It'll capture your data cube, which is very important. You know, it's not just one single line. It's a, a full three-dimensional data cube of data. It will capture that data cube in 0.4 of a second. I mean, that, that's just unreal compared to when we first um, started building OCT machines back in the day. Um, it would certainly take, a, you know, an age to capture that kind of data. And the issue with capturing um, three-dimensional data is that if you wait whilst your machine captures, and even if you've got the best of tracking capability, you get patient, you know, uh, micro saccades, you'll get patient movement, and then you're going to get breaks in the data. So 0.4 of a second capture speeds mean... Um, basically you know, perfect data in, in literally a, 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 you know, a, an instant. Um, the other benefits of the, the new 6000 that you were fortunate to, to, to work with is it has a, a two point, or up to a 2.9 millimeter um, scan depth um, along with a 12 millimeter um, raster scans you know, from a wide field point of view. And if you move into our OCT-A, so that's the OCT angiography capability, uh, with Angioplex, we have a 12 by 12 millimeter scan area, which is huge when you think about it. I mean, that's, that's your 45 degree view from a traditional fundus camera captured in a, a, you know, a dynamic and structural way. Um, we also have HD Angioplex scans um, and the capability to montage those scans. So your 12 by 12, let's say 45 degree view, suddenly becomes as wide as um, our Claris images if you allow the software to instantaneously stitch those together. Wow. So it's a pretty, pretty exciting device. And uh, as I say, most importantly, it maintains the traditional Cirrus family operation, if you like, the, 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 the GUI, as we call it, the GUI, the, um, the interface. So anybody familiar with a Cirrus device can jump on a 6000 that I'm sure you saw yourself and operate it um, and, as you said, be blown away by the speed. Yep. Yeah, it's amazing. And in fact, even for the OCTA scans, right, even those are, are significantly improved over the old device. Yeah, very much so. And, um, and it's all down to, you know, technology moves so fast. Um, you know, we are able to introduce um, higher resolution cameras within the system. Um, we're, we're able to process things faster. We're able to track things faster. Um, and then obviously there are other elements like the 22 inch widescreen monitor that's now externally mounted to allow some degree of flexibility in, in, its, um, uh, in, in its positioning within a practice. Right. Cool. So is there anything else you'd like folks to know about? You know, I know that a bunch of people have been in your booth checking things out, but is there anything you'd, you'd like to tell them? Uh, to be honest, we have um, our representatives who can talk about our whole portfolio fluently. Um, we have some some specials, um, of course. You know, one always likes to bring um, some some attractive offers to to any event. So um, please have a chat with our uh, representatives. They'll be able to talk you through the portfolios and listen to your um, you know requirements um, from a practice point of view and explain how from Zeiss we can assist you moving forward. Uh, don't, uh, you know, don't be afraid to, to have a chat with the, with the guys on hand. Excellent. And I think the next time I'm at a physical trade show, what I'm going to do is play with the Cirrus again just to see how fast <laughs> I can make a scan. Because it was, I got to, only got to play with the prototype when I was there. It wasn't actually on market yet. Um, and I was shocked then, and I'm sure it's just as fast now. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's almost too fast for, for a demonstration because yeah. um, there you go, it's done. It's yep. like, really? Did that, that, that really happen? Yep. It's over before you know it. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. All right. Well, exactly. Exactly. Well, yeah. So, Ben, thank you so much for being here today. And I hope everyone checks out your, your booth and you have a great rest of the show. Thank you very much. Take care. Good to speak to you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. All right. So. We are cooking along here. We, we are, are coming. Um, we're the end of the tunnel is in sight. Yeah, I know. Can you believe it? So the classes are almost done. 
Um, we're getting close. And in fact, we have an interview coming up soon with Ben Chudner. <laughs> always, <laughs> always a good conversation. Always fun to talk to Dr. Ben and uh, you know talk to him about private equity because he obviously is at the, the, the center of all this. So he knows the marketplace mm -hmm. better than anyone I've ever met. Absolutely. Private equity being involved with it. So, and he tells it like it is too. So you never get a, a BS story from him. He's always, you know, willing to tell the truth. I like that. Even yes. if it's ugly. And he, he's direct. Oh, yeah. And I'm a direct person. And so I think that's why, um, that's why I like talking with him because he will just give it to you straight. Yep. So from what I'm hearing um, in the chat room that things are going smoothly so far. We've had a couple of tiny hiccups here and there. I think we've had some time difficulties with people thinking something is one time, but it's another. But I am knocking wood here that so far, right. we aren't seeing a lot of tech challenges, which I'll be grateful for. Yeah, it seems to all be going well. I try to do the best with the schedule, by the way, that you see on the screen to emphasize to people that this is Eastern time. <laughs> um, so hopefully people didn't get too confused by that, you know, that the schedule we put, even though we, even we are not on Eastern time, right? we're in the Pacific time zone. I always put everything in terms of Eastern time just because... How come? Is that where the majority of people are? That is correct. The majority of people in the country, there's, there's definitely a bias here against the West Coast. The majority of people, not only in the country, but in the eye care industry are on the East Coast. So hmm. when I work with people on a daily basis, I always have to express everything in terms of Eastern time. And people will do it as a matter of course. They won't even think about the fact that I'm in Pacific time. They'll just say, I'll meet with you at 7, and I know that means if, 7 Eastern. Does that, do they know? I mean, some people honestly might not know where you're located. Yeah, I tell them. Oh, okay. <laughs> some people don't care. Most people actually are very respectful if I say, look, I cannot take a meeting before 11 a.m. Eastern time because I'll be, you know, getting the kid off to school. I mean, right. I'm just not here. Um, but most people, they don't think about it really, right? Because who cares, right, out here on the West Coast? I mean, there are a few companies actually like Zeiss or Oculus who are out here, but... Um, for the most part, the industry is on the East Coast, so we just have to live with it. Well, I think I'm one of those people who are guilty of thinking of things only in Eastern time, and I think part of it is just, yeah, you're right, we don't really think about others, and another is sometimes I don't know where somebody is. I try to ask, right. so I try not to be that big of a pain in the butt about it. I do try to ask but I likely am guilty. But it's also easier for us to express things in Eastern time because then there's no ambiguity, so that's why I always do it. So well, like when I talk to my buddy and partner here, Steve, it's always, we're gonna meet at, you know, whatever it is, five. We say five, and, and I know that just means two. So, yeah. That works, that works, yeah. Yep. So we are, let's see, about 20 after four, so we are right in the midst of uh, Laura Perriman's Dow to Healthy Beautiful Eyes, Slowing Myopia Progression. Uh, we're coming into the last stretch of the two-hour class of myopia, uh, how to treat it, and then also changing lives with lenses, a new approach to vertical heterophoria. You got it. And I, ma I managed to pronounce it correctly. <laughs> and in fact, we're going to be speaking with the folks from the Neurovisual Medicine Institute who are part of that uh, heterophoria lecture. So. Anyway, um, let me just thank our sponsors while we have a few minutes here, because uh, this may be one of the last times we'll have to do it now that I think about it. Um, so, you know, we couldn't do CE Wire without our sponsors. It just would not happen. Or, uh, correction, CE Wire without our sponsors would make the conference significantly more expensive for attendees. Um, that's just the truth of the matter. Um, the conference, even though we have no physical location and we're not at the Sands Expo or the Tropicana <laughs> or anywhere fun like that, it's still expensive to get off the ground, right? We have huge fixed costs, not only to you know cover the cost of the speakers, of actually accrediting the material, which I guess most people don't even think about it, but when you accredit something, you have to go through a process of doing it um, with multiple organizations, right? So we have to get the lectures accredited by COPE. The lectures, uh, the tests for the lectures also have to go through an optometry school and they have to vet the tests. So. Mm -hmm. And that um, costs money. And that costs money, too. Um, so there's multiple steps that you have to go through to get this stuff done. And we run all of our lectures actually through COPE twice. If you've taken CUR before, you'll notice your COPE ID numbers when you get them that they have two different numbers, right? If you take it live, you get one number. If you take it on demand, you get a different one. Um, so we run everything through twice, and we get charged twice, even though I kind of doubt there's twice as much work involved. But, you know, we do it twice, even though we're submitting the same class Administratively. twice. Administratively. Yes, there's, I, I will accept that there is overhead, so we willingly pay it. Um, but anyway, the point is, I guess, there's a lot of overhead expense, and that doesn't even start to talk about the technology. 
that we have to maintain to actually run the conference um, and keep it running. Because again, as part of COAST requirements, everyone needs access to their certificates, right, for years after the conference is done. And so we have to keep everything running, even in the off season. So for us, this is really just beginning, right, because the lectures are now on demand through August. And even after that, we have to keep the works going because you need right. access to your certificates at all times. So there's significant support costs uh, in running the conference too. So that's kind of how it works. Um, so anyway, thanks, our, thanks to our sponsors. And let me quickly just run through all of them again. So thank you to Marco for sponsoring the live stream today. They've uh, kept our spirits up here with the Marco meatball on our screen at all times. Um, so Marco, you know, was there for us in the beginning. They were the first sponsor of the conference and have done the live stream ever since. So thank you, Marco. Uh, Hogstrite, so you know them for their instruments, particularly yeah. the octopus, the well-loved octopus. And they have specials on the octopus today, among other things, if you go to their booth. $1,000 rebate with the purchase of an Octopus 900 Basic, $1,500 rebate with purchase of an Octopus 900 Pro. So definitely head on over and check it out. Uh, this is an exclusive for CE Wire. They're not going to do it anywhere else, and the reason they do it is because they didn't have to drag their equipment here. <laughs> so they can pass the savings on to you. Uh, the Neurovisual Medicine Institute, uh, again, this is a, a, a place that deals with uh, binocular vision issues and how you can address these in your practice in a systemic way to help patients and grow your practice. So they offer courses uh, on how to build this into your practice because binocular vision, of course, is one purview of optometry, which is pretty much unique to optometry, right? You're not going to get too much encroachment on this, um, and you're perfectly situated to treat these patients, and they wanted to show you techniques to do so. And so they're giving, uh, there's a talk actually by them right now, and we're going to be speaking to the principals of the Institute later. Today is one of our last interviews. Mm -hmm. Tear care, we had a nice long talk with Jim Sluck all about the tear care device uh, and how you can use it to treat MGD in your office. And just fascinating how the technology has come down both in size and convenience and price, you know, from something that was very exotic and exclusive to, as Jim said, something that you could put on a credit card. Um, something that literally is similar in price to the highest end iPhone you can buy. Mm -hmm. um, so now this is a technology that can truly help a patient with uh, MGD and you can really you know, get to the root of the problem at a, an incredibly low price. So we're hoping that this really uh, builds people's awareness of, of the issue and we get into more practices. So you can check them out um, as well and check out their booth and learn more about the device. And perhaps at the next conference we go to, we'll even play with it a little and put it on film so you can see it. Yeah, that would That's be That's the one fun. thing we couldn't do here because I didn't have one here. Um, VTI Natural View, so they make the Natural View contact lens. It's a specialty lens company. Um, so the Natural View multifocal is kind of a cool and unusual one in that it doesn't have a, a, a different ads, right? You don't prescribe it that way. Uh, it's got one ad. And so if you want to check them out, go into their booth and see what they're all about uh, in their line of specialty contact lenses. Um, they're offering up to $3 a box off with purchase of 25 or 50 unit bank of Natural View multifocal one day contact lenses. And interesting thing about Natural View too, if you're starting to do myopia management, see, I can say this, whether they can't or not, <laughs> I don't care. Um, it's not FDA approved for my, myopia management, but it is efficacious by, according to me, so <laughs> people do use it. Um, you know, you can obviously use a lens for whatever you want to use it for, and people are using the Natural View lens for myopia management. It's become a very popular option. So you might want to go in and check it out. Um, Zeiss, and so we just got off the phone uh, with Ben over at Zeiss and talking all about their different products, the Claris and the Cirrus and kind of the interesting stuff that they have going on. If you haven't seen the images that the Claris produces, go into their booth and take a look. It's really kind of incredible. Um, it's a wide field unit that doesn't sort of have a lot of the hassles of the older wide field units. You don't have to jam your face into it. Um, <laughs> I love well, that visual. I, have you ever actually had a wide field picture taken yes, before? I have. Yeah, so on the older devices, you know you really have to get your face in there or else you know, you're not going to get a good picture. Uh, with this one, the unit itself is small. Um, it moves back and forth actually, so you don't have to reposition the patient. Um, and you, you don't have to really smush your nose or face or anything else to get it in there. Um, they're running a special here so on Claris retinal camera, Cirrus OCTs, and OCTAs, and HFA3 perimeters and throwing in an extra warranty for most products. Um, there's also retina-specific bundles with a combination of Claris and Cirrus, and glaucoma bundles with a combination of the HFA3 and Cirrus, and specials on the forum data management uh, software. So check them out. And AB Max, so this is a device that I 
you know, like to call it's like a Dremel tool <laughs> <laughs> for anterior blepharitis um, to help you get rid of some of the cruft that's there. Um, this is the second generation of the device. We spoke with, with John, who was the inventor of the original one. He's got the patents on his wall to prove it. Um, and now this is the second generation device and the important improvements. There are improved modes for this one, but even more importantly, the consumables are way cheaper. I think they're like half price or less. Um, so if you have an older device, this could be a good time right now to upgrade because the consumables for this one are, are much less costly. He's also offering a deal at the conference where he'll actually give you the unit for free as long as you buy a certain number of consumables. And an interesting uh, program, let's see if I can find it here, a trade-in program for the original uh, units um, where you can trade up and get one of the new ones and they'll give you credit for the old one. So, and that actually can be, you know, you can make uh, up the difference very quickly if you buy a lot of tips and you use it a lot. So. Definitely check them out. And Neuralens, so again, Neuralens is a company that um, has a diagnostic unit that can help, help you with binocular vision, patients with binocular vision problems. Um, and the unit, the diagnostic unit can create, whoa, sorry, <laughs> can create a prescription, that woke me up, can create a prescription for you um, so that uh, you can then send off the script to Neuralens and they'll create a custom lens from that with Prism built into it and Gretchen. You are a proud recipient of one of those. I am. And I, tell us about your experience. I do wear them when I am spending all day with heavy monitor use on a day with a lot of editing. And I wear them over my multifocal contact lenses. So all I have is whatever prism has been determined that I need so I don't have any correction in them. And I do notice a difference when I'm wearing them versus when I'm not with a lot of heavy monitor work. And I really should have brought them on this trip because I've been looking at my laptop most of the day. So yeah, so I've tried them and I've noticed I can tell a difference when I'm wearing them versus sure. when I'm not. In fact, I'm going to have to keep a bottle of Excedrin here, right? Because Gretchen, she's been here doing, doing this a long time without her lenses <laughs> on. So God only knows what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so Oculus, again, with the famous logo now, they can't be unseen. Yes, Gretchen's an idiot, didn't see the logo before, but I see it now. I don't know how I missed it, and it is lovely. I like it. So thank you to Oculus for sponsoring the conference. We've been speaking a lot about Oculus today and, you know, the different uses for their diagnostic devices, and we were talking specifically about the Pentacam because over this past year we got a lot of experience with it. This thing is the Swiss Army knife uh, <laughs> of diagnostic devices, but importantly, people are using it for... Um, fitting sclera lenses. It is incredibly useful for this. So you can take the output of the Pentacam, feed it into another computer program that then creates um, a map, basically, that you send off to Wave, the contact lens company, to create sclera lenses. And you can get a sclera lens made in three days from this output. Which is incredible, yeah. especially given what we saw a few days ago at the Contact Lens Museum yeah. with those uh, glass scleral lenses. <laughs> three days is, and safely made without fire or asbestos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and glass? Fire, asbestos, glass, and sharp tools. Yes. All, all in one little spot, so it would have been a, yeah. That would have been a challenge. I can only imagine how many they could have produced in a day, even if they knew what they were doing back then. It would have been That would have, would been, have been amazing. A lot. <laughs> so, yeah, so, um, that, so the Panacam. Um, they have interesting deals, actually. Oh, and I forgot to mention also with the Panacam, they have a new one where they can measure axial length. So for those of you who are doing myopia management, check it out because it just adds yet another you know, part to the Swiss Army knife. Um, you know, the ability to measure axial length is something that most people don't have. So if you right. have it in your office and you're doing myopia management, it's incredibly important. They're running a deal, by the way, if you buy a Keratograph 5M, um, and you can get 45% off your first 10 wave lenses ordered each month for a 48 month period. That's a, up to a $28,000 value. So if you're doing a lot of specialty lenses, this is definitely something to consider. That's a huge savings. And 48 months is four years, people. Yep. That's a long time. It is a very long time. So science-based health, so makers of Hydro Eye supplement. So we spoke with Zach Denning yesterday all about it. As their name implies, they are big into the science. Mm -hmm. And when they formulate mm -hmm. these things, they look to the science to guide them. Um, they're not big into hand-waving, you know, thinking, oh, this probably will work. No, no, no. When they formulate these things, they want to use the best science available to actually make it. Um, so definitely check them out. Um, they have a Special going on, buy one case of Hydro Eye, get one free. Uh, but if you check out their site, they have a lot of interesting information too about the different kinds of supplements and what they do and how they work because I confess to 100% ignorance on this topic. Mm -hmm. um, so Zach gave us a good lesson yesterday, but they really do have the latest information. And of course, 
they help you interpret some of those studies that have recently come out as well, which is really important. Absolutely. They are a good source of information and willing to talk to you and to discuss what's going on. I mean, you'll have a conversation, not a sales pitch. Yep, exactly. That's one thing that I like. Exactly. Yep, and they, they won't try to snow you or anything. They really do care about the science, so it's really fun to talk to them about it, um, especially for those who are ignorant like me about the <laughs> science of the latest studies. It's hard to keep up. Look, when you don't do something every day, right? Right. It's really hard to keep up. So it's really nice that we have people like Zach who are willing to keep up with the science and keep us informed. Absolutely. So covalent careers, if you're looking to switch jobs or you're, you, in your practice, you need an optometrist or optician uh, or help, this is a place to create your listing. Now, if you list with covalent careers, uh, your listing will go to multiple websites. It doesn't just go there. It goes all over the place, including on OD Wire. And I think I probably still left it up here somewhere. Or perhaps I didn't. It's getting late. <laughs> um, but I can bring it up again. There we go. So um, you can see on, I'm on OD Wire right now. I'm on the tab that says jobs. And lo and behold, there it is. There's a list of all the ones that are listed on Covalent Careers. All 800 of them. Yep. So if you're looking to get your job in front of people who are either ODs or if you're looking for an optician as well, they'll make sure it gets to the right place. So you can see Luxotic has got a lot going on there, huh? Um, 843 jobs are, That's a are lot. listed as open. So. Um, so definitely check them out. Um, if you place with them, you can get 10% off monthly job listings. So go for that uh, as well. So pretty cool stuff. And where were we? Yes, 10% off listings, as I said. So I Care Live is uh, a telehealth company. Now, don't get scared and run away. <laughs> <laughs> so telehealth is coming to I Care whether you want it to or not. Now, what they happen to produce are tools. Oops, not you guys. Where are you? Did I lose you? I lost you. Sorry. Like I said, late in the day. Um, so I Care Live makes tools um, for telehealth, telemedicine for your office. So um, the idea is they build tools that will keep you closer to your patients even as they are remote from you. Right. So I think most people have probably had the case of the panicked patient calling with a red eye and they're in, you know, wherever. <laughs> far, far away, <laughs> perhaps even out of the country, and oh my gosh, what do I do? Um, so what iCare Live does is build tools that allow you to continue to interact with your patient even if they're far away and interact in a meaningful way that's HIPAA compliant, right? So imagine being able to take a picture of that red eye that the patient has now and be able to talk to them and talk them through it in a very structured way. So this isn't just like taking a random phone call. This is like actually being able to generate patient data and look and, and have the, basic, the patient basically has a portal on their phone into your medical records and mm -hmm. you can work with them even when they're remote. And my feeling about all of this, and you know I love to give my personal feeling, <laughs> is that things like this are going to be the standard of care 10, ten years from now I would say easily, right? right? Where you're going to expect your doctor to have these sorts of tools at their disposal and if they don't, I mean they're a dinosaur or worse, right? I mean, it would be the equivalent of like using paper records, right? So I'm sure some people still do, but you know, for these days, I mean, especially out here on the West Coast, I don't know if we're more tech forward than everyone else, but most of the healthcare systems have systems like this in place um, for things like general practitioners and so forth, where you can interact with your clinician in a structured way. And I Care Live wants to give it to folks, um, you know, for you in your I Care practice. And so that is I Care Live. And we're almost to the end here. So I Care Pro, we had a great conversation with them before. If you need to market your practice online, whether it's a website or social media, or God help you, you need to actually do something about your Yelp and Google reviews finally, <laughs> um, these are the folks to call. So you know your online presence, which used, used to be as easy as just setting up a website, is long gone, right? You now have multiple outlets that, that you need to feed, as you say, constantly whether it's social feeds or making your website look decent, or again, those Google reviews, which are so critical because if people see you have bad ones or you have very few, they're gonna walk. They're not gonna even give you a second look. iCare Pro can handle all of the stuff for you. They have a great deal going on right now. If you sign up with them with certain of their packages, they'll actually come to your office and take professional photos of your office to use in these social settings, um, which is incredibly important. Like if you ever use Google Maps and you mouse over something that's on the map, you will see you know, pictures come up and you want the best ones possible. So definitely check out iCare Pro. Lac Rivera, maker of punctal plugs. And if you haven't checked out different plugs in a while, you might want to, you know, the latest in technologies here. They have huge discounts too. The list is too long for me to even list here. So you gotta go into the exhibit hall and look. 
Um, it's like a Chinese buffet menu, right, of different, <laughs> of different discounts for CEYR folks. So definitely go in there and, and check them out. And there's a lecture on punctal plugs going on very soon, right? Uh, uh, yeah, at 6 o'clock. Yep, so coming up. So if you haven't done plugs in a while or you're just getting started with them, good one to, to, um, to go over because um, Eric Brooker is going to go over sort of the ins and outs of plugs in, in 2020. Optometry Times, you have anything to say about that? Oh, absolutely nothing. <laughs> At Optometry Times, we aim to give our readers practical chairside advice in an easily consumed, easily digested format. We would love if you read our content between pa uh, patients, and what you read, you apply to the next patient in your chair, if appropriate. So our goal is to reach you wherever you are, whether you like print or digital. We will send you the content where, where and how you like to read it. We're always looking to connect with uh, new people to write for us, so if you have a desire to do that, please drop me a line. Uh, I need to give a shout out to our chief optometric editor, Ben Casella, who helps me with everything, and uh, without him, there would be no optometry times. So if you're interested in subscribing to either the print journal or our digital products, like our email newsletter and our digital edition, you can go into our booth and sign up there, or you can visit our website. And as always, thank you for reading. All right. And finally, Vision Equipment Inc. So this is Leo Hadley's company. He's been at the refurbished equipment game for a very long time. Uh, he takes uh, you know, used equipment and trades, and he, he refurbishes it to like new condition and then resells it. Um, so you can save a bundle on a device, if you don't want to necessarily spend for something that's brand new, you can get something that's close to it. Um, and, you know, he, uh, whoops, let me pop it back up there. Um, one thing that I love about Leo, we've been working with him for years now, and I've never heard anyone have a complaint about, you know, anything that's happened. And, and trust me, on ODWire, I get to hear complaints <laughs> endlessly, um, you know, because I, I sort of end up sometimes in the middle between all this stuff. Um, and but we've never actually had any problems with Leo. He does a really good job refurbishing the equipment, and more importantly, standing behind it um, when it comes time for service. So check him out. Uh, check out the discounts that he's got in his booth. I don't even know what they are because he's got constant turnover of equipment. Um, so whatever he has there, he has. So definitely give him a shout out. And again, for all of our sponsors, I'm going to be sending out an e-blast to everybody at the conference, reminding people that the exhibit hall remains open long after the classes are done, right? CUR is going to go on until August. Um, some of the discounts may or may not expire. Again, it depends on the vendor. But as I send out an e-blast, I'll let you know what these are when they expire. You know, obviously some vendors can't extend these discounts forever. Mm -hmm. um, but everyone will know about it. Everybody, you know, all the thousands of folks at the conference, I'll be sending you an e-blast letting you know what's what. And we're running a little bit late because we have another interview that we have coming up right now. And let me get that started. Thank you, Gretchen, for reminding me, because <laughs> I could just go on and on forever. Well, we're going to be talking with ben, ben Chudner, and his class will be starting in just about 20 minutes, talking about private equity, things to fear and things to jeer. Cheer, not cheer. Cheer, not jeer. Fear and cheer. I'm sorry. It's, <laughs> I need more coffee. Okay. Make sure I type that right. Ben, it's Adam and Gretchen. Hey, there. Uh -huh. hey sorry How's we're going, late. Guys? Oh, it's okay. I saw you were doing all your uh, all your sponsors, which is far more important than these interviews, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. You're pretty important. You know, you you tell it like it is. So we appreciate that. Hey Ben. Yeah, no, I try to. Hey Ben, yeah. how's your mom? <laughs> I'm doing very well, thank you. Well, good. Fact, she is going for her annual eye exam in about uh, three days. Oh, oh really? excellent. So she's following my advice. Yes, thank you for asking. Well, tell her I said hello. I, I will. I'll, I'll tell I'm the sure story. she'll never forget the two of you. Yeah, so, yeah, okay, so, please tell the story. So, stop, I'll, I'll awesome. tell the story. So, no, so, you know, we're walking there at Expo. Well, you're getting all cranked up here, I'm Adam. getting cranked up because I, when, I, when I see this kind of thing happen, so we're walking at Expo, right, and we see Ben and his mom in a restaurant, right, right down there in Restaurant Row. Actually, that's not what happened. That's not what happened? What happened was <laughs> we had lunch with Ben, and he said that he was meeting his mom for an early dinner because she lives in Vegas, and obviously we were in Vegas for Expo yeah. West. And because I am a pain in the ass, I said to Adam, let's go find Ben and his mom. We didn't just happen to walk by. I'm going to oh. fully own it. Wow. I'm going to own it. We went and hunted <laughs> Ben and his mom though. down. You found us. And I walked in, and I sat right down at the table while the server was there going over the specials. 
and he thought that I was there to join you for dinner. I was just being obnoxious, and Adam refused to sit down with me, but I just barked <laughs> it and said hi to your mom. This was the most brazen thing I've yeah, ever seen. You... I needed like a fainting couch. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> you guys were more than welcome to join us. She's, uh, she, she's always happy to meet people that I, that I work with. So. It would have been it would have been a fun fun evening for sure. Well, she is lovely, and she just started Thank talking you. to me like I was not a rude, inconsiderate person at all, and she just thought it was it was fine. So that's why I always ask how your More mom is. You do, I know, and I appreciate that. More surprising, when you left, she wasn't offended at all. She had nothing but nice things to say about the two. So. Sure, she was a, a very good sport. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Thank you. So yeah, she's awesome. So tell her I said hello and I hope that her eye exam goes well. <laughs> so meanwhile, Ben, Thank what you. what's going on in your world? Oh, you know, nothing nothing major, I guess. Uh just a lot of acquisitions, a lot of activity in the private equity uh space, especially last year, uh, as you guys are aware and I'll be talking about here in about uh 20 minutes, but um it's just been really really busy and with activity that happened last year, big moves, right? So my eye doctor being sold, um, eye care partners announcing their sale and, and, and then selling uh, just brings on even more interest in the space. Uh, so that's on the positive side. On the, on the negative side, we still continue to see uh, statements and, and, and people posting about how awful private equity is with very little understanding of, of what, it, what it really is today. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's, it's a constant, uh, I don't want to say battle because it's really kind of, and it's not, not horrible. It's a lot of fun, but it's just a constant education of people and try to get them to understand of where things are headed. Right. You know, it's funny. We were stuck talking to Craig Steinberg yesterday. What about did this. you say? I said we were talking to Craig Steinberg. Well, I thought you said we were stuck talking. I was <laughs> going to oh, say. I didn't, did, stuck, yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, we're, we're not, not Craig, stuck. I love you, Craig. I love you, man. No, we're not man. stuck. We were, <laughs> it's late. <laughs> so we, we were, we were talking to Craig Steinberg yesterday. Um, uh, about private equity, and he actually uh, now takes on um, clients where he reads the contracts for them, right, for, for folks who are being acquired. Yep. And he was talking about the complexity of the agreements. And the thing that really struck me, and I wonder if some of the dissatisfaction comes in that people, even when they're entering into these transactions, sometimes don't even know what they're doing, or they're not even getting people to help them vet the contract properly. Right. It, it, it is pretty interesting. I mean, there's, there's two big aspects two and sometimes three big aspects of the contracts, right? So for the associate doctors, uh, it's just an employment agreement. They will, their, their current agreement technically ends with their current employer mm -hmm. and then they, they take on a, a regular contract. And I do a lot of those negotiations. Uh, and then with the owner though, there's, there's two big ones. There's the asset purchase agreement, or at least what we use is an asset purchase agreement. And that's the, the big document that's, you know, the purchasing of the practice. And then there is, another employment agreement, which is oftentimes different because they negotiate different things. Um, you know, and, and so there's, it's a lot of stuff. And I think what we find is uh, sellers get what we call sellers fatigue. There's so much back and forth, so much information that's being requested. And I think they just get to a point where it's like, I just want this over with. I've been stressing about it. I'm not sleeping. Mm -hmm. I just want my paycheck, you know, the big payday. And, 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 and maybe it's true. They don't really understand uh, everything that, that they're signing. And that being said, though, you know, just not to toot our own home, but we have very few owners that leave, uh, that have left us uh, quickly after they have been acquired. I know it does happen in some of the groups. There's one in particular that, that you know, has technical, unfortunately, a reputation for that. But uh, we, we haven't seen it as much. So uh, maybe maybe our contracts are, I don't know, uh, friendlier. I, I, you know, I don't know. But, um, or maybe more ironclad. Do... <laughs> 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 no, you know, uh, <laughs> There's definitely outs. Uh, there's, you know, um, I think we're uh, we're one that has a little bit more on the holdback. So we do hold back money uh, for people because we want them to stay on uh, and we want them invested in the company. And I don't know that uh, the other two big ones uh, uh, have that. And I don't know much about Kepler, to be honest, but uh, in terms of their deals. But I don't know that uh, my adopter and, and uh, I care partners have these holdbacks that, that kind of lock, lock the doctor and so maybe that's a little bit uh, why we have a little bit better luck there. Right. And of course, we, as we've heard, the different groups, um, they work differently in terms of the disruption to the practice and the changes that they make. So perhaps you're a little more mild than some of the other groups? 
We are. So, you know, I always like to think of it as a spectrum. And, and you know, when I gave this talk last year for CE Wire, there were uh, really four main companies. There's, the, there's more than that, of course, in optometry and even more than that in ophthalmology. But the, there were four big ones. Uh, it was my doctor, eye care partners, uh, uh, AEG Vision, which is us, and Kepler at that time was uh, Total Eye Care Partners. And now there's a fifth one, obviously, with BSD Ventures. It's a spectrum, uh, and you have on the very far end of the spectrum is my eye doctor and what we assume will be BSD Ventures at some point, uh, where they completely change the practice, right? So they're um, they're going to take your practice. I mean, we're seeing this already with uh, OSIP, and we saw, we're seeing it with Shaper. It's now powered by my eye doctor. Those practices, from what we're being told, will eventually be my eye doctor practices. You look at uh, Mark Schaefer, as, as most people know, and even his lectures, he identifies himself as uh, a doctor practicing at my eye doctor. So uh, that's that's a complete disruption. They're, they're, they're creating a national brand. On the complete opposite end of the spectrum is Kepler, where they're really fairly hands-off. They have very little um, uh, integrated systems. They don't use a common platform. That's changing now because they're realizing they need to do that. Uh, but they don't really have a, an infrastructure where they have managers that oversee the practices. So they're on the complete opposite end. And, uh, and there's good and bad with that, which I, I talked about in my talk. Um, and then in the middle uh, land us and, and, uh, and iCare partners. And iCare partners skews a little bit more towards my doctor. They have larger brands. Uh, so Clarkson is a very, very large brand. They have some others, Toma and Sutton and a few others. Very, very, very large brands. And of course, now they have uh, nationwide uh, in Arizona and a little bit in, in Miami or Florida, excuse me. And then there's us where we have more regional brands. So we will tend to stay and keep the practice name for as long as we can, unless it's a single practice that we acquire in a market that has seven or eight other practices with a brand name, and then we'll kind of fold that new practice into the brand name over time. So maybe that's it, that we're a little less disruptive. Like, you know, it's hmm. hard to tell, you know, with, with, you know, it's very, it's a very emotional process. So it's hard to tell how people are going to respond. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the things that, that Steinberg told us yesterday, and I don't know if you can comment on it at all. He was talking about VSP ventures a little bit um, and that they mm -hmm. tend, they, they take practices that other, um, other companies won't touch in terms of their size. They're very small. Have you seen that? Is yeah. that true? Uh, you know, I, I, I saw one of the practices that they purchased uh, out in California was Craig Hisaka's old practice. And I, I've known Craig since before optometry school. He actually wrote, wrote my letter of recommendation in optometry school. That was a pretty big practice. So I don't know if that's completely true. I think Craig will have, uh, Craig Steinberg's going to have a much a better idea of that than I am, because most of the practices they're purchasing tend to be out, with the exception of their initial ones in Tennessee, tend to be out in California and uh, in the and northern Nevada areas. Where I think VSP is focusing in my, what I can think they're focusing on is heavily VSP practices, which makes sense in California. And we know for a fact that they're going in and saying, hey, if, if you know, if you go and sell to someone else, there's a chance that you'll lose your VSP um, uh, credentialing. Right which would obviously dramatically decrease the value of your practice. And if you stay with us, of course, you're going to stay VSP. Now, they haven't kicked anybody off of VSP yet that's private equity, but our anticipation is that in the next five years or so, VSP is going to start saying we're the only private equity group, essentially, that can have our providers be VSP. It's going to be a, a huge selling point for them. How is that legal? <laughs> I mean... I have no idea. <laughs> you know... <laughs> I mean, they... Yeah, they control their provider panel, I guess. And, you know, but if you think about it, if we follow the strict rules of VSP, I don't even know how they're they're changing the rules to allow us to be VSP providers anyway, if you think about it, right? I mean, mm. we're not owned by, by the, the doctor. And so that was the original rules of VSP. So we're what's called category two providers. I don't know. I mean, VSP seems, they have lots of lawyers. They must have figured something out. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, Ben, we have a, a question from Paul that he wanted to pose to you. When do private equity groups run out of money? And do they get additional investors? I mean, at, at what point uh, is this train going to slow down? You know, it, it won't slow down. It'll move on. Uh, so this started in dermatology and some other uh, medical professions. And uh, we're, just the next, we're just the next train stop, so to speak. Uh, I don't think money's ever going to run out of private equity. Uh, it, and it is this interesting thing. Private, our investors aren't the ones that actually, that aren't, are, they're not actually purchasing the practices. We still get loans to purchase the practice. We just pay in cash for that, that loan. It, it, you know, we still work with a bank that underwrites the, the deal. Um, and so, you know, that money is used for additional investment that we put into the practices. 
So, yeah, I mean, as, what you're seeing is, uh, especially with FFL, which was the iCare Partners transaction, where FFL is the only one that, that left. Unlike the My Eye Doctor one where Goldman Sachs bought that entity, FFL um, stepped out of iCare Partners and left all the physician uh, investors and the other investors in place. So they just sold their majority share to the next um, to the next investor. So I think, yeah, definitely there's additional investors. But honestly, the money won't run out. They'll just stop investing in optometry and they'll move on to the next profession, whatever that may be. So when do you anticipate that happening? That's a, you know, it's a great question. I, you know, it's tough, tough to predict uh, the <laughs> speed in which acquisitions are happening. Interestingly enough, you're not seeing very many uh, acquisitions advertised anymore. Like Envision Monday, we're, we're just, uh, we're, we're kind of staying away from promoting how much we're buying. Uh, and mm-hmm. it's kind of all the groups have done that, but there's been quite a bit of acquisitions in the last couple of months. Um, you know, in, in, I mean, the answer, the, the answer is that when the, the, enough of the practices that are worth buying are bought. Uh, how long that'll take, it's tough to say, but I would probably say three to five years is minimum. Uh, and then after that, I think you're going to start to see uh, a dramatic slowdown because it's going to get to the point where there's just no more valuable practices to purchase, which is unfortunate. And then what happens? What happens after private equity moves on? As you say, all of the most valuable practices are purchased. What does optometry look like then? Are Will, you, will we see... Uh, new private practices being started? Will there be more consolidation with practices that are left? What What's next? Yeah, again, I, I don't have a crystal ball. In fact, I, I said, you'll, if you, when, when we have my talk here coming up in, a, in about 10 minutes, uh, I do, do try to show, you know, what the future holds. I think a couple things. One is, you know, the big risk is that this is all going to become big optical. And, you know, what I, what I talk about is, right now in private equity in at least the major groups you have optometry kind of dictating what things are happening right so there's an od at my eye doctor that's the chief medical officer there's an od at eye care partners that's the chief medical officer i'm the chief medical officer for AEG vision and there's an od um at, uh, at obviously ods at kepler as long as the ods are continuing driving that and and take my eye doctor out for a second you look at the other ones we're all driving to enhance medical care in our practices. So we take a 360-degree approach. It's not really a, a retail play. Um, you know, we're buying instruments, we're bringing in OCTs, we're bringing OCT angiography, we're definitely bringing in wide field uh, fundus photography. As long as that happens, I think we're less attractive to big optical because that's not their model. They aren't, they aren't going to want to buy a business that has a high percentage of medical revenue or, or clinical revenue as opposed to retail revenue because it's just not their model. So I think what you'll see in the near future is consolidation. So that the groups are going to start eating each other up. Um, and then uh, from there, you know, it, it may be a buy and hold strategy for someone because it, it, these businesses are throwing off a lot of cash. So it may be an opportunity for someone to buy and hold. I think the ultimate risk and fear is that someone like Exo Luxottica or NVI or VSP decides to gobble up these players. Mm. You know, I, VSP maybe, I just don't see it as NBI's play or Esso of Exotica's play. I think, I do think, you know, again, it's not to spoil my talk, but I think my doctors is, big, is probably the biggest risk for that one just because they're kind of already creating a national brand and losing the local practice identity, which if I'm Luxottica and I see what's happening at the malls in America and I want to move away from lens crafters as, a, as my flagship brand, I'm looking at kind of that model to maintain my IMED provider list, which is, you know, what this really is for them. Absolutely. Wow. Got it. And it's interesting, too, you know, you mentioned they're throwing off a bunch of cash. It's, you know, the whole idea behind private equity, right, is you bring a bunch of practices together, try to squeeze out some efficiencies as well. And it's going to be interesting to see which model of the various groups actually is the most successful in the end. Agreed. Yeah. I, you, know, I, I, you know, again, I think, uh, I think my doctor has proven that they're going to be very successful. Um, you know, they sold for for uh, 16.8 times EBITDA, and actually it was more than that um, because they got credit for e- credit for EBITDA they didn't have yet. They had letter of intent on additional uh, EBITDA that they got credit for. So I think when you factor in that money that they got paid on, it was actually closer to 19 times EBITDA, what they actually had at the moment. That's the same as iCare Partners. It was 16.8 roughly, and, and it came closer to 19 times EBITDA. So um, obviously, and those are two different models. So I think, I think both work. I think they'll have they're going to have different endpoints. I think my doctor is going to, again, just my opinion here. I think my eye doctor ends up at a big, big optical. Uh, it's just, it plays really nicely to them. 
eye care partners, maybe it gets bought by a hospital. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, and that's just me throwing out pie, you know, pie in the sky stuff. Who knows? But, mm-hmm. um, you know, that model could be an integrated health model with some sort of hospital base or an ophthalmology group. And it, it just can, can keep growing from there. Got it. Well, I don't want to keep you too long because your talk is about to start in a few minutes. And mm-hmm. I know that yeah. you want to be there and answer questions. I always enjoy talking with you, Ben. Thanks so much for being willing to to come and talk to us and we'll be talking to you soon. Sounds great. I enjoy our talks as well and uh, and have a great rest of the show. I think it's almost over, right? Is this today's the last day? And today's live? the last day yeah. and we've got awesome. um, two more full slots of classes and then the last slot just has one. So yeah, we are staring down at the end of it. Yep. Awesome. Well, congratulations, guys. Thank you. Thanks, ben. Thanks for your help and we'll talk soon. Yeah, take care. All righty. Bye-bye. All right. Sounds good. Take care. <laughs> Bye. All right. Ben always has interesting things to say, he and does. I enjoy hearing what he has to say. And that's that's interesting about um, the money not running out, but just moving on. Yep. And I, I find that really, really interesting. Yep. So we are looking at 5 o'clock which as we said, Ben Chedner talking about private equity, things to fear and things to cheer. Whitney Hauser talking about the impact of oral medications on the ocular surface. Brian Hall is talking about cha- challenging cases in neuro-ophthalmology. And Mark Dunbar is talking about hot topics in retina. So that is coming up uh, starting momentarily. And then our last full slot, six o'clock, Management of uh, HSV and VSV anterior segment eye disease. Controlling myopia, what the evidence says and why one diopter matters. Is AMD a systemic disease? And then finally, bringing back the tears, ins and outs of punctal occlusion. Yep, and then at the 7 a.m. slot, you don't see it in here, this is an obsolete calendar, my apologies for that, but there's the talk all about AI uh, and binocularity and using machine learning to try to make the diagnosis, so kind of cool stuff. Yeah, so we've got um, two more full slots and then the AI class at 7, and that'll wrap up all of our classes. Yep, and the AI class will actually be in room 1, if you're planning on attending that one. So, excellent. And I think we have a call coming up, don't we? We do. We are going to be speaking with Rosner and Feinberg Feinberg from the Neurovisual Institute. All right. This should be interesting because I really wanted to learn more about the Institute. Mm -hmm. It's... uh, you know, they, they are the, you know, a new sponsor, so it's always fun to learn new stuff. So let me see if I can get them on the phone. And their class is just finishing now, Changing Lives with Lenses, a new approach to vertical heterophoria. So I'm going to actually give them a couple minutes before we get in there. Because they might want to run to the bathroom yeah. <laughs> after the class and talking with, uh, yeah. with attendees and answering their questions. Yeah. So before we call them then, I'm going to give them, I'm going to cut them some slack here because I know what this is like to be thrown into something like that mm-hmm. uh, so quickly. So um, we can probably just take a look here at what else we have going on just for a minute. Um, oh, let me just do one more reminder then for anyone who's still here and listening to me because I, oh, yes, I have to yes, nag. Yes. It's like my, my superpower. So um, <clears throat> remember to successfully complete your CE, watch the entire lecture. Do not leave the place early. Um, because we have software that actually checks to make sure the window's open. That's a COPE requirement, not our requirement. Um, They basically, COPE hands us the requirements, the list, and we tailor the software to meet its needs. And that's one of them. They want to make sure that you're actually here. Even if you know the material cold, leave that window open until the end of the lecture. The computer will record that you were here. That's also critically important if you're in a state like New York where the live credits are uh, kept differently from the um, on-demand credits, so. Uh, once you finished, pass the quiz. Again, uh, people had questions before about taking the quiz immediately. You do not need to take the quiz immediately. You can take it whenever you like, all the way through August, and you'll still get credit for the class. If you missed the quiz because you stayed in class late and you want to take it, go to the Help tab uh, in your window where you're there, and you can actually pull up the quizzes for each class. So go to the Help tab. You'll, you should see it there, the ability to pull up the quizzes. And by the way, if you're having any problem with anything, just send an email to support at cwire2020.com and you'll get all of us. This, that goes to all of the entire support staff, including me. So I will actually be there to take your requests or, or handle your problems as well if I can. Um, otherwise, we have the rest of the staff standing by right now. They know that obviously we've been yakking it up here on the air all day, so we can't really <laughs> do much. So our support staff has been ha- helping people log in all day, helping them with tests and so forth. So they're always there to help. 
Um, that's one critical difference. And I'll mention it again because I think it's hilarious. On your CE certificates, when you get them, you'll see a phone number. That's actually my cell phone number. If you have any problems with anything that's happened, feel free to contact me. Um, I always like hearing from folks at the conference. And, oh, final thing, number three, if you could please fill out the survey at the end of each course, it would really be helpful to us. It's a COPE requirement that we have to have surveys at the end of each course. Um, and for us, it's not just a requirement, it's really important because it's the primary way we get feedback on how good each class was, or if you had a problem with a speaker or with a topic, we really do need to know about it. Uh, because as you know, we will adjust the course load based on your feedback. You know, the, the, we're gonna start planning, we need a little vacation, but we're gonna probably start planning for next year's conference, you know, relatively soon, wow. right? In, in the spring um, is when we start. And we take the data from the, you know, we wait basically till most people have taken the classes, you know, in early summer. We take a look at what people have done and then we decide what we're going to do for next year. And it's your feedback on those surveys that helps us decide who, who to ask back uh, and what topics we would actually like to see. So please, please, please fill out the surveys. Also too, Adam, you and Paul and Steve really do listen when people offer suggestions mm -hmm. about what topics they are interested in, what they liked, what classes didn't go over so well. and. So if people out there are looking for education on a certain topic, uh, these guys here are willing to listen and you can affect the class lineup of next year's CE Wire simply by filling out the survey or getting in touch with Adam, Paul, or Steve yep. and letting them know. So your voice is heard and your vote does count. And in fact, if you look, here's a list. I don't know if I showed you this, Gretchen, but you can see it up here. The, the list of the different category hours for CE Wire as it <coughs> stands right now. <coughs> And you'll see there's a little bit of an overrepresentation of anterior segment stuff, but that's just because it's what people told us they wanted to see. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we overrepresent that. But if you look across here, what we tried to do was make it sort of broad. Right. right? We didn't want to really have, you know, anything overrepresented. So that's, that's why it looks the way it does. And we're willing to take on just about any topic as long as it can be categorized. Right, right. And if it's what people want to hear, then people will come in sit in the classes and support CE Wire, and more importantly, give them the education that they're looking for. Yep. Okay, so should we give these guys a shot? What do you think? I think so. We've given them long enough? I'm sure they have a million questions at their, their uh, talk, but I'll, I'll interrupt, right? I'll be rude. I'll be like you at the restaurant. See if I got the number right. That'll do it. Hi there. Hey, Hi there. how's it going? You got Adam and Gretchen here. How you doing? Hello. Hi, Gretchen. Hi, Adam. How are you both? We are doing great. How? And your talk just finished. So how did it go? Perfect. We sat here and we, we heard these two brilliant people speak. It was impressive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my um, goodness. It's serious. It's Feedback. Whatever happened with our download, there was a couple of audio visual glitches. Mm. So I don't know where that happened. If it's on your side or my side, but we should chat about that. Sure. The videos were all off by a second. And when I changed slides, our voice got cut out. So I don't oh, know no. if that's us or you. So uh, on the bright side, I haven't heard of anyone complaining about it, so it may have just been on your end where it happened. Normally, when we get cutouts like that, you know, we get people read us the riot act. <laughs> um, so we haven't heard anything too bad. So it looks like it's, you know, it, it went fairly smoothly at least. Yeah, and the cutouts that we were talking about verbally, it was like half a second. So frankly, you'd get the message. Right. It was kind of like, you know made me feel mad for that. Yeah, but you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting technical thing though, right? Because when you have hundreds of people, you know, taking this all at once, you have these bandwidth issues from where the thing's coming from. So sometimes some people can fall out of sync, but you know, for the most part this year, it's been, you know, I'm gonna knock wood because the show's not over yes, yet. Yes, knock wood. <laughs> um, but the most part, it's, it's been going pretty smoothly. So, um, you know, we've been talking up you guys all day today and yesterday. And the one question I had, you know, um, since I'm gonna put up your, an actual picture of your website right now, um, people have been asking me, so what is it that you guys do? And how in the world did you start this? So I'm kind of curious. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about your story. Sure. So for me, it was actually Mark's brother, who's an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and he was my first patient. 
he was feeling clumsy, clusty, walking into walls. And um, he said, can you examine my eyes? And I did. And um, what I'd learned is that when he was in medical school, he was frustrated by rereading for comprehension and just struggling with processing with reading. And um, when I examined his eyes, I found he, in fact, did need PRISM. And I synchronized the images that he was seeing with a small unit of PRISM. He felt better. He felt less clumsy, clusty. And really, it was 10 years later, he was processing all this information, started thinking that he needed to send his busy patients because they started coming like he did to other eye doctors. The other eye doctors were not <clears throat> making the connection. And then he called me up, which I thought was out of the blue, but for him, it was happening for quite a while, and he said, I need to send you my dizzy patient. Just like I said in the TED Talk, and I was shocked. I said, what would I do with him? He said, you're going to help them the way that you help me. So it really began my journey over 25 years ago, starting with, you know, one ENT, and then the next person was a brain injury doctor who herself needed PRISM. She got PRISM, and then she said, I'm going to send you my TBI patient. So everything happened very organically over all these 25 years. Wow. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. They, I think you learn a lot about binocularity in school and prescribing PRISM and stuff, but, you know, for most practitioners on a day-to-day -day basis, they don't really think about it very much, right? Right. And, you know, I think what I discovered as I started training my colleagues that a lot of them just abandoned some of those tests because they didn't know what to do with the results. You know, they might do the Von Grace, but they get the data and then say, what do I do with it? So for me, I was trying all those tests and they weren't really helping me out as much as I thought they should. And so I started creating my own format for how to figure these patients out using a lot of very, you know, sort of intuitive, provocative tests, having them walk a hallway, having them bend down and see if I could trigger their symptoms, and then just really beginning the trial process of using the small units of PRISM to synchronize the images. As I did, their walk changed, their symptoms changed. So, you know, it was, I credit women in optometry with trolling the internet and finding a book that we had written, if the walls in my exam room could talk. And when they, my colleagues read that article, they said, I want to learn what you do. I hadn't yet written the manual. And, and Mark and I just literally went into the office on Saturdays and started writing down what I was doing. And that's how the training program originally began over six years ago. Wow. So it just, it was born of your clinical experience. That's really remarkable. It was very organic. And I do credit my dad, who's 94. Oh, he wow. just retired a year ago. And he was the one that gave me the gift of time. He never told me how long I could see a patient for. And it was really being able to explore and figure them out that, was the gift of, you know, not worrying about what time was it and how long had I been spending. Right. And it, to this day, we do 80-minute exams with each of these patients. Wow. Did you say your father just retired? Yes, at age 93. He's still, you know, doing great. He just has some balance problems from, you know, sinus stenosis, or, you know, birthday celebrations. But his mind is sharp as a tack, and he did truly give me that freedom for exploration in a private setting where I could start to figure it out. But don't ask him if he's retired. He's just going to tell you he's on medical leave. <laughs> <laughs> wow, just retiring at age 93. Right. That's, That's incredible. Yep. And so let's just review just for a second. So this, this whole idea of binocular vision, vision dysfunction, right? So for people who've been out of school for a long time and might not really be, be up on what's going on, can you just tell people what that is and, and what it might lead to when you see people with, with this problem? Sure. You know, in its most basic form, it's when the two eyes are not working well together as a team. And, you know, the traditional test where you check each eye separately, for us, it's just the beginning. And in order to really figure out, is there a binocular vision, uh, let's say an eye misalignment or an image misalignment, we're looking at it on both the vertical and the horizontal plane. And there's about 16 different tests that we do, all of which to try to sort out are the two eyes working together well, or is there this, I'll call it image misalignment? And by working with small units of PRISM, we're actually able to, first of all, find out that there isn't an image misalignment. And then as we add the PRISM 
both again vertically and horizontally. We move the patients in space. We walk them down this long hallway. You saw some of that or heard some about how we walk them down a hallway. We're looking for their drift. Are they drifting to the right, to the left? And this is like old fashioned physical diagnosis to analyze what's happening and how is this impacting them. And I actually want to just get a word in here with regards to symptoms. You know, you would think that if they're having binocular vision dysfunction, they would all be seeing double. But that's more of a heterotopia. These people are more heterophoric. So they're able through struggling to maintain single imagery most of the time. And it's the struggling to do that that's getting them symptomatic. So most of the standard traditional associated and dissociated phoria tests are really made for bigger misalignments. We're finding really small misalignments, and I think that's what's throwing our um, vision colleagues, is that they're not finding anything on the traditional test or very little, and they don't know what to do with those numbers, and in reality, the patient is pretty symptomatic from this. Right. You know, when I was in school, we never really learned that we could help dizzy mm -hmm. people. So when my ENT brother-in-law said, I think you're going to help these people, I was really shocked, and I said, I'm certainly happy to try. And as I started to talk to them, there was a clear pattern that they were clumsy, clusty. They walked into furniture or door jams, and they were motion sick in the car. They would use their finger to help keep their um, place on the page. And then there was another colleague of mine who was a brain injury doctor, and she herself heard about my work, and she said, I'm coming for a visit. Sure enough, she needed a prism just like my brother-in-law. And after she got better, she started sending all these TBI patients. In those days, I was so naive, I didn't even know what the letters TBI meant, traumatic <laughs> brain injury. And now it represents over 50% of my patients have had some brain injury, whether it's a fall on black ice, whether it's some stroke, car accident, sports injury, glass injury. And the beautiful part about the work is whatever I would do for somebody who might be born with it, I'm doing the same exact assessment for someone with a brain injury and getting the same um, positive outcome. Right. And I just want to toss in that one of the things that Debbie touched on, but I want to expand upon, is that these patients don't have what are considered traditional vision symptoms. And the optometric and ophthalmologic communities don't understand this, and frankly, neither does the medical community. But binocular vision discomfort, sorry, dysfunction, can be causative of anxiety problems, um, it can also be causative of what we would call vestibular symptoms, which Debbie was touching on, dizziness, nausea, motion sickness, and pain problems like headaches and neck pain. And you just, the patients tend to go, particularly our TBI colleague, she used to send, you know, the, the dizzy people went to the ENT and the headache people went to the neurologist and the neck discomfort people went to the chiropractor. And it just, it's not, they don't understand that it's syndromic. Right. So that's why our question so powerful because it covers those domains. And when somebody fills it out, we have um, isitmyeyes.com is the URL. So if anybody just goes to that, fills out, they may have an aunt or a relative that it sounds like them. Um, the score will tell us and we'll tell them, yeah, you are clearly symptomatic and this is likely to be from your eyes not working well together. Hmm. And everything is basically put into the glasses, incorporated into the eyeglass prescription. Right. And, you know, taking a look, and I'm pulling up your website right now as well, so, you know, show everybody. Um, one question that, that people also had, you know, if they are interested in this topic now, you obviously have the Institute. What does your training program kind of look like to get, to get people involved? That's a good question. Sure. So they come, you know, they certainly they call our office and we have an institute director and they'll ask to speak to that person. Her name is Ashley Voss. But basically, Ashley will walk them through the program. Basically, it's five days. They come on a Sunday. And I just did a Women in Optometry podcast, which articulates the entire program. Basically, they come on a Sunday. We start Monday morning. I work all day with them Monday one-on-one -on -one, or if it's two-on-one, -on -one, two people coming let's say, together. And then at the end of that first day, I've examined their eyes, they've examined mine, and maybe one of my staff members, and they're learning essentially the technique. And then day two, they're going to watch me examine patients live. And instead of eight people a day, which is all I ever see, we slow it down to 50%. So I'll mm. examine four people. 
And after each patient, we go through all the nuances of what I found, what did I do with that data, how they analyze it. Day three, which is Wednesday, they're going to see their own patients while I'm right there watching them, supporting them. Uh, day four, they are going to um, see my colleagues so they can see how another person <clears throat> might do the same work from a style. And then Friday, once again, they're back to seeing their own patients. They're then going to go home with a toolbox, if you will. It used to be a suitcase. Now it's, it's sort of bigger, so we send them home with a box. <laughs> now it's kind of time to stay home. And that toolbox has all the equipment they're going to need to start on Monday morning doing this work. We also provide for them all the necessary, quote, unquote, paperwork, marketing materials, information for the patient in the office, et cetera. So they have the ability to know what we do, um, and they can reproduce that as necessary in their own environment. Because what they're trying a whole new practice style, if you will, for the, at least for this patient population. And um, we really, they, they need everything, so we provide everything. Gosh, you so know. It becomes a niche. Yeah. Some people do squirrels. This is like a niche for them. Right. And you know what's interesting about it, too, is Gretchen and I were speaking to Crystal Brimer this morning, uh, Dr. Brimer, who has her Dry Eye Institute. And y it looks like your philosophies are very similar, where you have this intimate kind of group that you bring in mm -hmm. and show them a real life situation about how this works and then provide them with everything that they need to take home with them to actually implement this in practice. And then we also have um, 130 questionnaires that come in from all over the country and the world once a, throughout the week. So we get people, let's say if you're from Pennsylvania, you're going to get all those questionnaires that come through. So we also support our colleagues with referrals. And then we do webinars four times a year because new things happen, new techniques are developed, and we want to keep them abreast of everything new that we're doing. And then lastly, my least favorite thing, Debbie will pick up the phone if anybody calls. So she'll spend time with them in the evening. <laughs> that sounds like... Jealous, but no, seriously, we, we do provide the support that they need from the doctor. Also, when they get billing questions or optician questions, um, we provide that support as well. Because frankly, we really just want them to be successful. This is a whole new paradigm. And it's a lot of work convincing the world that what we're doing makes sense. And the last thing we want them to do is go out there and be not successful. And that's not been the case. Our students have gone home, and every one of them, we've got about 30 of them now, have been able to go ahead, you know, that very following Monday and start performing this kind of work. Right. That sounds there like a, a web website. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Website just want to share NVM Institute, Neurovisual Medicine Institute org. If anybody goes to that site, they'll learn much of the detail we're sharing as well videos that, that our colleagues produced. Yep, yeah, actually I have, I have those up on the screen right now so people can actually take, take a look. Um, one question I had for you though was about the, the spectacle lenses that you guys tend to produce, right, as, a, as part of a treatment, right, with PRISM. Um, do you find that the, the, it's challenging for some of the labs to make this or do people use their local labs? How does this work? We have a lab that we start out recommending that they use from day one so that they can be sure that when they receive their lenses for their patients that they're spot on because there is a training associated with saying to a lab, look, we need really tight tolerances. These are small units of prism. So we do encourage them to start out with the lab that we use. And for the most part, they do, at least for the first couple of years. And many of them tend to stay with that lab. But the important thing is that they know with confidence that whatever they've ordered is going to be spot on when they get it. Great. It sounds like that training program sounds like a, a big commitment from a doctor. It's about a week out of uh, his or her practice to come and shadow you, but it sounds like it's a very stepwise process in that they learn the concepts and then they watch you and then they do it on their own with support and then they have their own patients. So although it's a big time commitment, you get everything you need in those several days. And as soon as you walk back into your own practice, you're able to handle that on your own. Yeah, so I would say you're right. It is a time commitment. And what I say to them is, you know, we often will go out of state sometimes if we're lucky to have that opportunity to do continuing ad AOA or, you know, academy. So I, I say, look at this as a little vacation. You're going to come to train, learn a new subspecialty, get 40 credit hours and uh, really go home with something that's 
many ways, it's a game changer. So there's nothing routine about these patients. You're always thinking more than you maybe did with a traditional environment where you have complex cases, but they're in the same day that somebody comes in with a cane or, or off balance and quite nauseous. And by the end of that visit with their trial frame on, you've actually reduced their symptoms sometimes by more than 50%. So there's tremendous reward in this work. And I think they experience that during the week and know this is going to be different. Yep. I'm going to just pop two things here. The first one is the doctors that tend to come are the ones that are really looking to make a difference in their patients' lives. Mm-hmm. Um, not that they're not concerned about the financials. Um, the financials are solid. This work, you know, pays for itself. But the, their main goal, they've got a lot of heart. And they know that they could be doing better for this population because they see them. And they don't have the tools. And they're interested in expanding their repertoire by adding this to their practice. Um, we've trained people that have um, backgrounds in all kinds of optometry, vision therapy, um, uh, not, not sclerals. Uh, anyway, the point is, is that the, it oh, gives syntonics. them syntonics. So it gives them another tool to help this exact same patient population, and um, they find it very rewarding. <clears throat> Absolutely, and in fact, it's probably also a great referral driver too. Um, and I'm not, you know, I think for the doctors who've gone through this, I'm actually on. The, could it be my site right now? Everyone can see it up on the screen. And I'm looking at the, the map of providers across the United States. So I could imagine if you can become well-known, at least in your local area, this could be a good driver of referrals to your practice. Yes, and, and you know, in our office, and in, in, in theirs as well, they're going to find the people who are referring to them are ENTs, neurologists, mm-hmm. psychiatrists, OTs, PTs. And these are doctors who you actually establish relationships with with the communication that you create with nice letters that detail out your care. They're so happy to have you as a resource in the area because they've done everything they can. And this is this, their group of difficult patients that they're happy to know there's an answer for them. Right. Excellent. So if people want to get started with you, what's, what's their best approach? I would say just to call the office and I can give that phone number. It's 248. 248- Two five eight nine thousand, and press extension four, and that is our NVM Institute director Ashley Voss. Great. Okay. Yeah. And and uh, and I'm looking. I actually put up a, put up the number right on the screen right now as well. So I nailed it on the first try right here. So <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So everyone can see it. Thanks. So this great. is this is this has been great. So you know, I think um, if there are any you know more questions, we're obviously going to be posting this conversation on OD Wire. Not too many people you know watch during the live event because they're too busy sitting in classes. But we post all of this back to the site for all you know 23,000 people on OD Wire to see. Um, so if there are any questions, we'll definitely get back to you and, and let you know, and maybe you can continue the interaction with the docs online. That's great. We're looking forward to um, answering any questions they have. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks thank so much for being here. Thank you so much, here. and thank you for the talk. Thank, thank you for you. the support of CEY 2020, and I always enjoy hearing about the work that you do. Thank you for this thank opportunity you. to share our work. Thanks, guys. All righty. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Okay. Bye. Bye now. Cool stuff. Yeah, very interesting stuff about um, how they can help people with certain challenges, and it's just incredible what they can do to help. So I'm really glad that they were able to share a little bit about what they do, and I'm very interested in hearing how their talk went. I bet you that there were a lot of good questions I'm sure. I actually just kind of like, very similar to Crystal this morning, how it's this whole personal thing where you get to fly in and you spend a week, and obviously this is funny, right, because we're doing virtual CE here, the whole idea being it's cheap and you don't have to go anywhere. But I sort of find the opposite approach is also very valuable, right? Imagine if you can take like an entire week, Mm -hmm. if you have the ability to do it, to be somewhere and actually see a thing live for an entire week. And immerse yourself. And, and it, I think that's needed with uh, with small groups, mm-hmm. the way this is taught, the way you said Crystal's Dry Eye Institute, because certain techniques you really need to have that small group interaction to be able to, to try things out, to learn, to watch, and then to try it with the support of somebody there with you. And I think when you are immersed in something like that, as opposed to going to, even sitting in CE Wire, which is fabulous, but you aren't immersed. You're going right. from class to class 
or if you're at Vision Expo or an AOA or Academy, you're still going from class to class and then you go back to your regular environment and then all your good intentions are still very good, but stuff happens. Your optician calls out sick. You need to get a plumber in because the patient toilet is jammed. <laughs> Something's going on and you really can't right. jump in. But when you take the time, regardless of whether it's looking at binocular vision or looking at dry eye, or it could be whatever you're, you're interested in, having a small immersive group, I think goes a long way to, as Jim Sluck would put it, taking that ambition and turning it into action. Yep, afterward. absolutely. So yeah, pretty Agreed. cool stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. Adam, we are coming very close to the end here. It is the end. 5.30 Eastern. So we are halfway through Whitney Hauser's talk on the impact of oral medications on the ocular surface. All right. Ben Chudner's talk on private equity. Brian Hall's talk on challenging cases in neuro-ophthalmology. And Mark Dunbar's talk on hot topics in retina. So in 30 minutes, we will start our last full slot of classes talking about AH HSV and VSV anterior segment eye disease controlling myopia, what the evidence says and why one diopter matters. Is AMD a systemic disease? And bringing back the tears, ins and outs of punctal occlusion. And then finally at seven, we have AI meets OD, how machine learning is impacting optometry and its treatment of digital eye strain and headache. So, wow, this is it. We are staring down the end of yep, this is, this CEYR 2020. Shocker. <laughs> and we survived. And you know, well, they, it's not over yet. We're not over yet. So they mentioned there was a little, they had a little hiccup with their video. I suspect it was a local problem though uh, to their PC because usually when there's any sort of a tech glitch, oh, do we hear about it? Um, I asked Steve. He said there were, um, there was a little bit of a blip, um, but he had audio. So he said no complaints from anyone. So. Yeah. We will take it. So far, so good. Yep. So, I mean, it's, it can be a challenge sometimes pushing this much video and audio, um, you know, for this period of time. Right. You know, part of the technical challenges of doing this. So, um, I'm glad that nothing, you know, super huge has blown up. So, yeah, we will take it so far. So, so we far. We still have a few classes left, but yep. we will take the win, what we have so far. Indeed. So, yeah. Excellent. All right, well, I guess we are closing in on our final, you know, the, the, the way we're gonna close out here today is to talk to Steve Silverberg, right? Right. Um, so I guess maybe before that, we could just run through our sponsors one more time Absolutely. and say thank you to all of them. Because we wouldn't be here without the sponsors. No, we definitely wouldn't. Um, it just wouldn't happen. So let me pull it on up for folks. And if anybody out there has not yet gone into the exhibit hall to take a look at the sponsor booths there, please do. Yes, I, I will shame you if you don't. You'll be exhibit hall shamed. Because if, if you don't go visit the sponsors and don't support them, then they don't support CE Wire, and that means that your CE would be a lot more expensive yep. without their support. Yep. So take a look, go visit them, see what they have to say, ask questions, and they're there for you. Right, and again, no one, I, I know people don't in general as a rule care about the economics of these kinds of things, or they don't even think about it, but putting on a conference like this, particularly with this number of credits, has a very high fixed cost. Um, and that means long before you start registering around Thanksgiving time, you know, most of the costs of the conference has been sunk already in us retaining the speakers and the technology. Right. And then even the marketing for that matter. I mean, yeah, so we market a lot on ODWire, but you know, there's also some marketing expenses as well. And all of these are fixed sunk costs. And so we rely on our sponsors to help us get through that, you know, part before everyone registers. Um, it's, it's incredibly important that we have them on board. Uh, so thank you to all of them for coming out and sponsoring us today. And maybe we can just run through them one more time. Absolutely. All right. Do you want to go through the, la the rules again really quickly? Oh, the rules, okay. Just to remind so, everybody just to remind who's everyone, still there. Because, you know, you can't say that I didn't tell you so, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the biggest support issues that we frequently have is uh, people saying, how come I didn't get credit? 
Critical rules for completing your CE. One, watch the entire lecture and do not leave early. <laughs> don't close your browser window. This, you will regret it. This is probably the most critical rule. Don't leave because the computer has to track how long you've been watching, and it does that by looking at your browser window to make sure that it's open. That's our version of the uh, older ladies in sweaters sitting outside the, uh, the class. Yes. The monitors. Exactly. That is exactly what that is. And it's a COPE requirement, not, not one that we had. It's one that they had, and we had to implement it in the software. Uh, they want to make sure that you're here. And it also knows that you're here live versus on demand, which is critically important for some states like New York and Texas. So you want to you know, take as many live classes as you can. So it keeps track of that. And importantly, that also means uh, there's a quiz at the end, but you don't have to take it immediately. You can take it whenever you feel like it, all the way through August, and you'll still get credit for the live show if you were here, because it records the fact that you were here. I'd recommend taking the quizzes as soon as you can, just because you'll forget stuff. Uh, you need 70 to pass. Remember, if you can't find where a quiz is, go to the Help tab, and it can, uh, it'll bring up a list of all the quizzes, mm -hmm. so you can always find them again. And you can take a quiz as many times as you need to to pass, so don't worry about that. Are you able to see a quiz before you watch the, watch the course? So, no. Well, here's the thing. You can take it before the course ends, but again, if you pop out of that course and you close that window, I, it doesn't matter if you finish the quiz. You will not get credit. No, I meant if I want to take... Oh, download it first? No, I don't think that's the way it works. I think you have to go I into was just the... I want to yeah. make sure that nobody can game the system, that you can't look well, at the quiz so, first. So newsflash to everyone in, who you know has a medical license like me, they not only give you the quizzes, and many times they'll give you the answer key beforehand. Swear to God. Really? So and that is legit education? And so I, I don't think it is, but these rules are, are loose. They're fast and loose. Wow. And, um, and, and a lot of times medical C doesn't have the requirement that you have to sit there and watch the whole lecture. I've, you know, I, I, I'm not a saint, and I've done it before where I've closed the browser window out doing it live, taken the test because I knew I would pass without having to sit there for an hour, and I've gotten credit. Um, <sighs> it happens, right? And so they're getting stricter about it over the past several years. You know, they're starting to, to have stricter requirements, but optometry far outpaces, in my opinion anyway, medical CE, at least from what I've seen. And so you think that these regulations are a good thing? Oh, absolutely. I mean, are they a pain? Of course. Yes. But they're supposed to be, right? Because they're supposed to be, you know, keeping you honest so you can do this education online. I would much rather have a, a requirement to have to sit through a browser window being open than have to travel somewhere in terms of time, right? Um, so these rules I don't think are particularly onerous, particularly the, the quiz issue and keeping your window open. So um, for everybody who complains about how these rules are a pain in the ass, just remember your medical doctors, your gastroenterologist, your GP can look at the answer key before taking the <laughs> quiz right. for their CME. Now, so just that's what your your own medical practitioners are doing. So just remember that when right. you start complaining about so, optometry COPE rules. So in, in many ways, COPE is ahead of the curve in terms of actually requiring more from, from practitioners. So I don't think it's a terrible thing. Um, and I think it definitely helps people learn better. So anyway, let's get up on my soapbox. <laughs> um, and finally, please fill out the survey. Uh, when you're done with the test, we really, really need that data. Really need it, like badly. Like it's, th it is the most important thing to me once this conference ends because I actually go through all the thousands of responses, and I look through. And by the way, I especially love the verbal responses. You know, I leave you a couple blank lines if you feel like writing. Feel free. Wait, that isn't verbal. Well, you know what I mean. Written instead of the multiple choice. Was this good? One to five. Like so. There's that. That's the typical survey question. You mean an open-ended op response? Open-ended response. So we give them two lines to write whatever they feel like. And they say Adam and Gretchen were awesome, <laughs> or they say Adam and Gretchen totally sucked. Don't do that again. That's more like it. Um, <laughs> so yeah. So please write in there whatever you want. You know. And again, as I mentioned before, my phone number is on the certificates right there too. So if you have some real problem with something, feel free to contact me. I'm, I'm always here to listen. We don't want to do something that people hate, especially not year over year. Absolutely. Um, so please let us know. Okay, now our sponsors. So, Marco, the original sponsor, right? The, the original sponsor as I was down in Jacksonville and on a whim mentioned this to the folks at Marco, would you be willing to support this? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, sure, sounds great. And so without their, their support, actually, we wouldn't have gotten this off the ground at all. And they've been supporting the live stream since the beginning. So thank you, Marco. Thank you to Marco, the There's original. Yes, the, the original the, sponsor. The, the OG sponsor. And that's why you see the Marco Meatball everywhere on the live stream, right? So if you look up at the, the top, right, you see the, the thing up there. I love that you call it the Marco Meatball. Do yeah. they know you call it the Marco Meatball? They know that's what I call it, and they haven't given me a better name to call it, so that's what it will be called. They don't care? <laughs> yeah, so they, they don't care. Well, meatballs are good, yeah. so. so. So anyway, thank you, Marco. 
Um, so Hogstrite, so they're a new sponsor this year. Obviously, they, they make equipment that lots of folks use and love in their offices, and they have discounts at this show. They were so thrilled when they heard they didn't have to carry anything. <laughs> <laughs> so a um, $1,000 rebate with the purchase of an Octopus 900 Basic, $1,500 rebate with the purchase of Octopus 900 Pro. So check out their booth and, and all the stuff that Hog is doing. Uh, Neurovisual Medicine Institute, we just got off the phone with them. We did. And we learned all about the institute and how it works if you want to treat problems with binocularity. So they basically give the Clark Chang soup to nuts, I'll call it, um, <laughs> version of an institute where you can go out there and in five days learn how to integrate uh, this into your practice, the idea of, of uh, diagnosing and treating these disorders that many people do find difficult to treat and somewhat baffling, right? Um, you'll get referrals in from not just ODs, but, but people like ENTs, right? People who are dealing with dizziness issues or neurologists when their patients have headaches. So you can start building a referral base that goes beyond eye care to try to treat problems that may be caused by, by binocular issues. And basically their institute is a very intimate setting where they're gonna take you through this step by step, how to mm -hmm. do it, how to become an expert, um, they even give you all the sort of paperwork that you would need and everything to sort of set you up for success when you get back home and set up this new mode of practice. Um, so they're, they're enrolling students now in the Institute, so definitely check out their website, check out their booth here as well, uh, and learn all about it if this is something you're interested in. Again, it's one of those things where eye care is perfectly situated for, for this type of thing, whereas other specialties are not. So if you're looking for a niche, this would be a good one, I think. Tear care. So we spoke with Jim Sluck earlier about tear care. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a device for my, my bone mean gland dysfunction. Um, it's a little thing that you put up right on your lashes or your lids and, and uh, it um, takes care of uh, opening up the my bone mean glands with heat. Now this whole idea of using heat has been around for a while, right? But um, the great thing about tear care is that it is inexpensive, in fact shockingly inexpensive. I was a little bit surprised mm -hmm. um, by how far the technology has come and how much cheaper it's become. So it's put something that used to be relatively exotic that people couldn't access into something that literally every OD can afford to have in their office. Only ambitious ODs though, according yes. to Jim Sluck. You need to be ambitious and they want people who want to take action yeah. instead of just getting another device yes. that might just sit around. Anybody can buy a paperweight. Right. Right, but you really, if you're gonna buy it, you should buy it and use it and like use it. it. And, and so, but it's just amazing that in 2020, we have this technology now that used to be, you know, six figure expensive, you know, now we're getting tr real treatments that work at a price point, you know, that's under $2,000, which is amazing. So definitely check it out. VTI, so makers of the Natural View contact lens. Um, so they are specialty lens. And Gretchen, what is the interesting thing about this lens? The interesting thing about this lens is, wait, maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're saying. The most interesting thing about this lens, I will tell you, is the uh, one ad, right? So for their multifocal. Oh, that's not where I thought you were going. I apologize, <laughs> yes. So what, what did you think was interesting? <laughs> I, I thought we were talking about the show specials there, so oh. yeah. Well, that's I always was... interesting, but yeah, I'll show you the show special here too. Uh, but yeah, so they, they make a multifocal lens that only has a single ad, and so it's very different uh, from Absolutely. other lenses. Absolutely, so you're not going from a low ad to a high ad, or which one is the right one, when do you bump the patient, they've yep. got one. And it's a daily disposable, which also makes it interesting as well, so it's kind of a cool lens. Uh, and the most interesting thing, and I will say it because I can, it's not FDA approved for myopia management, but people are using it that way, as people tend to do. So this has become a very popular lens for that, that function. And Doug Benoit intimated that we might be hearing some information from them yes, so in the near future about that, and so. I hope that's the case. Yep, so we will see how that goes. So VTI, so they have $3 off per box on a purchase of 25 or 50 unit blank of natural view multifocal one day contacts, so check them out. Zeiss, we had a good conversation with them about the, the Claris and the, the uh, new Cirrus device as well. Um, so Zeiss has had sort of a refresh of their equipment over the past year or two, and you should definitely check them out if you haven't. It's shocking how fast the OCT has become. Um, I mean, I, I was just stunned when I actually got to play with the new Cirrus unit last September. I got to, to play with a prototype uh, at a trade show, and it was like, you know, you take it and it's done. And so it's a huge improvement in speed over the old ones, even for OCT and geography, so definitely worth checking out. Um, they all, we're also talking about the Claris units today, their wide field imaging unit, which is also amazing because you don't need to smush your face in like a pancake <laughs> against the <laughs> thing to get, to get out to the periphery. So if you haven't seen it, it's, it's pretty neat. And, it's and the device itself 
is so it's, it's smaller than you would think that it would be. It's very small. It's less than like the width of a patient's shoulders. So you can easily get the patient in. It doesn't take up a ton of floor space. So um, and very cool looking industrial design. So check them out. They're running a bunch of specials here on the Claris <coughs> Retinal Camera, the Cirrus OCTs, and the HFA3 perimeters, including an extra warranty for the equipment. And there's also retina specific bundles, which are a combination of Claris and Cirrus, and glaucoma bundles, which is a combination of HFS, HFA3 and Cirrus. Uh, and specials on the forum data management solution as well to integrate all this data together. So cool stuff from Zeiss. AB Max, so the Dremel tool for anterior blepharitis, Dremel as I call tool. it. Dremel tool, that's I'm bad. <laughs> I'm sure John at AB Max appreciates that description. But you know, it's a little handheld device that'll allow you to sort of get rid of all the cruft that have built up. Cruft? That's the technical term, right? <laughs> crap, is that better? Um, crap on, on and people's, stuff. Uh, crap cruft. and stuff on people's lids and lashes uh, to, to get rid of it. Um, and so he, John actually has the patents on the original device. This is a second generation device. And the second generation is noteworthy because it's got different operational modes and importantly, the consumables are way cheaper. I think they're like 50% less um, or better than that even. John's also got a deal going where he'll actually give away the device itself if you buy a certain number of consumables, which is incredible because he wants mm -hmm. this thing in as many offices as possible and doesn't want the price of the device itself to be a stumbling block. So check that out. He's also got an offer uh, to turn in your old one, <laughs> the Gen 1 device. You can see it up there on the screen. So if you have an old Gen 1 device, trade it in. You'll get a huge uh, or discount off of uh, the new device, which could mm -hmm. pay for itself rather rapidly, right? Because the new tips are so much cheaper than the and old ones. And consumable one. costs are a concern for practitioners when they are looking at what device to purchase mm -hmm. because even if uh, the actual device itself is reasonable, you have to remember that you need to replace those tips or whatever is it is that is the consumable product there that you need new ones for each patient and that can run into some money. Yep. So that is a consideration in addition to the cost of the equipment itself. Yep, absolutely. So AB Max, check it out. And Neuralens, uh, again, we, the, we're having a lecture tonight actually around seven. Uh, it's gonna, I think, get a little bit into this technology um, of using AI which in machine learning to actually, uh, you know, help prescribe PRISM, right, for right. people with binocular vision disorders. Right. Um, and that's, that's Neuralens' stock and trade. That's what they do. They have a diagnostic device that'll help you generate those prescriptions with PRISM mm -hmm. um, and then send the RX off to a lab where they can make these very special lenses. They can try to correct these problems. And Gretchen, even you have a pair of these. I do. I do. And I wear them when I'm doing a lot of heavy editing work, staring at my monitor that I would get some, some eye fatigue, some headaches, and I notice a difference when I'm not wearing them. So I strongly suggest that you check it out. And I wish I had brought them with me <laughs> for this trip as I stare at my laptop all day long. Right. Yeah, our eyes are about to fall out actually from doing this. We've just been here for so many days staring at these things. Um, Oculus, so again with the great logo. Absolutely. It cannot be unseen. Um, <laughs> we've been talking about Oculus an awful lot today and yesterday, um, just because their device, what I love about them, you know, uh, they, their device, as I mentioned, they're like Swiss Army knives, especially the Pentacam, <laughs> right? Penta, I mean, it means five, right? So um, they, it does a lot of different functions. And so what they're using, what a lot of docs are using it for now is using uh, the Pentacam to assist in sclera lens fits. And it's an interesting use for it. My local doc here, Charlie McBride, showed me how it all worked when he created a set of sclerals for me, just as on, you know, on a lark. Um, and it's amazing how quickly you can get the data from the Pentacam to a computer where you can finish you know, creating the model for your lens. You hit a button, it goes off to wave contact lens, and three mm -hmm. days later, you have a scleral. Um, totally different from the old way of doing things. Very different, very different, especially if you had a funky machine that we just saw at the Contact Lens Museum where you used glass, fire, and asbestos, <laughs> which was a very scary proposition, but yep. that is indeed what they did. Yep, that was very different from the old days, and now you know you get turnaround time of three days and a lens that actually fits perfectly because you know the, the machine generated the data to create it. So, And to be honest with you, I don't even know how 20 years ago, forget about your fire and asbestos machine, <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know how 20 years ago people did this reliably, right, where the instrumentation wasn't there. This must have been much more like a black art, you know, requiring... You keep saying black art. That I mean, I, it sounds like we're witches well, or something. Well, you know, I mean, it, it's think about it. Getting a good fit of a scleral lens must have been incredibly difficult. Right, but that's where experience came in. But you had the reproducibility problem, that if a patient broke a lens, which, my God, it's glass, of course, it's going to break, 
it would be a lot harder to get a, a, a similar lens that would fit the same. So if you can't reproduce it, boy, that's a challenge. Yep. So anyway, so things have come a very long way with the Panacam, and Oculus also has deals going for the Keratograph 5M. Buy one of those and you'll receive 45% off your first 10 wave lenses ordered each month for a 48-month period. So if you're starting to do a lot of scleral lenses, this could save you a huge amount of money rapidly because uh, obviously scleral lenses are not cheap. Right, and over 48 months, that's four years to get discounts. That's mm -hmm. incredible. That's, that's pretty great. So definitely check out Oculus. Um, what I really love about them too, we mentioned it yesterday, they are a very hands-on company. Um, oh, it's right, yes. Fam it's family run in, <coughs> in Germany, uh, and, and, and I didn't realize, I, I always thought the German arm of it was huge, right? This big conglomerate, and the, the US part of it just happened to be a small part of it because when I went to a trade show once, I ran into Michael Wolber, the US CEO, and he was wearing jeans and a t-shirt, this is right before a trade show, and he was there setting up their booth. I mean, who does that, the and, CEO? And I'm like, Michael, what? I, he's like, yeah, this is what we do. And I didn't realize that even their CEO of the, the main company back in Germany does the same thing. It's just who they are. I really like that. That yeah. means no, that, that you are not too good to set up the booth. Yep, so it's in their DNA. So they're a really, really <coughs> cool company. And what I also know just from working with them personally and, and you know watching Charlie make these lenses, they listen very closely to their users. If they have a problem with the way like a piece of software works or functionality, they listen closely and they do come back and make modifications to the devices to make sure that things are working the way the clinicians want them to. Right, so, that's important. You know, I don't have a lot of experience watching the different manufacturers, but this one I, I happen to, and they really do a great job, you know, keeping on top of their customers. Yep. Okay, so science-based health, the uh, supplement manufacturer, make, makers of Hydro Eye uh, for dry eye. We had a great conversation with them and Zach Denning, so as their name implies, they're all about the science, mm -hmm. and they make their formulations based on science, not just, you know, hocus pocus. <laughs> um, they keep up with the latest studies, and in fact, if you go to their website, they talk about some of the latest studies too, because you know, God knows I, I don't keep up. So uh, it's a great one-stop shop to actually go learn something. Uh, Zach knows more about you know, this field than I've you know, ever learned or forgotten. And uh, they're a great resource. Um, so you can check out Hydro Eye and their other products there as well. Uh, they're running a BOGO deal today. You buy one case here, uh, you'll get one free. Of Hydro Eye. Of Hydro Eye. Yep. yep. So Covalent Careers, if you're looking to take a new position, either in optometry or you're looking for an optician for your office or you're looking to hire somebody in, they're a great place to go make your listing. Uh, and the reason I say that is because when you make a listing with them, it doesn't just get posted to their site, right? Because who's just going there? Nobody, right? But what they do is they're clever. They take their listing and they list it in a whole bunch of different places. Absolutely. Everywhere where they can get in front of, of people that they think would want to see the ad and eye care practitioners and so forth. So if you and look even on... And, OD and even ODWire, if I can find it here with all my 50 million tabs open, if you go to the Jobs tab on ODWire, you look at the feed here, this actually comes from Covalent. So you're seeing their latest um, job listings, right? So that's where all 800 of them. This All 846 or whatever it is. Yeah, this is where we pull it from. Uh, so they don't just post it at ODWire, it's everywhere else too. So they really do a good job getting your ad the widest distribution. So hats off to them. And there's a discount of 10% off their monthly job listings if you're going to give it a shot with them. Um, so take it, definitely take advantage of that. Also what's really cool about their site is they have a bunch of content, like if you don't know how to write a job description um, or you want to write a really good one, they can show you how to do that pretty easily. Uh, and tips for interviews and so on and so forth. So they're really about the whole process. So really great people, give, give them a shot for sure. And again, yeah, 10% off the listing. So iCare Live, so iCare Live is a telehealth company, so they build tools that let you interact with your patients at a distance. I think that's probably the simplest way to say it. Um, let's see if I can find them here. I got a million windows open and <laughs> it's, it's challenging. Yeah, we're, getting to that, we're getting to that point in, uh, in the day. Um, so they, they build you know, telemedicine <coughs> solutions. So for instance, let's say you had a patient with a red eye who's on vacation. What are they going to do, right? Right. This gives you the ability to securely communicate with them and even have them send you pictures of what's going on with them in a secure fashion so you can keep close to them. And it does it in a structured way with these tools. So take a close look at their booth and the tools that they have. Um, so it's really sort of extending your reach. You know, people get nervous when they hear telehealth, but what this does is it's designed for your practice. And this is designed to extend the reach of your practice. And I believe, this is my own personal belief, that this type of tool, whether it's iCare Live or, or something else, you know, people are going to demand it and expect it very soon. 
Um, you're going to want to go to a doctor that has this kind of functionality. And anyone that doesn't is going to seem a little bit behind the curve. Well, I think the best thing about this is that you still maintain, I don't want to say control, that's not a good word, but you're still able to manage your patient as opposed to your patient with a red eye going into an ER and getting God knows what. Right. And you know the kind of care that your patient is getting. Uh, it's a little easier than trying to track down a practitioner uh, who you might know or trust in the area where the patient is. And if the patient is overseas, well, shoot, you might not know anybody. Yep. So you're able to still manage your patient even when your patient can't be in front of you. There's also an issue of peace of mind, right? It's very nice when the patient's checking out to tell them, hey, you know, here's this card, here's the app, make sure you put it on your phone. You can keep in contact with us no matter where you are if you need help for these services. No matter where you are, remember to reach for the app. Well, and also patients want the doctors they know and trust already. So it's, it's peace of mind, I think, for both sides because the doctor knows that uh, his or her patients are still being cared for by them. And also patients know that if I have an eye problem, I can go see Dr. Farkas, right. Dr. Resnick, uh, or whoever I normally see, because that's who I already see and I trust with my eyes. Why would I want to see anybody else if Dr. Resnick can help me out when I'm in California, for example? All right, so I care live. And I Care Pro, so again, they make not only just websites. I, do I still have the sample up here? This place is getting to be such a mess. Look at my desktop. Um, so I Care Pro, that's actually an example of not only a site that they built, but mm -hmm. also that mm -hmm. picture. Um, they took that. And so if you sign up with them, they'll actually bring a crew out to your office and take professional photos that you can use in your social media and on your website. That's really cool. And this is really important, right? Because you don't want to be that, that site, right? That, that site where people go and they're like, oh my gosh, was this shot with a potato? Who yeah. did this? <laughs> potato. Uh, um, <laughs> Like, this is ridiculous. So you want to have something that's really professional looking, especially these days, because people will not give you a second chance. People are cruel, right? You go on Google Maps, you see a location for a place, you mouse over it. If they see garbage picture come up, eh, they're not giving you a second chance. Or even worse, garbage picture coupled with a three-star Google review. <laughs> Gone. Absolute goner. And so iCare Pro can help you with both of those aspects because they can help manage your reviews as well. This is incredibly important. Um, review management is something that you cannot take for granted. If you start seeing yourselves with three-star reviews or low velocity of reviews where people aren't velocity. posting very frequently, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. you're in trouble because people are going to start avoiding your, your practice without even opening up your page and looking at you. Right. Or right. you're going to get ranked worse. Um, apparently, your reviews have uh, an impact on your SEO with Google. So you have every incentive to try to keep those reviews good, and iCare Pro has products that can actually help you do that above and beyond what you might have with Demand Force or, or Solution Reach or anything else. Um, so definitely check them out. Uh, you, you, you won't be sorry, especially if you're time limited as so many of us are. You don't want to have to keep up with this nonsense. Absolutely. It is a big time suck. It really is. And can you imagine having to worry about like the changes in SEO that, that Google might have done? Like, who, who keeps up with this on a daily basis? Unless right? that's your business, people right. really don't. I mean, for optometrists, their primary job is patient care. And they have neither the time and likely nor the interest to do that. Yep. So definitely, if you're going to outsource something, this is probably a good, <clears throat> good place to start. They have all different packages for all different sizes of practices, so from big, big to small. Um, and you can just outsource some of the stuff. If you don't want to handle social media, they can handle that, right? Your Google reviews or whatever, send it out to them. So cool stuff. And they don't lock you into long contracts, which is something I learned today as well. If ah. You, so that's something that's very different and very important as well. They, they believe that those are not really fair to the consumer. You know, you, like should, you should be able to escape if you want to, right? Um, so I care pro. Lac Rivera, maker of punctal plugs and associated products. <coughs> and again, if you haven't fit plugs in a while, you might want to go back, take a look at them uh, as the technology has advanced. We have a lecture going on. Uh, it's starting in about five minutes. In five minutes, you know, all about punctal plugs. Uh, and if you haven't done it in a while, you might want to sit in on that lecture just to review what's been happening in the field. Uh, Lac Rivera has a whole number of discounts. Uh, for folks at the conference and go into the booth to get them because it's this huge list, this huge <laughs> menu of discounts. I'm not going to put it up here right now. Uh, too long to recite, um, but they're there for you. And again, I'm going to be e-blasting everybody when the conference is over, reminding them of all these discounts um, and how, good, how long they're good for because some of them will expire relatively soon and some others will stick around for a while. Um, optometry Times? Optometry Times, yes. Uh, at Optometry Times, our goal is to bring you practical chair-side advice the way you want to receive it, whether it's print in a monthly journal, 
if it's via social media to see what we're highlighting that day in an email newsletter or in our monthly digital edition, which is all print. And also too, we want our content to be easily consumed, easily digested. So you can read an article between patients and then apply that advice from that article to the next patient in your chair. So you don't need to sit down with a glass of scotch and an hour or two to go through and read an article. I mean, if you want to, sure, and knock yourself out, that's great. But most people don't have that kind of time and their journals stack up in their office and I don't want you to keep it. I want you to get it, flip through it, read what you like, hopefully all of it, get what you can out of it and then throw it away because we will send you another one next month and you can also find everything on our website because it is all archived. And for those of you who are interested in sharing information with others, I'm always interested in talking to new authors. That would be fabulous. Give me a shout. We can talk about uh, what you're interested in. I would love to have you write for us. And I would also be interested in pointing you to our booth here or our website if you'd like to get our um, print issue. You can subscribe to that or you can uh, subscribe to our digital products to get our digital edition and our email newsletter. So thank you for reading and go check out what we have to offer. And remember that Gretchen is the first editor who will ever tell you that it is okay to throw her journal in the trash. <laughs> so kudos to you. <laughs> Absolutely, because we'll send you another one and you can find it all online. Yeah, don't hang on to it. Nobody's got room for that. But for those of you who do hang on to things, dig oh, through right. your closets and your garages and your basements and don't Unless it's a really old journal, then it would be, I mean, not like 1982, but if we're talking like 1942, but old things like that, you definitely want to get in touch with Pat Caroline and Craig Norman at the Contact Lens Museum. Uh, let them know what you have because they are looking to acquire these great pieces of history and share them with others. So don't hang on to Optometry Times from January 2019, <laughs> but other things, contact Pat and Craig. I thought that was a nice segue. That plug. was a very, a very good segue. And in fact, um, hopefully everyone's seen the movie. If not, you know, maybe I could let it run here after we get off the air. Oh, yeah, there's that no, would be there's great. There's no reason not to, right? I can just let it go. Yep. Um, so, you know, we took a trip to the Contact Lens Museum, and it was fantastic. And I'd recommend it to anyone who's interested in contact lenses and, and history uh, going there. Um, and I'm sure it's only going to get better as the years go on, right, as they move into a bigger space. Right, because you guys are sending them donations of not only cash money but stuff. So they will be able to move into a bigger space, which they need to do now. And that way they will be able to display uh, the more of their collection because right now they have only part of it because they don't have the space. Right. And you can go and say hi to Paul's diplomas, which are now hanging on the wall there. Well, they will be shortly. They will, they will be shortly. Right? Paul he packaged sent them, them today. up within 24 hours <laughs> and out the door. I was so impressed. Hilarious. Um, finally, Vision Equipment uh, Inc. This is Leo Hadley's company. Refurbished equipment. He does. He has a full line. So if you go to his booth, you can see what he's dealing with today. I can't tell you exactly what because I don't think he knows most of the time. It's constantly coming in and out. Cool thing about him is that he refurbishes everything and then supports what he sells. So if you're looking to buy something and you don't want to pay new prices, this is a really great way to go. Right. You know, you don't, don't want to load your office up with debt by doing the million dollar job. You know, why not use some refurb equipment? Right. If you want to try out something new, uh, a new line of therapy for your practice or open up a, a sports vision clinic, dry eye clinic, whatever, try out some refurbished equipment and that would be easier on your bottom line and you can get started that way. Well, you know, Leo made his mark, I believe, originally with edgers, refurbished edgers. And that's a really good place to get started, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're not sure that you really are going to be doing this edging thing or you have enough jobs to really make it worthwhile, why not start with an edger, right? right. Start with a refurb unit. Cut your teeth on it. See if you like it. Pun intended. Okay, <laughs> pun intended. <laughs> and see if you like it, right? See if it, if it makes sense economically and if this is something you want to keep doing, if you have right. the space for it and, and it makes sense. So um, pr probably a good place to start. And there we have it. Those and is are that our, it? Is that, that's all the sponsors, isn't it? Those are our sponsors for CEY 2020. And it is now 6 o'clock on the East Coast. And I'll run these down really quickly again. So we're getting started with our last full slot of classes for HSV and VSV, controlling myopia, AMD, is it a systemic disease, and bringing back tears in and outs of punctal occlusion. So those are four classes starting now for the last hour. And then at seven, uh, unopposed, we have AI meets OD about machine learning and treat, uh, how that's impacting op optometry and how it's treating uh, digital eye strain and headache. So you can take a look at that. And then Adam, that's 
Is that it? That, that's all that, she wrote for Seeking Liar 2020. Oh, I'm so sad. It seems like we've been planning it for so long, and, and now then, it's just it's boom. gone. What a bummer. It's like Christmas. <laughs> yeah. You plan for it for months and months, or you, your birthday comes around once a year, boom, mm -hmm. then it's gone. So I think we need to get uh, our stalwart Steve Silverberg on yep. the phone to hear his wrap-up, because he is the man behind the CE. He wrangles all of the authors, he gets all of the presentations in, he handles sending things into COPE, and then he goes through each and every one of those quizzes to make sure that they are fair and actually cover what's in the class. And then he sits in on the classes too. So yep. Steve is our man on the ground with CE and couldn't do it without him. Yep, so let's get Steve on the line here and have him send us off in fine fashion. And then we're opening a bottle of wine. Yep. <laughs> Hello. Oh, Steve, how you Hi, doing? Hi, Steve. We are coming good, up to the I end. Recognize... <laughs> Did you survive? We're coming up to the end. Did you survive? Oh, yes. I, I, I have been going from room to room, back to you, back to rooms. I looked at my Fitbit. I thought I'd have 15,000 steps, and I have 30. <laughs> 15 to the bathroom and 15 back. But uh, it feels like it. Um, but um, I want to correct you. This is not the end. This is the beginning. This is the end of the live show, which we certainly work hard for, and you certainly did yeoman work. But uh, see, where I is going to continue till August 1st, so people can still continue to do it and uh, get their credit and get the same quality education they got live. You yeah. are absolutely correct, and I was, yeah. I was wrong. It is the end of the live portion, but you are right. CE Wire will live on for another several months, quite a few months, till it, August. It, it will, till August. And in fact, I'm setting up a referral program as well. I didn't actually tell anyone this because, you know, well, Breaking news. The reason I didn't tell anyone this is because the software doesn't work yet. I'm getting there, working on it. Um, so that uh, you, can mm -hmm. refer, you can refer your OD friends to the conference as well. They'll get a coupon, so they'll get a little discount to attend, and then you'll get $40 off next year's conference. It'll send you a coupon. I love yeah. it. So, yep. If you really think about it, um, by the time this one ends, we'll be well on the way to 2021. So it's a continuous thing all year for us, pretty much. <clears throat> so it's Christmas every day in the um, Farkas, Fulberg, and yeah. Bailey House. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, Conference was interesting this year. People had some complaints. Some didn't like the air conditioning. Some thought the bathroom toilet paper wasn't good. <laughs> they wanted a Starbucks instead of a Dunkin' Donuts. But, we'll but how was the food? But, Did they uh, like the food? Uh, the food was, was um, good, yeah. I, I thought um, we put on a nice spread. They don't want a buffet. They want to sit down next year, but um, we'll just have to raise our rates then. <laughs> <laughs> With virtual things, with telemedicine, uh, I could see in four or five years as people can be walking around the conference with little avatars and say hello to their friends and shake hands and, and whatever. But uh, we'll let our software platform figure out that. Yep. Um, but I think everybody was happy. Um, you're, I, I, you know, I'm more concerned with content. Adam is more concerned with the overall program and getting everything done and the yep. back end of it. So um, I really tried this year to do, like Adam says, get people and get topics that people wanted. People wanted narcotics. A lot of states uh, need it now. People wanted to hear from what MDs really think. So I tried to get a pediatrician. I tried to get an ER doc. Even when the people wanted to do a lot of dry eye stuff, well, I convinced Whitney how to do it on drugs and dry eye. And, of course, uh, Perryman and Wiley handled the area of aesthetics. So even though there's a lot of things about the same areas, they really uh, are diverse. And I, I tell you, if you take all 60 credits, it's almost like you, you pretty much graduate from optometry school without taking uh, geometric optics. That's, <laughs> That's right. It. That's right. <laughs> Excellent. So, so, Steve, were there any standouts for you? I know that you sat in on a lot of these things. Anything you didn't know before? Uh, yeah, the, um, the lectures by um, the Rules Group, which is great. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's very complicated stuff when you're talking about... Uh, you know, replacing irises and uh, various ways of, of fitting contact lenses, et cetera. The, that's real complex stuff. That I love. And I tell you, like you, Adam, I know nothing about aesthetics. I know nothing about makeup. And my patients would ask me all the time, and I'd come up with some cockamamie answer, and I should have <laughs> known the right things. But now, listening to Riley and Perriman, I would know what to say and what proper things to get. Um, I'm going to stop my wife from shopping at CVS and Walmart uh, from now on. <laughs> spend five times the amount of money, and she doesn't have dry eyes. So uh, 
<laughs> um, but yeah, and, and, and very diverse. I was I was amazed at the um, lecture of um, we didn't talk about it, Dr. Ledger, who was out of the University of Pittsburgh, and what he was talking about was uh, he's a PhD, and uh, I actually found him from you know what Clipboard is? Mm-hmm. Yep. Clipboard is an app that you and it, various magazines. I found them on uh, Popular Science, and he had written an article for generic public. And uh, it was really interesting. His, his um, research is that when we're using antibiotics in the eye, we're not only killing, um, we're creating um, resistance and things like that, but there's flora in the eye that we're not aware of, bacteria that live there that are helpful bacteria. And because of us killing this normal flora that we don't even know exists, we're causing eye disease, MGD, et cetera. And uh, this stuff never appeared in the ophthalmological literature or the optometric literature. I thought it was just really interesting. That, that stood out for me. Um, as far as our, our regular speakers, they're all great. I mean, it literally, one by one by one, as I listen to the lectures, everybody tries hard to do a great job, and I think they were all successful. Nobody was boring. We've eliminated all the boring people um, <laughs> we over, over, over the years. It, no it, disrespect to anybody who lectured in previous years. None whatsoever. <laughs> You know what I was impressed with? Um, me, but not in the way that you think. <laughs> when I did this uh, presentation, you do it like, you know, six weeks before or two months before. And then when you listen to your lecture, you say, holy shit, I really, uh, oh, excuse me, holy, <laughs> holy cow. Uh, I, I forgot I was talking to Gretchen. Uh, uh, that I, um, I really, I can't believe I knew this stuff uh, yep. six weeks ago. But uh, it, I actually still know it. But it, it, it's amazing that when you do a presentation and you hear yourself speak rather than speaking live, it comes across a lot better than you thought. Um, I thought I had a list, but I don't have a list, I guess. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but um, I thought the overall conference was great, and each and every speaker, they, even the people who did myopia control, we had kind of four hours on it. Yep. Each one took it from a different slant, and I think Bullamar is giving a last lecture in, yes, in the last right hour now. on it. And I, I reviewed his, and his was totally different than Cooper and totally different than Mashad. They approached from one, Mashad approached it from one patient, how to handle that one patient and what to do, while Cooper was general for the whole field. So if somebody wants to know the hot topics, which are myopia control, dry eye, anterior sacral eye disease, narcotics, they, they got it this time. I think they got it from the, the best speakers that we can get. Yep. And, you know, Steve, what we're also doing, Gretchen mentioned it before, too, we actually take those surveys really seriously when we get them. So I'm urging people to fill them out because, uh, you know, we're going to start yep. on the on the prowl not, you know, very soon, right? Mm-hmm. You know, by the end of spring, starting to think about next year and what people want to see. So I'm really hoping that people fill out those surveys so we can learn what they actually think. Well, just to let people know, I filled out four or five surveys because when the course is playing, I could take the test at the end. And the surveys really take a minute to fill out. And, of course, if they want to make uh, a lot of comments, that'd be great. Um, I try to make comments for, for myself just to remember. But uh, just filling out the you know, checking boxes is great. But anything they could add about what they like, especially what they didn't like, so we can make it better year after year. I think we've gotten good over the last six years. Like, I can't believe we've been doing it for six years. I know. Uh, <laughs> it goes by like, like a second. But... Um, uh, I think anything they say, positive or negative, a new speaker they want. Uh, as you say, people approach us now. But we used to have to approach people when speaking. Um, and it's not because of the honorarium. It's certainly, uh, uh, they don't have to do a plane flight or a hotel, but uh, it's, it's certainly uh, something that people now want to do. And, and the good speakers want to come back. As you know, Gretchen, though, we can't have everybody back all the time because we mm. want to have fresh content. We have fresh speakers. But we have such a panel now. And I tried. I really tried. Your suggestion was to have people have um, uh, unique titles, et cetera. And you see somebody did, some of them did. Mm-hmm. Apparently until the end of Greece, you were three, two paragraphs with the title. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, I tried, and some people like uh, Mark Friedberg was a hot shot. His big, impressive title was Pussy T2. <laughs> I thought that was very uh, unique. It was uh, uh, something I would never thought of. And by the way, his lecture, I had listened to his lecture live at, at a conference, and it is fantastic. It's on what you do with the OCT um, if there's problems where the image would be obscured by something else. So if somebody has glaucoma and they have macular degeneration. So I didn't listen to this lecture here, but I had listened to it live, and I encourage anybody to listen to it. It was landmark. It was just as good as this first one a few years ago. So that's something I didn't get a chance to listen to because uh, I know I had listened to it live. But uh, I think all in all, it was a great show. Paul was missed, but I think you guys did yeoman work this time. 
Yeah, you know, at least Paul got to go to the Contact Lens Museum and give his two cents in. You know, we, 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 we cut out, actually, from the museum trip. It was hilarious. We cut, I had to cut out some stuff because Paul was being Paul, and I'm like, oh, no. We're going to have to leave some of this on the cutting room floor. Um, so, but, but it was, it was cool. fun. It was, it was long. I, I hope to get back to your place one day, and, uh, and I'll visit that. How, how long is the trip from your um, home to the, um, to the museum? It's about 45 minutes. 45? Yeah. Oh, not bad. Yeah. Why did they put it there rather than like St. Louis or something like that, or it'd be near something up metric? Yeah, so it's right across the street from Pacific University. That's where Pat Caroline works, and so he just wanted to do it. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah, if he's the one okay, who's doing the work and creating it, we might as well have it where where he's located and he's able to maintain it. Yep. Mm -hmm. The one thing funny about the conference is that people are starting to ask questions. So. What I do is I go into each room and I'll ask some lame questions to get the audience going. Right. And it's amazing, right after that, three, four, five questions go. And the speakers want to do that. Somebody just doesn't want to show up for a conference and sit there and have no questions. So um, Laura actually uh, uh, text messaged me, Perryman, to nobody was giving, asking questions. So I went into the room, asked a few questions, then afterwards the, the questions started flowing. So it's just like a, a classroom. Once uh, you, you break the dike, uh, everybody will, will flow through. Yep. Absolutely. But uh, you guys tired? Oh. Well, yeah. Three o'clock in the afternoon. You can go out to lunch now. Yeah. No, right we're, we're going to go roll over and die. Actually, we're going to open up a bottle of wine. So and then we're, pass out. And then pass out. So. <laughs> but I it, have to get up early for the wall. an early flight tomorrow. So that yeah. is totally going to suck. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It is what it well, is. At least you live. You live in Philly, right? Yes, and I cannot fly direct, so I'm well, on uh, a 5.45 a.m., God help me, and I'm changing in Dallas, and I'm not landing at home tomorrow until wow. 4.30 Eastern, and that will put me getting on the highway right into evening rush, which will be a treat. <laughs> you can't fly in directly to Newark and then just take that long drive? Oh, my God, Steve, like I won't fly that. into Newark if you paid me. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> No. <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> it's the worst airport, but that's where I go out of it. You're right. I, I fly throughout the country. We go to all these conferences, and whatever city you go to, whether it be Chicago, Atlanta, Orlando, uh, LAX, Newark is a, 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 a very bad place. Yeah, and it's, I would it's rather... Disgusting. And they... Go ahead. You'd rather have a connecting flight because it's really only about, what, 90 minutes from Newark to your house? Uh, yeah, and that's kind of a, a slog. Yeah, and it's it's a long ninety minutes yeah. because I'd have to get on ninety five and the turnpike, and yeah, it would be it would be a hard drive. I mean, some it might even be close to yeah. two so hours. These are the con kind of conversations that people have when they have to attend physical CE conferences. So I'm very glad that you guys are yeah. doing this because this is showing We're you why CE. Real. We have to make it yeah. real somehow. And uh, like I said, the air conditioning wasn't good, so people <laughs> complained about that. Um, That's right. That's but, right. And by the way, the content of the audio, I know there were some glitches, but all in all, um, the platform is much better, much smoother. Um, people know what to do. Um, I, I, I had very few support questions on where to find my quizzes, things like that. But uh, the few that we've had uh, were, were no big deal. Yes, yeah, so, so I, I, think, I made uh, the attendees. Yes, yeah, so this year, just so everyone knows, I made it a point to make sure that the audio was better and that the slides were actually, you know, higher resolution and everything else. I tried to impress upon the speakers the importance of doing that, right? Because when we started mm -hmm. six, six years ago, not that many people had really high-res displays on their desktops or laptops. Mm. Now they do. And so we want to make sure that we're sort of keeping pace with the time. So, yeah. Quality work. The good news is that people have a lot more bandwidth now on their desktops. So yep. nobody's getting kicked off, kicked on, things like that. So it makes it uh, a little bit easier in that regard. Yeah. And just um, with um, on the chat window, I mean, I know that a lot of support questions weren't coming there. But this is the fewest that I've ever seen. Yep. So I think everything ran very smoothly, so yeah, we're I, grateful. I received yep. like two or three during the day. Like I can't log in, and Kat took care of them immediately. She was fantastic. So our support person, Kat, yep. did an amazing job. Um, and even a couple of speakers didn't that know was, what they were doing. She came in and helped them out. So yeah. yeah. She had to do some things on the fly that you don't even know about, Adam, but that we'll tell you when we're off. Off the record. Yeah. So there's a lot that but goes on behind the scenes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. So I say job well done to everyone. And Steve, you are really taking on a lot of work there. I know all the work that you do with getting the lecturers, getting all the, you know, writing herd on everybody and taking the quizzes, sitting in the classes. That's a big commitment and well, it shows. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. It's hard work. We all do hard work. You did. Adam does, I know, and Paul does whatever he can. I mean, uh, 
per unit age, boy, I think that's the most work. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> that means anything. All right. Well, thanks, Steve, um, uh, for, for this. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to next year. We'll see how it goes. Thanks, yep. Steve. It's, and, uh, it's uh, wine o'clock here. Soon. Yeah, it's wine o'clock. we got to go open a bottle, so we'll catch <laughs> you later. Go and uh, I'll write my next uh, article for a uh, week or I'll, I'll promise you time. You do it because you're, you're um, the ones coming up, brother. It's yeah. coming. I know I was <laughs> hanging really? out, but it's so, coming. So, uh, I'll do genetics and the epigenetics will come right afterwards because it does tell it perfectly. There you go. There See, you go. that was my plan all along. All right. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, sure. Talk to you later. Catch you later. Okay, look, have some good pinot noir. Oh, <laughs> well, we will. All right. Well, Adam. I think we've reached the end. We have. It is 6.15 Eastern. Yep. We're well into the 6 o'clock classes. Then we've got a lone one coming up at 7. And then as Steve very uh, correctly uh, reframed my thinking that this is the end of the live portion yep. and then just the start of ongoing education with CE Wire yes, through the, the summer. The conference is nowhere near over. In fact, we're going to get many, many registrants now in the on-demand period. Right. So this is, and I mentioned the referral program that I'm setting up. Dad also mentioned we're going to have a raffle as part of that too. If you refer the most number of people, you will win an iPad Pro. Well, why don't you pimp that out, man? I, 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 there's a lot of things I should do that I don't. I mean, I... <laughs> <laughs> at the end of my rope here. But no, that's, that's going to be part of it. As soon as the software is ready, you guys will all get an e-blast. Anyone who's registered for the conference will get your own little email about it to try to invite your friends. You just put in your friend's email and it'll shoot it off to them. So that will be that. So There we I, go. So I guess that's it. So Gretchen, thank you for this. Thank you, you for a, having me. Great job as this usual. And uh, we survived the plague. I haven't yet. Oh, right. We're still here. So. I haven't yet. I'm not going to consider myself in the clear until, say, Tuesday after I go through all the travel. So, right. But so far, so good. So far, so good. And so your family's up and moving. They're up and moving. Everybody's fine. So we're all good here. So thank you, everyone, for attending this. And Thank uh, you very much for and, your time and attention. And we will see you online. And I'm going to leave you here. I'm not just going to cut everything off. I'm going to actually put on our trip to the Contact Lens Museum as we're leaving, just in case somebody wants to see it again. If it they is well because, worth the time to watch Because it's it. really cool. So thank you again, everyone. And we will catch you online. See you later. So, Would you um, tell us how you came about this idea? What prompted you and Craig to start a collection? Well, you know, uh, like most collections, you start collecting things one at a time, and then one day you wake up and you find uh, you've got a museum sitting in your home in closets, garages, and we found ourselves in that situation and then uh, decided that uh, we were just going to open up a contact lens museum. How long did it take you to curate the collection in here? A long time and we, that's an ongoing endeavor. Um, you know, Trying to do something of this magnitude while you're working full-time and everything else, uh, got full curriculum and back there it's um, it's, it's been very busy, but as you can see, um, it's just such a joy. It just brings so many smiles to so many faces when you bring older practitioners <laughs> through here because... Yeah, another relic in. Yeah, it, it really, it's so true Why don't you because... Me? I mean, I <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, we'll put you in the chair. There you go. That won't be creepy at all. <laughs> no, it won't be creepy at all. But no, you're so right. It's just uh, so many memories then come back to all of us that were touched by contact lenses. You know, it's uh, when you think about how contact lenses have changed so many people's lives and changed their lives. All those keratoconus patients, and irregular cornea patients. It's it's humbling, you know, to you know be a part of you know having this history. So we we felt that you know. Uh, the younger patient, where do you get your lenses? Nine years old. Yeah. 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 Younger contact lens wearers. Yeah. You know, they're in so many millions of people's lives have been changed so much with these. Now, if practitioners have 
anything lying around their basements or garages or the oh. back room of their practices, mm -hmm. would you be interested from in hearing from them? Yes, we'd be very interested. That's where we pick up a lot of these relics. Mm -hmm. um, every practitioner, literally everyone uh, out there, has one or two items that have been given to them by an elderly patient or uh, they took over a practice that you know, had been established back in the 30s or mm -hmm. 40s. And somewhere in their archives uh, are these treasures, you know, that they've not known what to do with them. They hold on to them because they don't take up a lot of space. But they don't know, where, they know they can't throw it out. Right, of course. Uh, <laughs> but they, they're looking for a place to send it. This is the place. <laughs> this is the place to send it. So there it can be archived, uh, taken care of properly. Um, we've, Craig and I have spent, you know, hours and hours learning about curating um, an optical museum like this. It's, uh, there's a lot that goes into it. We had to then uh, apply for a, um, a nonprofit uh, organization, a 501c3 with the government. We uh, got that, so we're official. So not only are you accepting items to be displayed here, you're accepting financial contributions to support yeah, the museum. Yeah, very much so. This has been totally funded uh, through gifts and so on, and by Craig and myself. And, oh, that's it. That's a good charity for next year. Absolutely. That is. It really is. It's a lovely charity for uh, individuals in the eye care profession that want to see, you know, the history of uh, contact lenses preserved. So uh, you can see here we uh, uh, encourage donations, and uh, so we, uh, yeah, we love it. You know, when people can, uh, when they win the lottery, you know, send us uh, some of that, and uh, so we have fun. But it's, um, we get the, believe it or not, our biggest support from uh, patients. So they feel this incredible emotional, you know, tie to these lenses. Sure. Now this is uh, actually just part of the collection. Uh, uh, a lot of it still is in storage right now. Uh, we need a, a bigger facility. When we opened this up in July, we opened it up with the knowledge that uh, we've already outgrown it. Uh, it's a good that, problem to uh, have. Good problem to have. And so we're just going to keep raising you know, funds as best we can and uh, hope to move into a bigger uh, facility as time goes on. And then this is, like I said, part of the collection. The other collection I'm going to show you is the uh, collection of antique glasses, uh, spectacle lenses, um, probably one of the finest in uh, North America right now, um, and that's across the street at the school. Um, so um, it's this has been just a passion for Craig and I, you know, this collecting. And, um, fortunately, we have wives that understand uh, the insanity because <laughs> uh, that's what it is. It's truly it's insane to be doing this. Uh, um, uh, but you know, Craig and I have been blessed so much, like you have like we all have, by the eye care industry. That, Very much so. Yeah, that it's just been a humbling experience to be a part of it. So this is our payback, or this is our legacy that we'll leave, you know, so. And it's a beautiful one. It's a start. It's, yeah, uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful start. And so we're real happy, very, very happy with it all. Excellent. So. Many, many years ago, as you can imagine, the, um, it's really myself and Craig Norman who kind of put this all together. The story begins over here. I'll sort of walk you through. 
this is kind of the evolution of contact lenses. The, uh, all of these lenses here are made of glass. And so these were the earliest uh, contact lens company and Zeiss. So they were the three making glass uh, scleral lenses at the time. When did Obra come in? Obrecht came in in the uh, 1940s. How do you know that name? <laughs> I used to live with him. <laughs> oh my, my! I was just uh, reading a, a book uh, this morning. Uh, his uh, textbook from 1945 uh -huh. on um, contact lenses. It's really one of the earliest. Yeah, and uh, that is. What a coincidence. Okay. So all are, of are these companies related? It's it's no, Muller Sohn no, and Muller Welt? No, they were different um, families. Okay. Yeah, they had no uh, no relation. And uh, so these uh, like I said, it's the largest collection of glass uh, contact lenses in the world. Hmm. So it's um, they're hard to find, very rare. Uh, wonderful to feel because they're incredibly heavy. Can can I touch one? Yeah. As a matter of fact, you can touch the one that is yours. Uh, <laughs> we wanted Craig and I wanted you to have this. This is a glass uh, really? scleral lens. Wow. And uh, it's all the contributions you've made to the industry, you deserve that. Oh, you are so <laughs> kind. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's kind of neat to have. You can see kind of how rough the optics were. Very rough. And, uh, but, you know, they got better with time. <laughs> That's a real early one. Like what year? So, uh, this would have been probably early 1900s. Wow. So between 1900 and 1910. But you could feel how smooth uh, yeah. the glass. The workmanship was, was wonderful. But um, yeah, it's uh, that's definitely one we wanted you to have. Oh, very nice. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. This would be a real challenge to apply and to remove. Yeah, it really, it really is because of the size. Um, these were about twenty. Two to 24 millimeters in diameter, so they were pretty big. And then I see that they're fenestrated as Some well. Some of them were, and that's kind of unique, the number of them that were fenestrated. Um, you can imagine drilling a hole in glass can be a little bit challenging. And, a lot of breakage. Uh, yeah. But uh, I'm always surprised when I'm going through the lenses, the number of them that have uh, actually been fenestrated. And that would have been a challenge as well, not only drilling the hole, but making sure that the edges are smooth enough. Because oh, yes. That would have been quite painful had you applied a yeah. fenestrated lens that wasn't smooth. But then you look at these Zeiss lenses, the optics are absolutely perfect, and they're incredibly thin. And I always wonder, how many of those broke in the eye? You know, it wouldn't take much trauma. That would have been to a shatter really big those. Problem. Yeah, but that was unique of the Zeiss lenses at the time. Um, they uh, they were incredibly thin. Do you know who made this one? The one that you gave me. Uh, that one, yes, I do. That one uh, was uh, from the uh, Mueller Weld Company. Wow. Yeah. Look at these. There. And then so those are the molds right those there? Those are the molds. So that and is brass. Let me, let and me then take you through how, let's say it's uh, 1920 and I'm going to fit you with a contact lens. It would all begin over here. Um, May I sit in the chair? Again? Yes, please. Okay. You sit in the chair again. That's where I sit. <laughs> I get comfortable in here. <laughs> and um, now the molding process began by just simply mixing this compound. It's called moldite. moldite yeah. And we would mix it in one of these uh, containers. And then uh, it would be placed into a syringe. 
and this mold then would be placed onto the eye and the moldite compound injected through here and then it would take a perfect mold of the anterior segment. So the molding compound would harden in about 90 seconds. So you had to be real efficient with your time. You had to load this, inject it, and uh, be pretty efficient. So you have to do that on a board exam, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> 1950s. So. Jeez. And uh, then uh, what happened next was when you had that beautiful mold, you would mix this next compound called cast stone. And that cast stone then uh, was just like a, um, a concrete, but incredibly fine, powdery concrete. And then you would let it harden, and uh, then you would have this beautiful impression of the eye. Now, back in the day, in the, before World War II, a second mold would have to be made of brass. And the reason for that is that when the lens was actually turned into a contact lens, it um, was made of glass, and the glass would just simply, the heat of the glass would destroy the, the moldite, so it had to be turned into a brass mold. Then it was taken over here, and this is probably the highlight of the museum in the fact that we have the only remaining glass contact lens making apparatus in the world. This really? is it. This is the only one left. Does it work if it you works. wanted to create a lens? Oh, you yeah. Could? Yeah, we've had it fired up, and you can see we've destroyed part of the. Uh, table from the firing <laughs> it up and uh, uh, it makes a lot of pops and noises and now there was a, this vice was on the stand we don't know what its function was but uh, it must have had some function the problem with this instrument is that nowhere can we find anything written on how to manufacture the contact lens or how they were manufactured. Wow. So we're having to piece it together little by little. Now, the... Um, if oh, I push this, is something going to happen? Yeah, push oh, it. Push it? Yeah, push both of them. Uh, this one. Oh and my god! it still works. That's the amazing thing. We fired up these motors and um, uh, they were still working. Uh, this is incredible. So, uh, they, uh, now, the way it worked was you attach the mold, the brass mold of the shape of the eye here. Top two, I think. Perfect. Now, that bottom, yeah, no, you got it. You got them both, okay. good. And what would happen is you uh, had natural gas and oxygen that were mixed together. Those were, um, it wasn't propane. Propane hadn't been invented yet, so they actually used natural gas wow. back in that day. And so the gases were then mixed up here to the appropriate concentration, and these valves controlled the amount of oxygen versus the uh, amount of natural gas. It looks like it's a very non-precise process. Exactly, exactly, very non-precise. Then they had these two by two wafers of glass uh, that were set right here. And then this was just simply brought around once the glass had been molten and this just brought down and an impression made of the uh, contact lens. And that's the mold right there. And that's the mold. So you would of swap the, uh, that out depending upon the yeah. patient you're creating this for. And then in this little container, when I got the instrument, uh, it was just filled up to about here with asbestos. Oh, excellent. So, uh, that uh, made it all complete. Uh, so then you would bring it back here, drop this mold. And because it was flaming hot.
from uh, being in contact with the glass and it would fall into the asbestos where it would be cooled and now with these little tools here the residual glass would be broken away and then you saw over here how the edges were rounded and then the power placed on the front of the lens with, uh, with this. Now the only thing we can think of here is that this was actually operated by hand the, to oscillate the uh, application of the power on the front side of the lens. That's all we can actually kind of surmise. We don't know how else it was driven. And, uh, but everything came with the unit. It was intact. And it's actually from, of all places, Perth, Australia. Don Ezekiel. Yeah, Don Ezekiel. And, and if anybody would have something like this, it would be it'd him. It would be him. And uh, you'll see as you go through the museum, Many of the pieces are from Don's collection, and that was probably the largest in the world. And he gave it all to us, so we're really super fortunate to have that. And he got his basement back. I'm sorry? He got his basement back. Yes, <laughs> he had his garage. He had, uh, had it in his laboratory. But when he sold the laboratory, it went moved into his garage. So he was kind of uh, grateful, but again, sad to see it all go away. And uh, but to have the only one remaining. Uh, now this is for this. <laughs> <laughs> A mechanical tool that nothing yeah. to do with creating the contact no, lens. No, no, just strictly for changing out the gas. If you wanted to, is there gas in there? Could no. you make one? No, we uh, we keep the uh, the live ones in my garage at home, uh, <laughs> but these are uh, actually empty. And so you have uh, filled ones if you wanted oh, to. Yes. I mean, I don't know that oh, I put asbestos there, sure. but you could create oh, yeah, a glass yeah. lens. We're the only ones in the world that can make glass contact lenses if you need one. Have you tried it? Oh yeah, yeah, we've tried it, and it's incredible. Just there's a lot of experimentation getting the temperature right, getting the just the exact amount of uh, natural gas and the exact amount of oxygen. But you could see that it uh, would be very easy to, uh, to accomplish. Now, when PMMA came along, things changed rather dramatically because now it was possible to just simply use the mold itself rather than turning it into a brass mold. And what was used at that time then were these PMMA wafers. That's actual PMMA? Yeah. I thought now, it was cardboard. No, it's, it's it has this protective coating on it, and you just peel this away, and then there's this beautiful piece of acrylic plastic. Wow. For scleral lenses. That's really cool. Very cool. And now, you know, it didn't take any temperature at all to melt that. You know, you, that was not like melting glass. So I think we may even have one here that might be, yeah, there we go. Oh, so that's so, it. That's it. So did I ask the question when you were in school? Did you ever see anything like this? Yes, well, with, with the way it worked in school, <laughs> our, our contact lens course, was one person with keratoconus that was handed down from class to class. <laughs> and we had a, it was at Columbia University, and we had Isidore Finkelstein was the professor, a very bright guy, but that was it. And he had this one guy, and every time they had to do something to wash the lens or something, there was no sink. Fink, the Fink used to walk in to the bathroom and wash it and try it on, and this guy never succeeded, but he kept coming back for 
class to class, oh. and that was the contact lens course in the 50s. Oh my gosh. That's so interesting you mentioned that name. I read his name for the first time last night, uh, Fickelstein yeah. from Columbia University, and the reason I came across it, I was uh, doing a story, as I'll show you down here, on Dennis England, who helped invent the first corneal contact lens. But uh, I came across an article written by Hank Knoll from Bosch and Law on uh, this gentleman from, uh, from Columbia University. And it was the first time I had seen his name. And so it was really Yeah, so cool. that, that was the kind of neat. That was the contact lens course. Oh, wow. my period. <laughs> End so of story. Cool. And then whatever you learn happened afterwards. Yeah. It happened afterwards. But the academy required. In order to become a diplomate, you had to be able to fit a, a scleral lens, lens and yeah. using moldite. Yeah. And oh. what happened, yeah, as basically we smuggled in some anesthetic because there's no way you can put that shit in your eye. <laughs> yeah, don't no get and say stay still now. Because you so, can imagine if the patient's eye was moving right. during the molding process, you know, you have a pretty bad mold. Yeah, I mean, so. <laughs> what year did you earn your, uh, your diplomate? In 1965, I think. And so that was being required at that yeah, time? Yeah, it was a very large class. Uh, the, the word was, you better get it now because it's going to get much tougher to do. But that particular part was separating the men from the boys because you had to learn not only to do it, but then to adjust it. And, yeah. uh, and I was always very unhandy. I figured I'd cut my hand off with the burrs yeah. that, that they used. Um, oh, my. So, uh, Wonderful. <laughs> So we yeah. have glass lenses. Glass lenses, and yeah. then... Uh, oh, boy. Er Irv Orish and I was suffered. Oh, <laughs> my. So here we go to PMMA sclerals. PMMA sclerals, and, you know, it was uh, very uh, plastic. It was very slow to get involved into the... evolve into the contact lens industry. It was only after World War II that plastic really did replace glass. Yeah, as it was from the World War II. Huh. Yeah. Plastic started first started on airplanes. Mm -hmm. I see up there Ernst Abbey. Yeah, Ernst Abbey. Does that have anything to do with the Abbey value? Yep, it sure does. <laughs> that is it right there. He was the mathematician, uh, the brains behind the Carl Zeiss Corporation. and. Um, he was a brilliant mathematician. He developed this machine right here. This um, was it's like a, an early lensometer. It it looks like an early lensometer, but it's called a refractometer. And what it did is just measure the index of refraction of huh. the glass. Huh. And because when they were manufacturing glass at the time, they could never control the index of refraction of it. Uh, so each piece had a different index. And so what they had to do is read the index of refraction and then they knew what radius to put on the front to create the power. There was a lot of math involved. There was then. a ton of math involved back in those days. And, uh, but he was the one who really kind of uh, was at the forefront of that. Now I see back here there are corneal lenses as well as scleral lenses. Yeah, it's just like um, um, CDs and uh, VHSs. <laughs> you know, there's that time uh, in space where the two cross over mm -hmm. and um, this was uh, really it in the 1950s. Uh, it was unsure which of the two modalities was going to really take over. Was it going to stay scleral or was it going to go corneal? And so you see a number of these fun sets that have actually both in them. Now here's the uh, Theo Ulbrick sets uh, out of New York. Uh, the one in the back was the original Theo Ulbrich, uh scleral lens set, and then the one in the front uh, is one of the um, later uh, sets. 
I like these glasses down here. The world of contact lenses. That is that really is cool. Bizarre. So um, W. J. made them. Well, Newton Wesley uh, was the man responsible for kind of bringing contact lenses into the mainstream. Uh, so in the early 1960s, he marketed everything uh, to get contact lenses out to the masses. God bless him. Yep, and uh, he appeared on the Steve Allen show, <laughs> and he was just this incredible kind of showman, but yet incredibly ethical. And, um, I yeah, never, he was keratoconic. Yeah, that's correct. Do you have any stories? Well, yeah, he and he had a partner, George Jesson, mm -hmm. yeah. and George was a, a glad hander type of salesperson, and Newton was the front front guy with the research type of thing. Right. And uh, they they did everything, and they not only market glasses, but I remember they used to hand out ties. Oh, I've got one. Christmas. Oh, There's contact yeah, lenses on it. Yes, I'm so, it's so funny you should make that you're the only one I've ever known right there uh, oh, from the uh, Newton oh, Wesley is, yeah. Company. And, uh, but he, he was just this incredible marketer. Yes. And it was just so cool what he was able to do. That's good. Somebody needs to get the word out. Well, you know, and uh, little known fact, it was Newton Wesley who founded Pacific University College of Optometry. Is that right? I didn't yeah, know that. Yes. He, uh, it's a rather kind of long and sometimes sad story because um, he founded it uh, but then had to give it up mm -hmm. and sell it uh, because of uh, World War II and the internment camp. So his two sons and his wife ended up in a, an internment camp uh, throughout uh, the course of World War II. And uh, it was here in Portland where the internment camp was. And um, uh, Roy Wesley, his son, is still alive. And um, he is on our board of directors of the museum because he's this incredible historian of uh, that era uh, of the internment camps and all the kind of injustices done uh, back then. So kind of a fun story to just uh, hear him talk about. Oh, and, I bet. Um, about his life growing up as a child in, in the camp. Right. So... And then um, over here, um, we have a couple other items. Uh, one is the Micon. This was the first commercially available contact lens solution that went into the back of a scleral contact lens. Well, what is Micon? And, um, you know, it, it's, I'm not sure, I think it's a sodium bicarbonate. Uh, uh, system. What does it say there? I looked oh, it up. Oh, two percent sodium. Go. You were yeah, right. I was. Sodium bicarbonate solution. So where did the name Micon come uh, from? No, that I don't know. It was manufactured by House of Vision in Chicago. House of Vision. <laughs> House of Vision. Yes. It uh, sounds like a sketchy place. It does. It, it, uh, like a haunted place. <laughs> Now, uh, next to it here is another one of those Wesley Jessen things. This was a research lens, um, and uh, patients were losing their lenses um, pretty easily when they switched to corneal. So what they did is they impregnated the contact lens with little uh, graphite particles. Uh, and then you would just pick it up with a magnet or Are find Are you it. kidding me? Yeah, so it was a magnetic... A magnetic contact, contact lens. Contact lens, and that's what it's actually stuck to is the magnet right there. Oh my gosh. Did that affect vision by having no, that into the no, plastic? No, it, it's sort of like putting fenestrations in the lens. They never really affected acuity very much, and uh, 
just a, a clever idea. So, but they never marketed it or anything, but it's just kind of cool to have the one of their... magnetic lens. Wow. Some magnetic. patients may like to have that option available to oh, them. Oh, gosh, I thought it was so clever, you know. But it just shows you, you know, you've got a problem, uh, you know, this is how we're going to fix it. Who was the optician that brought the, I forgot his name, that brought, made the corneal lens popular? Uh, oh, Kevin Tui? Tui, yeah. Yeah. Tui lens. Kevin Tui. That was the first one. We've got some of his early uh, things over here as we evolve from. It took lids of steel to adapt to <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, the, then we went from the sclerals into the. Uh, oh, we have a, a Tui contact lens fitting record back there. Yes. Yes, now that's kind of interesting. That's Robert, uh, Robert Ryan. Uh, Ryan. Now, Is that a HIPAA violation, Pat? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a definite <laughs> HIPAA violation. Now, he was a famous actor. Oh, sure. Uh, back in the 50s. And, um, and uh, another famous person that was Ronald Reagan. Ronald mm, Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Yep. Any more contact lenses? More contact lenses. So, we have some pretty interesting things. Oh, so here's the little scandal, I guess, with Dennis England. His, he yes. tried to, he applied for the first U.S. patent. In 1945, I've got the original patent. Uh, Craig, um, I've got a Xerox copy, but Craig has uh, contacted the patent office, and we're going to see if we can get the original patent, uh, that patent application. And Kevin um, Tui preceded him. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, 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 he sorry. Followed, okay. uh, he followed him by uh, two years, one month. Um, was uh, two years later, Kevin Tui took out his patent, or applied for his patent. That was uh, in the 50s, I think. Yeah, 1950. Yeah, yeah, and then Bill Feinblum also got a well with scleral lenses. Yeah, and there's Bill's uh, diagnostic set. <laughs> yeah, You'll notice was... those green lenses there, and uh, apparently someone told me that uh, those were actually developed for treatment of an eye stigmas. Huh. Now, Did uh, it work? That, I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't know why it would work. Again, I wish uh, Bill was still alive. And, uh, you know, there's a, a, there's a Yiddish questions. expression, it worked like a toitan bankus, like a, a leech on a dead person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so did you know Feinblum? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. We well, used to, he used to yeah, work together. He was the man. Yeah, he was, yeah. uh, Bill, uh, what happened towards the end, he, uh, he, he couldn't handle the contact lenses, so he referred to us. Hmm. But he was a tremendous promoter, and his main specialty was low vision. Yeah. Hmm. Right. And he was able to get his, his, his face on, on Life magazine, hmm. yeah. and he ended up having a tremendous practice on Park Ed. And again, the low vision didn't work. But <laughs> it was... It was, but people kept coming I've got in. got that Life magazine with that, <laughs> his story, the Feinblum story. It's yeah. actually one of the really earliest um, he, he publications. Yeah. He was, well, actually, there's <laughs> a direct link but between Bill promoting and me. <laughs> Afterwards, oh, so, so I shouldn't I shouldn't knock them. This machine, the Yeah, it's the only one I've ever seen. It um, you know, again another WJ product uh, from the 1960s, and you turn those dials, and it would bring you would build your contact lens. Each one of those dials uh, put on a different radius of curvature. Wow. So you design both the anterior and posterior surface of the lens with that little, they call it computer, but it's just roller um, device. And um, it, a very, very cool thing, but. Did you ever um, use one? No, never used one. Uh, it's the only one I've ever seen. Yeah, those, uh, those tinted lenses are also very interesting. Yeah, those yeah, are from change England. Your, yeah. Change your eye color. Yeah, <laughs> Caprice what, what, PMMA what, what, lenses. What, 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 oh, God. Somebody needed his eye color changed. Yeah. I forgot his name already. Well, I recognize something George, down there. George Siegel. Oh, the actor, yeah. So George he came in, you know, he was, he, 
he was young and he had to play an Arab. He had blue eyes. So he had to play an Arab in some sort of film he was in. So Columbia Pictures sent him in. He, he was in New York in those days. So we had to give him one of those lenses. So I gave him the lenses and I gave him a bottle of anesthetic. We <laughs> 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 shooting because he, yes. he suffered with them. They were thick and they were terrible. Oh, wow. So he had to have dark eyes for the shoot. Did so, you see the movie? Afterward? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Maybe it didn't even come out. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it could be. <laughs> many, yeah, many maybe don't do. make it. I see a bottle of Playa gel down there. I haven't yeah, heard of oh it uh, in a long yes. time. Uh, Playa gel and, and the ones behind it, the yellow ones, are called LC65. Um, they were uh, big items back in the 60s for PMMA. And what happened in the 50s and low 60s, early 60s? These lenses were very thick, and somebody came up with the idea of what if we fenestrate them? And they put four little holes in, and they called it the vent air contact lens. Yeah. So vent air, and then I became, became a marketer for the, for the thing. They did a tremendous amount of advertising, and they ended up with offices all over the country. Wow. They were. That there was one of them. There was one other company from Chicago that also. Yeah, um, there was a Spiro Vent. Spiro Vent had and, one. Uh, you just happen to have some of it right here. <laughs> yes, yes. Some of the, here's an original Tui uh, brochure, and uh, let's see. I don't know if I have my vent there out there. See, no, I guess I don't. After that, the lenses were so thick that the people were terribly uncomfortable, and that's when I went into practice. Mm. And Ted, my partner, worked for Ventair down the street. Oh, boy. And he sent people over to yeah. me. And then we came up with the bright idea. says, hey, if they're so uncomfortable we're thick, why don't we make a thinner lens? Oh, boy. So we formed a company called Microthin Contact Lenses, and we got one Orthodox Jew to work in Brooklyn in a lab, uh -huh. and he was the micro-thin maven. He oh, was the one that, that did it, and we had a thinner lens, and because we had a thinner lens, we were able to succeed where, where Ventir failed. So we built up a very large PMMA practice in those years. How did Ventir feel about Ted? They didn't know what he worked for us, <laughs> and then after that, after that <laughs> He left there because the practice got big enough that right. we were able to. Now, to over them. on in this cabinet is the uh, early evolution of soft lenses. Mm -hmm. uh, soft lenses were developed by that gentleman there, Otto Wichterly in Prague, Czechoslovakia. He started working on uh, the material in the early 1960s. He actually started producing contact lenses in 1966, and those were the first soft lenses. They were called SPOFA, S-P-O-F-A, SPOFA lenses. Right there, right in front of you, is the first soft contact lens brochure ever <laughs> produced. That was in 1965. Um, and, um, these uh, lenses here uh, really do represent the first team out for first soft contact lenses. I've got one hydrated there. The rest are stored dry. Wow. Um, the um, very kind of neat to have those as part of the collection. These were the original SPOFA cases from 1966. And um, about the same time, a uh, company in upstate New York and Toronto uh, started this uh, Bionite company, you know, which was a Griffin lens. Well, I've never um, heard of that. Yeah, that um, was the um, uh, high water content lens. It had about a 55% water, but you see it um, goes back to that same time frame as the Otto Wichterly uh, lenses. Oh, and there it says they were purchased by AO. Yep. And, and then, then became Softcon. Yep, and then became Softcon, exactly. And, and then bb and marketed them very differently. They had uh, salespeople, and the first sales manager insisted that all their salespeople come in with dark suits. Uh -huh. So they were very, very formal, Very unique. Very, <laughs> very businesslike. Yeah. With, uh, 
with the Bausch and Lomb lens. Uh, and now we're into the salt tablets and the heat salt units. Salt tablets and then heat units. Uh, oh, yeah, this the is the, uh, the scepter unit. range of the scepter units. The first one you see right here was the original Bosch and Lohm one, uh, 1971. The FDA had no idea on how to disinfect these soft contact lenses, so this is what Bosch and Lohm came up with. If um, you look kind of closely, that heater unit there was uh, actually a baby bottle warmer. <laughs> uh, they purchased them from uh, Gerber Baby Food Company and then modified the top lid to hold the contact lens case. So you filled that up. You remember the distilled water oh, that you put in there and, uh, and uh, push your button. And actually, it was a marvelous way to sterilize lenses because after that, people, the cold sterilization came in, but unfortunately, they put thimerosal mm -hmm. into the solution. And that and was this one right here. This was the first. And the red eyes started. The red eyes started uh, big time. So you'll love these names here, Paul. The uh, normal, flexol, and oh, preflex. Yeah, that will resonate yeah, with you. Those are just so cool. Alcon Swirl the, Clean. Uh, yes. That sounds like toilet clean. Well, it does sound like <laughs> Sorry, Alcon. The acceptor unit was something that the patients had individually. However, the office had very large units. Right. So you can right down here. Lenses, so there they are. Oh. I remember and, and those that, glass vials. Cut my that fingers particular on them. one ended up with a short circuit over a weekend, and our office burned down. Oh no! <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> the staff yeah. got to turn it off before they they, uh, they lost so many an office fire. with that unit. Wow. And that was, uh, that was when you met me at the door. Said, "Dad, you can sleep late tomorrow." And I came back from the winter. <laughs> You know, this was, um, uh, you'll notice that a lot of different cleaning systems were developed because at the time we had to make soft lenses last a year. Right. Uh, they were replaced on a yearly basis, so a lot of heroic uh, things were developed to try to well, extend the length of time. The, uh, matter of fact, we had one, one scheme. We met the developer, a woman who developed the contraceptive sponge. You remember this Seinfeld sponge worthy? Right. It was a contraceptive sponge. I remember that. And it was FDA approved, and it had the ability that if you would rub a contact lens on it, you could clean it. And we say, this is what we're going to do. So how did somebody come up with that concept that this is a contraceptive sponge, I'm going to put my contact lens on there? I mean, where did that come from? You say, what? <laughs> I mean, who would think of that? So, yeah. <laughs> and the chemicals, because it was a spermicide, yeah. right? So, but, I mean, but, wonder what the chemicals yeah, would do so, to so the we, lens. We started dealing with this crazy woman uh, who, who had some company in, in Europe and Germany, and it cost us at least six figures by the time we figured out it's not going to work, and then she conned us. <laughs> and so that, another scheme. Okay, so I'm glad to hear that you that talk was... talk about waste, my West Indian land, that was even worse. But So that actually, nobody ever really did that, so she no, no, took we, you we for just, a ride. Okay, I'm yeah, glad to absolutely, hear that. Absolutely. I mean, not that you were taken for a no, ride, no, I'm not I, glad, I, but I, that nobody I was cleaning their lenses many rides. on a contraceptive That was only, that was only, yeah. <laughs> that was only one of this many rides. <laughs> I see CSI lenses back there, yes. and now I, what else did I see? Um, yeah. Lens Plus. Now we're getting into things that I remember. Yeah. Those terrible vials that you cut your hand on. Yeah. Yep. And do you have a, there it is. The crimper. The, yeah, the crimper. crimper. I remember crimper. those things. And those oh, very yes. light, uh, the caps. Caps. Uh, that they were, were light aluminum. and then you put it on and then yeah. when you try to pull it off. Yep. There goes your finger. Yep. And uh, so it, it's just so much fun. Then lenses, I never made it. Uh, the hmm. 3M lens. Uh, called the Advent Lens, uh, lasted in the marketplace just a few months, and it was a pure fluorocarbon contact lens, uh, very oxygen permeable. They teamed up with Allergan to promote that lens, but it never made it. Uh, the Epicon uh, was another one that 
never quite made it in the marketplace. And then the Nike Max site down I remember here. That. You have any Still Soft in there? Still Soft is right here. Yeah. Yep. Another one that worked beautifully. 100% oxygen permeable, but yeah. way too thick. So yeah. it was terribly and uncomfortable. And so hard to remove, yes. too. It was that rubbery yeah. thing. It was Dow, Dow Corning owned it. Yep, and Dow gave Corning, way to go. Man, <laughs> this has got to be weird for you. Know, <laughs> yeah. All these things coming back. And <laughs> yep. just, uh, <laughs> you, you wonder where all that garbage is being stored. You know, I, I always ask myself, where well, is Well, are you kidding? Stored? I mean, I, I've got these Gilbert and Sullivan operettas up here. That, <laughs> oh, uh, my. You know, oh. So, that's yeah, but I can't remember what happened to them yesterday. Yeah, right. Either. <laughs> either. That's uh, the truth. Well, you've got a DMV in there. Yeah, we do, and and it looks like you have a designer case. Yeah, we do. There was a short period where Revlon bought out one of these companies. I, I uh, Hydrocurve. Bought uh, out Hydrocurve. Or Barnes Hyde. They got themselves a really serious PR firm in New York. And they sent me around the country to talk about uh, their their particular product. They were interested in and uh, in, in tinted lenses in those days and changing eye color. And uh, but they they got me on morning shows all over the place by using a great PR firm. And that's when you did Phil Donahue. Yeah, you know, Phil Donahue came through that as well. Oh, these you'll remember. Now these were called medical alert bracelets, and uh, and they were developed for PMMA lens wearers who had been involved in auto accidents and maybe in a coma, because what was happening is people were wearing PMMA contact lenses. They'd be in a two-week coma. They'd finally look at their eyes and find a huge ulcer sitting there. So uh, these medical alert bracelets uh, made everyone aware of the fact that they were wearing contact lenses. And then uh, these old Shiatz tenometers, you'll remember those. Uh, oh, yes. Both you and I were yes. trained on those back sure. in the day. And, wow. Um, really beautiful instruments. and. Um, Obviously replaced by applanation tonometry, and uh, oh. so you know what you need. Oh, you do have it over there. I see. Uh, you need. A, I was looking at this uh, trial lens that you need oh, a yeah. lens cabinet. Oh yes. I have a friend uh, at one of the practices where I worked, and she had one of those old. It was a big piece of furniture oh, with the lens. It was oh, beautiful. My. I wanted. Oh it. no, I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Those are, you know, they sell for a lot of money now, as yeah. you can imagine, because they are just beautiful. And uh, read this uh, Barbie doll. I thing. saw that. Ooh. Does it? Why do you? Why does it say "looking for Ken"? Uh, yeah, I, I just put that in there. <laughs> it's a little sexist, <laughs> yeah, Patrick. Yeah, a little, little bit, but. Uh, uh, on oh wait, on loan from the Craig Norman Barbie doll collection. <laughs> yeah. That's totally awesome. Uh, yeah. We need to find out what other Barbie dolls Craig yeah. has in his collection. Yeah, yeah we, we really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got Eclipse glasses in yeah, there. Yeah, you know, it's part of our history. Um, 19, or 2017. <coughs> that, was, um, that was really interesting that we had done a story about how to protect your eyes during an eclipse. That's and there cool. were a lot, there was so much interest drawn during that very short window of time of people talking about that yeah. and, and vision and blindness and looking at oh. the sun. So it was a great, a great news hook yeah, and great PR sure for all of eye care. It was, it was a, um, a wonderful opportunity for eye care to uh, tell the story. And then we have a collection of eye cups there, mm -hmm. and this was kind of the original treatment for blepharitis. And I don't know why it went out of vogue, because it's still perhaps one of the better treatments for cleaning the lids and lashes, and very popular in the 30s and 40s. As you can see, a lot of different styles came out. And 
Well, maybe it will come back into vogue because neti yes. pots are coming back into yeah, vogue. Yeah, yeah. Similar know. concept. Yep, yep, exactly. I mean, that looks like patent medicine, though. What is that, McElroy's lotion? What is that? Some of these were mixtures that you would put into the eye cup and uh, not sure what some of these uh, actually had within them, but you'll see in the forefront the uh, bicarbonate of soda uh, tablets. Uh, that's what was usually used. Baking soda? Um, yeah, yeah. Hmm. And... Uh, this is really cool. And I now, see some uh, instrumentation up here, too. it starts over Placido here. Discs. Uh, these are all from the early 1900s. These are all keratometers, ophthalmometers. They look like satellite dishes of today. Oh, yes. they there were do. still some in my, in my school. Yeah. yeah. That, Just things. like that. And, yeah, that's uh, the one where we yeah. position. You had, to, you had to get the axis on. Yep. And they, they rotate and... I swear that they could still be used today. You know, uh, the electronics would just have to be redone, but uh, other than that, um, they're uh, fully uh, functional. And this is the old slit lamps too. Yeah, the old slit lamps, and um, you know, you really realize that very little has changed in, in the optics of eye care. Um, optics are just such a fundamental thing. So this is circa unknown for this clock, and I'm guessing 60s. Wow. Yeah, you know, some of this stuff I'm still trying to track down, you know. Um, I need to get out to Bosch and Loam. Uh, so much of the history of optics in of this course. country originated there, and um, I've... Um, been in contact with their curator there, and a lovely person, lovely woman. American and, Optical still do? Uh, you know, that's the other one. American Optical in Massachusetts, are they still around? That I am not sure of. And uh, if they're still around, AO was a big, big company. Then uh, back here we have uh, um, some interesting things. One, this is our uh, uh, little humble um, uh, library. What we're trying to do is uh, also get all of the books ever written on contact lenses and um, any articles, um, brochures, anything related to contact lenses. Uh, we're trying to archive and, and save as well. Does the AOA library have? You know, I'm surprised the AOA does not have a very um, complete collection. Uh, they're, um, uh, I've always been kind of a little taken back by the fact that they haven't taken they're kind of the history of optometry a bit more serious. And, and, and um, Indiana also, they have the the, history, the historical society. Oh yeah. They should have. Yes, and uh, so sure. we need to get involved with all of those folks. Now this, uh, here's a company you'll remember. Uh, uh, Milton Roy uh, company here. Uh, it's an American Optical, and uh, this was the original um, inventory system for fitting contact lenses. <laughs> and uh, they came in two diameters, 8.2 and 8.7 diameter lenses, all PMMA. And uh, yeah. Then, uh, but still a fairly complete set. So and not many of those. Really? She wore PMA for a lot of years. Hmm. And then, uh, of course, this is a bathroom, but of course we had to deck it out with all of this antique uh, <laughs> stuff. And, and uh, so this is, is really quite fun. And, um, 
So really anything historical related to eye care, we, uh, we jump on, uh, Craig and I. This is uh, something you might remember too, the old uh, Leslie Jessen uh, photo periscope, P-E-K is what it was called. And uh, again, that was uh, another WJ product. These were the projectors I used for many, many years. I know. <laughs> I know. Sure. See, the thing is, is that back in those days, that equipment never wore out. No, it kept it, it's like these old, uh, all these old greens refractors. Yes. Um, you know, they still are 100% functional today. Uh, the, the workmanship that went into all of these instruments was just unbelievable. And then the other thing that was always amazing to me is how heavy all of this stuff, because it was all made with cast iron, uh, especially this chair. Yep. Uh, this is pure <laughs> cast <laughs> iron and um, from the 1950s and yeah. an old B&L keratometer. Who do you think that? Do you think he could still work it? Uh, I bet you he <laughs> could. <laughs> it would this, come this, back to you. Yeah. This is a slip lamp. It's not. Yeah. It's, it's not just the. Um, and there's the Burton lamp. Yeah, the, the Burton lamp. The black light. Yep. People used to use this one. This one I thought was very unique. It was on a uh, mobile stand, and uh, you would oh, wheel it around that. and. Uh, and Put up the. So this is the Foropter? Look at how tiny it is. Yeah, that was one of the real early oh, Foropters. Now here's one of the original Foropters, the Zang Foropters, and what you did here is you use your loose lenses mm. and you would put them in here and then your uh, auxiliary lenses, the uh, prism, would fold, move into position, Maddox rods, all of these things. So this was the earliest of them. And then uh, they evolved into that one there. Wow. This so hard. this had a joystick already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a newer, yeah. newer model. That's a, that's a newer 1950 um, Zeiss. <laughs> Never. As a matter of fact, most of the time I didn't use one. Mm -hmm. I remember yes. when I was in the uh, in the sixties, I joined the. Uh, they put me on the committee, the contact lens committee. There were very few people limited to practice, so even though I was very young, they put me on there, and basically there was a problem because opticians in those days were the were the leaders in contact lens fit, fitting you know, and delivery. But the optometrist said, no, 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 they, they didn't like that idea. I said, well, you know, what? one thing you could do is make it the state of the art that everyone has to have a slit lamp examination when they, have, when they wear contact lenses. And then the AOA in their wisdom says, we can't do that because some of our, many of our members don't have a slit lamp and you'll estrange them. Yeah. So not only didn't they have sinks in their exam rooms to wash their hands, they didn't have a slit lamp to examine their eyes. <laughs> but people survived. Yeah, they needed it somehow. <laughs> Goes back. Hey, hi. Hi, how are you? Hi. See you tomorrow. You betcha. <laughs> this sounds good. I love it. These... So is this yours or is this the school's? No, this is mine. Mine and Craig's. Wow. Completely. Okay. And, uh, now the story here begins actually in all of all places, China. Uh, China was the first uh, country to produce uh, spectacle lenses. And these are some of those early spectacles. Uh, many of them are made of tortoise shell and um, some made of brass. They found their way to Europe, and they think through the uh, 
Adventures of Marco Polo that he actually then kind of brought back the concept. So they were introduced in the late um, uh, 1200s. So Marco uh, Polo brought the concept of eyeglasses, spectacles, in addition to mm -hmm. spaghetti. It's just spaghetti, there you go. <laughs> and both have had a big impact. <laughs> and then um, here are some of the earliest glasses made uh, in this country in the early 1700s. These were made by blacksmiths at the time. And so they're made of iron, but they were shaped and uh, then uh, uh, this, these are all from the mid 1700s. So what, these, is a wig, what are wig eyeglasses? Wig eyeglasses had these little extenders on them. Uh, you'll notice the little bars, the oh, second bar. to stick in the wig, to, to stay on. To stick in the wig. Uh, Interesting. So they were just referred to as wig glasses. And uh, then uh, in the late 1700s uh, were these models that uh, were available. So we're moving away from the entire round shape. We've got uh, some rectangular shape. Yep, we oval. sure do. Interesting. So yeah. even then we're getting into different lens shapes. Yep. But still the jewelers didn't get involved and you can tell as soon as the jewelers got involved because the frames got incredibly elaborate. They're rimless. Yeah, they rimless? were rimless, but wow. they, were, they were glass. They are all glass. Plastic hadn't come about until the 1920s. Mm. So very, very slow on the uptake. Oh, and there's... Franklin's bifocals. Yeah, that's an original 1700 uh, Franklin bifocal. Where did you find that? Uh, again, been collecting my entire life. And, um, that's incredible. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. The only thing that I miss about these glasses, and same thing with the context, you just wish they could talk. Oh, and of course. just tell us your history. And tell us where you've been. Uh, it would be just so absolutely fascinating and then what happened oh, then, then pinch nez and then the oxford frames uh, very similar uh, the oxford frame used a little spring to hold the uh, the glasses on the eyes and then it was in the 1920s that plastic first got introduced. Tortoise. And Corn tortoise rim. and beautiful, beautiful. You know, you look at some of these from the 20s and you go, I would wear those. Uh -huh. I mean, those are very cool. I mean, they're just incredibly cool glasses. Wow. And then we have the 30s. And uh, then these were glasses that were called inventory glasses made by American Optical. The doctor would um, buy them in these uh, boxes like this and then he would put, he or she would put them together. The frames are right there and you can see the different bridge sizes. Mm -hmm. And then the bows that went around the ear were what are called gold-filled um, material. Um, what they were... More expensive. Um, yeah, and you could see these uh, are all gold-filled as well. And, um, and you don't so, have these cases locked? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to edit that part. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When, did, when did male, female glasses start? Hmm. You know, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. You know, the um, it uh, that's a good question because they were the same um, for many, many years. These are just old ads, and uh, then um, a fake spectacle lenses. Mm -hmm. You remember those? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, remember you're... the old a fake spectacle lenses? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, how thick, thick. heavy. People and, just couldn't, uh, yeah. they couldn't get around. Oh, 
So here are some of the old optics books. We have the Irv Borsch refraction book that you and I were raised on. And uh, that one's actually signed by Irv. Oh, wow. So kind of special. Pat, so, would you um, tell us how you came about this idea? What prompted you?